This is Audible. Brilliance Audio presents the unabridged recording of Reaper's Gale by Stephen Erickson, performed by Michael Page. To Glen Cook. Prologue. The Elder Warren of Corald Emorlan, the Age of Sundering. In a landscape torn with grief, the carcasses of six dragons lay strewn in a ragged row, reaching a thousand or more paces across the plain, flesh split apart, broken bones jutting, jaws gaping, and eyes brittle dry. Where their blood had spilled out onto the ground, wraiths had gathered like flies to sap, and were now ensnared, the ghosts writhing and voicing hollow cries of despair as the blood darkened, fusing with the lifeless soil. And when at last the substance grew indurate, hardening into glassy stone, those ghosts were doomed to an eternity trapped within that murky prison. The naked creature that traversed the rough path formed by the fallen dragons was a match to their mass, yet bound to the earth, and it walked on two bowed legs, the size thick as thousand-year-old trees. The width of its shoulders was equal to the length of a Tarthano Toblakai's height. From a thick neck hidden beneath a mane of glossy black hair, the frontal portion of the head was thrust forward, brow, cheekbones, and jaw— and its deep-set eyes revealing black pupils surrounded in opalescent white. The huge arms were disproportionately long, the enormous hands almost scraping the ground. Its breasts were large, pendulous, and pale. As it strode past the battered, rotting carcasses, the motion of its gait was strangely fluid, not at all lumbering, and each limb was revealed to possess extra joints. Skin the hue of sun-bleached bone, darkening to veined red at the ends of the creature's arms, bruises surrounding the knuckles, a latticework of cracked flesh exposing the bone here and there. The hands had seen damage, the result of delivering devastating blows. It paused to tilt its head upward, and watched as three dragons sailed the air high amidst the roiling clouds, appearing then disappearing in the smoke of the dying realm. The earth-bound creature's hands twitched, and a low growl emerged from deep in its throat. After a long moment, it resumed its journey. Beyond the last of the dead dragons, to a place where rose a ridge of hills, the largest of these cleft through as if a giant claw had gouged out the heart of the rise, and in that crevasse raged a rent, a tear in space that bled power in nacreous streams. The malice of that energy was evident in the manner in which it devoured the sides of the fissure, eating like acid into the rocks and boulders of the ancient berm. The rent would soon close, and the one who had last passed through had sought to seal the gate behind him. But such healing could never be done in haste, and this wound bled anew. Ignoring the virulence pouring from the rent, the creature strode closer. At the threshold it paused again and turned to look back the way it had come. Draconian blood hardening into stone— horizontal sheets of the substance already beginning to separate from the surrounding earth, to lift up on edge, forming strange, disarticulated walls. Some then began sinking, vanishing from this realm, falling through world after world, to reappear, finally, solid and impermeable in other realms, depending on the blood's aspect, and these were laws that could not be challenged. Starveld Demolaine, the blood of dragons and the death of blood. In the distance behind the creature, Korald Emorlan, the realm of shadows, the first realm born of the conjoining of dark and light, convulsed in its death throes. Far away the civil wars still raged on, whilst in other areas the fragmenting had already begun, vast sections of this world's fabric torn away, disconnected and lost and abandoned to either heal round themselves or die. 
Yet interlopers still arrived here, like scavengers gathered round a fallen leviathan, eagerly tearing free their own private pieces of the realm, destroying each other in fierce battles over the scraps. It had not been imagined by anyone that an entire realm could die in such a manner, that the vicious acts of its inhabitants could destroy everything. Worlds live on, had been the belief, the assumption, regardless of the activities of those who dwelt upon them. Torn flesh heals, the sky clears, and something new crawls from the briny muck. But not this time. Too many powers, too many betrayals, too vast and all-consuming the crimes. The creature faced the gate once more. Then Kilmandaros, the elder goddess, strode through. The ruined Kachain Chemal domain after the fall of Silchas ruin. Trees were exploding in the bitter cold that descended like a shroud, invisible yet palpable upon this racked, devastated forest. Gothos had no difficulty following the path of the battle, the successive clashes of two elder gods warring with the soul-taken dragon. And as the Jaghut traversed its mangled lengths, he brought with him the brutal chill of Omptos Felak, the Warren of Ice. Sealing the deal, as you asked of me, male. Locking the truth in place to make it more than memory. Until the day that witnesses the shattering of Omtos Felak itself. Gothos wondered, idly, if there had ever been a time when he believed that such a shattering would not come to pass. That the Jaghut, in all their perfected brilliance, were unique, triumphant in eternal domination a civilization immortal when all others were doomed. Well, it was possible. He had once believed that all of existence was under the benign control of a caring omnipotence, after all. And crickets exist to sing us to sleep, too. There was no telling what other foolishness might have crept into his young, naive brain all those millennia ago. No longer, of course. Things end. Species die out. Faith in anything else was a conceit, the product of unchained ego, the curse of supreme self-importance. So what do I now believe? He would not permit himself a melodramatic laugh in answer to that question. What was the point? There was no one nearby who might appreciate it, including himself. Yes, I am cursed to live with my own company. It's a private curse, the best kind. He ascended a broken, fractured rise, some violent uplift of bedrock, where a vast fissure had opened, its vertical sides already glistening with frost when Gothos came to the edge and looked down. Somewhere in the darkness below, two voices were raised in argument. Gothos smiled. He opened his warren, made use of a sliver of power to fashion a slow, controlled descent towards the gloomy base of the crevasse. As Gothos neared, the two voices ceased, leaving only a rasping, hissing sound, pulsating, the drawing of breath on waves of pain, and the jaghut heard the slithering of scales on stone, slightly off to one side. He alighted atop broken shards of rock a few paces from where stood Mail, and ten paces beyond him the huge form of Kilmandaros, her skin vaguely luminescent, in a sickly sort of way, standing with hands closed into fists, a belligerent cast to her brutal mien. Skabandari, the soul-taken dragon, had been driven into a hollow in the cliffside, and now crouched, splintered ribs no doubt making every breath an ordeal of agony. One wing was shattered, half torn away. A hind limb was clearly broken, bones punched through flesh. Its flight was at an end. The two elders were now eyeing Gothos, who strode forward, then spoke. I am always delighted, he said, when a betrayer is in turn betrayed. In this instance, betrayed by his own stupidity, which is even more delightful. Male, elder god of the seas, asked, The ritual, are you done, Gothos? More or less? 
The Jack Hut fixed his gaze on Kilmandaros. Elder Goddess, your children in this realm have lost their way. The huge bestial woman shrugged and said in a faint, melodic voice, They're always losing their way, Jack Hut. Well, why don't you do something about it? Why don't you? One thin brow lifted, then Gothos bade his tusks in a smile. Is that an invitation, Kilmandaros? She looked over at the dragon. I have no time for this. I need to return to Korald Emolan. I will kill him now. And she stepped closer. You must not, Mael said. Kilmandaros faced him, huge hands opening, then closing again into fists. So you keep saying, you boiled crab? Shrugging, Mael turned to Gothos. Explain it to her, please. How many debts do you wish to owe me? The jackhut asked him. Oh, now really, Gothos. Very well. Kilmandaros, within the ritual that now descends upon this land, upon the battlefields and these ugly forests, death itself is denied. Should you kill the Tist Edur here, his soul will be unleashed from his flesh, but it will remain only marginally reduced in power. I mean to kill him. Kilmandaros said in her soft voice. Then, Gothos's smile broadened, you will need me, Mael snorted. Why do I need you? Kilmandaros asked the Jaghut. He shrugged. A finest must be prepared to house, to imprison this soul-taken soul. Very well, then make one. As a favor to you both? I think not, Elder Goddess. No, alas, as with male here, you must acknowledge a debt to me. I have a better idea, Kilmandaros said. I crush your skull between a finger and thumb. Then I push your carcass down Scabandari's throat so that he suffocates on your pompous self. This seems a fitting demise for the both of you. Goddess, you have grown bitter and crabby in your old age, Gothos said. It is no surprise, she replied. I made the mistake of trying to save Korald Emolan. Why bother? Mael asked her. Kilmandaros bared jagged teeth. The president is unwelcome. You go bury your head in the sands again, Mael, but I warn you, the death of one realm is a promise to every other realm. As you say, the elder god said after a moment, and I do concede that possibility. In any case, Gothos demands recompense. The fists unclenched, then clenched again. Very well. Now, Jaghut. Fashion a finest. This will do, Gothos said, drawing an object into view from a tear in his ragged shirt. The two elders stared at it for a time, then Mael grunted. Yes, I see now. Rather curious choice, Gothos. The only kind I make, the Jaghut replied. Go on then, Kilmandaros. Proceed with your subtle conclusion to the soul taken's pathetic existence. The dragon hissed, screamed in rage and fear as the elder goddess advanced. When she drove a fist into Scabandari's skull, centered on the ridge between and above the draconic eyes, the crack of the thick bone rang like a dirge down the length of the crevasse, and with the impact blood spurted from the goddess's knuckles. The dragon's broken head thumped heavily onto the broken bedrock, fluid spilling out from beneath the sagging body. Kilmandaros wheeled to face Gothos. He nodded. I have the poor bastard. Mael stepped towards the jaghut, holding out a hand. 
I will take the finest, then. No. Both elders now faced Gothos, who smiled once more. Repayment of the debt, for each of you. I claim the finest, the soul of Scabandari, for myself. Nothing remains between us now. Are you not pleased? What do you intend to do with it? Mail demanded. I have not yet decided, but I assure you it will be most curiously unpleasant. Kilmandaros made fists again with her hands and half raised them. I am tempted, Jack Hutt, to send my children after you. Too bad they've lost their way, then. Neither elder said another word as Gothos departed from the fissure. It always pleased him, outwitting doddering old wrecks and all their hoary, brutal power. Well, a momentary pleasure, in any case. The best kind. Upon her return to the rent, Kilmandaros found another figure standing before it, black-cloaked, white-haired, an expression of arched contemplation fixed upon the torn fisher. About to enter the gate, or waiting for her, the elder goddess scowled. You are not welcome in Korald Emorlan, she said. Anamandaris Puraki settled cool eyes upon the monstrous creature. Do you imagine I contemplate claiming the throne for myself? You would not be the first. He faced the rent again. You are besieged, Kilmandaros, and Edgewalker is committed elsewhere. I offer you my help. With you, Tist Andy, my trust is not easily earned. Unjustified, he replied. Unlike many others of my kind, I accept that the rewards of betrayal are never sufficient to overwhelm the cost. There are soul taken now, in addition to feral dragons warring in Korald Emolan. Where is Osak? the elder goddess asked. Mael informed me that he was planning to get in my way again. Osirk imagined I would take part in slaying Scabandari. Why should I? You and Mael were more than enough. He grunted then. I can picture Osirk circling round and round, looking for me. Idiot. And Scabandari's betrayal of your brother? You have no desire to avenge that? Anamandaris glanced at her, then gave her a faint smile. The rewards of betrayal. The cost to Scabandari proved high, didn't it? As for Silchas, well, even the Azaths do not last forever. I almost envy him his newfound isolation from all that will afflict us in the millennia to come. Indeed. Do you wish to join him in a similar barrow? I think not. Then I imagine that Silchas Ruin will not be inclined to forgive you your indifference the day he is freed. You might be surprised, Kilmandaros. You and your kind are mysteries to me, Anamandaris Puraki. I know. So, goddess, have we a pact? She cocked her head. I mean to drive the pretenders from the realm. If Korald Emolan must die, then let it do so on its own. In other words, you want to leave the throne of shadow unoccupied? Yes. He thought for a time, then he nodded. Agreed. Do not wrong me, soul taken. I shall not. Are you ready, Kilmandaros? They will forge alliances, she said. They will all war against us. Anamandaris shrugged. I have nothing better to do today. The two ascendants then walked through the gate, and together they closed the rent behind them. There were other paths, after all, to this realm, paths that were not wounds. Arriving within Korald Emolan, they looked upon a ravaged world. 
then set about cleansing what was left of it. The all done in the last days of King Disganar. Prida Bivat, a captain of the Dream Garrison, was far from home. Twenty-one days by wagon, commanding an expedition of two hundred soldiers of the Tattered Banner Army, a troop of thirty Blue Rose Light Cavalry, and four hundred support staff, including civilians, she had, after delivering orders for the setting of camp, slid down from the back of her horse to walk the fifty-odd paces to the edge of the bluff. When she reached the rise, the wind struck her a hammer blow to her chest, as if eager to fling her back to scrape her from this battered lip of land. The ocean beyond the ridge was a vision from an artist's nightmare, a seascape torn, churning, with heavy twisting clouds shredding apart overhead. The water was more white than blue-green, foam boiling, spume flying out from between rocks as the waves pounded the shore. Yet she saw with a chill rushing in to bludgeon her bones, this was the place. A fisher boat blown well off course into the deadly maelstrom that was this stretch of ocean, a stretch that no trader ship, no matter how large, would willingly venture into. A stretch that had, eighty years ago, caught a Mekros city and had torn it to pieces, pulling into the depths twenty thousand or more dwellers of that floating settlement. The fisher crew had survived, long enough to draw their beleaguered craft safely aground in hip-deep water thirty or so paces from the bedrock strand. Catch lost, their boat punched into kindling by relentless waves, the four lethery managed to reach dry land. To find this. Tightening the strap of her helm, lest the wind tear it and her head from her shoulders, Prida Bivat continued scanning the wreckage lining this shoreline. The promontory she stood on was undercut, dropping away three man heights to a bank of white sand heaped with elongated rows of dead kelp, uprooted trees, and remnants of eighty year old Mekros City. And something else, something more unexpected war canoes, the sea going kind, each as long as a coral faced whale high-proud, longer and broader of beam than Tist Edor craft. Not flung ashore as wreckage, no, not one she could see displayed anything like damage. They were drawn up in rows high along the beach, although it was clear that that had happened some time past, months at least, perhaps years. A presence at her side, the merchant from Dreen who had been contracted to supply this expedition. Pale-skinned, his hair pallid blonde, so fair as to be nearly white. The wind was blasting red the man's round face, but she could see his light blue eyes fixed on the array of war canoes, tracking, first westward along the beach, then eastward. I have some talent, he said to her, loudly so as to be heard over the gale. Bivat said nothing. The merchant no doubt had skill with numbers, his claim to talent and she was an officer in the Lethary army, and could well gauge the likely complement of each enormous craft without his help. A hundred, give or take twenty. Preda? What? The merchant gestured helplessly. These canoes! He waved up the beach, then down. There must be... And then he was at a loss for words. She well understood him. Yes. Rose upon rose, all drawn up to this forbidding shore. Dreen, the nearest city of the kingdom, was three weeks away, to the southwest. Directly south of here was the land of the Aldan, and of the tribe's seasonal rounds with their huge herds virtually all was known. The Lethary were in the process of conquering them, after all. There had been no report of anything like this. Thus... Not long ago, a fleet arrived upon this shore, whereupon everyone had disembarked, taking all they had with them, and then, presumably, set off inland. There should have been signs, rumors, a reverberation among the all at the very least. We should have heard about it. But they hadn't. The foreign invaders had simply disappeared. Not possible. How can it be? She scanned the rose once again 
as if hoping that some fundamental detail would reveal itself, would ease the hammering of her heart and the leaden chill of her limbs. Preda? Yes, one hundred per craft, and here before us, stacked four, five deep. What? Four, maybe five thousand? The north shoreline was a mass of grey-wooded war canoes, for almost as far as she could see to the west and to the east, drawn up, abandoned, filling the shore like a toppled forest. Upwards of a half million, the merchant said. That is my estimate. Preda, where in the errant's name did they all go? She scowled. Kick that mage nest of yours, Letor Anict. Make them earn their exorbitant fees. The king needs to know every detail. Everything. At once, the man said, while she would do the same with the cedar's squad of acolytes. The redundancy was necessary. Without the presence of Kuru Khan's chosen students, she would never learn all that Letor Anict held back on his final report, would never be able to distill the truths from the half-truths, the outright lies. A perennial problem with hiring private contractors— they had their own interests, after all, and loyalty to the crown was, for creatures like Leto Anict, the new factor of Dreen, always secondary. She began looking for a way down onto the beach. Bivat wanted a closer look at these canoes, especially since it seemed that sections of their prows had been dismantled. Which is an odd thing to do, yet a manageable mystery, one I can deal with and so not think about all the rest. Upwards of a half million. Errant's blessing, who is now among us? The Aldan, following the Edur conquest. The wolves had come, then gone, and where corpses had been dragged out from the solid press atop the hilltop, where the unknown soldiers had made their last stand, the signs of their feeding were evident and this detail remained with the lone rider as he walked his horse amidst the motionless, sprawled bodies. Such pillaging of the dead was unusual. The dun-furred wolves of this plain were as opportunistic as any other predator on the Aldan, of course. Even so, long experience with humans should have sent the beasts fleeing at the first sour scent, even if it was commingled with that of spilled blood. What, then, had drawn them to this silent battlefield? The lone rider, face hidden behind a crimson-scaled mask, drew rein near the base of the low hill. His horse was dying, racked with shivers. Before the day's end, the man would be walking. As he was breaking camp this dawn, a horn-nosed snake had nipped the horse as it fed on a tuft of sliver-stem grasses at the edge of a gully. The poison was slow but inevitable, and could not be neutralized by any of the herbs and medicines the man carried. The loss was regrettable but not disastrous, since he had not been traveling in haste. Ravens circled overhead, yet none descended, nor had his arrival stirred them from this feast. Indeed, it had been the sight of them, wheeling above this hill, that had guided him to this place. Their cries were infrequent, strangely muted, almost plaintive. The Dreen legions had taken away their dead, leaving naught but their victims to feed the grasses of the plain. The morning's frost still mapped glistening patterns on death-dark skin, but the melt had already begun, and it seemed to him that these dead soldiers now wept from stilled faces, from open eyes, from mortal wounds. Rising on his stirrups, he scanned the horizon, as much of it as he could see, seeking sight of his two companions, but the dread creatures had yet to return from their hunt, and he wondered if they had found a new, more inviting trail somewhere to the west, the lethary soldiers of Dreen marching triumphant and glutted back to their city. If so, then there would be slaughter on this day. The notion of vengeance, however, was incidental. His companions were indifferent to such sentiments, they killed for pleasure, as far as he could tell. Thus the annihilation of the dream, and any vengeance that could be ascribed to the deed, existed only in his own mind. The distinction was important. Even so, a satisfying conceit. Yet these victims here were strangers, these soldiers in their grey and black uniforms. 
Stripped now of weapons and armor, standards taken as trophies, their presence here in the Aldan, in the heart of the rider's homeland, was perturbing. He knew the invading Lethary, after all, the numerous legions with their peculiar names and fierce rivalries. He knew as well the fearless cavalry of the Blue Rose, and the still free kingdoms and territories bordering the Aldan, the rival Drasilhani, the Kerin, the Balkando kingdom, and the Safinand state. He had treated with or crossed blades with them all years ago, and none were as these soldiers here. Pale-skinned, hair the color of straw or red as rust, eyes of blue or gray, and so many women. His gaze settled upon one such soldier, a woman near the hill's summit, mangled by sorcery, her armor melded with the twisted flesh. There were sigils visible on that armor. Dismounting, he ascended the slope, picking his way round bodies, moccasins skidding on blood-soaked mud, until he crouched down at her side. Paint on the blackened bronze hauberk, wolf heads, a pair, one was white-furred and one-eyed, the other furred silver and black, a sigil he had not seen before. Strangers, indeed. Foreigners, here in the land of his heart. Behind the mask he scowled. Gone. Too long. Am I now the stranger? Heavy drumbeats reverberated through the ground beneath his feet. He straightened. His companions were returning. So, no vengeance after all. Well, there was time yet. The mournful howl of wolves had awakened him this morning, their calls the first to draw him here, to this place, as if they sought a witness, as if indeed they had summoned him. While their cries had urged him on, he had not caught sight of the beasts, not once. The wolves had fed, however, some time this morning, dragging bodies from the press. His steps slowed as he made his way down the slope, slowed until he stood, his breath drawn in and held as he looked more closely at the dead soldiers on all sides. The wolves have fed, but not as wolves do. Not like, like this. Chests torn open, ribs jutting. They had devoured hearts. Nothing else, just the hearts. The drumbeats were louder now, closer, the rake of talons hissing through grass. Overhead, the ravens, screaming, fled in all directions. Book One The Emperor in Gold The lie stands alone, the solitary deceit with its back turned, no matter the direction of your reluctant approach, and with each step your goal is driven on, your stride carried astray. The path enfolding upon itself, round and round you walk, and what stood alone before you, errant as mischance, an accidental utterance, now reveals its legion of children, this mass seething in threads and knots, and surrounded, you cannot draw breath, cannot move. The world is of your making, and one day, my friend, you will stand alone amidst a sea of dead the purchasing of your words all about you, and the wind will laugh you a new path into unending torment. The solitary deceit is its solitude. The lie is the lie standing alone. The threads and knots of the multitude tighten in righteous judgment, with which you once so freely strangled every truthsayer, every voice of dissent. So now ease your thirst on my sympathy and die parched in the wasteland. Fragment found on the day the poetess Tesora Vedict was arrested by the Patriotists, six days before her drowning. Chapter One Two forces, once in vicious opposition, now found themselves virtual bedmates, although neither could decide which of them had their legs pried open first. The simple facts are these— the original hierarchical structure of the Tist Edur tribes proved well suited to the lethary system of power through wealth. The Edur became the crown, settling easy upon the bloated gluttony of Lether. But does a crown possess will? 
Does the wearer buckle beneath its burden? Another truth is now, in hindsight, self-evident. As seamless as this merging seemed to be, a more subtle, far deadlier conjoining occurred below the surface, that of the specific flaws within each system, and this blending was to prove a most volatile brew. The Hiroth Dynasty, Volume 17, The Colony, A History of Lether, Dinith Arnara. Where is this one from? Tanal Yathavanar watched the invigilator slowly rotating the strange object in his pudgy hands, the onyx stones in the many rings on the short fingers glimmering in the shafts of sunlight that reached in through the opened window. The object Karos Invict had manipulated was a misshapen collection of bronze pins, the ends bent into loops that were twisted about one another to form a stiff cage. Blue rose, I believe, sir. Tanar replied. One of Senorbo's. The average duration for solving it is three days, although the record is just under two. Who? Karas demanded, glancing up from where he sat behind his desk. A Tarthanal half-blood, if you can believe that, sir. Here in Letharus, the man is reputedly a simpleton, yet possesses a natural talent for solving puzzles. And the challenge is to slide the pins into a configuration to create a sudden collapse. Yes, sir, it flattens out. From what I have heard, the precise number of manipulations is... No, Tanal, do not tell me. You should know better. The invigilator, commander of the Patriotists, set the object down. Thank you for the gift. Now, a brief smile... Have we inconvenienced Bruthantrana long enough, do you think? Karos rose, paused to adjust his crimson silks, the only color and the only material he ever wore, then collected the short scepter he had made his official symbol of office, black bloodwood from the Edoer homeland with silver caps studded in polished onyx stones, and gestured with it in the direction of the door. Tanal bowed, then led the way out into the corridor, to the broad stairs where they descended to the main floor, then strode through the double doors and out into the compound. The row of prisoners had been positioned in full sunlight, near the west wall of the enclosure. They had been taken from their cells a bell before dawn, and it was now shortly past midday. Lack of water and food, and this morning's searing heat, combined with brutal sessions of questioning over the past week, had resulted in more than half of the eighteen detainees losing consciousness. Tanal saw the invigilator's frown upon seeing the motionless bodies collapsed in their chains. The Tist Edor liaison, Bruthen Trana of the Denratha tribe, was standing in the shade, more or less across from the prisoners, and the tall, silent figure slowly turned as Tanal and Karos approached. Bruthen Trana, most welcome, said Karos in Victad. You are well? Let us proceed, Invigilator, the grey-skinned warrior said. At once. If you will accompany me, we can survey each prisoner assembled here. The specific cases— I have no interest in approaching them any closer than I am now, Bruthen said. They are fouled in their own wastes, and there is scant breeze in this enclosure. Karos smiled. I understand, Bruthen. He leaned his scepter against a shoulder, then faced the row of detainees. We need not approach, as you say. I will begin with the one to the far left, then... Unconscious or dead? Well, at this distance, who can say? Noting the Edward's scowl, Tanal bowed to Bruthen and Karos and walked the fifteen paces to the line. He crouched to examine the prone figure, then straightened. He lives. Then awaken him, Karos commanded. His voice, when raised, became shrill, enough to make a foolish listener wince. Foolish, that is, if the invigilator was witness to that instinctive reaction. Such careless errors happened but once. Tanal kicked at the prisoner until the man managed a dry, rasping sob. On your feet, traitor, Tanal said in a quiet tone. The invigilator demands it. Stand, or I will begin breaking bones in that pathetic sack you call a body. He watched as the prisoner struggled upright. 
Water, please. Not another word from you. Straighten up, face your crimes. You are lethary, aren't you? Show our Edoer guest the meaning of that. Tanal then made his way back to Karos and Bruthen. The invigilator had begun speaking. Known associations with dissenting elements in the physician's college. He has admitted as much. Although no specific crimes can be laid at this man's feet, it is clear that... The next one, Bruth and Trana cut in. Karos closed his mouth, then smiled without showing his teeth. Of course. The next is a poet who wrote and distributed a call for revolution. He denies nothing, and indeed you can see his stoic defiance even from here. And the one beside him? The proprietor of an inn, a tavern of which was frequented by undesirable elements, disenchanted soldiers, in fact, and two of them are among these detainees. We were informed of the sedition by an honorable whore. Honorable whore, invigilator? The Edor half smiled. Karos blinked. Why, yes, Bruce and Trana. Because she informed on an innkeeper. An innkeeper engaged in treason. Demanding too high a cut of her earnings, more likely. Go on, and please, keep your descriptions of the crimes brief. Of course, Karos and Victad said, the scepter gently tapping on his soft shoulder like a baton measuring a slow march. Tanal, standing at his commander's side, remained at attention whilst the invigilator resumed his report of the specific transgressions of these lethary. The eighteen prisoners were fair representations of the more than three hundred chained in cells below ground. A decent number of arrests for this week, Tanal reflected, and for the most egregious traitors among them waited the drownings. Of the three hundred and twenty or so, a third were destined to walk the canal bottom, burdened beneath crushing weights. Bookmakers were complaining these days, since no one ever survived the ordeal any more. Of course, they did not complain too loudly, since the true agitators among them risked their own drowning. It had taken but a few of those early on to mute the protestations among the rest. This was a detail Tanal had come to appreciate— one of Karos Invictad's perfect laws of compulsion and control, emphasized again and again in the vast treatise the invigilator was penning on the subject most dear to his heart. Take any segment of population, impose strict yet clear definitions on their particular characteristics, then target them for compliance. Bribe the weak to expose the strong. Kill the strong, and the rest are yours. Move on to the next segment. Bookmakers had been easy targets, since few people liked them, especially inveterate gamblers, and of those there were more and more with every day that passed. Karos Invictad concluded his litany. Bruthentrana nodded, then turned and left the compound. As soon as he was gone from sight, the invigilator faced Tanal. An embarrassment, he said. Those unconscious ones? Yes, sir. A change of heads on the outer wall. At once, sir. Now, Tanal Yathvanar, before anything else, you must come with me. It will take but a moment, then you can return to the tasks at hand. They walked back into the building, the invigilator's short steps forcing Tanal to slow up again and again as they made their way to Karos's office. The most powerful man next to the emperor himself took his place once more behind the desk. He picked up the cage of bronze pins, shifted a dozen or so in a flurry of precise moves, and the puzzle collapsed flat. Karos Invictad smiled across at Tanal, then flung the object onto the desk. Dispatch a missive to Senorbo in Blue Rose. Inform him of the time required for me to find a solution, then add, from me to him, that I fear he's losing his touch. Yes, sir. Karos Invictad reached out for a scroll. Now, what was our agreed percentage on my interest in the Inn of the Belly-Up Snake? I believe Rotos indicated forty-five, sir. Good. Even so, I believe a meeting is in order with the Master of the Liberty Consign. Later this week will do. For all our takings of late, we still possess a strange paucity in actual coin. 
and I want to know why. Sir, you know Rortos Hivana's suspicions on that matter. Vaguely, he will be pleased to learn I am now prepared to listen more closely to said suspicions. Thus, two issues on the agenda. Schedule the meeting for a bell's duration. Oh, and one last thing, Tano. Sir? Ruth and Trana, these weekly visits, I want to know, is he compelled? Is this some Edoer form of royal disaffection or punishment? Or are the bastards truly interested in what we're up to? Bruthen makes no comment, ever. He does not even ask what punishments follow our judgments. Furthermore, his rude impatience tires me. It may be worth our while to investigate him. Tanal's brows rose. Investigate a test error? Quietly, of course. Granted, they ever give us the appearance of unquestioning loyalty, but I cannot help but wonder if they truly are immune to sedition among their own kind. Even if they aren't, sir, respectfully, are the Patriotists the right organization? The Patriotists, Tanal Yathvana, said Karos sharply, possess the Imperial Charter to police the Empire. In that charter no distinction is made between Edor and Lethery, only between the loyal and the disloyal. Yes, sir. Now I believe you have tasks awaiting you. Tanal Yathvana bowed then strode from the office. The estate dominated a shelf of land on the north bank of Lether River, four streets west of Quillas Canal. Stepped walls marking its boundaries made their way down the bank, extending out into the water, on posts to ease the current's tug, more than two boat lengths. Just beyond rose two mooring poles. There had been flooding this season. An infrequent occurrence in the past century, Rortos Hivana noted as he leafed through the estate compendium, a family tome of notes and maps recording the full eight hundred years of Hivana blood on this land. He settled back in the plush chair and, with contemplative languor, finished his ballot tea. The house steward and principal agent, Venet Sathard, quietly stepped forward to return the compendium to the wood and iron chests sunk in the floor beneath the map table, then replaced the floorboards and unfurled the rug over the spot. His tasks completed, he stepped back to resume his position beside the door. Rotos Hivana was a large man, his complexion florid, his features robust. His presence tended to dominate a room, no matter how spacious. He sat in the estate's library now, the walls shelved to the ceiling. Scrolls, clay tablets, and bound books filled every available space, the gathered learning of a thousand scholars, many of whom bore the Hivana name. As head of the family and overseer of its vast financial holdings, Rotos Hivana was a busy man, and such demands on his intellect had redoubled since the Tist Edur conquest, which had triggered the official formation and recognition of the Liberty Consign an association of the wealthiest families in the Lether Empire, in ways he could never have imagined before. He would be hard-pressed to explain how he found all such activities tedious or enervating. Yet that was what they had become, even as his suspicions slowly, incrementally resolved into certainties, even as he began to perceive that somewhere out there there was an enemy, or enemies, bent on the singular task of economic sabotage, not mere embezzlement, an activity with which he was personally very familiar, but something more profound, all-encompassing. An enemy. To all that sustained Rortos Hivana, and the liberty consign of which he was master, indeed to all that sustained the empire itself, regardless of who sat upon the throne, regardless even of those savage, miserable barbarians who were now preening at the very pinnacle of lethary society, like grey-feathered jackdaws atop a horde of baubles. Such comprehension, on Rortos Hivana's part, would once have triggered a most zealous response within him. The threat alone should have sufficed to elicit a vigorous hunt, and the notion of an agency of such diabolical purpose, one, he was forced to admit, guided by the most subtle genius, should have enlivened the game until its pursuit acquired the power of obsession. Instead, Rotos Hivana found himself seeking notations among the dusty ledgers for evidence of past floodings, 
pursuing an altogether more mundane mystery that would interest but a handful of muttering academics. And that, he admitted often to himself, was odd. Nonetheless, the compulsion gathered strength, and at night he would lie beside the recumbent, sweat-sheathed mass that was his wife of thirty-three years, and find his thoughts working ceaselessly, struggling against the currents of time's cyclical flow, seeking to clamber his way back with all his sensibilities into past ages, looking, looking for something. Sighing, Rotos set down the empty cup, then rose. As he walked to the door, Venet Sathad, whose family line had been indebted to the Hivanas for six generations now, stepped forward to retrieve the fragile cup, then set off in his master's wake. Out onto the waterfront enclosure, across the mosaic portraying the investiture of Skoval Hivana as imperial cedar three centuries past, then down the shallow stone stairs to what, in drier times, was the lower terrace garden. But the river's currents had swirled in here, stealing away soil and plants, exposing a most peculiar arrangement of boulders set like a cobbled street, framed in wooden posts arranged in a rectangle, the posts little more than rotted stumps now, rising from the flood's remnant pools. At the edge of the upper level, workers, under Rotus's direction, had used wood bulwarks to keep it from collapsing, and to one side sat a wheelbarrow filled with the multitude of curious objects that had been exposed by the floodwaters. These items had littered the cobbled floor. In all, Rotus mused, a mystery. There was no record whatsoever of the lower terrace gardens being anything but what it was, and the notations from the garden's designer— from shortly after the completion of the estate's main buildings, indicated the bank at that level was nothing more than ancient flood silts. The clay had preserved the wood, at least until recently, so there was no telling how long ago the strange construct had been built. The only indication of its antiquity rested with the objects, all of which were either bronze or copper. Not weapons, as one might find associated with a barrow, and if tools— then they were for activities long forgotten, since not a single worker Rotos had brought to this place was able to fathom the function of these items. They resembled no known tools, not for stoneworking, nor wood, nor the processing of foodstuffs. Rotos collected one and examined it for at least the hundredth time. Bronze, clay cast, the flange was clearly visible. The item was long, roundish, yet bent at almost right angles. Incisions formed a cross-hatched pattern about the elbow. Neither end displayed any means of attachment, not intended, therefore, as part of some larger mechanism. He hefted its considerable weight in his hand. There was something imbalanced about it, despite the centrally placed bend. He set it down and drew out a circular sheet of copper, thinner than the wax layer on a scryer's tablet. Blackened by contact with the clays, yet only now the edges showing signs of verdigris. Countless holes had been punched through the sheet, in no particular pattern, yet each hole was perfectly uniform, perfectly round, with no lip to indicate from which side it had been punched. Vedit, he said, have we a map recording the precise locations of these objects when they were originally found? Indeed, master, with but a few exceptions. You examined it a week past. I did. Very well. Set it out once more on the table in the library this afternoon. Both men turned as the gate watcher appeared from the narrow side passage along the left side of the house. The woman halted ten paces from Rotos and bowed. Master, a message from Invigilator Karos Invictad. Very good, Rotos replied distractedly. I will attend to it in a moment. Does the messenger await a response? Yes, master. He is in the courtyard. See that refreshments are provided. The watcher bowed, then departed. Venet, I believe you must prepare to undertake a journey on my behalf. Master? The invigilator at last perceives the magnitude of the threat. Venet Sathad said nothing. You must travel to Dream City. Rotos said, his eyes once more on the mysterious construct dominating the lower terrace. 
The consign requires a most specific report of the preparations there. Alas, the factor's own missives are proving unsatisfactory. I require confidence in those matters if I am to apply fullest concentration to the threat closer to hand. Again, Venet did not speak. Rotos looked out onto the river. Fisher boats gathered in the bay opposite, two merchant traders drawing in towards the main docks. One of them, bearing the flag of the Esterict family, looked damaged, possibly by fire. Rotos brushed the dirt from his hands and turned about, making his way back into the building, his servant falling into step behind him. I wonder what lies beneath those stones. Master? Never mind, Venet. I was but thinking out loud. The Aldan camp had been attacked at dawn by two troops of Atripreda Bivat's Blue Rose cavalry. Two hundred skilled lancers riding into a maelstrom of panic as figures struggled out from the hide huts, as the dream-bred war-dogs, arriving moments before the horse-soldiers, closed on the pack of all herder and dray dogs, and in moments the three breeds of beast were locked in a vicious battle. The all-warriors were unprepared, and few had time to even so much as find their weapons before the lancers burst into their midst. In moments the slaughter extended out to encompass elders and children. Most of the women fought alongside their male kin, wife and husband, sister and brother, dying together in a last blending of blood. The engagement between the Lethery and the All took all of two hundred heartbeats. The war among the dogs was far more protracted, for the herder dogs, while smaller and more compact than their attackers, were quick and no less vicious, while the drays, bred to pull carts in summer and sleds in winter, were comparable with the dream breed. Trained to kill wolves, the drays proved more than a match for the war dogs, and if not for the lancers then making sport of killing the mottled-skinned beasts, the battle would have turned. As it was, the all-pack finally broke away the survivors fleeing onto the plain, eastward, a few dream war-dogs giving chase before being recalled by their handlers. Whilst lancers dismounted to make certain there were no survivors among the all, others rode out to collect the herds of Myrid and Rodara in the next valley. Atripreva Bivat sat astride her stallion, struggling to control the beast with the smell of blood so heavy in the morning air. Beside her, sitting awkward and in discomfort on the unfamiliar saddle, Brol Handar, the newly appointed Tist Edur overseer of Dreen City, watched the lethery systematically loot the encampment, stripping corpses naked and drawing their knives. They all bound their jewellery, mostly gold, deep in the braids of their hair, forcing the lethery to slice away those sections of the scalp to claim their booty. Of course, there was more than just expedience in this mutilation, for it had been extended to the collecting of swaths of skin that had been decorated in tattoos, the particular style of the all rich in color and often outlined in stitched gold thread. These trophies adorned the round shields of many lancers. The captured herds now belonged to the factor of Dreen, Letur Anikt, and as Brol Handar watched the hundreds of Myrid come over the hill, their black woolly coats making them look like boulders as they poured down the hillside, it was clear that the factor's wealth had just risen substantially. The taller Rodara followed, blue-backed and long-necked, their long tails thrashing about in near panic as war-dogs on the herd's flanks plunged into faint attacks again and again. The breath hissed from the Atripreda's teeth. Where is the factor's man, anyway? Those Damned Rodara are going to stampede. Lieutenant, get the handlers to call off their hounds. Hurry! The woman unstrapped her helm, pulled it free and set it atop the saddle horn. She looked across at Brawl. There you have it, overseer. So these are the all. She grimaced, looked away. A small camp by their standards, seventy-odd adults. Yet large herds. Her grimace became a scowl. They were once larger, overseer, much larger. I take it, then, that this campaign of yours is succeeding in driving away these trespassers. 
Not my campaign. She seemed to catch something in his expression, for she added, Yes, of course, I command the expeditionary forces, overseer, but I receive my orders from the factor, and, strictly speaking, the all are not trespassers. The factor claims otherwise. Letour Anict is highly ranked in the Liberty Consign. Brol Handar studied the woman for a moment, then said, Not all wars are fought for wealth and land, Atribrida. I must disagree, overseer. Did not you, Tist Edur, invade preemptively in response to the perceived threat of lost land and resources? Cultural assimilation, the end of your independence. There is no doubt in my mind, she continued, that we Lethary sought to obliterate your civilization, as we had done already with the Tarthanol and so many others, and so an economic war. It does not surprise me, Atripreda, that your kind saw it that way and I do not doubt that such concerns were present in the mind of the Warlock King. Did we conquer you in order to survive? Perhaps. Brawl considered saying more than he shook his head, watching as four war dogs closed on a wounded cattle dog. The lame beast fought back, but was soon down, kicking, then silent and limp as the war dogs tore open its belly. Bevat asked, do you ever wonder, Overseer, which of us truly won that war? He shot her a dark look. No, I do not. Me. Now, I am not as indifferent as you think. There is the glow of heightened excitement in your rather blunt, dogged features. What has happened? Has Shur Kelal returned, then? Would I be here if she had? Ublala asked. No, Tehol Bedict, she is gone. Out to the seas, with all her pirated young men. I was too big, you see. I had to sleep on the deck, no matter the weather. And that was no fun. And those pirates, they kept wanting to tie sails to me, laughing as if that was funny or something. Ah, well, sailors have simple minds, friend. And pirates are failed sailors, mostly taking simpledom to profound extremes. What? I have news, you know. Do you now? I do. Can I hear it? Do you want to? Why, yes, else I would not have asked. Really want to? Look, if you're not interested in telling me... No, I'm interested in telling you. That is why I'm here although I will have some of that soup if you're offering. Ublala Pang, you are most welcome to this soup, but first let me fish out this rag I fed into the broth, lest you choke or something. Rag? What kind of rag? Well, squarish, mostly. I believe it was used to wipe down a kitchen counter, thereby absorbing countless assorted foodstuffs. Tell Bedict. One of the pure blood has come to the city. Is that your news? The huge man nodded solemnly. Pure blood? Another nod. So, a Tarthanol. No, Ublala Pung cut in. Pure blood. Purer than any Tarthanol. And he carries a stone sword. On his face are the most terrifying tattoos, like a shattered tile. He is greatly scarred, and countless ghosts swirl in his wake. Ghosts? You could see ghosts following him around? See them? Of course not. But I smelled them. Really? So what do ghosts smell like? Never mind. A Tarthanol who's more Tarthanol than any Tarthanol has arrived in the city. What does he want? You do not understand, Tehol Bedict. He is a champion. He is here to challenge the Emperor. Oh, the poor man. Yes, the poor man. But he's not a man, is he? He's a Tist Edur. Tehol Bedict frowned across at Ublala Pang. Ah, we were speaking of two different poor men. Well, a short time earlier, a runner from Rucket visited. It seems Scale House collapsed during that earthquake. But it was not your normal earthquake, such as never occurs around here anyway. Ublala Pang, 
There is another champion, one far more frightening than any pure blood Tarthanol. There is great consternation among the rat catchers, all of whom seem to know more than they're letting on. The view seems to be that this time the Emperor's search has drawn in a most deadly haul. Well, I don't know nothing about that, Ubla Lapung said, rubbing thoughtfully at the bristle on his chin. Only this pure blood has a stone sword, chipped like those old spear points people are selling in the Downs Market. It's almost as tall as he is, and he's taller than me. I saw him pick up a leathery guard and throw him away. Throw him away? Like a small sack of... of mushrooms or something. So his temper is even worse than yours, then? Pure blood, no, no fear. Right. So how is it you know about pure bloods? The Seragal. Our gods, the ones I helped to kill, they were fallen pure bloods, cast out. So the one who has just arrived, he is the equivalent of one of your gods, Ublalapung? Please don't tell me you're planning on trying to kill him. I mean, he has a stone sword and all. Kill him? No, you don't understand, Tehol Bedict. This one, this pure blood, he is worthy of true worship. Not the way we appeased the Seragol. That was to keep them away. Wait and see, wait and see what is going to happen. My kin will gather once the word spreads. They will gather. What if the Emperor kills him? Ublala Pung simply shook his head. They both looked over as Bug appeared in the doorway, in his arms the body of a naked woman. Now really, Tehol said, the pot's not nearly big enough. Besides, hungry as I am, there are limits, and eating academics far exceeds them. The manservant frowned. You recognize this woman? I do, from my former life, replete as it was with stern tutors and the occasional subjects of youthful crushes and the like. Alas, she looks much worse for wear. I had always heard that the world of scholars was cutthroat. What debate on nuances resulted in this, I wonder? Bug carried her over and set her down on his own sleeping pallet. As the manservant stepped back, Ublala Pung stepped close and struck Bug in the side of the head, hard enough to send the old man reeling against a wall. Wait! Tehol shouted to the giant. No more! Rubbing at his temple, Bug blinked up at Ublala Pung. What was that all about? he demanded. Tehol said. Never mind what I said, Ublala. It was but a passing thought, amusing, devoid of substance, a careless utterance disconnected in every way from physical action. Never intended. You said he needed boxing about the head, Tehor Bedict. You asked me because it had got bigger or something, so I needed to puncture it so it'd get smaller again. It didn't look any bigger to me, but that's what you said. He was above his situation, you said. Station, not situation. My point is, both of you, stop looking at me like that. My point was, I was but voicing a few minor complaints of a domestic nature here, not once suspecting that Ublala Pung would take me so literally. Master, he is Ublala Pung. I know, I know. Clearly all the once finely honed edges of my intellect have worn off of late. Then his expression brightened. But now I have a tutor! A victim of the patriotists, Bug said, eyeing Ublala askance as he made his way over to the pot on the hearth. Abyss below, master, this barely passes as muddy water. Aye, alas, in dire need of your culinary magic. The patriotists? You broke her out of prison? In a manner of speaking. I do not anticipate a citywide manhunt, however. She was to have been one of the ones who simply vanished. Ublala Pung grunted a laugh. They'd never find her if it was a manhunt. The other two men looked across at him. The half-blood Tarthanol gestured at the obvious. Look, she's got breasts and stuff. Bug's tone was soft as he said to Tehol, She needs gentle healing, master. 
and peace. Well, no better refuge from the dreads of the world than Tehol Bedict's abode. A manhunt! Ublala laughed again, then shook his head. Them patriotists are idiots! Chapter 8 When stone is water, time is ice. When all is frozen in place, fates rain down in fell torrent. My face revealed in this stone that is water. The ripples locked hard to its shape, a countenance passing strange. Ages will hide when stone is water. Cycles bound in these depths are flawed illusions breaking the stream. When stone is water, time is ice. When all is frozen in place, our lives are stones in the torrent. And we rain down, rain down like water on stone with every strike of the hand. Water and Stone, Elder Fent The realm of shadow was home to brutal places, yet not one could match the brutality of shadows upon the soul. Such thoughts haunted Cotillion these days. He stood on a rise, before him a gentle elongated slope reaching down to a lake's placid waters. A makeshift camp was visible on a level terrace forty paces to his left, a single longhouse flanked by half-buried outbuildings, including stable and coop. The entire arrangement, fortunately unoccupied at the time, excepting a dozen hens and a rooster, one irritated rook with a gimp leg and two milk cows, had been stolen from another realm captured by some vagary of happenstance, or, more likely, the consequence of the breaking of mysterious laws, as seemed to occur sporadically during Shadow Realm's endless migration. However it had arrived, Shadow Throne learned of it in time to dispatch a flurry of wraiths to lay claim to the buildings and livestock, saving them from predation by roving demons, or, indeed, one of the hounds. Following the disaster at the First Throne, a score of survivors had been delivered to this place, to wonder and wonder at the strange artifacts left by the previous inhabitants, the curved wooden prows surmounting the peaks of the longhouse with their intricate serpentine carvings, the mysterious totemic jewellery, mostly of silver although amber seemed common as well, the bolts of cloth, wool both coarse and fine, wooden bowls and cups of hammered bronze, Wandering through it all, dazed, a blankness in their eyes. Recovering, as if such a thing is possible. Off to his right, a lone cape-shrouded figure stood at the water's edge, motionless, seeming to stare out on the unmarred expanse of the lake. There was nothing normal to this lake, Cotillion knew, although the scene it presented from this section of the shore was deceptively serene. Barring the lack of birds— and the absence of mollusks, crustaceans, or even insects. Every scrap of food to feed the livestock and the miserable rook was brought in by the wraiths Shadow Throne had assigned to the task. For all of that, the rooster had died mere days after arriving. Died from grief, I expect, not a single dawn to crow awake. He could hear voices from somewhere just beyond the longhouse, Panak, Astar, and the other surviving children, well, hardly children any more. They'd seen battle, they'd seen their friends die, they knew the world, every world, was an unpleasant place where a human's life was not worth much. They knew, too, what it meant to be used. Further down the beach, well past the lone hooded figure, walked Trull Sengar and the Tlanimas, Onrak the Broken. Like an artist with his deathless muse, or perhaps at his shoulder a critic of ghastly mien. An odd friendship, that one. But then Tlani Mas were full of surprises. Sighing, Cotillion set off down the slope. The hooded head half turned at his approach, a face the hue of burnished leather, eyes dark beneath the felted wool rim of the hood. Have you come with the key, Cotillion? Quick Ben. It is good to see that you have recovered. More or less. What key? The flash of a humorless smile. The one that sets me free. Cotillion stood beside the wizard and studied the murky expanse of water. I would imagine that you could leave here at any time. You are a high mage, 
with more than one warren at your disposal. Force a gate, then walk through it. Do you take me for a fool? Quick Ben asked in a quiet voice. This damned realm is wandering. There's no telling where I would come out, although if I guess correctly, I would be in for a long swim. Ah, well, I'm afraid I pay little attention to such things these days. We are crossing an ocean, then? So I suspect. Then indeed, to journey anywhere you require our help. The wizard shot him a glance. As I thought. You have created pathways, gates with fixed exits. How did you manage that, Cotillion? Oh, not our doing, I assure you. We simply stumbled onto them, in a manner of speaking. The Azath. Very good. You always were sharp, Ben Delat. A grunt. I've not used that version of my name in a long time. Oh? When was the last time? Do you recall? These Azath, Quick Ben said, clearly ignoring the question. The House of Shadow itself, here in this realm, correct? Somehow it has usurped the gate, the original gate, Korald Emelan. The house exists both as a cast shadow and as its true physical manifestation. No distinction can be made between the two. A nexus, but that is not unusual for Azath constructs, is it? What is, however, is that the gate to Korald Emelan was vulnerable in the first place to such a usurpation. Necessity, I expect, said Cotillion, frowning at seeing a slow sweep of broad ripples approach the shore, their source somewhere further out. Not at all what it seems. What do you mean? The god shrugged. The realm was shattered, dying. The Azath participated in healing the fragments, intentional, by design, by intellect, or in the manner that blood dries to create a scab. Is the Azath nothing more than some kind of natural immune system, such as our bodies unleash to fight illness? The breadth of your scholarly knowledge is impressive, Quick Ben. Never mind that. The Warrens were Karul's supreme sacrifice, his own flesh, his own blood. But not the Elder Warrens, or so we are to believe. Whose veins were open to create those, Cotillion? I wish I knew. No, rather, I don't. I doubt it is relevant in any case. Does the Azath simply respond to damage, or is there a guiding intelligence behind its actions? I cannot answer you. I doubt anyone can. Does it even matter? I don't know, to be honest, but not knowing makes me nervous. I have a key for you, Petillion said after a moment. Charles Sengar and Onrak were now walking towards them. For the three of you, in fact, if you want it. There's a choice. Not for them, Cotillion said, nodding in the direction of Trull and the Talani Mas. And they could use your help. The same was true of Kalamekar, Quick Ben said, not to mention Adjunct Tavare. They survived, Cotillion replied. You cannot be sure, though, not with Kalam. You can't be entirely sure, can you? He was alive when the dead house took him. So Shadow Throne claims. He would not lie. The wizard barked a bitter laugh. Callum still lives, Quick Ben. The dead house has him beyond the reach of time itself. Yet he will heal. The poison will degrade, become inert. Shadow Throne saved the assassin's life. Why? Now that is a harder question to answer. Cotillion admitted, perhaps simply to defy Lassine, and you should not be surprised if that is his only reason. Believe me, for Shadow Throne it suffices. Be glad, Ben Edifon Delat, that I do not tell you his real reason. Charles Sengar and Onrak drew close, then halted. The Tist Edoer's new stone-tipped spear was strapped to his back. He was wearing a long cape against the chill, the wall dyed deep burgundy, one of the more useful treasures found in the longhouse. It was held in place by an exquisite silver brooch depicting some sort of stylized hammer. 
At his side, Onrak the Broken's skeletal frame was so battered, dented, and fractured, it was a wonder that the warrior was still in one piece. The Talani Mas spoke. This lake, God, the shore opposite. What of it? It does not exist. Cotillion nodded. Charles Sengar asked, How can that be? Onrak says it's not a gate on the other side. It's not anything at all. Cotillion ran a hand through his hair, then scratched his chin, realizing he needed to shave, and squinted out on the water. The other side is unresolved. What does that mean? Quick Ben demanded. To fully understand, you will have to go there, wizard. The three of you, that is the path of your journey. And you must leave soon. Forgive us for being unimpressed, the Tist Edor said dryly. The last nightmare you sent us into has made us rather reluctant adventurers. We need a better reason, Cotillion. I imagine you do. We're waiting, Quick Ben said, crossing his arms. Alas, I cannot help you. Any explanation I attempt will affect your perception of what you will find at your journey's end. And that must not be allowed to happen because the manner in which you perceive will shape and indeed define the reality that awaits you. He sighed again. I know that's not very helpful. Then summon Shadow Throne, Troll Sengar said. Maybe he can do better. Cotillion shrugged, then nodded. A dozen heartbeats later, a mostly formless shadow rose in their midst, from which emerged a knobby cane at the end of a skinny, gnarled arm. The god glanced about, then down, to find itself ankle-deep in water. Hissing, Shadow Throne picked up the tattered ends of his cloak, then pranced onto dry land. Oh, wasn't that amusing, he sang. Wretches, all of you, what do you want? I'm busy. Do you understand? Busy. Onrak pointed one skeletal arm out towards the lake. Catillion would send us across this water, on a mission he will not explain, to achieve goals he refuses to define, in a place he cannot describe. We therefore call upon you, Formless One, to deliver what he will not. Shadow Throne giggled. Catillion glanced away, suspecting what was coming. Delighted to, Bony One. I respond in this manner. It is as Catillion believes— the rooster died of grief. A curse from Quick Ben as Shadow Throne then swirled into nothingness. Cotillion turned away. Supplies await you outside the longhouse. When you return down here, a boat will have been readied. Make your goodbyes to Minala and the children as brief as possible. The way ahead is long and arduous, and we are running out of time. The undying gratitude healed hard to starboard, the gale bitter with the cold reek of ice. Pulling and half climbing his way across the aft deck as the crew struggled against the sudden onslaught, first mate Scorgan Caban reached the pilot station where Shur Kelal, held in place by a leather harness, stood with legs planted wide. She seemed impervious to the plunging temperature, with not even a hint of colour slapped to her cheeks by the buffeting wind. An uncanny woman indeed. Uncanny, insatiable, unearthly, she was like a sea goddess of old, a glamoured succubus luring them all to their doom. But no, that was not a good thought, not now, not ever, or at least for as long as he sailed with her. Captain, it's going to be close. The mountains of ice are closing on the cut, maybe faster than we are. Where in the errant's name did they come from? We'll make it, Shurkilal asserted. Come round into the lee of the island. It's the northwest shore that's going to get hammered. I'd be amazed if the citadel's walls on that side survive what's coming. Look at the reach, pretty. It's nothing but fangs of ice. Wherever all this has come from, it's devouring the entire coast. Damned cold is what it is, Scorgan said in a growl. Maybe we should turn round, Captain. That fleet never came after us anyway. We could head for Lether Mouth. And starve before we're halfway there. No, pretty. Second Maiden Fort's an independent state now. 
and I'm finding that rather appealing. Besides, I'm curious, aren't you? Not enough to risk getting crushed by them white jaws, Captain. We'll make it. The foment that was the crest of the heaving bergs was the color of old leather, shredded by the churning fragments of ice, tree roots, shattered trunks, and huge broken rocks that seemed to defy the pull to the deep, at least for long enough to appear atop the water, like the leading edge of a slide rolling on across the surface of the tumult before reluctantly vanishing into the depths. Tumbling out from this surge like rotted curtains was fog, plucked and torn by the ferocious winds, and Shurk Elal, facing astern, watched as the maelstrom heaved in their wake. It was gaining, but not fast enough. They were moments from rounding the isle's rocky headland, which looked to be formidable enough to shunt the ice aside down its length. At least she hoped so. If not, then Second Maiden's Harbour was doomed. And so is my ship and crew. As for herself, well, if she managed to avoid being crushed or frozen in place, she could probably work her way clear, maybe even clamber aboard for the long ride to the mainland's coast. It won't come to that. Islands don't get pushed around. Buried, possibly. But then Fent Reach is where it's all piling up. What's chasing us here is just an outer arm, and before long it'll be fighting the tide. Errant Fend, imagine what happened to the Edor homeland. That entire coast must have been chewed to pieces, or swallowed up entire. So what broke up the dam? That's what I want to know. Groaning, the undying gratitude rounded the point, the wind quickly dropping off as the ship settled and began its crawl into the high-walled harbour. A prison island indeed. All the evidence remained, the massive fortifications, the towers with lines of sight and fire arcs facing both to sea and inland. Huge ballistae, mangonels and scorpions mounted on every available space, and in the harbour itself rock-pile islands held miniature forts festooned with signal flags, fast ten-man pursuit galleys moored alongside. A dozen ships rode at anchor in the choppy waters. Along the docks, she saw, tiny figures were racing in every direction, like ants or a kicked nest. Pretty, have us drop anchor other side of that odd-looking dromon. Seems like nobody's going to pay us much attention. Hear that roar? That's the northwest shore getting hit. The whole damned island could go under, Captain. That's why we're staying aboard, to see what happens. If we have to run east, I want us ready to do so. Look! There's a harbour scow coming our way. Damn. Typical. World's falling in, but that don't stop the fee-takers. All right, prepare to receive them. The anchor had rattled down by the time the scow fought its way alongside. Two officious-looking women climbed aboard, one tall, the other short. The latter spoke first. Who's the captain here, and where do you hail from? I am Captain Shurk Elal. We've come up from Letharas. Twenty months at sea with a hold full of goods. The tall woman, thin, pale, with stringy blonde hair, smiled. Very accommodating of you, dear. Now, if you'll be so kind, brevity here will head down into the hold to inspect the cargo. The short, dark-haired woman, brevity, then said, And Pithy here will collect the anchoring fee. Fifteen docks a day. That's a little steep. Well... Pithy said with a lopsided shrug. It's looking like the harbour's days are numbered. We'd best get what we can. Brevity was frowning at Shurk's first mate. You wouldn't be Scorgan Caban the Pretty, would you? Aye, that's me. I happen to have your lost eye, Scorgan, in a jar. The man scowled across at Shurk Elal, then said, You and about fifty other people. What? But I paid good money for that. How many people lose an eye sneezing? By the errant, you're famous. Sneeze, is it? That's what you heard? And you believed it? Spirits of the deep, lass. And you paid the crook how much? Shirk said to Pithy. You and your friend here are welcome to inspect the cargo. But if we're not offloading, that's as far as it goes. And whether we offload or not depends on the kinds of prices your buyers are prepared to offer. I'll prove it to you, Brevity said, advancing on Scorgan Kaman. It's a match, all right. 
I can tell from here. Can't be a match, the first mate replied. The eye I lost was a different colour from this one. You had different coloured eyes? That's right. That's a curse among sailors. Maybe that's why it ain't there no more. Scorgan nodded towards the nearby Dromon. Where's that hailing from? I never seen lines like those before. Looks like it's seen a scrap or two asides. Brevity shrugged. Foreigners, we get a few. No more of that, Pissy cut in. Check the cargo, dearie. Time's a-wasting. Shurkelal turned and examined the foreign ship with more intensity after that peculiar exchange. The Dromon looked damned weather-beaten, she decided, but her first mate's lone eye had been sharp. The ship had been in a battle, one involving sorcery. Black charred streaks latticed the hull like a painted web. A whole lot of sorcery. That ship should be kindling. Listen, Pithy said, facing inland. They beat it back like they said they would. The cataclysm in the making seemed to be dying a rapid death, there on the other side of the island where clouds of ice crystals billowed skyward. Shurkelal twisted round to look out to the sea to the south, past the promontory. Ice, looking like a massive frozen lake, was piling up in the wake of the violent vanguard that had come so close to wrecking the undying gratitude. But its energy was fast dissipating. A gust of warm wind backed across the deck. Scorgan Caban grunted. And how many sacrifices did they fling off the cliff to earn this appeasement? He laughed. Then again, you probably got no shortage of prisoners. There are no prisoners on this island, Pithy said, assuming a lofty expression as she crossed her arms. In any case, you ignorant oaf, blood sacrifices wouldn't have helped. It's just ice, after all. The vast sheets up north went and broke to pieces. Why, just a week passed, and we were sweating on common here, and that's not something we ever get on Second Maiden. I should know. I was born here. Born to prisoners? You didn't hear me, Scorgan Caban? No prisoners on this island! Not since you ousted your jailers, you mean? Enough of that, Shurkilal said, seeing the woman's umbrage ratchet up a few more notches on the old hoist pole, and it was plenty high enough already. Second maiden is now independent, and for that I have boundless admiration. Tell me, how many Edo's ships assailed your island in the invasion? Pithy snorted. They took one look at the fortifications, and one sniff at the mages we'd let loose on the walls, and went right round us. The captain's brows rose a fraction. I had heard there was a fight. There was, when our glorious liberation was declared, following the terrible accidents befalling the warden and her cronies. Accidents! Ha! That's a good one! Shurkelal glared across at her first mate, but like most men, he was impervious to such non-verbal warnings. I will take that fifteen docks now, Pithy said, her tone cold, plus the five docks disembarking fee, assuming you intend to come ashore to take on supplies or sell your cargo, or both. You ain't never mentioned five. Pretty, Shurkilal interrupted, head below and check on brevity. She may have questions regarding our goods. Aye, Captain. With a final glower at Pithy, he stumped off for the hatch. Pithy squinted at Shurkelal for a moment, then scanned the various sailors in sight. You're pirates. Don't be absurd. We're independent traders. You have no prisoners on your island. I have no pirates on my ship. What are you suggesting by that statement? Clearly, if I had been suggesting anything, it was lost on you. I take it you are not the harbour master, just a toll taker. She turned as first Scorgan, then Brevity emerged onto the deck. The short woman's eyes were bright. Pithy, they got stuff. Now there's a succinct report, Shurkilal said. Brevity, be sure to inform the harbour master that we wish a berth at one of the stone piers to better effect unloading our cargo. A messenger out to potential buyers might also prove rewarding. She glanced at Pithy, then away, as she added, as for mooring and landing fees, I will settle up with the harbour master directly once I have negotiated the master's commission. You'll think you're smart, Pithy snapped. I should have brought a squad with me. 
How would you have liked that, Captain? Poking in here and there, giving things a real look. How would you like that? Brevity, who rules second maiden? Shurkilal asked. Sheikh Brulig, Captain. He's Grand Master of the Putative Assembly. The Putative Assembly? Are you sure you have the right word there, lass? Putative? That's what I said. That's right, isn't it, Pithy? The Captain thinks she's smart, but she's not so smart, is she? Wait until she meets Sheikh Brulig. Then won't she be surprised. Not really, Shulk said. I happen to know Sheikh Brulig. I even know the crime for which he was sent away. The only surprise is that he's still alive. Nobody kills Sheikh Brulig easily, Pithy said. One of the crew burst into a laugh that he quickly converted into a cough. We'll await the harbour master's response, Shirk Elal said. Pithy and Brevity returned to their scow, the former taking the oars. Strange women, Scorgan Caban muttered as they watched the wallowing craft pull away. An island full of inbred prisoners, Shirk replied in a murmur. Are you at all surprised, pretty? And if that's not enough, a full-blooded sheik, who just happens to be completely mad, is ruling the roost. I tell you this, our stay should be interesting. I hate interesting. And probably profitable. Oh, good. I like profitable. I can swallow interesting so long as it's profitable. Get the hands ready to ship the anchor. I doubt we'll have to wait over long for the harbour master's signal flag. Aye, Captain. Udinas sat watching her clean and oil her sword. An Edoer sword, set into her hands by a Tist Edoer warrior. All she needed now was a house so she could bury the damned thing. Oh yes, and the future husband's fateful return. Now maybe nothing was meant by it, just a helpful gesture by one of Fear's brothers, the only Sengar brother Udinas actually respected. Maybe, but maybe not. The interminable chanting droned through the stone walls, a sound even grimmer than the blunt grunting of Edur women at morning. The onyx wizards were in consultation. If such an assertion held any truth, then the priestly version of their language was incomprehensible and devoid of the rhythm normally found in both song and speech. And if it was nothing but chanting, then the old fools could not even agree on the tempo. And he had thought the Tist Edur strange. They were nothing compared to these Tist Andy, who had carried dour regard to unhuman extremes. It was no wonder, though. The Andara was a crumbling black stone edifice at the base of a refuse-cluttered gorge, as isolated as a prison. The cliff walls were honeycombed with caves, pocked with irregular chambers, like giant burst bubbles along the course of winding tunnels. There were bottomless pits, dead ends, passages so steep they could not be traversed without rope ladders. Hollowed-out towers rose like inverted spires through solid bedrock, while over subterranean chasms arched narrow bridges of white pumice, carved into amorphous shapes and set without mortar. In one place there was a lake of hardened lava, smoother than wind-polished ice, the obsidian streaked with red, and this was the Amas chamber where the entire population could gather, barefooted, to witness the endless wrangling of the Reeve Masters, otherwise known as the Onyx Wizards. Master of the rock, of the air, of the root, of the dark water, of the night. Five wizards in all, squabbling over orders of procession, hierarchies of propitiation, proper hem-length of the Onyx robes, and errant knew what else. With these half-mad neurotics, any burr in the cloth became a mass of wrinkles and creases. From what Udinas had come to understand, no more than fourteen of the half-thousand or so denizens, beyond the wizards themselves, were pure tist and e. And of those, only three had ever seen daylight, which they quaintly called the blinded stars. Only three had ever climbed to the world above. No wonder they'd all lost their minds. Why is it, Udinas said, when some people laugh, it sounds more like crying. Seren Pedak glanced up from the sword bridging her knees, the oil-stained cloth in her long-fingered hands. I don't hear anyone laughing or crying. I didn't necessarily mean out loud, he replied. A snort from fear, Sengar, 
where he sat on a stone bench near the portal way. Boredom is stealing the last fragments of sanity in your mind, slave. I, for one, will not miss them. The wizards in Silchas are probably arguing the manner of your execution, fierce Engar, Udinas said. You are their most hated enemy, after all. Child of the betrayer, spawn of lies and all that. It suits your grand quest, for the moment at least, doesn't it? Into the viper's den. Every hero needs to do that, right? And moments before your doom arrives, out hisses your enchanted sword and evil minions die by the score. Ever wondered what the aftermath of such slaughter must be? Dread depopulation, shattered families, wailing babes. And should that crucial threshold be crossed, then inevitable extinction is assured, hovering before them like a grisly spectre. Oh yes, I heard my share when I was a child, of epic tales and poems and all the rest. But I always started worrying about those evil minions, the victims of those bright heroes and their intractable righteousness. I mean, someone invades your hideout, your cherished home, and of course you try to kill and eat them. Who wouldn't? There they were, nominally ugly and shifty-looking, busy with their own little lives, plating nooses or some such thing. Then shock! The alarms are raised. The intruders have somehow slipped their chains, and death is a whirlwind in every corridor. Seren Pedak sheathed the sword. I think I would like to hear your version of such stories, Udinas. How you would like them to turn out. At the very least, it will pass the time. I'd rather not singe Kettle's innocent ears. She's asleep, something she does a lot of these days. Perhaps she's ill. Perhaps she knows how to wait things out, the Aquato responded. Go on, Udinas. How does the heroic epic of yours, your revised version, turn out? Well, first, the hidden lair of the evil ones. There's a crisis brewing. Their priorities got all mixed up. Some past evil ruler with no management skills or something. So they've got dungeons and ingenious but ultimately ineffective torture devices. They have steaming chambers with huge cauldrons awaiting human flesh to sweeten the pot. But alas, nobody's been by of late. After all, the lair is reputedly cursed, a place whence no adventurer ever returns. All dubious propaganda, of course. In fact, the lair's a good market for the local woodcutters and the pitch sloppers. Huge hearths and torches and murky oil lamps. That's the problem with underground lairs. They're dark. Worse than that, everyone's been sharing a cold for the past eight hundred years. Anyway, even an evil lair needs the necessities of reasonable existence. Vegetables, bushels of berries, spices and medicines, cloth and pottery, hides and well-gnawed leather, evil-looking hats. Of course, I've not even mentioned all the weapons and intimidating uniforms. You have stumbled from your narrative trail, Udinas, Seren Pedak observed. So I have. And that, too, is an essential point. Life is like that. We stumble astray, just like those evil minions. A crisis, no new prisoners, no fresh meat. Children are starving. It's an unmitigated disaster. What's the solution? Why, they invent a story. A magical item in their possession, something to lure fools into the lair. It's reasonable, if you consider it. Every hook needs a wriggling worm. And then they choose one among them to play the role of the insane master, the one seeking to unlock the dire powers of that magical item and so bring about a utopia of animated corpses stumbling through a realm of ash and rejected tailings. Now if this doesn't bring heroes in by the drove, nothing will. Do they succeed? For a time. But recall those ill-conceived torture implements. Invariably... Some enterprising and lucky fool gets free, then crushes the skull of a dozing guard or three, and mayhem is let loose. Endless slaughter. Hundreds, then thousands of untrained evil warriors who forgot to sharpen their swords, and never mind the birch bark shields that woodcutter with the hump sold them. Even fierce Sengar grunted a laugh at that. 
All right, Udinas, you win. I think I prefer your version after all. Udinas, surprised into silence, stared across at Seren Pedak, who smiled and said, You have revealed your true talent, Udinas. So the hero wins free. Then what? The hero does nothing of the sort. Instead, the hero catches a chill down in those dank tunnels. Makes it out alive, however, and retreats to a nearby city, where the plague he carries spreads and kills everyone. And for thousands of years thereafter, that hero's name is a curse to both people living above ground and those below. After a moment, Fear spoke. Ah, even your version has an implicit warning, slave. And this is what you would have me heed. But that leads me to wonder... What do you care for my fate? You call me your enemy, your lifelong foe, for all the injustices my people have delivered upon you. Do you truly wish me to take note of your message? As you like, Edu, Udinas replied, but my faith runs deeper than you imagine, and on an entirely different course from what you clearly think. I said the hero wins clear, at least momentarily but I mentioned nothing of his hapless followers, his brave companions, all of whom died in the lair. Not at all. In the aftermath, there was dire need for new blood. They were one and all adopted by the evil ones, who were only evil in a relative sense, being sickly and miserable and hungry and not too bright. In any case, there was a great renaissance in the Lair's culture, producing the finest art and treasures the world had ever seen. And what happened then? Seren asked. It lasted until a new hero arrived, but that's another tale for another time. I have talked myself hoarse. Among the women of the Tist Edur, Fiersengar said then, is told the tale that Father Shadow, Scabandari Blood Eye, chose of his own free will to die, freeing his soul to journey down the grey road, a journey in search of absolution, for such was the guilt of what he had done on the plains of the Ketra. Now that is a convenient version. Now it is you who lack subtlety, Udinas. This alternative interpretation is itself allegorical, for what it truly represents is our guilt for Scabandari's crime. We cannot take back the deeds of Father Shadow, nor were we in any position ever to gainsay him. He led, the Edua followed. Could we have defied him? Possibly, but not likely. As such, we are left with a guilt that cannot be appeased, except in an allegorical sense. And so we hold to legends of redemption. Seren Pedak rose and walked over to set her scabbarded sword down beside the food pack. Yet this was a tale held in private by the women of your tribe's fear. Setting aside for the moment the curious fact that you know of it, how is it the promise of redemption belongs only to the women? The warriors follow another path, fear replied. That I know of the story and the truth of Scabandari is due to my mother who rejected the tradition of secrecy. Uroth does not flee knowledge, and she would her sons do not either. Then how do you explain Rulad? Udinas asked. Do not bait him, Seren Pedek said to the slave. Rulad is accursed, by the sword in his hand, by the god who made that sword. Rulad was young, Fear said, unconsciously wringing his hands as he stared at the chamber's worn floor. There was so much still to teach him. He sought to become a great warrior, a heroic warrior. He was discomforted in the shadows of his three older brothers, and this made him precipitate. I think the god chose him over Hanan Mossag, said Udinas. Rulad had no choice. Fear studied Udinas for a long moment, then he nodded. If that is your belief, then you are far more generous towards Rulad than any Tist Edur. Again and again, Udinas, you leave me unbalanced. Udinas closed his eyes as he leaned back against the rough wall. He spoke to me, Fear, because I listened. Something the rest of you never bothered doing. Which isn't that surprising, since your vaunted family order had just been shattered. Your precious hierarchy was in disarray. 
Shocking. Terrible. So, while he could not speak to you, you in turn were unwilling to hear him. He was silent, and you were deaf to that silence. A typical mess. I don't regret having no family. You lay all the blame at the foot of the chaotic god. Utinas opened his eyes, blinked for a moment, then smiled. Too convenient by far. Now if I was seeking redemption, I'd leap on the back of that one and ride the beast all the way to the cliff's edge, then ride over. Amen. Then what? What to blame? Well, how should I know? I'm just a worn-out slave. But if I had to guess, I'd look first at that rigid hierarchy I mentioned earlier. It traps everyone, and everyone makes sure it traps everyone else, until none of you can move, not side to side, not up either. You can move down, of course, just do something no one else likes. Disapproval kicks out every rung of the ladder, and down you go. So it is the way of living among the Tist Edur. Fear snorted, looked away. All right, Udinas said, sighing. Let me ask you this. Why wasn't that sword offered to some lethery? A brilliant officer of an army, a cold-blooded merchant prince. Why not Esgara himself, or better still, his son, Quillas? Now there was ambition and stupidity in perfect balance. And if not a lethery, then why not a Nerek shaman? or a Fent, or a Tarthanal. Of course, all those others, well, those tribes were mostly obliterated, at least all the taboos, traditions, and rules of every sort that kept people in line, all gone, thanks to the lethery. Very well, Seren Pedek said. Why not a lethery? Udina shrugged. The wrong fatal flaws, obviously. The chained one recognized the absolute perfection of the Tist Edur, their politics, their history, their culture, and their political situation. Now I understand, Fear murmured, his arms crossed. Understand what? Why Rulad so valued you, Udinas? You were wasted scraping fish scales all day, when by the measure of your intelligence and your vision, you could sit tall on any kingdom's throne. The slave's grin was hard with malice. Damn you, fear Sengar. How did that offend you? You just stated the central argument, both for and against the institution of slavery. I was wasted, was I? Or of necessity kept under firm heel? Too many people like me on the loose and no ruler, tyrant or otherwise, could sit assured on a throne. We would stir things up again and again. We would challenge, we would protest, we would defy. By being enlightened, we would cause utter mayhem. So, fear, kick another basket of fish over here. It's better for everyone. Except you. No, even me. This way, all my brilliance remains ineffectual, harmless to anyone and therefore especially to myself lest my lofty ideas loose a torrent of blood. Seren Pedak grunted. You are frightened by your own ideas, Udinas? All the time, Aquito. Aren't you? She said nothing. Listen, Fear said. The chanting has stopped. As usual, the debate ended with everyone losing. The clash of intractable views produced no harmony, just exhaustion and an ache in the back of the skull. Clip, seated with his legs propped up on the back of the next lower bench, in the gloom of the uppermost tier overlooking the absurdly named Disc of Concordance on which stood five lowering onyx wizards, struggled to awaken his mind as the wizards turned as one to face Silchas' ruin. Ordent Brid, Reeve of the Rock, who had sent Clip to retrieve these fell wanderers, was the first to speak. Selchas Ruin, brother of blood to our black-winged lord, we know what you seek. Then you also know not to get in my way. At these cold words, Clip sat straighter. It is as I warned! 
cried Rin Varalath, reeve of the night, in his high-pitched grating voice. He arrives like a leviathan of destruction. Which of the brothers was gifted the greater share of deliberation and wisdom? Well, the answer is clear. Calm down, said Penneth Vinandas. Clip smiled to himself, wondering yet again if the reeve aspects created the personalities of their masters, or, in the case of Penneth, mistress, or was it the other way round? Of course the mistress of the root would advise calm, a settling of wild wills, for she was so assuredly rooted. I am calm, snarled Rin Varalath. He jabbed a finger at Siltras Rowan. We must not yield to this one, else all that we have achieved will be brought down upon our very heads. The balance is all that keeps us alive, and each of you knows that. And if you do not, then you are more lost than I ever imagined. Draxos Hulch, reeve of the dark water, spoke in his depthless baritone. The issue, my fellow wizards, is less open to debate than you would hope. Unless, of course, we can explain to this warrior the nature of our struggle and the uneasy balance we have but recently won. Why should he be interested? Rin Varalath asked. If this all collapses, it is nothing to him. He will move on, uncaring. Our deaths will be meaningless as far as he is concerned. Siltras Ruin sighed. I am not insensitive to the battle you have waged here, wizards. But your success is due entirely to the inevitable disintegration of the Jaghut's ritual. He scanned the faces before him. You are no match for Omtos Felak, when its wielder was none other than Gothos. In any case, the balance you believe you have achieved is illusory. The ritual fails. Ice, which had been held in check, held timeless, has begun to move once more. It falters in the warmth of this age, yet its volume is so vast that even melted it will affect vast change. As for the glaciers bound in the highest reaches of the mountains of Blue Rose, those to the north, well, they have already begun their migration. Unmindful of the distant ocean's assault, they draw power from a wayward flow of cold air. These glaciers, wizards, still hold the spear of the ritual, and soon it will drive for your heart. The Andara is doomed. We care nothing for the Andara, said Gestalin Aros, reeve of the air. The balance you speak of is not the one that matters to us. Silchas ruin, the Jaghut's ritual was of ice only in the manner that fire is of wood. It was the means of achieving a specific goal, and that goal was the freezing in place of time, of life, and of death. Clip's gaze narrowed on Silchas ruin, as the albino Andy slowly cocked his head, then said, you speak of a different failing, yet the two are linked. We are aware of that, cut in Ordent Brid. Then, with a faint smile, perhaps more so than you. You speak of a spear of ice, of Omtos Felak's very core, still living, still powerful. That spear, Silchas Ruin, casts a shadow, and it is within that shadow that you will find what you seek, although not, I think, in the way you desire. Explain. We will not, snapped Rin Varalath. If you wish to understand, then look to your kin. My kin? Are you then able to summon an Amanda? Not him, replied Ordent Brid. He hesitated, then continued. We were visited not so long ago by an ascendant, Menendor, Sister Dawn. If anything, Ruin's voice grew even colder as he demanded, What has she to do with this? Balance, you ignorant fool! Rin Varalas's shriek echoed in the chamber. Where is she now? Silchas Ruin asked. Alas, replied Draxos Hulch, 
We do not know, but she is close for reasons that are entirely her own. She will, I fear, oppose you, should you decide to force your way past us. I seek the soul of Scabandari Blood-Eye. I do not understand that you would object to such a goal. We see the truth of that, said Ordent Brid. A long moment of silence. The five onyx wizards faced a nonplussed Silchas Ruin, who seemed at a loss for words. It is, said Penneth Vinandas, a question of compassion. We are not fools, said Ordent Brid. We cannot oppose you. Perhaps, however, we can guide you. The journey to the place you seek is arduous. The path is not straight. Siltas Rowan, it is with some astonishment that I tell you that we have reached something of a consensus on this. You have no idea how rare such a thing is. Granted, I speak of a compromise, one which sits uneasier with some of us than with others. Nonetheless, we have agreed to offer you a guide. A guide? To lead me on this crooked path or tug me ever astray from it? Such deceit would not work for very long. True. Nor would I be merciful upon its discovery. Of course. Siltras Ruin crossed his arms. You will provide us with a guide. Very well. Which of you has volunteered? Why, none of us, said Ordent Brid. The need for us here prevents such a thing. As you said, a spear of ice is directed at us, and while we cannot shatter it, perhaps we can redirect it. Silchas Ruin, your guide shall be the mortal sword of the black-winged lord. At that, the wizard gestured. Clip rose to his feet, then began his descent to the disk of concordance. The chain and its rings appeared in his hand, whirring, then snapping, then whirring out again. He is an Amanda's mortal sword? Silchas Ruin asked in obvious disbelief as he stared up at this meeting's audience of one. Clip smiled. Do you think he would be displeased? After a moment, the brother of Rake grimaced, then shook his head. Probably not. Come the morrow, Ordent Brid said. We will begin preparing the way for the continuation of your journey. Reaching the edge of the lowest tier, Clip dropped lightly onto the polished stone of the disc, then approached Silchas Ruin, the chain in his hand spinning and clacking. Must you always do that? Silchas Ruin demanded. Do what? Siltras Ruin walked into the chamber, followed a moment later by the Tist Andy, Clip. Seren Pedak felt a sudden chill, although she could not determine its source. Clip was smiling, but it was a cynical smile, and it seemed his eyes held steady on fear Sengar, as if awaiting some kind of challenge. Aquitor, said Siltras Ruin, releasing the clasp of his cloak as he walked over to the stone table against a far wall, where waited wine and food. At least one mystery has been answered. Oh? The preponderance of wraiths here in the Endara, the countless ghosts of dead Tist Andi. I know why they are here. I am sorry, I did not know this place was crowded with wraiths. I've not even seen Wither lately. He glanced across at her, then poured himself a goblet of wine. It is extraordinary, he murmured, how something as basic as the absence of a taste on the tongue can prove the most excruciating torture when one is buried for thousands of years. She watched him take a mouthful of the watery wine, watched him savor it, then he said, Time, Aquitor. The Omptos Felak ritual, which froze all in place, defied Hood himself. Apologies, Hood is the Lord of Death. The ghosts, they had nowhere to go. Easily captured and enslaved by the Tist Edur, but many others managed to evade that fate, and they are here among their mortal kin. 
The Onyx wizards speak of compassion and balance, you see. No, I do not, but I think that is of no matter. Will the wizards help us? A wry grimace from Silchas Ruin, then he shrugged. Our fell party now has a new member, Aquitor, who is charged with guiding us to what we seek. Fear Sengar, suddenly tense, stepped close to Clip. Tist Andy, he said. Know this, please. I possess no enmity towards you or your people. If indeed you will lead us to where the soul of Scabandari is bound, I will be in your debt. Indeed, all of the Edur will be in your debt. Clip grinned. Oh, you don't want that, warrior. Fear seemed taken aback. You, said Silchas Ruin to the Tist Edur, pose the gravest threat to these Andy. Your kind has good reason to hunt down every last one of them. Nor are the lethery well disposed to them, given their resistance to the annexation, a resistance that continues to this day. Blue Rose does not appreciate being occupied, nor do the humans who lived in peace alongside those possessing Andy blood in their veins hold any loyalty to the lethery conquerors. When the Onyx Order ruled, it was a distant sort of rule, reluctant to interfere in daily activities and making few demands on the populace. And now, fierce Engar, your kind rule the lethery, compounding the resentment seething in Blue Rose. I cannot speak for the Empire, Fear said, only for myself. Yet I believe that, should events transpire in the manner I desire, then true liberation may be the reward granted by the Edoer for their assistance. To the entire province of Blue Rose and all its inhabitants. Certainly, I would argue for that. Clip's laugh was sardonic. The chains spun to wrap tight around his right hand, yet that served as his only comment to these grave pronouncements and bold promises. Seren Pedak felt sick inside. Clip, this maddening pup with his chain and rings, his ever-mocking expression. Oh, fear, Sengar, do not trust this one. Do not trust him at all. Are you certain you want to do this, Overseer? Brol Handar glanced across at the Atri Preda. This expedition is to be punitive, Vivat. No formal proclamation of war has been made. The missive from Letharas is very clear on this. Apparently it falls under my duties as overseer to ensure that the engagement does not exceed its parameters. You march to hunt down and destroy those who slaughtered the settlers. Her eyes remained on the columns of Lethary and Edoer troops marching along the road. Dust hung in the air, staining the sky's bright blue. The sound from the army reminded Brol Handar of broken ice groaning and crunching its way down a river. Bivat spoke. That is precisely my intention, overseer. That and nothing more, as I have been commanded. He studied her for a moment longer, then shifted on the saddle to ease the strain on his lower back. He preferred admiring horses from afar to perching atop the damned things. It seemed they understood his distaste and reciprocated in kind, and this one was in the habit of tossing its head as it drew up from every canter, clearly seeking to crack Brol's chin. The Atri Preda told him he leaned too far forward, and the horse knew it and saw the error as an opportunity to inflict damage. The Tist Edoer was not looking forward to this journey. Nonetheless, he finally said, I will accompany you. He knew she was unhappy with the prospect, yet he had his own bodyguards from his own tribe, his own carriage and driver and team of oxen, more than enough supplies to ensure they were not a burden on the military train. I remain concerned for your safety, she said. No need. I have every confidence in my arape. Forgive me, overseer, but hunting seals is not the same as a tree breeder. Brol Handar interrupted in turn. My warriors faced crack lethery soldiers in the conquest, and it was your lethery who broke. Seals? Indeed, some of them weighing as much as an ox with tusks longer than a short sword, and white-furred bears and cave-dwelling bears, 
short-legged wolves and pack wolves, and, one should not forget, jack shapeshifters. Did you imagine the white wastes of the north are empty lands? Against what an Arape must face every day, the lethery were no great threat. As for protecting me from the all, presumably such a need would only arise following the rout of your forces. We shall have a Karisnan of the Denratha as well as your mage cadre. In short, he concluded, your concerns ring false. Tell me, Atriprida, what was the substance of your secret meeting with Factor Letur Anict? The question, voiced as an afterthought, seemed to strike her like a blow, and the eyes she fixed on him were wide, alarmed, until something darker swirled to life. Financial discussions, overseer, she said in a cold tone. An army needs to eat. The financing of this punitive expedition is provided by the Imperial Treasury. Said funds managed by the factor. After all, that is the function of being a factor, sir. Not in this instance, Brolhandar replied. Disbursement is being managed by my office. In fact, it is Edor Coin that is sponsoring this expedition. At Ripreda, you should in the future be certain of the facts before you contrive to lie. Now, it would seem that you are to proceed under the burden of two sets of orders. I do hope, for the sake of your peace of mind, that the two do not prove conflicting. I should imagine not, she said tightly. Are you confident of that, Atripreda? I am, sir. Good. Overseer, a number of the settlers killed originated from within the Factor's own household. Brol's brows lifted. The desire for a most bloody vengeance must be overwhelming, then, for poor Leto Anict. At that meeting, sir, I simply reiterated my intent to exact the necessary punishment against the murderers. The Factor sought reassurance, which I was pleased to give him under the circumstances. In other words, Letur Anict was somewhat alarmed that his control over the management of the expedition had been taken away, for such a decision was unprecedented. One must assume he is intelligent enough to recognize, once he has calmed down somewhat, that the move indicates disapproval of his recent excesses. I would not know, sir. I shall be interested to gauge his humility upon our triumphant return, Atripreda. She said nothing. Of course, he added to himself, there would probably be much more to Leto Anik's response at that time, given that there was, in fact, nothing truly official in any of this. The factor's cronies in the palace, the lethery servants of, it was likely, the Chancellor, would be outraged upon discovering this circumvention. But this time it was the Edur who had organized this minor usurpation, a working of the tribes, the linkage established via the Karisnan and the Edo staffs of various overseers. There was vast risk in all this. The emperor himself knew nothing of it, after all. Leto Anict needed to be reined in. No, more than that, the man needed hobbling. Permanently. If Brol had his way, there would be a new factor of Dreen within a year. And as for Leto Anict's holdings, well... The crime for high treason and corruption at the scale he had managed would without doubt result in their confiscation, with all familial rights stripped away, and restitution at such high level that the Anict line would be indebted for generations to come. He is corrupt, and he has spun a deadly web here, from Dreen out into every bordering nation. He seeks war with all of our neighbors, unnecessary war, pointless beyond the covetous greed of one man. Such corruption needed excision, for there were plenty of Leto Annects in this empire, thriving under the protection of the Liberty Consign, and quite possibly the Patriotists. This man here would be the example and the warning. You Lethery think us fools. You laugh behind our backs. Mock us in our ignorance of your sophisticated deceptions. Well, there is more than one kind of sophistication, as you shall discover. Finally, Brol Handar no longer felt helpless. Atripreda Bivat fumed in silence. The damned fool at her side was going to get himself killed, and she would be made responsible for that failure to protect him.
Karisnan and Arape bodyguards would achieve nothing. The factor's agents infected every lethary legion on this march, and among those agents, errant damned assassins, masters of the poison. She liked this warrior at her side, dour as he was, which seemed a trait of the Tist Edur in any case, and though clearly intelligent, he was also naive. It was clear that Letur Anict had penetrated the pathetic, unofficial efforts of Brol Handar and a half-dozen other overseers, and the factor intended to eliminate this nascent threat here and now, on this very expedition. We have a problem with Brol Handar, the factor had said, his pale round face looking like dusty stone in the habitual gloom of his inner sanctum. Sir? Unsanctioned, he seeks to exceed his responsibilities, and in so doing undermine the traditional functions of a factor in a border province. His ambitions have drawn others into his web, which could, alas, have fatal repercussions. Fatal? How? Atri Preda, I must tell you, no longer are the patriotists focusing exclusively on the lethary in the empire. There has come to light evidence of an emerging conspiracy among the Tist Edur, against the state, possibly against the emperor himself. Absurd. Do you truly take me for such a fool, Anict? Against the state and against the emperor are two different things. The state is you and people like you. The state is the liberty consign and the patriotists. The state is the chancellor and his cronies. Against them, the notion of a conspiracy among the Tist Edur to rid the empire of lethary corruption seemed more than plausible. They had been occupiers long enough to come to understand the empire they had won, to begin to realize that a far more subtle conquest had taken place, of which they were the losers. The Tist Edur were, above all else, a proud people, not likely to abide defeat, and the fact that the victors were, by their measure, cowards in the true sense of the term, would sting all the more. So she was not surprised that Brol Handar and his fellow Edur had at last begun a campaign of eradication against the lethary running the state. Not surprising, either, the extent to which the Edur have underestimated their enemy. Sir, I am an officer in the Imperial Army. My commander is the Emperor himself. The Emperor rules us all, Atri Preda, Letur Anict had said with a faint smile. The conspiracy among his kind directly threatens his loyal support structure, those who endeavor at great personal sacrifice to maintain that apparatus. People such as yourself, indeed. What are you asking of me, sir? Brawl Handar will insist on accompanying your punitive expedition, I believe it is his intent to claim territories reconquered for himself. A wave of one hand. No doubt in the name of the Empire or some such meaningless nonsense. You mean as you have done? I will try to talk him out of it, she said. It's not safe. Indeed, it isn't. Precisely my point. After a moment, Leto Anict leaned back. You will, alas, not win your argument. The overseer will march with you, accepting the risks. The risks, yes, imagining they come from the all. I will do all I can to preserve his life, Vivat said. A spread of hands. Of course, that is your duty, and we both know how treacherous the all can be, especially as they are now commanded by none other than Red Mask. Who can say what dread ambushes he has contrived to spring upon you, with the principal aim of murdering commanders and other important personages? Indeed, Atri Preda, you have your duty, and I would expect no less from you. But I do remind you, Brol Handar is engaged in treason. Then have Orbin Truthfinder arrest him. If he dares, for that will bring it all out into the open, and you're not ready for that. We will, the factor then said, be prepared for his return. So soon? Has the emperor been informed of these developments, sir? He has. The patriotists would not be engaged in this hunt were it not so. I am sure you understand that, Atri Preda. She believed she did. Even Karos and Victad would not proceed without some sort of sanction. Is that all, sir? It is. 
Errant smile on your hunt, a trip reader. Thank you, sir. And now everything had proceeded to match the factor's predictions. Brol Handar would accompany the expedition, refuting her every argument against the idea. Reading his expression, she saw a renewed confidence and will. The overseer felt as if he had found, at last, firm footing. No error in his recognition of his true enemy. The unmitigated disaster lay in the Edo's belief that he had made the first move. She said now to the overseer, Sir, if you will excuse me, I must have words with my officers. Of course, Brolhandar replied. When do you anticipate contacting the enemy? Oh, you fool, you already have. That depends, sir, on whether they're fleeing or coming straight for us. The overseer's brows lifted. Do you fear this red mask? Fear that yields respect is not a bad thing, sir. In that fashion, yes, I fear red mask, as he will me before too long. She rode away then, down to her troops, seeking out, not an officer, but one man in particular, a horseman among the blue rose, taller and duskier than most. After a time, she found him, gestured him to ride out to her side, and they walked their horses along one edge of the road. She spoke of two things, one loud enough to be heard by others, and concerning the health of the mounts and other such mundane details, the other in much quieter tones, which no one but the man could hear. What can you see of the horizon's bruised smear that cannot be blotted out by a raised hand? Red Mask glanced over at the foreigner. Anister Tock smiled. Lying in a ditch amidst the wastes of humanity is something I would recommend to any nascent poet. The rhythms of ebb and flow, the legacy of what we discard. Wealth like liquid gold. Not entirely sane any more, Red Mask judged, unsurprised. Skin and bones, scabbed and stained with fiery peeling rashes. At least he could now stand without the aid of a stick, and his appetite had returned. Before long, Red Mask believed, the foreigner would recover, at least physically. The poor man's mind was another matter. Your people... Anister Tok continued after a moment. Do not believe in poetry, in the power of simple words. Oh, you sing with the coming of dawn and the fleeing sun. You sing to storm clouds and wolf tracks and shed antlers you find in the grass. You sing to decide the order of beads on a thread, but no words to any of them, just tonal variations, as senseless as birdsong. Birds sing! cut in Natakas, who stood on the foreigner's other side, squinting westward to the dying sun, to tell others they exist. They sing to warn of hunters. They sing to woo mates. They sing in the days before they die. Very well, the wrong example. You sing like whales. Like what? asked Natakas and two other copper faces behind them. Oh, never mind then. My point was, you sing without words. Music is its own language. Natakas, said Anister Tok, answer me this, if you will. The song the children use when they slip beads onto a thread, what does it mean? There is more than one, depending on the pattern desired. The song sets the order of the type of bead and its color. Why do such things have to be set? Because the beads tell a story. What story? Different stories, depending on the pattern, which is assured by the song. The story is not lost, not corrupted, because the song never changes. For God's sake, the foreigner muttered, what's wrong with words? With words, said Red Mask, turning away. Meanings change. Well... Anister Tok said, following as Red Mask made his way back to his army's camp. That is precisely the point. That's their value, their ability to adapt. Grow corrupt, you mean. The lethery are masters at corrupting words, their meanings. They call war peace. They call tyranny liberty. On which side of the shadow you stand decides a word's meaning.
Words are the weapons used by those who see others with contempt, a contempt which only deepens when they see how those others are deceived and made into fools because they chose to believe. Because in their naivety, they thought the meaning of a word was fixed, immune to abuse. Tog's tates, Red Mask, that's a long speech coming from you. I hold words in contempt, Anister Tok. What do you mean when you say Tog's teats? Tog's a god, not a goddess. No, then its teats are useless, precisely. What of the others? Hood's breath. Hood is the lord of death. Thus, no breath. Correct. Beru's mercy. She has no mercy. Maori fend. The lady of the poor fends off nothing. Red Mask regarded the foreigner. Your people have a strange relationship with your gods. I suppose we do. Some decry it as cynical, and they may have a point. It's all to do with power, Red Mask, and what it does to those who possess it. Gods not accepted. If they are so unhelpful, why do you worship them? Imagine how much more unhelpful they'd be if we didn't. At whatever Anister Tok saw in Red Mask's eyes, he then laughed. Annoyed, Red Mask said, You fought as an army devoted to the Lord and Lady of the Wolves. And see where it got us. The reason your force was slaughtered is because my people betrayed you. Such betrayal did not come from your wolf gods. True, I suppose. We accepted the contract. We assumed we shared the meaning of the words we had exchanged with our employers. At that he offered Red Mask a wry smile. We marched to war believing in honor. So, Tog and Fandere are not responsible, especially for the stupidity of their followers. Are you now godless, Anister Tok? Oh, I heard their sorrowful howls every now and then, or at least I imagined I did. Wolves came to the place of slaughter and took the hearts of the fallen. What? What do you mean? They broke open the chests of your comrades and ate their hearts, leaving everything else. Well, I didn't know that. Why did you not die with them? Red Mask asked. Did you flee? I was the best rider among the Grey Swords. Accordingly, I was acting to maintain contact between our forces. I was, unfortunately, with the all when the decision was made to flee. They dragged me down from my horse and beat me senseless. I don't know why they didn't kill me there and then, or just leave me for the lethery. There are levels to betrayal, Anister Tok, limits to what even the all can stomach. They could run from the battle, but they could not draw a blade across your throat. Well, that's a comforting relief. Apologies. I have always been prone to facetious commentary. I suppose I should be thankful, but I'm not. Of course you're not, Red Mask said. They were approaching the broad hide awning protecting the Rodara skin maps the war leader had drawn, mostly from what he could recall of leathery military maps he had seen. These new maps had been stretched out on the ground, pegged down, arrayed like pieces of a puzzle to create a single rendition of a vast area, one that included the South Border Kingdoms. But you are a soldier, Anister Tok, and I have need of soldiers. So, you seek an agreement between us? I do. A binding of words? Yes. And what if I choose to leave, to walk away? You will be permitted and given a horse and supplies. You may ride east or southeast or indeed north, although there is nothing to be found to the north, but not west, not southwest. Not to the lesser empire, in other words. Correct. I do not know what vengeance you hold close to your wounded soul. I do not know if you would betray the all to answer their betrayal of you for which I would not blame you in the least. I have no desire to have to kill you, and this is why I forbid you to ride to Lether. I say, 
Red Mask studied the map in the crepuscular light. The black lines seemed to be fading into oblivion before him. It is my thought, however, to appeal to your desire for vengeance against the Lethary, rather than the All. Yes, you believe you can defeat them. I shall, Anister Tok. By preparing fields of battle well in advance. Well, as a tactic, I would not gainsay it. Assuming the Lethary are foolish enough to position themselves precisely where you want them. They are arrogant, Red Mask said. Besides, they have no choice. They wish to avenge the slaughter of settlements and the theft of herds they call their property, even though they stole them from us. They wish to punish us, and so will be eager to cross blades. Using cavalry, infantry, archers, and mages. Yes. How do you intend to negate those mages, Red Mask? I will not tell you yet. In case I leave, circle round and somehow elude you and your hunters. The chance of that is remote. At the foreigner's smile, Red Mask continued. I understand you are a skilled rider, but I would not send all after you. I would send my Kachain Chimal. Anister Tok had turned, and he seemed to be studying the encampment, the rows upon rows of tents, the wreathed dung smoke of the fires. You have fielded, what, ten, twelve thousand warriors? Closer to fifteen. Yet you have broken up the clans. I have in the manner needed to field something resembling a professional army. You must shift that loyalty from the old blood ties. I've seen you badgering your troop commanders, ensuring that they will follow your commands in battle. I've seen them in turn badgering their squad leaders, and the squad leaders their squads. You are a soldier, Anister Tok, and I hated every moment of it, Red Mask. That matters not. Tell me of your grey swords, the tactics they employed. That won't be much help. I could, however, tell you of the army I originally belonged to before the grey swords. He glanced over with his one glittering eye, and Red Mask saw amusement there, a kind of mad hilarity that left him uneasy. I could tell you of the Malazans. I have not heard of that tribe. Anister Tok laughed again. Not a tribe, an empire. An empire three, four times the size of Lether. You will stay, then? Anister Tok shrugged. For now. There was nothing simple to this man, Red Mask realized. Mad indeed, but it could prove a useful madness. Then how, he asked, do the Malazans win their wars? The foreigner's twisted smile gleamed in the dusk like the flash of a knife. This could take a while, Red Mask. I will send for food. And oil lamps. I can't make out a damned thing on your map. Do you approve of my intent, Anister Tok? To create a professional army? Yes, it's essential. But it will change everything. Your people, your culture, everything. He paused, then added in a dry, mocking tone, You'll need a new song. Then you must create it, Red Mask replied. Choose one from among the Malazans, something appropriate. Aye, the man muttered, a dirge. The white knife flashed again, and Red Mask would rather it had remained sheathed. Chapter 9 Everywhere I looked I saw the signs of war upon the landscape. There the trees had crested the rise, dispatching skirmishers down the slope to challenge the upstart low growth in the riverbed, which had been dry as bone until the breaking of the ice dams high in the mountains, where the savage sun had struck in unexpected ambush, a siege that breached the ancient barricades and unleashed torrents of water upon the lowlands. And here, on this tuck and fold of bedrock, the old scars of glaciers were vanishing beneath advancing mosses, creeping and devouring colonies of lichen which were themselves locked in feuds with kin. Ants flung bridges across cracks in the stone, the air above swirling with winged termites, 
dying in silence in the serrated jaws of Rinazan that swung and ducked as they evaded yet fiercer predators of the sky. All these wars proclaim the truth of life, of existence itself. Now we must ask ourselves, are we to excuse all we do by citing such ancient and ubiquitous laws? Or can we proclaim our freedom of will by defying our natural urge to violence, domination, and slaughter? Such were my thoughts, puerile and cynical, as I stood triumphant over the last man I had slain, his lifeblood a dwindling stream down the length of my sword blade, whilst in my soul there surged such pleasure as to leave me trembling. King Kilanbas in the Valley of Slate, Third Letharas Tide the Wars of Conquest. The ruins of a low wall encircled the glade, the battered, rough-cut basalt dividing swaths of green grasses. Just beyond rose a thin copse of young birch and aspen, spring leaves bright and fluttering. Behind this stand the forest thickened, darkened, grey-skinned bowls of pine crowding out all else. Whatever the wall had enclosed had vanished beneath the soft loam of the glade, although depressions were visible here and there to mark out cellar pits and the like. The sunlit air seemed to spin and swirl, so thick were the clouds of flying insects, and there was a taint of something in the warm, sultry air that left Sukul and Kadu with a vague sense of unease, as if ghosts watched from the black knots on the trees surrounding them. She had quested outward more than once, finding nothing but minute life sparks, the natural denizens of any forest, and the low murmurings of earth spirits, too weak to do much more than stir restlessly in their eternal dying sleep. Nothing to concern them, then, which was well. Standing close to one of the Shinhai walls, she glanced back at the makeshift shelter, repressing yet another surge of irritation and impatience. Freeing her sister should have yielded nothing but gratitude from the bitch. Sheltatha Law had not exactly fared well in that barrow, beaten senseless by Silchas Ruin and a damned Loki Wival, left near drowned in a bottomless bog in some memory pocket realm of the Azath, where every moment stretched like centuries, so much so that Sheltatha had emerged indelibly stained by those dark waters, her hair a burnt red, her skin the hue of a beetle nut, as waxy and seamed as that of a Talani mass. Wounds gaped bloodless, taloned fingernails gleamed like elongated beetle carapaces. Sukul had found her eyes drawn to them again and again, as if waiting for them to split, revealing wings of exfoliated skin as they dragged the fingers loose to whirl skyward. And her sister was fevered, day after day raving with madness. Dialogue, negotiation, had been hopeless thus far. It had been all Sukul had managed, just getting her from that infernal city out here to a place of relative quietude. She now eyed the lean-to, which from this angle hid the recumbent form of Sheltatha Law, grimly amused by the sight. Hardly palatial, as far as residences were concerned, and especially given their royal blood, if the fiery draconian torrent in their veins could justify the appellation, and why wouldn't it? Worthy ascendants were few and far between in this realm, after all, barring a handful of dour elder gods, and these nameless spirits of stone and tree, spring and stream. No doubt Menandor has fashioned for herself a more stately abode, ripe for appropriation. Some mountain fastness, spurred and impregnable, so high as to be forever wreathed in clouds. I want to walk those airy halls and call them my own, our own, unless I have no choice but to lock Sheltatha in some crypt, where she can rave and shriek, disturbing no one. I should tear your throat out. The croak, coming from beneath the bowed shelter, triggered a sigh from Sukul. She approached until she came round to the front and could look within. Her sister had sat up, although her head was bowed, that long crimson hair obscuring her face. Her long nails at the end of her dangling hands glistened as if leaking oil. Your fever has broken? That is well. Shaltatha Law did not look up. Is it? I called for you, 
when ruin was clawing loose, when he turned upon me, that self-serving, heartless bastard turned on me. I called on you. I heard, sister. Alas, too far away to do much about it, that fight of yours. But I came at last, didn't I? Came and freed you. Silence for a long moment, then her voice dark and brutal. Where is she, then? Menendor? It was her, wasn't it? Lor looked up suddenly, revealing amber eyes, the white stained like rust, a ghastly gaze, yet wide and searching. Striking me from behind. I suspected nothing. I thought you were there. I thought you were there, weren't you? As much a victim as you, Shaltatha. Merendor had prepared long for that betrayal, a score of rituals, to drive you down, to leave me helpless to intervene. She struck first, you mean? The statement was a half-snarl. Were we not planning the same, Sukul? That detail is without much relevance now, isn't it? And yet, dear sister, she didn't bury you, did she? Not through any prowess on my part, nor did I bargain for my freedom. No, it seemed Menendor was not interested in destroying me. Sukul could feel her own sneer of hatred twisting her features. She never thought I was worth much. Sukul and Kadu, Dapple, the Fickle. Well, she is about to learn otherwise, isn't she? We must find an Azath. Sheltatha Law said, baring brown teeth. She must be made to suffer what I suffered. I agree, sister. Alas, there are no surviving Azath in this place. On this continent, I mean. Sheltatha Law, will you trust me? I have something in mind, a means of trapping Menendor, of exacting our long-awaited revenge. Will you join me? As true allies, together there are none here powerful enough to stop us. You fool! There is Silchas ruin! I have an answer for him as well, sister. But I need your help. We must work together, and in so doing we will achieve the demise of both Menendor and Silchas ruin. Do you trust me? Sheltatha Law's laugh was harsh. Cast that word away, sister. It is meaningless. I demand vengeance. You have something to prove to us all. Very well. We shall work together and see what comes of it. Tell me your grand plan, then. Tell me how we shall crush Silchas Ruin, who is without equal in this realm. You must conquer your fear of him, Sukul said glancing away, studying the glade, noting how the shafts of sunlight had lengthened, and the ruined walls surrounding them now hunched like crumbling darkness. He is not indomitable. Scabandari proved that well enough. Are you truly so stupid as to believe that? Sheltatha demanded, clambering free of the lean-to, straightening like some anthropomorphic tree. Her skin gleamed, polished, and the color of stained wood. I shared the bastard's barrow for a thousand eternities. I tasted his dreams. I sipped at the stream of his secret most thoughts. He grew careless. Sukul scowled at her kin. What are you saying? The terrible eyes fixed mockingly on her. He stood on the field of battle. He stood, his back to Scabandari, whom he called Blood-Eye, and was that not hint enough? Stood, I tell you, and but waited for the knives. I do not believe you. That must be a lie. It must be. Why? Wounded, weaponless, sensing the fast approach of this realm's powers, powers that would not hesitate in destroying him and Blood Eye both. Destroying in the absolute sense. Silchas was in no condition to defend against them. No, he well knew, was Scabandari, for all that idiot's pompous preening over the countless dead. 
So join in Scapandari's fate or escape? Millennia within a barrow of an Azaz. You call that an escape, Shaltafa? More than any of us. More even than Enomandaris, she said, her eyes suddenly veiled. Silchas ruin thinks draconian, as cold, as calculating, as timeless. Abyss below, Sokol and Kadu, you have no idea. A shudder took Sheltatha then, and she turned away. Be sure of your scheme, sister, she added in a guttural tone. And no matter how sure you make yourself, leave us a means of escape, for when we fail. Another faint groan from the earth spirits on all sides, and Sukul and Kadu shivered, assailed by uncertainty and fear. You must tell me more of him, she said. All you learned, oh, I shall. Freedom has left you arrogant, sister. We must strip that from you. We must free your gaze of that veil of confidence and refashion your plans accordingly. A long pause, then Shaltatha Law faced Sukul once again, an odd glint in her eyes. Tell me, did you choose in deliberation? What? A gesture. This place, for my recovery. Sukul shrugged. Shunned by the local people, private, I thought, shunned I, with reason. And that would be? Sheltatha studied her for a long moment, then she simply turned away. Matters not. I am ready to leave here now. As am I, I think. Agreed. North. Another sharp glance, then a nod. Oh, I see your contempt, sister. I know you felt as Menendor did. I know you think little of me. And you thought I would step forward once she struck? Why? I spoke of trust, yes, but you did not understand. I do indeed trust you, Sheltatha. I trust you to lust for vengeance. And that is all I need. For ten thousand lifetimes of slight and disregard, it will be all I need. His tattooed arms bared in the humid heat, Taxilian walked to the low table where sat Samar Dev, ignoring the curious regard from other patrons in the courtyard restaurant. Without a word, he sat, reached for the jug of watered, chilled wine, and poured himself a goblet, then leaned closer. By the seven holies, witch, this damned city is a wonder and a nightmare. Samar Dev shrugged. The word is out. A score of champions now await the Emperor's pleasure. You are bound to attract attention. He shook his head. You misunderstand. I was once an architect, yes? It is one thing, he waved carelessly, to stand agape at the extraordinary causeways and spans, the bridges, and that dubious conceit that is the eternal domicile, even the canals with their locks, inflows, and outflows. The aqueduct courses and the huge blockhouses with their massive pumps and the like. He paused for another mouthful of wine. No, I speak of something else entirely. Did you know an ancient temple of sorts collapsed the day we arrived? A temple devoted, it seems, to rats. Rats? Rats! Not that I could glean any hint of a cult centered on such foul creatures. Garsa would find the notion amusing, Samardev said with a half-smile, and acquire in such cultists yet another enemy, given his predilection for wringing the necks of rodents. Taxilian said in a low voice, Not just rodents, I gather. Alas, but on that matter I would allow the Toblakai some steerage room. He warned them that no one was to touch his sword, a dozen or more times, in fact. That guard should have known better. Dear witch, Taxilian sighed, you've been careless, or worse, lazy. It's to do with the emperor, you see. The weapon destined to cross blades with Rulad's own. The touch signifies a blessing, 
Did you not know? The loyal citizens of this empire want the champions to succeed. They want their damned tyrant obliterated. They pray for it. They dream of it. All right, Samardev hissed. Keep your voice down. Taxilian spread his hands, then he grimaced. Yes, of course. After all, every shadow hides a patriotist. Careful of whom you mock? That's a capricious, bloodthirsty bunch, Taxilian, and you being a foreigner only adds to your vulnerability. You'll need to eavesdrop on more conversations, which The Emperor is unkillable. Karsa Olong will join all the others in that cemetery of urns. Do not expect otherwise. And when that happens, why, all his hangers-on, his companions, all who came with him will suffer the same fate. Such is the decree. Why would the patriotists bother with us, given our inevitable demise? He drained the last wine from his goblet, then refilled it. In any case, you distracted me. I was speaking of that collapsed temple, and what I saw of its underpinnings, the very proof of my growing suspicions. I didn't know we're destined for execution. Well, that changes things, although I am not sure how. She fell silent, then considering Taxilian's other words, she said, Go on. Taxilian slowly leaned back, cradling the goblet in his hands. Consider Erlitan, a city built on the bones of countless others. In that, little different from the majority of settlements across all seven cities. But this Letharas, it is nothing like that, Samardev. No. Here, the older city never collapsed, never disintegrated into rubble. It still stands, following street patterns not quite obscured. Here and there, the ancient buildings remain like crooked teeth. I have never seen the like, which It seems no regard whatsoever was accorded those old streets. At least two canals cut right through them. You can see the bulge of stonework on the canal walls, like the sword ends of long bones. Peculiar indeed. Alas, a subject only an architect or a mason would find a source of excitement, Taxilian. You still don't understand. That ancient pattern, that mostly hidden gridwork and the remaining structures adhering to it, which none of it is accidental. What do you mean? I should probably not tell you this, but among masons and architects there are secrets of a mystical nature. Certain truths regarding numbers and geometry reveal hidden energies, lattices of power. Samardev, there are such courses of energy, like twisted wires in mortar, woven through this city. The collapse of Scale House revealed it to my eyes, a gaping wound, dripping ancient blood. Nearly dead blood, I'll grant you, but undeniable. Are you certain of this? I am, and furthermore, someone knows, enough to ensure that the essential constructs, the buildings that form a network of fulcra, the fixing points to the lattice of energy, they all remain standing. Barring this scale house, a nod, not necessarily a bad thing, indeed not necessarily accidental, that collapse. Now you have lost me. That temple fell down on purpose? I would not discount that. In fact, that accords precisely with my suspicions. We approach a momentous event, Samardev. For now, that is as far as I can take it. Something is going to happen. I only pray we are alive to witness it. You've done little to enliven my day, she said, eyeing her half-finished breakfast of bread, cheeses, and unfamiliar fruit. At the very least, you can order us another carafe of wine for your sins. I think you should run, Taxilian said under his breath, not meeting her eyes. I would, barring the event I believe is coming. But as you say, my interest is perhaps mostly professional. You, on the other hand, would do better to look to your own life, to maintaining it, that is. She frowned. 
It's not that I hold to an unreasoning faith in the martial prowess of Karsa Orlong. There have been enough hints that the Emperor has fought other great champions, other warriors of formidable skill, and none could defeat him. Nonetheless, I admit to a feeling of, well, loyalty. Enough to join him at Hood's Gate? I am not sure. In any case, don't you imagine that we're being watched? Don't you think that others have tried to flee their fate? No doubt. But some are dev to not even try. I will think on it, Taxilian. Now I've changed my mind. That second carafe of wine will have to wait. Let us walk this fair city. I am of a mind to see this ruined temple for myself. We can gawk like the foreigners we are, and the patriotists will think nothing of it. She rose from her seat. Taxilian followed suit. I trust you've already paid the proprietor. No need, imperial largesse. Generosity towards the condemned. That runs contrary to my sense of this fell empire. Things are always more complex than they first seem. Tracked by the eyes of a dozen patrons, the two left the restaurant. The sun devoured the last shadows in the sand-floored compound, heat rising in streaming waves along the length of the rectangular, high-walled enclosure. The sands had been raked and smoothed by servants, and that surface would remain unmarred until late afternoon, when the challengers in waiting would troop out to spar with each other and gather, those who shared a language, to chew and gnaw on these odd, macabre circumstances. Yet, leaning against a wall just within the inner entranceway, Taralak Veed watched Ikaria move slowly alongside the compound's outer wall, one hand out to brush with fingertips the bleached, dusty stone and its faded frieze. On that frieze, faded images of imperial heroes and glory-soaked kings, chipped and scarred now by the weapons of unmindful foreigners sparring with each other, each and every one of those foreigners intent upon the murder of the emperor now commanding the throne. Thus a lone set of footprints now, tracking along that wall, a shadow diminished to almost nothing beneath the tall, olive-skinned warrior, who paused to look skyward as a flock of unfamiliar birds skittered across the blue gap, then continued on until he reached the far end, where a huge barred gate blocked the way into the street beyond. The figures of guards were just visible beyond the thick, rust-pitted bars. Icarium halted, facing that gate stood motionless, the sunlight bleaching him as if the jag had just stepped out from the frieze on his left, as faded and worn as any hero of antiquity. But no, not a hero, not in anyone's eyes, not ever. A weapon and nothing more. Yet he lives, he breathes, and when something breathes, it is more than a weapon. Hot blood in the veins, a grace of motion, a cavort of thoughts and feelings in that skull, awareness like flames in the eyes. The nameless ones had knelt on the threshold of stone for too long, worshipping a house, its heaved grounds, its echoing rooms. Why not the living, breathing ones who might dwell within that house? Why not the immortal builders? A temple was hallowed ground not to its own existence, but to the god it would honour but the nameless ones did not see it that way. Worship taken to its absurd extreme, yet perhaps in truth as primitive as leaving an offering in a fold of rock, of blood paint on that worn surface. Oh, I am not the one for this, for thoughts that chill the marrow of my soul. A growl cut and scarred by the betrayals, the ones that wait in every man's shadow, for we are both house and dweller, stone and earth, blood and flesh. And so we will haunt the old rooms, walk the familiar corridors, until turning a corner we find ourselves facing a stranger who can be none other than our most evil reflection. And then the knives are drawn and a life's battle is waged, year after year, deed after deed, Courage and vile treachery, cowardice and bright malice. The stranger has driven me back, step by step, until I no longer know myself, 
What sane man would dare recognize his own infamy? Who would draw pleasure from the sensation of evil, satisfaction from its all too bitter rewards? No. Instead, we run with our own lies. Do I not utter my vows of vengeance each dawn? Do I not whisper my curses against all those who wronged me? And now I dare judge the nameless ones who would wield one evil against another. And what of my place in this dread scheme? He stared across at Icarium, who still faced the gate, who stood like a statue, blurred behind ripples of heat. My stranger, yet which one of us is the evil one? His predecessor, Mappo, the Trell, had long ago left such struggles behind, Taralak suspected, choosing to betray the nameless ones rather than this warrior before the gate. An evil choice? The Graal was no longer so sure of his answer. Hissing under his breath, he pushed himself from the wall and walked the length of the compound, through waves of heat, to stand at the jag's side. If you leave your weapons, Taralak said, you are free to wander the city. Free to change my mind? Ikarium asked with a faint smile. That would achieve little, except perhaps our immediate execution. There might be mercy in that. You do not believe your own words, Ikarium. Instead, you speak to mock me. That may be true, Taralak Veed. As for this city, he shook his head, I am not yet ready. The Emperor could decide at any moment. He will not. There is time. The growl scowled up at the jag. How are you certain? Because, Taralak Veed, Ikarium said, quiet and measured as he turned to walk back, he is afraid. Staring after him, the growl was silent. Of you? What does he know? Seven holies, who would know of this land's history? its legends. Are they forewarned of Icarium and all that waits within him? Icarium vanished in the shadow beneath the building entranceway. After a dozen rapid heartbeats, Taralak followed, not to reclaim the jag's door companionship, but to find one who might give him the answers to the host of questions now assailing him. Varat Torn, once second in command to Atriprida Jan Tobis, huddled in a corner of the unfurnished room. His only reaction to Jan Tovis's arrival was a flinch. Curling yet tighter in that corner, he did not lift his head to look upon her. This man had, alone, led Taralak Veed and Icarium back through the Warrens, a tunnel torn open by unknown magic, through every realm the expedition had traversed on their outward journey. The Atriprida herself had seen the blistering wound that had been the exit gate, she had heard its shrieking howl, a voice that seemed to reach into her chest and grip her heart. She had stared in disbelieving wonder at the three figures emerging from it, one dragged between two. No other survivors, not one, neither Edor nor Lethary. Varat Torn's mind had already snapped. Incapable of coherent explanations, he had babbled, shrieking at anyone who drew too close to his person yet unable or unwilling to tear his wide eyes from the unconscious form of Icarium. Taralak Veed's rasping words then. All dead. Everyone. The first throne is destroyed. Every defender slaughtered. Icarium alone was left standing. And even he was grievously wounded. He is... he is worthy of your emperor. But so the Graal had been saying since the beginning. The truth was, no one knew for certain. What had happened in the subterranean sepulchre where stood the first throne? The terrible claims did not end there. The throne of shadow had also been destroyed. Jan Tobis remembered the dismay and horror upon the features of the Tist Edur when they comprehended Taralak Veed's badly accented words. Another expedition was necessary. That much had been obvious, to see the truth of such claims. The gate had closed shortly after spitting out the survivors, the healing almost as violent and fraught as the first wounding, with a cacophony of screams. Your scouts have found no other signs of all in this area, I understand. 
So now the factor will consolidate the lethary claim in the usual fashion? The Atri Preda nodded. Outposts, forts, raised roads, settlers will follow. And then the factor will extend his covetous intentions yet further east. As you say, overseer, of course I am sure you recognize the acquisition's gift to the Tist Edur as well. The Empire's territory expands. I am certain the Emperor will be pleased. This was Brol Handar's second week as governor of Dreen. There were few Tist Edur in this remote corner of Rulad's empire, less than a hundred, and only his three staff members were from Brol's own tribe, the Arape. The annexation of Aldan by what amounted to wholesale genocide had begun years ago, long before the Edur conquest, and the particulars of rule in Far Letharas seemed to have little relevance to this military campaign. Brol Handar, the patriarch of a clan devoted to hunting tusked seals, wondered, not for the first time, what he was doing here. Titular command as overseer seemed to involve little more than observation. The true power of rule was with Letor Anict, the factor of Dreen, who is highly ranked in the Liberty Consign. Some kind of guild of merchants he had learned, although he had no idea what precisely was liberating about this mysterious organization. Unless, of course, it was the freedom to do as they pleased, including the use of imperial troops to aid in the acquisition of ever more wealth. Atri Prida. Yes, overseer? These all, do they fight back? No, not as they did today. I mean, do they mount raids? Do they mass their warriors on the path to all-out war? She looked uncomfortable. Overseer, there are two, well, levels to this. Levels? What does that mean? Official and unofficial. It is a matter of perception. Explain. The belief of the common folk, as promulgated through imperial agents, is that the all have allied themselves with the Akrin to the south, as well as the Durasilhani and the two kingdoms of Balkando and Safinand. In short, all the territories bordering the Empire, creating a belligerent, warmongering, and potentially overwhelming force. The horde of the Balkando conspiracy, that threatens the entire eastern territories of the Lether Empire. It is only a matter of time before that horde is fully assembled, whereupon it will march. Accordingly, every attack launched by the Lethery military serves to diminish the numbers the All can contribute. And furthermore, the loss of valuable livestock in turn weakens the savages. Famine may well manage what swords alone cannot, the entire collapse of the all. I see. And the unofficial version? She glanced across at him. There is no conspiracy, overseer, no alliance. The truth is, the all continue to fight among themselves. Their grazing land is shrinking, after all and they despise the Akrin and the Drasilhani, and have probably never met anyone from Balkando or Safinand. She hesitated, then said, We did clash with a mercenary company of some sort, two months past. The disastrous battle that spurred your appointment, I suspect. They numbered perhaps seven hundred, and after a half-dozen skirmishes I led a force of six thousand lethary in pursuit. Overseer, we lost almost three thousand soldiers in that final battle. If not for our mages, she shook her head, and we still have no idea who they were. Brol studied the woman. He had known nothing about any such clash. The reason for his appointment? Perhaps. The official version you spoke of earlier, the lie, justifies the slaughter of the all in the eyes of the commonary all of which well serves the factor's desire to make himself yet richer. I see. Tell me, Atri Preda, why does Letor Anict need all that gold? What does he do with it? The woman shrugged. Gold is power. Power over whom? Anyone and everyone. Excepting the Tist Edur, who are indifferent to the lethary idea of wealth. She smiled. Are you overseer? Still? What do you mean? There are Hiroth in Dreen. Yes, you have met them. Each claims kinship with the Emperor, and upon that claim they have commandeered the finest estates and land. They have hundreds of indebted as slaves. 
Soon, perhaps, there will be Tist Edward among the membership of the Liberty Consign. Brol Handar frowned. On a distant ridge stood three all dogs, two drays and one smaller cattle dog, watching as the herds were driven through the destroyed encampment, the livestock bawling in the stench of spilled blood and wastes. He studied the three silhouettes on the ridge. Where would they go now, he wondered. I have seen enough. He tugged his horse round, too tight on the reins, and the beast's head snapped up and it snorted, backing as it turned. Brol struggled to keep his balance. If the Atripreda was amused, she was wise enough not to show it. In the sky overhead, the first carrion birds had appeared. The South Jasp River, one of the four tributaries of Letha River leading down from the Blue Rose Mountains, was flanked on its south bank by a raised road that, a short distance ahead, began its long climb to the mountain pass, beyond which lay the ancient kingdom of Blue Rose, now subject to the Lethary Empire. The South Jasp ran fast here, the momentum of its savage descent from the mountains not yet slowed by the vast plain it now found itself crossing. The icy water pounded over huge boulders left behind by long-extinct glaciers, flinging bitter cold mist into the air that drifted in clouds over the road. The lone figure awaiting the six Tist Edur warriors and their entourage was, if anything, taller than any Edur, yet thin, wrapped in a black sealskin cloak, hood raised. Two baldricks crisscrossed its chest, from which hung two leathery longswords, and the few wisps of long white hair that had pulled free in the wind were now wet, adhering to the collar of the cloak. To the approaching Merud Edur, the face within that cowl looked pallid as death, as if a corpse had just dragged itself free of the numbing river, something long frozen in the white-veined reaches of the mountains that awaited them. A lead warrior, a veteran of the conquest of Letharus, gestured for his comrades to halt, then set out to speak to the stranger. In addition to the other five Edur, there were ten Lethary soldiers, two burdened wagons and forty slaves shackled one to the next in a line behind the second wagon. Do you wish company? the Merud asked, squinting to see more of that shadowed face. For the climb to the pass? It's said there remain bandits and renegades in the heights beyond. I am my own company. The voice was rough, the accent archaic. The Merud halted three paces away. He could see more of that face now. Edur features, more or less, yet white as snow. The eyes were unnerving, red as blood. Then why do you block our path? You captured two leathery two days back. They are mine. The Merud shrugged. Then you should have kept them chained at night, friend. These indebted will run at any opportunity. Fortunate for you that we captured them. Oh, yes, of course I will return them into your care. At least the girl. The man is an escaped slave from the Hiros, or so his tattoos reveal. A drowning awaits him, alas. But I will consider offering you a replacement. In any case, the girl, young as she is, is valuable. I trust you can manage the cost of retrieving her. I will take them both, and pay you nothing. Frowning, the Merud said, You were careless in losing them. We were diligent in recapturing them. Accordingly, we expect compensation for our efforts, just as you should expect a certain cost for your carelessness. Unchain them, the stranger said. No. What tribe are you? The eyes, still fixed unwavering upon his own, looked profoundly dead. What has happened to your skin? As dead as the emperor's. What is your name? Unchain them now. The Merud shook his head. Then he laughed, a little weakly, and waved his comrades forward as he began drawing his cutlass. Disbelief at the absurdity of the challenge slowed his effort. The weapon was halfway out of its scabbard when one of the stranger's longswords flashed clear of its sheath and opened the Edo's throat. 
Shouting in rage, the other five warriors drew their blades and rushed forward, while the ten leathery soldiers quickly followed suit. The stranger watched the leader crumple to the ground, blood spurting wild into the river mist descending onto the road. Then he unsheathed his other longsword and stepped to meet the five Edur. A clash of iron, and all at once the two leathery weapons in the stranger's hands were singing, a rising timber with every blow they absorbed. Two Edurs stumbled back at the same time, both mortally wounded, one in the chest, the other with a third of his skull sliced away. This latter one turned away as the fighting continued, reaching down to collect the fragment of scalp and bone, then walked drunkenly back along the road. Another Edur fell, his left leg cut out from beneath him. The remaining two quickly backed away, yelling at the lethery who were now hesitating three paces behind the fight. The stranger pressed forward. He parried a thrust from the Edur on the right with the long sword in his left hand sliding the blade under, then over, drawing it leftward before a twist of his wrist tore the weapon from the attacker's hand. Then a straight-arm thrust of his own buried his point in the Edor's throat. At the same time he reached over with the long sword in his right hand, fainting high. The last Edor leaned back to avoid that probe, attempting a slash aimed at clipping the stranger's wrist. But the long sword then deftly dipped, batting the cutlass away, even as the point drove up into the warrior's right eye socket, breaking the delicate orbital bones on its way into the forebrain. Advancing between the two falling Edur, the stranger cut down the nearest two lethery, at which point the remaining eight broken ran, past the wagons, where the drivers were themselves scrambling in panicked abandonment, and then alongside the row of staring prisoners, running, flinging weapons away down the road. As one lethery in particular moved opposite one of the slaves, a leg kicked out, tripping the man, and it seemed the chain line writhed then, as the ambushing slave leapt atop the hapless lethery, loose chain wrapping round the neck before the slave pulled it taut. Legs kicked, arms thrashed, and hands clawed, but the slave would not relent, and eventually the guard's struggles ceased. Silchas Ruin, the swords keening in his hands, walked up to where Udinas continued strangling the corpse. You can stop now, the albino Tist Andy said. I can, Udinas said through clenched teeth, but I won't. This bastard was the worst of them, the worst. His soul even now drowns in the mist, Silchas Ruin said turning as two figures emerged from the brush lining the ditch on the south side of the road. Keep choking him, said Kettle, from where she was chained farther down the line. He hurt me, that one. I know, Udinas said in a grating voice. I know. Siltras Ruin approached Kettle. Hurt you? How? The usual way, she replied, with the thing between his legs. And the other lethery. The girl shook her head. They just watched, laughing, always laughing. Siltra's ruin turned as Seren Pedak arrived. Seren was chilled by the look in the Tist Andy's uncanny eyes as Siltra's ruin said, I will pursue the ones who flee Equator and rejoin you all before day's end. She looked away, her gaze catching a momentary glimpse of fear Sengar, standing over the corpses of the Merud Tist Edur, then quickly on to the rock-littered plain to the south, where still wandered the Tist Edur who'd lost a third of his skull. But that sight as well proved too poignant. Very well, she said, now squinting at the wagons and the horses standing in their yokes. We will continue on this road. Udinas had finally expended his rage on the lethery body beneath him, and he rose to face her. Seren Pedak, what of the rest of these slaves? We must free them all. She frowned. Exhaustion was making thinking difficult. Months and months of hiding, fleeing, eluding both Edur and lethery, of finding their efforts to head eastward blocked again and again, forcing them ever northward, 
and the endless terror that lived within her had driven all acuity from her thoughts. Free them, yes, but then... Just more rumors, Udina said, as if reading her mind, as if finding her thoughts before she did. There's plenty of those, confusing our hunters. Listen, Seren, they already know where we are, more or less, and these slaves, they'll do whatever they can to avoid recapture. We need not worry over much about them. She raised her brows. You vouch for your fellow indebted, Udinas? All of whom will turn away from a chance to buy their way clear with vital information, yes? The only alternative, then, he said, eyeing her, is to kill them all. The ones listening, the ones not yet beaten down into mindless automatons, suddenly raised their voices in proclamations and promises, reaching out towards Seren, chains rattling. The others looked up in fear, like Myrid catching scent of a wolf they could not see. Some cried out, cowering in the stony mud of the road. The first Edur he killed, said Udinas, has the keys. Silchas Ruin had walked down the road. Barely visible in the mist, the Tist Andy veered into something huge, winged, then took to the air. Seren glanced over at the row of slaves. None had seen that, she was relieved to note. Very well, she said in answer to Udinas, and she walked up to where Fear Sengar still stood near the dead Edur. I must take the keys, she said, crouching beside the first fallen Edur. Do not touch him, Fear said. She looked up at him. The keys, the chains. I will find them, he said. Nodding, she straightened, then stepped back. Watched as he spoke a silent prayer, then settled onto his knees beside the body. He found the keys in a leather pouch tied to the warrior's belt, a pouch that also contained a handful of polished stones. Fear took the keys in his left hand and held the stones in the palm of his right. These, he said, are from the Merrowed shore. Likely he collected them when but a child. Children grow up, Seren said. Even straight trees spawn crooked branches. And what was flawed in this warrior? Fear demanded, glaring up at her. He followed my brother, as did every other warrior of the tribes. Some eventually turned away, Fear, like you. What I have turned away from lies in the shadow of what I am now turned towards, Aquitor. Does this challenge my loyalty towards the Tist Edur, my own kind? No. That is something all of you forget, conveniently so, again and again. Understand me, Aquitor. I will hide if I must, but I will not kill my own people. We had the coin, we could have bought their freedom. Not Udinas. He bared his teeth, said nothing. Yes, Udinas, the one man you dream of killing, if not for Silchas ruin. Fear Senga, she said, you have chosen to travel with us, and there can be no doubt, none at all, but Silchas Ruin commands this meagre party. Dislike his methods if you must, but he alone will see you through. You know this. The Hiroth warrior looked away, back down the road, blinking the water from his eyes. And with each step, the cost of my quest becomes greater. An indebtedness you should well understand, Aquitor. The lethary way of living, the burdens you can never escape nor purchase your way clear. She reached out for the keys. He set them into her hand, unwilling to meet her eyes. We're no different from those slaves. She hefted the weight of the jangling iron in her hand. Chained together? Yet who holds the means of our release? Where has he gone? Fear asked. To hunt down the lethary. I trust you do not object to that. No, but you should, Equator. I suppose I should at that. She set off to where waited the slaves. A prisoner near Udinas had crawled close to him, and Seren heard his whispered question. That tall slayer, 
Was that the white crow? He was, wasn't he? I have heard. You have heard nothing, Udinas said, raising his arms as Seren approached. The three-edged one, he said to her. Yes, that one. Errant takers, you took your time. She worked the key until the first shackle clicked open. You two were supposed to be stealing from a farm, not getting rounded up by slave trackers. Trackers camped on the damned grounds. No one was smiling on us that night. She opened the other shackle and Udinas stepped out from the line, rubbing at the red wheels round his wrists. Seren said, Fear sought to dissuade Silchas. You know, if those two are any indication, it's no wonder the Edor and the Andy fought ten thousand wars. Udinas grunted as the two made their way to where stood Kettle. Fear resents his loss of command, he said. That it is to a tist Andy just makes it worse. He's still not convinced the betrayal was the other way round all those centuries back, that it was Skabandari who first drew the knife. Seren Pedak said nothing. As she moved in front of Kettle, she looked down at the girl's dirt-smeared face, the ancient eyes slowly lifting to meet her own. Kettle smiled. I missed you. How badly were you used? Seren asked as she removed the large iron shackles. I can walk, and the bleeding stopped. That's a good sign, isn't it? Probably. But this talk of rape was unwelcome. Seren had her own memories haunting her every waking moment. There will be scars, Kettle. Being alive is hard. I'm always hungry and my feet hurt. I hate children with secrets, especially ones with secrets they're not even aware of. Find the right questions. There's no other way of doing this. What else bothers you about being among the living again, Kettle? And how? Why? Feeling small. Seren's right arm was plucked by a slave, an old man who reached out for the keys with pathetic hope in his eyes. She handed them to him. Free the others, she said. He nodded vigorously, scrabbling at his shackles. Now, Seren said to Kettle, that's a feeling we all must accept. Too much of the world defies our efforts to conform to what would please us. To live is to know dissatisfaction and frustration. I still want to tear out throats, Seren. Is that bad? I think it must be. At Kettle's words, the old man shrank away, redoubling his clumsy attempts at releasing himself. Behind him, a woman cursed with impatience. Udinas had climbed onto the bed of the lead wagon and was busy looting it for whatever they might need. Kettle scrambled to join him. We need to move out of this mist, Seren muttered. I'm soaked through. She walked towards the wagon. Hurry up with that, you two. If more company finds us here, we could be in trouble, especially now that Silchus Rowan is gone. The Tist Andy had been the singular reason for their survival thus far. When hiding and evading the searchers failed, his two swords found a voice, the eerie song of obliteration. The White Crow. It had been a week since they last caught sight of Edor and Lethary, who were clearly hunters, seeking the traitor, Fear Sengar seeking the betrayer, Udinas. Yet Seren Pedak was bemused. There should have been entire armies chasing them. While the pursuit was persistent, it was dogged rather than ferocious in its execution. Silchas had mentioned once in passing that the Emperor's Karisnan were working ritual sorceries, the kind that sought to lure and trap, and that snares awaited them to the east and round Letharas itself. She could understand those to the east, for it was the wild lands beyond the empire that had been their destination all along, where fear, for some reason he did not care to explain, believed he would find what he sought, a belief that Silchas Ruin did not refute. But to surround the capital city itself baffled Seren, as if Rulad is frightened of his brother. Udinas leapt down from the lead wagon and made his way to the second one. I found coin he said. Lots. We should take these horses, too. We can sell them once we're down the other side of the pass. There is a fort at the pass, 
Seren said. It may be ungarrisoned, but there's no guarantee of that, Udinas. If we arrive with horses and they recognize them... We go round that fort, he replied, at night, unseen. She frowned, wiped water from her eyes. Easier done without horses. Besides, these beasts are old, too broken. They won't earn us much, especially in Blue Rose. And when Wival returns, they'll probably die of terror. Wival's not coming back, Udinas said, turning away, his voice grating. Wival's gone, and that's that. She knew she should not doubt him. The dragon-spawn spirit had dwelt within him, after all. Yet there was no obvious explanation for the winged beast's sudden disappearance, at least none that Udinas would share. Wival had been gone for over a month. Udinas swore from where he crouched atop the bed of the wagon. Nothing here but weapons. Weapons? Swords, shields, and armor. Lethery? Yes, middling quality. What were these slavers doing with a wagon load of weapons? Shrugging, he climbed back down, hurried past her, and began unhitching the horses. These beasts would have had a hard time on the ascent. Selchas Ruin is coming back, Kettle said, pointing down the road. That was fast? Udinas laughed harshly, then said, The fools should have scattered, made him hunt each one down separately. Instead, they probably regrouped like the stupid good soldiers they were. From near the front wagon, Fear Sengar spoke. Your blood is very thin, Udinas, isn't it? Like water, the ex-slave replied. For errant's sake, Fear, he did not choose to abandon your brother. You know that. Nor is he responsible for Rulad's madness. So how much of your hatred for Udinas comes from guilt? Who truly is to blame for Rulad? For the Emperor of a Thousand Deaths? The white-skinned Tist Andy strode from the mists, an apparition, his black cloak glistening like snakeskin. Swords sheathed once more, muting their cries. Iron voices reluctant to fade, they would persist for days now. How she hated that sound. Tanal Yathvana stood looking down at the naked woman on his bed. The questioners had worked hard on her, seeking the answers they wanted. She was badly broken, her skin cut and burned, her joints swollen and mottled with bruises. She had been barely conscious when he'd used her last night. This was easier than whores and cost him nothing besides. He wasn't much interested in beating his women, just in seeing them beaten. He understood his desire was perversion, but this organization, the Patriotists, was the perfect haven for people like him. Power and immunity, a most deadly combination. He suspected that Kaoros and Victad was well aware of Tanal's nightly escapades and held that knowledge like a sheathed knife. It's not as if I've killed her. It's not as if she'll even remember this. She's destined for the drownings in any case. What matter if I take some pleasure first? Soldiers do the same. He had dreamed of being a soldier once, years ago, when in his youth he had held to misguided romantic notions of heroism and unconstrained freedom, as if the first justified the second. There had been many noble killers in the history of Lether. Geron Eberricht had been such a man. He'd murdered thousands, thieves, thugs, and wastrels, the depraved and the destitute. He had cleansed the streets of Letheras, and who had not indulged in the rewards? Fewer beggars, fewer pickpockets, fewer homeless, and all the other decrepit failures of the modern age. Tanal admired Geron Eberricht. He had been a great man. Murdered by a thug, his skull crushed to pulp, a tragic loss, senseless and cruel. One day we shall find that killer. He turned away from the unconscious woman, adjusted his light tunic so that the shoulder seams were even and straight, then closed the clasps of his weapon belt. One of the invigilator's requirements for all officers of the Patriotists, belt, dagger, and short sword. Tanal liked the weight of them the authority implicit in the privilege of wearing arms where all other lethery, barring soldiers, were forbidden by proclamation of the Emperor. 
as if we might rebel. The damned fool thinks he won that war. They all do. Dim-witted barbarians. Tanal Yathvanar walked to the door, stepped out into the corridor, and made his way towards the invigilator's office. The second bell after midday sounded a moment before he knocked on the door. A murmured invitation bade him enter. He found Rortos Hivana, master of the Liberty Consign, already seated opposite Karos in Victad. The large man seemed to fill half the room, and Tanel noted that the invigilator had pushed his own chair as far back as possible, so that it was tilted against the sill of the window. In this space on his side of the desk, Karos attempted a posture of affable comfort. Tanel, our guest is being most insistent with respect to his suspicions. Sufficient to convince me that we must devote considerable attention to finding the source of the threat. Invigilator, is the intent sedition or treason, or are we dealing with a thief? A thief, I should think, Karos replied, glancing over at Rotos Hivana. The man's cheeks bulged before he released a slow sigh. I am not so sure. On the surface, we appear to be facing an obsessive individual, consumed by greed and, accordingly, hoarding wealth. But only as actual coin. And this is why it is proving so difficult to find a trail. No properties, no ostentation, no flouting of privilege. Now, a subtle consequence, the shortage of coin is finally noticeable. True, no actual damage to the Empire's financial structure has occurred. Yet. But if the depletion continues, he shook his head, we will begin to feel the strain. Tanal cleared his throat, then asked, Master, have you assigned agents of your own to investigate the situation? Rotos frowned. The Liberty Consign thrives precisely because its members hold to the conviction of being the most powerful players in an unassailable system. Confidence is a most fragile quality, Tanal Yathvana. Granted, a few who deal specifically in finances have brought to me their concerns. Druz Senikt, Barakta Ilk, for example. But there is nothing as yet formalized, no true suspicion that something is awry. Neither man is a fool, however. He glanced out of the window behind Karos and Victad. The investigation must be conducted by the Patriotists in utmost secrecy. The heavy-lidded eyes lowered, settling on the invigilator. I understand that you have been targeting academics and scholars of late. A modest shrug and lift of the brows from Karos in Victad. The many paths of treason. Some are members of established and respected families in Lefa. No, Rotas, not the ones we have arrested. True, but those unfortunate victims have friends in Vigilator, who have in turn appealed to me. Well, my friend, this is delicate indeed. You tread now on the thinnest skin of ground, with naught but mud beneath. He sat forward, folding his hands on the desk. But I shall look into it nonetheless. Perhaps the recent spate of arrests has succeeded in quelling the disenchantment among the learned, or at least culled the most egregious of their lot. Thank you, Invigilator. Now who will conduct your investigation? Why, I will attend to this personally. Then it Safad, my assistant who awaits in the courtyard below, can serve as liaison between your organization and myself for this week. Thereafter, I will assign someone else. Very good. Weekly reports should suffice, at least to start. Agreed. Rotos Hivana rose, and after a moment Karos and Victad followed suit. The office was suddenly very cramped, and Tanal edged back, angry at the intimidation he felt instinctively rising within him. I have nothing to fear from Rotos Hivana, nor Karos. I am their confidant, the both of them. They trust me.
Karos Invictad was a step behind Rotos, one hand on the man's back as the master opened the door. As soon as Rotos stepped into the hallway, Karos smiled and said a few last words to the man, who grunted in reply, and then the invigilator closed the door and turned to face Tanal. One of those well-respected academics is now staining your sheets, Yathavana. Tanal blinked. Sir, she was sentenced to the drowning. Revoke the punishment. Get her cleaned up. Sir, it may well be that she will recall a certain measure of restraint, Karos Invictad said in a cold tone, is required from you, Tanal Yathvana. Arrest some daughters of those already in chains, damn you, and have your fun with them. Am I understood? I yes, sir, if she remembers. Then restitution will be necessary, won't it? I trust you keep your own finances in order, Yathvana. Now be gone from my sight. As Tanal closed the door behind him, he struggled to draw breath. The bastard. There was no warning of her, was there? Whose mistake was all this? Yet you think to make me pay for it. All of it. Blade and axe take you, Invictad. I won't suffer alone. I won't. Depravity holds a certain fascination, don't you think? No. After all, the sicker the soul, the sweeter its comeuppance. Assuming there is one. There's a center point, I'm sure of it. And it should be dead center, by my calculations. Perhaps the fulcrum itself is flawed. What calculations? Well, the ones I asked you to do for me, of course. Where are they? They're on my list. And how do you calculate the order of your list? That's not the calculation you asked for. Good point. Anyway, if he'd just hold all his legs still, we could properly test my hypothesis. He doesn't want to, and I can see why. You're trying to balance him at the midpoint of his body, but he's designed to hold that part up with all those legs. Are those formal observations? If so, make a note. On what? We had the wax slab for lunch. No wonder I feel I could swallow a cow with nary a hiccup. Look! Ha! He's perched. Perfectly perched. Both men leaned in to examine Esgara, the insect with a head at each end. Not unique, of course. There were plenty around these days, filling some arcane niche in the complicated miasma of nature a niche that had been vacant for countless millennia. The creature's broken twig legs kicked out helplessly. You're torturing him, said Bug, with clear depravity, Teho. It only seems that way. No, it is that way. All right, then. Teho reached down and plucked the hapless insect from the fulcrum. Its head swiveled about. Anyway, he said as he peered closely at the creature, that wasn't the depravity I was talking about. How goes the construction business, by the way? Sinking fast. Ah, is that an affirmation or decried destitution? We're running out of buyers. No hard coin, and I'm done with credit, especially when it turns out the developers can't sell the properties. So I've had to lay everyone off, including myself. When did all this happen? Tomorrow. Typical. I'm always the last to hear. Is Esgara hungry, do you think? He ate more wax than you did. Where do you think all the waste goes? Here's all mine. Master, I already know where yours goes. And if Biri ever finds out... Not another word, Bug. Now, by my observations, and according to the notations you failed to make... Esgara has consumed food equivalent in weight to a drowned cat. Yet he remains tiny, spry, fit, and thanks to our wax lunch today, his heads no longer squeak when they swivel, which I take to be a good sign, since now we won't be woken up a hundred times a night. Master. Yes? How do you know how much a drowned cat weighs? Selosh, of course. I don't understand. You must remember. Three years ago, 
that feral cat netted in the Rinnesinkt estate, the one raping a flightless ornamental duck. It was sentenced to drowning. A terrible demise for a cat. Yes, I remember now. The yowl heard across the city. That's the one. Some unnamed benefactor took pity on the sodden feline corpse, paying Selosh a small fortune to dress the beast for proper burial. You must be mad. Who would do that and why? For ulterior motives, obviously. I wanted to know how much a drowned cat weighs, of course. Otherwise, how valid the comparison. Descriptively, I've been waiting to use it for years. Three. No, much longer. Hence my curiosity and opportunism. Prior to that cat's watery end, I feared voicing the comparison, which, lacking veracity on my part, would invite ridicule. You're a tender one, aren't you? Don't tell anyone. Master, about those vaults. What about them? I think extensions are required. Tehol used the tip of his right index finger to stroke the insect's back or, alternatively, rub it the wrong way. Already? Well, how far under the river are you right now? More than halfway. And that is how many? Vaults? Sixteen. Each one three man-heights by two. All filled? All. Oh. So presumably it's starting to hurt. Bugs' construction will be the first major enterprise to collapse. And how many will it drag down with it? No telling. Three, maybe four. I thought you said there was no telling. So don't tell anyone. Good idea. Bug, I need you to build me a box, to very specific specifications which I'll come up with later. A box, master. Wood good enough? What kind of sentence is that? Wood good enough? No, wood, you know, the burning kind. Yes, wood that wood will do. Size? Absolutely, but no lid. Finally, you're getting specific. I told you I would. What's this box for, master? I can't tell you, alas. Not specifically, but I need it soon. About the vaults. Make ten more, Bug. Double the size. As for Bug's construction, hold on for a while longer, amass debt, evade the creditors, keep purchasing materials and stockpiling them in storage buildings charging exorbitant rent. Oh, and embezzle all you can. I'll lose my head. Don't worry, Esgara here has one to spare. Why, thank you. Doesn't even squeak, either. That's a relief. What are you doing now, master? What's it look like? You're going back to bed. And you need to build a box, Bug, a most clever box. Remember, though, no lid. Can I at least ask what it's for? Tehol settled back on his bed, studied the blue sky overhead for a moment, then smiled over at his manservant, who just happened to be an elder god. Why, comeuppance, Bug? What else? Chapter 2 The waking moment awaits us all upon a threshold, or where the road turns if life is pulled, sparks like moths inward to this single sliver of time, gleaming like sunlight on water. We will accrete into a mass made small, veined with fears and shot through with all that's suddenly precious, and the now is swallowed, the weight of self a crushing immediacy, on this day, where the road turns, comes the waking moment. Winter Reflections Corara of Dreen The ascent to the summit began where the leathery built road ended. With the river voicing its ceaseless roar fifteen paces to their left, the roughly shaped pavestones vanished beneath a black stone slide at the base of a moraine. Uprooted trees reached bent and twisted arms up through the rubble, jutting limbs from which hung root tendrils dripping water. Swaths of forest climbed the mountainside to the north, on the other side of the river, and the ragged cliffs edging the tumbling water on that side were verdant with moss. The opposite mountain, flanking the trail, was a stark contrast, latticed with fissures, 
broken, gouged, and mostly treeless. In the midst of this shattered façade, shadows marked out odd regularities of line and angle, and upon the trail itself, here and there, broad, worn steps had been carved, eroded by flowing water and centuries of footfalls. Seren Pedak believed that a city had once occupied the entire mountainside, a vertical fortress carved into living stone. She could make out what she thought were large, gaping windows, and possibly the fragmented ledges of balconies high up, hazy in the mists. Yet something, something huge, terrible in its monstrosity, had impacted the entire side of the mountain, obliterating most of the city in a single blow. She could almost discern the outline of that collision. Yet among the screes of rubble tracking down the sundered slopes, the only visible stone belonged to the mountain itself. They stood at the base of the trail. Seren watched the lifeless eyes of the Tist Andy slowly scan upward. Well? she asked. Silchas Ruin shook his head. Not from my people. Kachain Chemal. A victim of your war? He glanced across at her, as if gauging the emotion behind her question, then said, Most of the mountains from which the Kachain Chemal carved their sky keeps are now beneath the waves, inundated following the collapse of Omtos Felak. The cities are cut into the stone, although only in the very earliest versions are they as you see here open to the air rather than buried within shapeless rock. An elaboration suggesting a sudden need for self-defense, he nodded. Fear Sengar had moved past them and was beginning the ascent. After a moment, Udinas and Kettle followed. Seren had prevailed in her insistence to leave the horses behind. In a clearing off to their right sat four wagons covered with tarps, it was clear that no such contrivance could manage this climb, and all transport from here on was by foot. As for the mass of weapons and armor the slavers had been conveying, either it would have been stashed here, awaiting the hauling crew, or the slaves would have been burdened like mules. I have never made this particular crossing, Seren said, although I have viewed this mountainside from a distance. Even then I thought I could see evidence of reshaping. I once asked Hull Bedict about it, but he would tell me nothing. At some point, however, I think our trail takes us inside. The sorcery that destroyed this city was formidable, Siltras Ruin said. Perhaps some natural force. No, Aquitor, Starvald Demolane. The destruction was the work of dragons, a laint of the pure blood. At least a dozen, working in concert, a combined unleashing of their warrens. Unusual, he added. Which part? Such a large alliance, for one. Also the extent of their rage. I wonder what crime the Kachin Chemal committed to warrant such retaliation. I know the answer to that, came a sibilant whisper from behind them and Seren turned, squinted down at the insubstantial wraith crouched there. Whither? I was wondering where you had gone to. Journeys into the heart of the stone, Seren Pedak, into the frozen blood. What was their crime, you wonder, Silchas Ruin? Why, nothing less than the assured annihilation of all existence. If extinction awaited them, then so too would all else die. Desperation or evil spite? Perhaps neither. Perhaps a terrible accident, that wounding at the center of it all. But what do we care? We shall all be dust by then, indifferent, insensate. Siltras Ruin said without turning, Beware the frozen blood wither. It can still take you. The wraith hissed a laugh. Like an ant to sap, yes. Oh, but it is so seductive, master. You have been warned. If you are snared, I cannot free you. The wraith slithered past them, 
flowed up the ragged steps. Seren adjusted the leather satchel on her shoulders. The Fent carried supplies balanced on their heads. Would that I could do the same. The vertebrae become compacted, Siltras Ruin said, resulting in chronic pain. Well, mine are feeling rather crunched right now, so I'm afraid I don't see much difference. She began the climb. You know, as a soul taken, you could just... No, he said as he followed. There is too much bloodlust in the veering. The draconian hunger within me is where lives my anger, and that anger is not easily contained. She snorted, unable to help herself. You are amused, Aquitor. Scabandari is dead. Fear has seen his shattered skull. You were stabbed and then imprisoned, and now that you are free, all that consumes you is the desire for vengeance. Against what? Some incorporeal soul? Something less than a wraith? What will be left of Scabandari by now? Siltras Rowan, yours is a pathetic obsession. At least Fear Sengar seeks something positive. Not that he'll find it, since you will probably annihilate what's left of Scabandari before he gets a chance to talk to it, assuming that's even possible. When he said nothing, she continued, It seems I am now fated to guiding such quests. Just like my last journey, the one that took me to the lands of the Tist Edur. Everyone at odds, motives hidden and in conflict. My task was singular, of course. Deliver the fools, then stand well back as the knives are drawn. Aquitor, my anger is more complicated than you believe. What does that mean? The future you set before us is too simple, too confined. I suspect that when we arrive at our destination, nothing will proceed as you anticipate. She grunted. I will accept that, since it was without doubt the case in the village of the Warlock King. After all, the fallout was the conquest of the Leathery Empire. Do you take responsibility for that, Aquitor? I take responsibility for very little, Silchas Rowan. That much must be obvious. The steps were steep, the edges worn and treacherous. As they climbed, the air thinned, mists swirling in from the tumbling falls on their left, the sound a roar that clambered among the stones in a tumult of echoes. Where the ancient stairs vanished entirely, wooden trestles had been constructed, forming something between a ladder and steps against the sheer angled rock. They found a ledge a third of the way up where they could gather to rest. Among the scatter of rubble on the shelf were remnants of metopes, cornices and friezes bearing carvings too fragmented to be identifiable, suggesting that an entire façade had once existed directly above them. The scaffolding became a true ladder here, and off to the right, three man-heights up, gaped the mouth of a cave, rectangular, almost door-shaped. Udinas stood regarding that dark portal for a long time before he turned to the others. I suggest we try it. There is no need, slave, replied Fear Sengar. This trail is straightforward, reliable. And getting icier the higher we go. The indebted grimaced, then laughed. Oh, there are songs to be sung, are there, Fear? The perils and tribulations, the glories of suffering, all to win your heroic triumph. You want the elders who were once your grandchildren to gather the clan round the fire for the telling of your tale, a lone warrior's quest for his god. I can almost hear them now, describing the formidable fierce Sengar of the Heroth, brother to the emperor with his train of followers, the lost child, the inveterate lethary guide, a ghost, a slave, and of course the white-skinned nemesis. The white crow with his silver-tongued lies. Oh, we have here the gamut of archetypes, yes. He reached into the satchel beside him and drew out a water-skin, 
took a long drink, then wiped his mouth with the back of his hand. But imagine all of it going for naught, when you pitch from a slippery rung and plunge five hundred man-heights to your ignominious death. Not how the story goes, alas, but then life isn't a story now, is it? He replaced the skin and shouldered his pack. The embittered slave chooses a different route to the summit, the fool. But then, he paused to grin back at fear, somebody has to be the moral lesson in this epic, right? Seren watched the man climbing the rungs. When he came opposite the cave mouth, he reached out until one hand gripped the edge of a stone, then followed with a foot, stretching until the probing tip of his moccasin settled on the ledge. Then, in a swift shifting of weight, combined with a push away from the ladder, he fluidly spun on one leg, the other swinging over empty air. Then, stepping inward, pulled by the weight of the satchel on his back into the gloom of the entrance. Nicely done, Siltras Ruin commented, and there was something like amusement in his tone, as if he had enjoyed the slaves poking at Fear Sengar's sententious self-importance thus revealing two edges to his observation. I am of a mind to follow him. Me too, said Kettle. Seren Pedak sighed. Very well, but I suggest we use ropes between us and leave the showing off to Udinas. The mouth of the cave revealed that it had been a corridor, probably leading out onto a balcony before the façade had sheared off. Massive sections of the walls, riven through with cracks, had shifted, settled at conflicting angles, and every crevasse, every fissure on all sides that Seren could see, seethed with the squirming furred bodies of bats, awakened now to their presence, chittering and moments from panic. As Seren set her pack down, Udinas moved beside her. Here, he said, his breath pluming, light this lantern, Aquito. When the temperature drops, my hands start going numb. At her look, he glanced over at Fear Sengar, then said, Too many years reaching down into icy water. A slave among the Edoer knows little comfort. You were fed, Fear Sengar said. When a bloodwood tree toppled in the forest, Utinas said, we'd be sent out to drag it back to the village. Do you remember those times, Fear? Sometimes the trunk would shift unexpectedly, slide in mud or whatever, and crush a slave. One of them was from our own household. You don't recall him, do you? What's one more dead slave? You, Edur, would shout out when that happened, saying the Bloodwood spirit was thirsty for leathery blood. Enough, Udinas. Seren said, finally succeeding in lighting the lantern. As the illumination burdened, the bats exploded from the cracks and suddenly the air was filled with frantic beating wings. A dozen heartbeats later, the creatures were gone. She straightened, raising the lantern. They stood on a thick, moldy paste, guano crawling with grubs and beetles, from which rose a foul stench. We'd better move in. Seren said, and get clear of this. There are fevers. The man was screaming as the guards dragged him by his chains across the courtyard to the ring wall. His crushed feet left bloody smears on the pavestones. Screams of accusation wailed from him, shrill outrage at the shaping of the world, the lethery world. Tanal Yathvana snorted softly. Hear him. Such naivety. Karos Invictad, standing beside him on the balcony, gave him a sharp look. You foolish man, Tanalyathvana. Invigilator? Karos Invictad leaned his forearms on the railing and squinted down at the prisoner. Fingers like bloated river worms slowly entwined. From somewhere overhead, a gull was laughing. Who poses the greatest threat to the Empire, Yathvana? Fanatics, Tanal replied after a moment, like that one below. Incorrect. Listen to his words. He is possessed of certainty. He holds to a secure vision of the world, a man with the correct answers, 
that the prerequisite questions were themselves the correct ones goes without saying. A citizen with certainty, Yathvana, can be swayed, turned, can be made into a most diligent ally. All one needs to do is find what threatens them the most. Ignite their fear, burn to cinders the foundations of their certainty, then offer an equally certain alternate way of thinking, of seeing the world. They will reach across, no matter how wide the gulf, and grasp and hold on to you with all their strength. No, the certain are not our enemies. Presently misguided, as in the case of the man below, but always most vulnerable to fear. Take away the comfort of their convictions, then coax them with seemingly cogent and reasonable convictions of our own making. Their eventual embrace is assured. I see. Tanal Yathvanar, our greatest enemies are those who are without certainty, the ones with questions, the ones who regard our tidy answers with unquenchable scepticism. Those questions assail us, undermine us. They agitate. Understand, these dangerous citizens understand that nothing is simple. Their stance is the very opposite of naivety. They are humbled by the ambivalence to which they are witness, and they defy our simple, comforting assertions of clarity of a black and white world. Yathvana, when you wish to deliver the gravest insult to such a citizen, call them naive. You will leave them incensed, indeed virtually speechless, until you watch their minds backtracking, revealed by a cascade of expressions, as they ask themselves, who is it that would call me naive? Well, comes the answer, clearly a person possessing certainty, with all the arrogance and pretension that position entails. A confidence, then, that permits the offhand judgment, the derisive dismissal uttered from a most lofty height. And from all this, into your victim's eyes will come the light of recognition. In you he faces his enemy, his truest enemy, and he will know fear, indeed terror. You invite the question, then, invigilator. Karos Invictad smiled. Do I possess certainty? Or am I, in fact, plagued by questions, doubts? Do I flounder in the wild currents of complexity? He was silent for a moment, then he said, I hold to but one certainty. Power shapes the face of the world. In itself, it is neither benign nor malicious. It is simply the tool by which its wielder reshapes all that is around him or herself, reshapes it to suit his or her own comforts. Of course, to express power is to enact tyranny, which can be most subtle and soft, or cruel and hard. Implicit in power, political, familial, as you like, is the threat of coercion against all who choose to resist. And know this, if coercion is available, it will be used. He gestured. Listen to that man. He does my work for me. Down in the dungeons, his cellmates hear his ravings, and some among them join in chorus. The guards take note of who, and that is a list of names I peruse daily, for they are the ones I can win over the ones who say nothing or turn away. Now that is the list of those who must die. So, said Tunnel, we let him scream. Yes, the irony is, he truly is naive, although not, of course, as you originally meant. It is his very certainty that reveals his blithe ignorance. It is a further irony that both extremes of the political spectrum reveal a convergence of the means and methods and indeed the very attitudes of the believers, their ferocity against naysayers, the blood they willingly spill for their cause, defending their version of reality, the hatred they reveal for those who voice doubts. Skepticism disguises contempt, after all and to be held in contempt by one who holds to nothing is to feel the deepest, most cutting wound. And so we who hold to certainty, Yathvanar, soon find it our mission to root out and annihilate the questioners. And my, the pleasure we derive from that! Tanal Yathvanar said nothing. 
inundated with a storm of suspicions, none of which he could isolate, chased down. Carlos Invictad said, You were so quick to judge, weren't you? Ah, you revealed so much with that contemptuous utterance. And I admit to being amused at my own instinctive response to your words. Naive. Errant take me. I wanted to rip your head from your body, like decapitating a swamp fly. I wanted to show you true contempt. Mine. For you and your kind. I wanted to take that dismissive expression on your face and push it through an awful grinder. You think you have all the answers? You must, given the ease of your voiced judgment. Well, you pathetic little creature, one day uncertainty will come to your door, will clamber down your throat, and it will be a race to see which arrives first, humility or death. Either way, I will spare you a moment's compassion, which is what sets you and me apart, isn't it? A package arrived today, yes? Tanal blinked. See how we all possess a bloodlust. Then he nodded. Yes, Invigilator, a new puzzle for you. Excellent. From whom? Anonymous. Most curious. Is that part of the mystery, or fear of ridicule when I solve it after a mere moment's thought? Well, how can you possibly answer that question? Where is it now? It should have been delivered to your office, sir. Good. Permit the man below to scream for the rest of the afternoon, then have him sent below again. Tanal bowed as Karos left the balcony. He waited for a hundred heartbeats, then he too departed. A short time later, he descended to the lowest level of the ancient dungeons, down spiraling stone steps to corridors and cells that had not seen regular use in centuries. The recent floods had inundated both this level and the one above it, although the waters had since drained, leaving behind thick silts and the stench of stagnant, filthy water. Carrying a lantern, Tanal Yathvana made his way down a sloping channel until he came to what had once been the primary inquisition chamber. Arcane, rust-seized mechanisms squatted on the pavestone floor, or were affixed to walls, with one bedframe-like cage suspended from the ceiling by thick chains. Directly opposite the entrance was a wedge-shaped contraption, replete with manacles and chains that could be drawn tight via a wall-mounted ratchet to one side. The inclined bed faced onto the chamber, and shackled to it was the woman he had been instructed to release. She was awake, turning her face away from the sudden light. Tanal set the lantern down on a table cluttered with instruments of torture. Time for a feeding, he said. She said nothing. A well-respected academic. Look at her now. All those lofty words of yours, Tanal said. In the end, they prove less substantial than dust on the wind. Her voice was ragged, croaking. May you one day choke on that dust, little man. Tanal smiled. Little. You seek to wound me. A pathetic effort. He walked over to a chest against the wall to his right. It had contained vice helms, but Tanal had removed the skull crushers, filling the chest with flasks of water and dried foodstuffs. I shall need to bring down buckets with soap water, he said, drawing out the makings of her supper. Unavoidable as your defecation is, the smell and the stains are most unpleasant. Oh, I offend you, do I? He glanced over at her and smiled. Janath Anna, a senior lecturer in the Academy of Imperial Learning. Alas, you appear to have learned nothing of imperial ways, although, one might argue, that has changed since your arrival here. She studied him, a strangely heavy look to her bruised eyes. From the First Empire until this day, little man. There have been times of outright tyranny. But the present oppressor's artist Edo is scarcely worth noting. After all, the true oppression comes from you. Lethary against lethary. Furthermore, furthermore, Tanal said, mocking her, 
The patriotists are the lethary gift of mercy against their own. Better us than the Edur. We do not make indiscriminate arrests. We do not punish out of ignorance. We are not random. A gift? Do you truly believe that? she asked, still studying him. The Edor don't give a damn one way or the other. Their leader is unkillable, and that makes their mastery absolute. A high-ranking Tist Edor liaises with us almost daily to keep you in reign. You, Tanal Yathvanar, not your prisoners. You and that madman Karas Invictad. She cocked her head. Why is it, I wonder, that organizations such as yours are invariably run by pitiful human failures, by small-minded psychotics and perverts, all bullied as children, of course, or abused by twisted parents? I'm sure you have terrible tales to confess of your miserable youth. And now the power is in your hands, and oh, how the rest of us suffer. Tanar walked over with the food and the flask of water. For Erin's sake, she said, loosen at least one of my arms so I can feed myself. He came up beside her. No, I prefer it this way. Are you humiliated, being fed like a babe? What do you want with me? Janath asked as he unstoppered the flask. He set it to her cracked lips, watched her drink. I don't recall saying I wanted anything, he replied. She twisted her head away, coughing, water spilling onto her chest. I've confessed everything, she said after a moment. You have all my notes, my treasonous lectures on personal responsibility and the necessity for compassion. Yes, your moral relativism. I refute any notion of relativism, little man which you'd know had you bothered reading those notes. The structures of a culture do not circumvent nor excuse self-evident injustice or inequity. The status quo is not sacred, not an altar to paint in rivers of blood. Tradition and habit are not sound arguments. White crow, woman, you are most certainly a lecturer. I liked you better unconscious. Best beat me senseless again she said. Alas, I cannot. After all, I am supposed to free you. Her eyes narrowed on his, then shied away again. Careless of me, she muttered. In what way? he asked. I was almost seduced, the lure of hope. If you are supposed to free me, you would never have brought me down here. No, I am to be your private victim, and you, my private nightmare. In the end, the chains upon you will be a match to mine. The psychology of the human mind, Tanal said, pushing some fat-soaked bread into her mouth. Your speciality. So you can read my life as easily as you read a scroll. Is that supposed to frighten me? She chewed, then with a struggle swallowed. I wield a far deadlier weapon, little man. And that would be? I slip into your head. I see through your eyes, swim the streams of your thought. I stand there, looking at the soiled creature chained to this rape bed. And eventually I begin to understand you. It's more intimate than making love, little man, because all your secrets vanish. And in case you were wondering, yes... I am doing it even now, listening to my own words as you listen, feeling the tightness gripping your chest, that odd chill beneath your skin despite the fresh sweat, the sudden fear as you realize the extent of your vulnerability. He struck her, hard enough to snap her head to one side. Blood gushed from her mouth. She coughed, spat, then spat again, her breath coming in ragged, liquid gasps. We can resume this meal later, he said, struggling to keep his words toneless. I expect you'll do your share of screaming in the days and weeks to come, Janeth, but I assure you, your cries will reach no one.
A peculiar hacking sound came from her. After a moment, Tanal realized she was laughing. Impressive bravado, he said with sincerity. Eventually, I may in truth free you. For now, I remain undecided. I'm sure you understand. She nodded. You arrogant bitch, he said. She laughed again. He backed away. Do not think I will leave the lantern, he snarled. Her laughter followed him out, cutting like broken glass. The ornate carriage, trimmed in gleaming bloodwood, was motionless, drawn up to one side of the main thoroughfare of Dreen, its tall wheels straddling the open sewer. The four bone-white horses stood listless in the unseasonal heat, heads hanging down over their collars. Directly ahead of them the street was framed in an arching open gate, and beyond it was the sprawling maze of the high market, a vast concourse crowded with stalls, carts, livestock, and throngs of people. The flow of wealth, the cacophony of voices, and the multitude of proffering or grasping hands seemed to culminate in a force battering at Brol Handar's senses, even from where he sat, protected within the plush confines of the carriage. The heaving sounds from the market, the chaotic back-and-forth flow of people beneath the gate, and the crowds on the street itself, all made the overseer think of religious fervor, as if he was witness to a frenzied version of a Tist Edur funeral. In place of the women voicing their rhythmic grunts of constrained grief, drovers bullied braying beasts through the press. Instead of unblooded youths wading through blood-frothed surf, pounding paddles against the waves, there was the clatter of cartwheels and the high piping cries of hawkers. The wood smoke of the pyres and offerings in wreathing an Edua village was, here, a thick, dusty river tainted with a thousand scents. Dung, horse piss, roasting meat, vegetables and fish, uncured myrid hides and tanned rodara skins, rotting wastes and the cloying smells of intoxicating drugs. Here, among the lethary, no precious offerings were thrown into the sea. Tusked seal ivory leaned against shelves like fang rows from some wooden mechanisms of torture. In other stalls, that ivory reappeared, this time carved into a thousand shapes, many of them mimicking religious objects from the Edur, the Jek, and the Fent, or as playing pieces for a game. Polished amber was adornment, not the sacred tears of captured dusk, and bloodwood itself had been carved into bowls, cups, and cooking utensils, or to trim an ostentatious carriage. Through a slit in the shutters, the overseer watched the surging to and fro on the street. An occasional Tist Edur appeared in the crowds, a head taller than most lethary, and Brol thought he could read something of bemusement behind their haughty, remote expressions. And once, in the face of an overdressed, ring-speared elder whom Brawl knew personally, he saw the glint of avarice in the Edur's eyes. Change was rarely chosen, and its common arrival was slow, subtle. Granted, the Lethary had experienced the shock of defeated armies, a slain king, and a new ruling class, but even then such sudden reversals had proved not nearly as catastrophic as one might have expected. The skein that held leather together was resilient, and, Brawl now knew, far stronger than it appeared. What disturbed him the most, however, was the ease with which that skein entwined all who found themselves in its midst. Poison in that touch, yet not fatal, just intoxicating. Sweet, yet perhaps ultimately deadly. This is what comes of comfort. Yet he could well see the reward of comfort was not available to all. Indeed, it seemed disturbingly rare. While those who possessed wealth clearly exulted in its display, that very ostentation underscored the fact that they were a distinct minority. But that imbalance was, he now understood, entirely necessary. Not everyone could be rich. The system would not permit such equity, for the power and privilege it offered was dependent on the very opposite. Inequity. Else how can power be assessed? How can the gifts of privilege be valued? For there to be rich, there must be poor. 
and more of the latter than the former. Simple rules, easily arrived at through simple observation. Brol Handar was not a sophisticated man, a shortcoming he was reminded of every day since his arrival as overseer of Dreen. He had no particular experience with governing, and few of the skills in his possession were proving applicable to his new responsibilities. The factor, Leto Anikt, was conducting an unofficial war against the tribes beyond the borderlands, using imperial troops to steal land and consolidate his newfound holdings. There was no real justification for this bloodshed. The goal was personal wealth. As yet, however, Brol Handar did not know what he was going to do about it, if indeed he was going to do anything. He had prepared a long report to the Emperor, providing well-documented details describing the situation here in Dreen. That report remained in Brol's possession, for he had begun to suspect that, should he send it off to Letharas, it would not reach the Emperor or any of his Edor advisers. The Lethary Chancellor, Triban Gnoll, appeared to be complicit and possibly even in league with Letor Anikt, hinting at a vast web of power, hidden beneath the surface and seemingly thriving unaffected by Edor rule. At the moment, all Brol Handar had were suspicions, hints of that insidious web of power. One link was certain, and that was with this Lethary association of wealthy families, the Liberty Consign. Possibly this organization was at the very heart of the hidden power, but he could not be sure. Brol Handar, a minor noble among the Tist Edur, and newly appointed overseer to a small city in a remote corner of the empire, well knew that he could not challenge such a thing as the Liberty Consign. He was, indeed, beginning to believe that the Tist Edur tribes, scattered as they had become across this vast land, were little more than flotsam riding the indifferent currents of a turgid deep river. Yet there is the Emperor, who is quite probably insane. He did not know to whom to turn, nor even if what he was witnessing was, in truth, as dangerous as it seemed. Brawl was startled by a commotion near the gate, and he leaned forward to set an eye against the slit between the shutters. An arrest. People were quickly moving away from the scene as two nondescript lethary, one to each side, pushed their victim face first against one of the gate's uprights. There were no shouted accusations, no frightened denials. The silence shared by the patriotist agents and their prisoner left the overseer strangely shaken as if the details did not matter to any of them. One of the agents was searching for weapons, finding none, and then, as his fellow agent held the man against the ornate upright, he removed the leather hip satchel from the man's belt and began rummaging through it. The prisoner's face was pressed sideways against the bas-relief carvings on the broad, squared column, and those carvings depicted some past glory of the Lethary Empire. Brol Handar suspected the irony was lost on all concerned. Sedition would be the charge. It was always the charge. But against what? Not the presence of the Tist Edur. That would be pointless, after all, and certainly there had been virtually no attempts at reprisal, at least none that Brol Handar had heard about. So, what precisely? Against whom? The indebted always existed, and some fled their debts, but most did not. There were sects formulated around political or social disquiet, many of them drawing membership from the disenfranchised remnants of subjugated tribes, the Fent, the Nerek, Tarthanol, and others. But since the conquest, most of these sects had either dissolved or fled the empire. Sedition. A charge to silence debate. Somewhere, therefore, there must exist a list of the accepted beliefs, the host of convictions and faiths that composed the proper doctrine, or was something more insidious at work. There was a scratch at the carriage door, and a moment later it opened. Brol Handar studied the figure stepping onto the runner, the carriage tilting with his weight. By all means, Orbin, he said, enter. Muscles softened by years of inactivity, fleshy face, the jowls heavy and slack. Orbin, truth finder, seemed to sweat incessantly, regardless of ambient temperature, 
as if some internal pressure forced the toxins of his mind to the surface of his skin. The local head of the Patriotists was, to Brol Handar's eye, the most despicable malicious creature he had ever met. Your arrival is well-timed, the Tist Edor said as Orbin entered the carriage and settled down on the bench opposite, the acrid smell of his sweat wafting across. Although I was not aware that you personally oversee the daily activities of your agents. Orbin's thin lips creased in a smile. We have stumbled on some information that might be of interest to you, overseer. Another one of your non-existent conspiracies? The smile widened momentarily, a flicker. If you are referring to the Balkando conspiracy, alas, that one belongs to the Liberty Consign. The information we have acquired concerns your people. My people? Very well. Brawl Handar waited. Outside, the two agents were dragging their prisoner away, and around them the flow of humanity resumed, furtive in their avoidance. A party was sighted west of Blue Rose. Two tissed Edur, one of them white-skinned. This latter one, I believe, has become known as the White Crow. The most disturbing title for us leathery, by the way. He blinked, the lids heavy. Accompanying them were three leathery, two female and one an escaped slave with the ownership tattoos of the Hiroth tribe. Brol forced himself to remain expressionless, although a tightness gripped his chest. This is none of your business. Do you have more details as to their precise location? They were heading east to the mountains. There are three passes, only two open this early in the season. Brawl Handar slowly nodded. The Emperor's Karisnan are also capable of determining their general whereabouts. Those passes are blocked. He paused, then said, It is as Hanan Mossag predicted. Orbin's dark eyes studied him from between folds of fat. I am reminded of Edor efficiency. Yes. The man known as Truthfinder went on. The patriotists have questions regarding this white-skinned Tist Edor, this white crow. From which tribe does he hail? None. He is not Tist Edor. Ha! Ah, I am surprised. The description... Brol Handar said nothing. Overseer, can we assist? Unnecessary at this time, Brol replied. I am most curious as to why you have not already closed in on this party and effected a capture. My sources indicate that the Tist Edor is none other than Fear Sengar, the Emperor's brother. As I said, the passes are blocked. Ah, then you are tightening the net even as we speak. Brol Handar smiled. Orbin, you said earlier the Balkando conspiracy is under the purview of the Liberty Consign. By that, are you truly telling me that the Patriotists are without interest in that matter? Not at all. The Consign makes use of our network on a regular basis. For which you are no doubt rewarded. Of course. I find myself... Orbin raised a hand, head cocking. You will have to excuse me, overseer. I hear alarms. He rose with a grunt, pushing open the carriage door. Bemused, Brawl said nothing, watching as the lethary left. Once the door was closed, he reached to a small compartment and withdrew a woven ball filled with scented grasses, then held it to his face. A tug on a cord stirred the driver to collect up the traces. The carriage lurched as it rolled forward. Brawl could hear the alarms now, a frantic cacophony. Leaning forward, he spoke into the voice tube. Take us to those bells, driver. He hesitated, then added, No hurry. The dream garrison commanded a full dozen stone buildings situated on a low hill north of the city centre. Armory, stables, barracks, and command headquarters were all heavily fortified, although the complex was not walled. Dreen had been a city-state once, centuries past, and after a protracted war with the All, the beleaguered king had invited Lethary troops to effect victory against the nomads. 
Decades later, evidence had come out that the conflict itself had been the result of lethary manipulations. In any case, the lethary troops had never left. The king accepted the title of vizier, and in a succession of tragic accidents, he and his entire line were wiped out. But that was history now, the kind that was met with indifference. Four principal avenues extended out from the garrison's parade grounds, the one leading northward converging with the gate road that led to the city wall and the north coast track, the least frequented of the three landward routes to and from the city. In the shadows beneath the gabled balcony of a palatial estate just beyond the armory, on the North Avenue, a clear line of sight was available for the short, lithe figure standing in the cool gloom. A rough woven hood hid the features, although had anyone bothered to pause in passing, squinting hard, they would have been startled to see the glint of crimson scales where the face should have been, and eyes hidden in black-rimmed slits. But there was something about the figure that encouraged inattention. Gazes slid past, rarely comprehending that, indeed, someone stood in those shadows. He had positioned himself there just before dawn, and it was now late afternoon. Eyes fixed on the garrison, the messengers entering and exiting the headquarters, the visitation of a half-dozen noble merchants, the purchasing of horses, scrap metal, saddles, and other sundry materiel. He studied the skin hides on the round shields of the lancers, flattened faces, the skin darkened to somewhere between purple and ochre, making the tattooing subtle and strangely beautiful. Late afternoon, the shadows lengthening, and the figure made note of two lethary men passing across his field of vision for the second time. Their lack of attention seemed conspicuous, and some instinct told the cowled figure that it was time to leave. As soon as they had passed by, heading up the street, westward, the figure stepped out from the shadows, walked swiftly and silently after the two men. He sensed their sudden heightened awareness, and perhaps something like alarm. Moments before catching up to them, he turned right into an alley leading north. Fifteen paces in, he found a dark recess in which he could hide. He drew back his cloak and cinched it, freeing his arms and hands. A dozen heartbeats passed before he heard their footfalls. He watched them walk past, cautious, both with drawn knives. One whispered something to the other, and they hesitated. The figure allowed his right foot to scrape as he stepped forward. They spun round. The Aldan Kadaran whip was a whisper as it snaked out. The leather, studded with coin-sized, dagger-sharp, overlapping half-moon blades, flickering out in a gleaming arc that licked both men across their throats, blood sprayed. He watched them crumple. The blood flowed freely, more from the man who had been on the left, spreading across the greasy cobbles. Stepping close to the other victim, he unsheathed a knife and plunged it point-first into his throat. Then, with practiced familiarity, he cut off the man's face, taking skin, muscle, and hair. He repeated the ghastly task with the other man. Two fewer agents of the patriotists to contend with. Of course, they worked in threes, one always at a distance, following the first two. From the garrison, the first alarms sounded, a shrill collection of bells that trilled out through the dusty air above the buildings. Folding up his grisly trophies and pushing them beneath a fold in the loose Rodara wool shirt that covered his scaled hauberk, the figure set off along the alley, making for the north gate. A squad of the city guard appeared at the far mouth, five armoured, helmed lethary with short swords and shields. Upon seeing them, the figure sprinted forward, freeing the Cadaran whip in his left hand, while in his right hand he shook free the Rigtha crescent axe from the over-under strips of rawhide that had held it against his hip. A thick haft, as long as a grown man's thigh bone, to which each end was affixed a three-quarter moon iron blade, their planes perpendicular to each other. Cadaran and Rigtha, ancient weapons of the Aldan, their mastery virtually unknown among the tribes for at least a century. The constabulary had, accordingly, never before faced such weapons. At ten paces from the first three guardsmen, the whip lashed out, a blurred sideways figure eight that spawned screams and gouts of blood that spilled almost black in the alley's gloom. Two of the lethary reeled back. 
The lithe, wiry figure closed on the last man in the front row. Right hand slid along the haft to run up against a flange beneath the left side crescent blade, the haft slapping parallel to the underside of his forearm as he brought the weapon up, blocking a desperate slash from the guard's short sword. Then, as they all threw his elbow forward, the right side blade flashed out, cutting at the man's face, connecting just below the helm's rim, chopping through the nasal ridge and frontal bone before dipping into the soft matter of his brain. The tapered, sharp crescent blade slid back out with ease as they all slipped past the falling guard, whip returning from an over-the-head gather to hiss out, wrapping round the neck of the fourth lethery, who shrieked, dropping his sword as he scrabbled at the deadly blades, as they all dropped into a crouch, his right hand sliding the length of the rigtha haft to abut the flanged base of the right blade, then slashing out. The fifth guard jerked his shield upward to block, but too late. The blade caught him across the eyes. A tug on the whip decapitated the fourth guard. The all released his hold on the cataran's handle, and gripping the rigtha at both ends, stepped close to slam the haft into the last guard's throat, crushing the windpipe. Collecting the whip, he moved on. A street, the sound of lancers off to the right. The gate, fifty paces to the left, now knotted with guards, heads turning his way. He raced straight for them. Atripreda Bivat took personal command of a troop of lancers. Twenty riders at her back, she led her horse at a canter, following the trail of a bloodbath. The two patriotist agents midway down the alley, five city guardsmen at the far end. Riding out onto the street, she angled her mount to the left, drawing her longsword as she neared the gate. Bodies everywhere, twenty or more, and only two seemed to be still alive. Bivat stared from beneath the rim of her helm, cold sweat prickling awake beneath her armor. Blood everywhere. On the cobbles, splashed high on the walls and the gate itself. Dismembered limbs. The stench of vacated bowels, spilled intestines. One of the survivors was screaming, head whipping back and forth. Both his hands had been sliced off. Just beyond the gate, Bivat saw as she reined in, four horses were down, their riders sprawled out on the road. Drifting dust indicated that the others from the first troop to arrive were riding in pursuit. The other survivor stumbled up to her. He had taken a blow to the head, the helm dented on one side and blood flowing down that side of his face and neck. In his eyes, as he stared up at her, a look of horror. He opened his mouth, but no words came forth. Bivat scanned the area once more, then turned to her finad. Take the troop through, go after them. Get your weapons out, damn you! She glared back down at the guardsmen. How many were there? He gaped. More guardsmen were arriving. A cutter hurried to the screaming man who had lost his hands. Did you hear my question? Bivat hissed. He nodded, then said, One. One man at Tripreda. One? Ridiculous. Describe him. Scales. His face was scales. Red as blood. A rider from her troop returned from the road. The first troop of lancers are all dead at Tripreda, he said, his tone high and pinched. Further down the road, all the horses but one. Sir, should we follow? Should you follow? You damned fool! Of course you should follow! Stay on his trail! A voice spoke behind her. That description, Atripreda. She twisted round in her saddle. Albin Truthfinder, sheathed in sweat, stood amidst the carnage, his small eyes fixed on her. Bivat bared her teeth in a half-snarl. Yes! She snapped. Red mask. None other. The commander of the patriotists in Dreen pursed his lips, glanced down to scan the corpses on all sides. It seems, he said, his exile from the tribes is at an end. Yes, errant save us. Brol Handar stepped down from the carriage and surveyed the scene of battle. He could not imagine what sort of weapons the attackers had used to achieve the sort of damage he saw before him. The Atripreda had taken charge, as more soldiery appeared, 
while Orbin Truthfinder stood in the shade of the gate blockhouse entrance, silent and watching. The overseer approached Bivat. At Ripreda, he said, I see none but your own dead here. She glared at him, yet it was a look containing more than simple anger. He saw fear in her eyes. The city was infiltrated, she said, by an all-warrior. This is the work of one man? It is the least of his talents. Ah, then you know who this man is. Overseer, I am rather busy. Tell me of him. Grimacing, she gestured him to one side of the gate. They both had to step carefully over corpses sprawled on the slick cobblestones. I think I have sent a troop of lancers out to their deaths, overseer. My mood is not conducive to lengthy conversation. Oblige me. If a war party of all Dan warriors is at the very edge of this city, there must be an organized response. One, he added, seeing her offended look, involving the Tist Edor as well as your units. After a moment she nodded. Red Mask, the only name by which we know him. Even the Aldan have but legends of his origins. And they are? Letor Anict. Brolhandar hissed in anger and glared across at Orbin, who had moved within hearing range. Why is it that every disaster begins with that man's name? Bivat resumed. There was skirmishing years ago now between a rich all tribe and the Factor. Simply, Letor Anict coveted the tribe's vast herds. He dispatched agents who one night entered an all camp and succeeded in kidnapping a young woman, one of the clan leader's daughters. The all, you see, were in the habit of stealing leathery children. In any case, that daughter had a brother. Red Mask, she nodded. A younger brother. Anyway, the factor adopted the girl into his household, and before too long she was indebted to him. No doubt without even being aware of that. Yes, I understand. And so, in order to purchase that debt and her own freedom, Leto demanded her father's herds. Yes, more or less. And the clan leader agreed. Alas, even as the factor's forces approached the all camp with their precious cargo, the girl plunged the knife into her own heart. Thereafter, things got rather confused. Leto Anik's soldiers attacked the all camp, killing everyone. The factor decided he would take the herds anyway. Yes. It turned out, however, that there was one survivor. A few years later, as the skirmishes grew fiercer, the factor's troops found themselves losing engagement after engagement. Ambushes were turned, and the name of Red Mask was first heard, a new war chief. Now what follows is even less precise than what I have described thus far. It seems there was a gathering of the clans, and Red Mask spoke, argued, that is, with the elders. He sought to unify the clans against the lethary threat, but the elders could not be convinced. In his rage, Red Mask spoke unwise words. The elders demanded he retract them. He refused, and so was exiled. It is said he traveled east into the wild lands between here and Colance. What is the significance of the mask? Bivat shook her head. I don't know. There is a legend that he killed a dragon in the time immediately following the slaughter of his family. No more than a child, which makes the tale unlikely. She shrugged. And so he has returned, Brolhandar said. Or some other all-warrior has adopted the mask and so seeks to drive fear into your hearts. No, it was him. He uses a bladed whip and a two-headed axe. The weapons themselves are virtually mythical. The overseer frowned at her. Mythical? All legends hold that their people once fought a war, far to the east, when the all dwelt in the wildlands. The Kadaran and Rigtha were weapons designed to deal with that enemy. I have no more details than what I have just given you, except that it appears that whatever that enemy was, it wasn't human. Every tribe has tales of past wars, an age of heroes. Overseer, the Aldan legends are not like that. Oh? Yes, first of all, the All lost that war. That is why they fled west. Have there been no lethary expeditions into the wild lands? 
not in decades, overseer. After all, we are clashing with the various territories and kingdoms along that border. The last expedition was virtually wiped out, a single survivor driven mad by what she had seen. She spoke of something called the hissing night, the voice of death, apparently. In any case, her madness could not be healed, and so she was put to death. Brol Handar considered that for a time. An officer had arrived and was waiting to speak with the Atri Prida. Thank you, he said to Bivat, then turned away. Overseer, he faced her again. Yes? If Red Mask succeeds this time, with the tribes, I mean, well, we shall indeed have need of the Tist Edur. His brows rose. Of course, Atri Prida. And maybe this way I can reach the ear of the Emperor and Hanan Mossag. Damn this letter, Anikt. What has he brought down upon us now? He rode the leathery horse hard, leaving the north road and cutting east across freshly tilled fields that had once been all done grazing land. His passage drew the attention of farmers, and from the last hamlet he skirted, three stationed soldiers had saddled horses and set off in pursuit. In a dip of the valley Red Mask had just left, they met their deaths in a chorus of animal and human screams, piercing but short-lived. A bluster of Rinazan spun in a raucous cloud over the all-warrior's head, driven away from their favoured hosts by the violence, their wings beating like tiny drums, and their long serrated tails hissing in the air as they tracked Red Mask. He had long since grown used to their ubiquitous presence. Residents of the wild lands, the weasel-sized flying reptiles were far from home, unless their hosts, in the valley behind him and probably preparing another ambush, could be called home. He slowed his horse, shifting in discomfort at the awkward leathery saddle. No one would reach him now, he knew, and there was no point in running this beast into the ground. The enemy had been confident in their city garrison, brazen with their trophies, and Red Mask had learned much in the night and the day he had spent watching them. Blue Rose lancers properly stirruped and nimble on their mounts, far more formidable than the foot soldiers of years before. And thus far, since his return, he had seen of his own people only abandoned camps, drover tracks from smallish herds and disused teepee rings. It was as if his home had been decimated and all the survivors had fled, and at the only scene of battle he had come upon there had been naught but the corpses of foreigners. The sun was low on the horizon behind him, dusk closing in, when he came upon the first burned Aldan encampment, a year old, maybe more, white bones jutting from the grasses, blackened stumps from the hut frames, a dusty smell of desolation. No one had come to retrieve the fallen, to lift the butchered bodies onto lashed platforms, freeing the souls to dance with the carrion birds. The scene raised grim memories. He rode on. As the darkness gathered, the Rinazan slowly drifted away, and Red Mask could hear the double thump, one set to either side, as his two companions, their bloody work done, moved up into flanking positions, barely visible in the gloom. The Rinazan settled onto the horizontal, scaled backs to lick splashed gore and pluck ticks, to lift their heads in snapping motions, inhaling sharply to draw in the biting insects that buzzed too close. Red Mask allowed his eyes to half close. He had been awake for most of two days. With Sag Churok, the hulking male, gliding over the ground to his right, and Gunth Mack, the young drone that was even now growing into a female on his left, he could not be more secure. Like the Rinazan, the two Kachain Chemal seemed content, even in this strange land and so far away from their kin. Content to follow Red Mask, to protect him, to kill Lethary. And he had no idea why. Silchas Rowan's eyes were reptilian in the lantern light. No more appropriate a sight possible given the chamber they now found themselves in, as far as Seren Pedak was concerned. The stone walls, curving upward to a dome, were carved in overlapping scales. The unbroken pattern left her feeling disoriented, slightly nauseous. 
She settled onto the floor, blinked the grit from her eyes. It must be near morning, she judged. They had been walking tunnels, ascending inclines and spiraling ramps for most of an entire night. The air was stale, despite the steady downward flow of currents, as if it was gathering ghosts with every chamber and down every corridor it traversed. She glanced away from her regard of Silchas Rowan, irritated at her own fascination with the savage, unearthly warrior, the way he could hold himself so perfectly still, even the rise and fall of his chest barely discernible. Buried for millennia, yet he did indeed live. Blood flowed in his veins, thoughts rose grimed with the dust of disuse. When he spoke, she could hear the weight of barrow stones. It was unimaginable to her how a person could so suffer without going mad. Then again, perhaps he was mad, something hidden deep within him, either constrained by exigencies or simply awaiting release. As a killer, for that surely was what he was, he was both thorough and dispassionate, as if mortal lives could be reduced in meaning, reduced to surgical judgment, obstacle or ally. Nothing else mattered. She understood the comfort of seeing the world in that manner. The ease of its simplicity was inviting. But for her, impossible. One could not will oneself blind to the complexities of the world. Yet for Silchas Rowan, such seeming complexities were without relevance. He had found a kind of certainty, and it was unassailable. Alas, Fear Sengar was not prepared to accept the hopelessness of his constant assaults upon Silchas Rowan. The Tist Edor stood near the triangular portal they would soon pass through, as if impatient with this rest stop. You think, he now said to Silchas Ruin, that I know virtually nothing of that ancient war, the invasion of this realm. The albino Tist Andy's eyes shifted, fixed on Fear Sengar, but Silchas Ruin made no reply. The women remembered, Fear said. They passed the tales to their daughters. Generation after generation. Yes, I know that Scabandari drove a knife into your back, there on that hill overlooking the field of battle. Yet was this the first betrayal? If he was expecting a reaction, he was disappointed. Udinas loosed a low laugh from where he sat with his back to the scaled wall. You two are so pointless, he said. Who betrayed whom? What does it matter? It's not as if we're relying on trust to keep us together. Tell me, Fear Sengar, once master of mine, does your brother have any idea of who Ruin is? Where he came from? I would suggest not, else he would have come after us personally with ten thousand warriors at his back. Instead, they toy with us. Aren't you even curious why? No one spoke for a half-dozen heartbeats, then Kettle giggled, drawing all eyes to her. Her blink was owlish. They want us to find what we're looking for first, of course. Then why block our attempts to travel inland? Seren demanded. Because they know it's the wrong direction. How could they know that? Kettle's small, dust-stained hands fluttered like bats in the gloom. The crippled god told them. That's how. The crippled god said it's not yet time to travel east. He's not ready for open war yet. He doesn't want us to go into the wildlands where all the secrets are waiting. Seren Pedak stared at the child. Who in Erin's name is the crippled god? The one who gave Rulad his sword, Aquitor. The true power behind the Tist Edur. Kettle threw up her hands. Skabandar is dead. The bargain was Hanan Mossack's, and the coin was Rulad Sengar. Fear stood with bad teeth, staring at Kettle with something like terror in his eyes. How do you know this? he demanded. The dead told me. They told me lots of things. So did the ones under the trees, the trapped ones. And they said something else, too. They said the vast wheel is about to turn one last time before it closes. It closes because it has to, because that's how he made it. To tell him all he needs to know. To tell him the truth. Tell who? 
Saren asked, scowling in confusion. Him, the one who's coming. You'll see. She ran over to where fear stood, took him by one hand and started tugging. We need to hurry or they'll get us. And if they get us, Silchas Ruin will have to kill everyone. I could strangle that child. But she pushed herself to her feet once more. Udinas was laughing. She was inclined to strangle him as well. Silchas, she said as she moved close. Do you have any idea what Kettle was talking about? No, Aquitor. But, he added, I intend to keep listening. Chapter 3 We came upon the fiend on the eastern slope of the Radagar Spine. It was lying in a shallow gorge formed by flash flooding, and the stench pervading the hot air told us of rotting flesh, and indeed, upon examination, conducted with utmost caution on this, the very day following the ambush on our camp by unknown attackers, we discovered that the fiend was, while still alive, mortally wounded. How to describe such a demonic entity? When upright, it would have balanced on two hugely muscled hind legs, reminiscent of that of a Shaba, the flightless bird found on the isles of the Draconian archipelago, yet in comparison much larger here. The hip level of the fiend, when standing, would have been at a man's eye level. Long-tailed, the weight of the fiend's torso evenly balanced by its hips, thrusting the long neck and head far forward, the spine made horizontal. Two long forelimbs, thickly bound in muscle and hardened scales providing natural armor, ended not in grasping talons or hands, but enormous swords, iron-bladed, that seemed fused, metal to bone, with the wrists. The head was snouted, like that of a crocodile, such as those found in the mud of the southern shoreline of the Blue Rose Sea, yet again here much larger. Desiccation had peeled the lips back to reveal jagged rows of fangs, each one dagger long. The eyes, clouded with approaching death, were nonetheless uncanny and alien to our senses. The Atripreda, bold as ever, strode forward to deliver the fiend from its suffering, with a sword thrust into the soft tissue of its throat. With this fatal wound, the fiend loosed a death cry that struck us with pain, for the sound it voiced was beyond our range of hearing, yet it burst in our skulls with such ferocity that blood was driven from our nostrils, eyes, and ears. One other detail is worth noting, before I expound on the extent of said injuries. The wounds visible upon the fiend were most curious, elongated, curving slashes, perhaps from some form of tentacle, but a tentacle bearing sharp teeth, whilst other wounds were shorter but deeper in nature, invariably delivered to a region vital to locomotion or other similar dispensation of limbs, severing tendons and so forth. Factor Brenida Anict, Expedition into the Wildlands Official Annals of Pufanan Ibiris He was not a man in bed. Oh, his parts functioned well enough, but in every other way he was a child, this emperor of a thousand deaths. But worst of all, Nisal decided, was what happened afterwards, as he fell into that half-sleep, half-something else, limbs spasming, endless words tumbling from him in a litany of pleading, punctuated by despairing sobs that scraped the scented air of the chamber. And before long, after she'd escaped the bed itself, drawing a robe about her and taking position near the painted scene in the false window, five paces distant, she would watch him crawl down onto the floor and make his way as if crippled from some spinal injury, the ever-present sword trailing in one hand across the room to the corner, where he would spend the rest of the night, curled up, locked in some eternal nightmare. A thousand deaths lived through night upon night. A thousand. An exaggeration, of course, a few hundred at most. Emperor Rulad's torment was not the product of a fevered imagination, nor born of a host of anxieties. What haunted him were the truths of his past. She was able to identify some of his mutterings, in particular the one that dominated his nightmares, for she had been there. 
in the throne room, witness to Rulad's non-death, weeping there on the floor, all slick with his spilled blood, with a corpse on his throne and Rulad's own slayer lying half upright against the dais, stolen away by poison. Hanan Mossag's pathetic slither towards that throne had been halted by the demon that had appeared to collect the body of Bryce Bedict, and the almost indifferent sword thrust that killed Rulad as the apparition made its way out. The Emperor's awakening shriek had turned her heart into a frozen lump, a cry so brutally raw that she felt its fire in her own throat. But it was what followed a short time after his return that stalked Rulad with a thousand dripping blades. To die, only to return, is never to escape. Never escape anything. Wounds closing, he had lifted himself up, onto his hands and knees, still gripping the cursed sword, the weapon that would not let go. Weeping, drawing in ragged breaths, he crawled towards the throne, sagging down once more when he reached the dais. Nissal had stepped out from where she had hidden moments earlier. Her mind was numb, the suicide of her king, her lover, and the eunuch, Nefadas. The shocks, one upon another in this terrible throne room, the deaths tumbling like crowded gravestones in a flooded field. Triban Gnoll, ever the pragmatist, knelt before the new emperor, pledging his service with the ease of an eel sliding under a new rock. The first consort had been witness as well, but she could not see Turadal Brizard now, as Rulad, blood-wet coins gleaming, twisted round on the step and bared his teeth at Hanan Mossag. Not yours, he said in a rasp. Rulad, Emperor, and you, Hanan Mossack, are my cedar. Warlock King no longer. My cedar, yes. Your wife, dead, yes. Rulad lifted himself onto the dais, then rose, staring now at the dead lethary king, Esgara Diskanar. Then he reached out with his unburdened hand, grasped the front of the king's brocaded tunic, and dragged the corpse from the throne, letting it fall to one side, head crunching on the tiled floor. A shiver seemed to rack through Rulad. Then he sat on the throne and looked out, eyes settling once more on Hanan Mossag. Seder, he said, in this our chamber you will ever approach us on your belly, as you do now. From the shadows at the far end of the throne room there came a phlegmatic cackle. Rulad flinched, then said, Now you will leave us, Cedar, and take that hag, Janol, and her son with you. Emperor, please, you must understand. Get out! The shriek jarred Nissal, and she hesitated, fighting the urge to flee, to get away from this place, from the court, from the city, from everything. Then his free hand snapped out, and without turning he said to her, not you, whore. You stay. Whore. That term is inappropriate, she said, then stiffened in fear, surprised by her own temerity. He fixed feverish eyes on her. Then incongruously he waved dismissively and spoke with sudden weariness. Of course, we apologize. Imperial concubine. His glittering face twisted in a half-smile. Your king should have taken you as well. He was being selfish, or perhaps his love for you was so deep that he could not bear inviting you into death. She said nothing, for in truth she had no answer to give him. Ah, we see the doubt in your eyes. Concubine, you have our sympathy. Know that we will not use you cruelly. He fell silent then as he watched Hanan Mossag drag himself back across the threshold of the chamber's grand entranceway. A half dozen more Tist Edua had appeared, tremulous in their furtive motions, their uncertainty at what they were witnessing. A hissed command from Hanan Mossag sent two into the room, each one drawing up the burlap over the mangled forms of Janal and Quillas, her son. The sound as they dragged the two flesh-filled sacks from the chamber was, to Nissal's ears, more grisly than anything else she had yet heard on this fell day. At the same time, the Emperor went on after a moment, the title and its attendant privileges remain, should you so desire. 
She blinked, feeling as if she was standing on shifting sand. You free me to choose, Emperor? A nod, the bleary red-shot eyes still fixed on the chamber's entranceway. Odinas, he whispered. Betrayer, you... you are not free to choose. Slave, my slave, I should never have trusted the darkness. Never! He flinched once more on the throne, eyes suddenly glittering. He comes! She had no idea whom he meant, but the raw emotion in his voice frightened her anew. What more could come on this terrible day? Voices outside, one of them sounding bitter, then diffident. She watched as a Tist Edor warrior strode into the throne room, Rulad's brother, one of them, the one who had left Rulad lying on the tiles, young, handsome in that way of the Edor, both alien and perfect. She tried to recall if she had heard his name. Troll, said the emperor in a rasp. Where is he? Where is fear? He has left. Left? Left us? Us. Yes, Rulad. Or do you insist I call you emperor? Expressions twisted across Rulad's coin-studded face, one after another. Then he grimaced and said, You left me too, brother. Left me bleeding on the floor. Do you think yourself different from Udinas? Less a betrayer than my lethary slave? Rulad, would that you were my brother of old. The one you sneered down upon? If it seemed I did that, then I apologize. Yes, you see the need for that now, don't you? Troll Sengar stepped forward. It's the sword, Rulat. It is cursed. Please throw it away. Destroy it. You've won the throne now. You don't need it any more. You are wrong, he bared his teeth, as if sickened by self-hatred. Without it, I am just Rulad, youngest son of Tomad. Without the sword, brother, I am nothing. Troll cocked his head. You have led us to conquest. I will stand beside you. So will Binadas and our father. You have won that throne, Rulad. You need not fear Hanan Mossag. That miserable worm? You think me frightened of him? The sword tip made a snapping sound as its point jumped free of the tiles. Rulad aimed the weapon at Troll's chest. I am the Emperor! No, you're not, Troll replied. Your sword is Emperor. Your sword and the power behind it. Liar! Rulad shrieked. Nissal saw Troll flinch back, then steady himself. Prove it. The Emperor's eyes widened. Shatter the sword. Sister's blessing, just let it fall from your hand. Even that, Rulad, just that, let it fall. No! I know what you want, brother. You will take it. I see you tensed, ready to dive for it. I see the truth! The weapon was shuddering between them, as if eager for blood, anyone's blood. Troll shook his head. I want it shattered, Rulad. You cannot stand at my side, the Emperor hissed. Too close. There is betrayal in your eyes. You left me, crippled on the floor. He raised his voice. Where are my warriors? Into the chamber. Your Emperor commands it. A half dozen Edor warriors suddenly appeared, weapons out. Troll, Rulad whispered. I see you have no sword. Now it is for you to drop your favoured weapon your spear, and your knives. What? Do you fear I will slay you? Show me the trust you claim in yourself. Guide me with your honor, brother. She did not know it then. She did not understand enough of the Edor way of life, but she saw something in Troll's face, a kind of surrender, but a surrender that was far more complicated, fraught, than simply disarming himself there before his brother. Levels of resignation, settling one upon another, the descent of impossible burdens, and the knowledge shared between the two brothers of what such a surrender signified. She did not realize at the time what Troll's answer would mean, the way it was done, not in his own name, not for himself, but for fear. 
fear Sengar more than anyone else. She did not realize then the immensity of his sacrifice as he unslung his spear and let it clatter to the tiles, as he removed his knife belt and threw it to one side. There should have been triumph in Rulad's tortured eyes then, but there wasn't. Instead, a kind of confusion clouded his gaze, made him shy away as if seeking help. His attention found and focused upon the six warriors, and he gestured with the sword and said in a broken voice, Tralsenga is to be shorn. He will cease to exist for ourself, for all Edo. Take him, bind him, take him away. Neither had she realized what that judgment, that decision, had cost Rulad himself. Free to choose, she had chosen to remain, for reasons she could not elucidate even in her own mind. Was there pity? Perhaps. Ambition, without question, for she had sensed in that predatory manner demanded of life in the court that there was a way through to him, a way to replace, without all the attendant history, those who were no longer at Rulad's side. Not one of his warrior sycophants, they were worthless, ultimately, and she knew that Rulad was well aware of that truth. In the end, she could see he had no one. Not his brother, Benadas, who, like Troll, proved too close and thus too dangerous for the Emperor to keep around, and so he had sent him away, seeking champions and scattered kin of the Edo tribes. As for his father, Tomad, again the suborning role proved far too awkward to accommodate. Of the surviving Karisnan of Hanan Mosag, fully half had been sent to accompany Tomad and Binadas, so as to keep the new cedar weak. And all the while, as these decisions were made, as the shorning was conducted, in secrecy, away from lethary eyes, and as Nissal maneuvered herself into the Emperor's bed, the Chancellor, Triban Gnoll, had watched on, with the hooded eyes of a raptor. The consort, Turadal Brizad, had vanished, although Nissal had heard rumors among the court servants that he had not gone far that he haunted the lesser-traveled corridors and subterranean mysteries of the old palace, ghostly and rarely more than half seen. She was undecided on the veracity of such claims. Even so, if he were indeed hiding still in the palace, she realized that such a thing would not surprise her in the least. It did not matter. Rulad had no wife, after all. The Emperor's lover, a role she was accustomed to, although it did not seem that way, Rulad was so young, so different from Esgara Diskanar. His spiritual wounds were too deep to be healed by her touch, and so, even as she found herself in a position of eminence, of power, close as she was to the throne, she felt helpless and profoundly alone. She stood watching the Emperor of Letha writhing as he curled up ever tighter in the corner of the room. Among the whimpers, groans, and gasps, he spat out fragments of his conversation with Troll, his forsaken brother. And again and again, in hoarse whispers, Rulad begged forgiveness. Yet a new day awaited them, she reminded herself, and she would see this broken man gather himself, collect the pieces, and then take his place seated on the imperial throne, looking out with red-rimmed eyes, his fragmented armor of coins gleaming dull in the light of the traditional torches lining the chamber's walls, and where those coins were missing there was naught but scarred tissue, crimson-ringed wheels of malformed flesh, and then this ghastly apparition would, in the course of that day, proceed to astonish her. Eschewing the old protocols of imperial rule, the Emperor of a Thousand Deaths would sit through a presentation of petitions, an ever-growing number of citizens of the Empire, poor and rich alike, who had come to accept the Imperial invitation, feeding their courage to come face to face with their foreign ruler. For bell after bell, Rulad would mete out justice as best he could. His struggles to understand the lives of the Lethary had touched her in unexpected ways— there was, she had come to believe, a decent soul beneath all that accursed trauma. And it was then that Nissal found herself most needed, although more often of late it was the Chancellor who dominated the advising, and she had come to realize that Triban Gnoll had begun to view her as a rival. He was the principal organizer of the petitions, the filter that kept the numbers manageable, 
and his office had burdened accordingly. That his expanded staff also served as a vast and invasive web of spies in the palace was of course a given. Thus Nissal watched her emperor, who had ascended the throne wading through blood, strive for benign rule, seeking a sensitivity too honest and awkward to be other than genuine, and it was breaking her heart. For power had no interest in integrity, even as Gara Diskanar, so full of promise in his early years, had come to raise a wall between himself and the empire's citizens in the last decade of his rule. Integrity was too vulnerable to abuse by others, and Asgara had suffered that betrayal again and again, and perhaps most painfully of all from his own wife, Janal, and then their son. Too easy to dismiss the burden of such wounds, the depth of such scars. And Rulad, this youngest son of an Edur noble family, had been a victim of betrayal of what must have been true friendship with the slave Udinas, and in the threads of shared blood from his very own brothers. But each day he overcame the torments of the night just gone. Nissal wondered, however, how much longer that could last. She alone was witness to his inner triumph, to that extraordinary war he waged with himself every morning. The Chancellor, for all his spies, knew nothing of it. She was certain of that, and that made him dangerous in his ignorance. She needed to speak to Triban Gnoll. She needed to mend this bridge. But I will not be his spy. A most narrow bridge, then, one to be trod with caution. Rulad stirred in the gloom, and then he whispered, I know what you want, brother. So guide me, guide me with your honor. Ah, Trollsengar, wherever your spirit now lurks, does it please you? Does this please you, to know that your shawning failed? So that you have now returned to so haunt, Rulad? Guide me, Rulad croaked. The sword scraped on the floor, rippling over mosaic stones like cold laughter. It is not possible, I'm afraid. Bruthentrana studied the lethery standing before him for a long moment and said nothing. The Chancellor's gaze flicked away as if distracted, and seemed moments from dismissing the Edoa warrior outright. Then, perhaps realizing that might be unwise, he cleared his throat and spoke in a tone of sympathy. The Emperor insists on these petitions, as you are aware, and they consume his every waking moment. They are, if you forgive me, his obsession. His brows lifted a fraction. How can a true subject question their emperor's love of justice? The citizens have come to adore him. They have come to see him for the honorable ruler he is in truth. That transition has taken some time, I admit, and involved immense effort on our part. I wish to speak to the emperor, Bruthen said, his tone matching precisely the previous time he had spoken those words. Triban Gnoll sighed. Presumably you wish to make your report regarding Invigilator Karos Invictad and his patriotists in person. I assure you I do forward said reports. He frowned at the test Edor, then nodded and said, Very well, I will convey your wishes to His Highness Bruthentrana. If need be, place me among the petitioners. That will not be necessary. The Tist Edor gazed at the Chancellor for a half-dozen heartbeats. Then he turned about and left the office. In the larger room beyond waited a crowd of lethery. A score of faces turned to regard Bruthen as he threaded his way through, faces nervous, struggling with fear, while others studied the Tist Edor with eyes that gave away nothing. The Chancellor's agents, the ones who, Bruthen suspected, went out each morning to round up the day's petitioners, then coached them in what to say to their emperor. Ignoring the lethery as they parted to let him pass, he made his way out into the corridor, then onward through the maze of chambers, hallways, and passages that composed the palace. He saw very few other Tist Edur, barring one of Hanan Mossag's Karisnan, bent backed and walking with one shoulder scraping against a wall, dark eyes flickering and acknowledgement as he limped along. Bruthentrana made his way into the wing of the palace closest to the river, 
and here the air was clammy, the corridors mostly empty. While the flooding that had occurred during the early stages of construction had been rectified by an ingenious system of subsurface pylons, it seemed nothing could dispel the damp. Holes had been knocked in outer walls to create a flow of air, to little effect apart from filling the musty gloom with the scent of river mud and decaying plants. Bruthen walked through one such hole, emerging out onto a mostly broken-up cobble path, with felled trees rotting amidst high grasses off to his left and the foundations of a small building to his right. Abandonment lingered in the still air like suspended pollen, and Bruthen was alone as he ascended the path's uneven slope to arrive at the edge of a cleared area, at the other end of which rose the ancient tower of the Azath, with the lesser structures of the Jaghut to either side. In this clearing there were grave markers, set out in no discernible order, half-buried urns, wax-sealed at the mouth, from which emerged weapons, swords, broken spears, axes, maces, trophies of failure, a stunted forest of iron. The fallen champions, the residents of a most prestigious cemetery, all had killed Rulad at least once, some more than once, the greatest of these, an almost full-blood Tarthanal, had slain the Emperor seven times, and Bruthen could remember with absolute clarity the look of growing rage and terror in that Tarthanal's bestial face each time his fallen opponent arose, renewed, stronger and deadlier than he had been only moments earlier. He entered the bizarre necropolis, eyes drifting across the various weapons, once so lovingly cared for, many of them bearing names, but now sheathed in rust. At the far end, slightly separated from all the others, stood an empty urn. Months earlier, out of curiosity, he had reached down into it and found a silver cup, the cup that had contained the poison that killed three lethary in the throne room, that had killed Bryce Bedict. No ashes, even his sword had disappeared. Bruthentrana suspected that if this man were to return now, he would face Rulad again and do what he did before. No, it was more than suspicion, a certainty. Unseen by Rulad, as the new emperor lay there, cut to shreds on the floor, Bruthen had edged into the chamber to see for himself. And in that moment's fearful glance, he had discerned the appalling precision of that butchery. Bryce Bedict had been perfunctory, like a scholar dissecting a weak argument, an effort on his part no greater than tying on his moccasins. Would that he had seen the duel itself, that he had witnessed the artistry of this tragically slain lethary swordsman. He stood, looking down at the dusty web-covered urn, and prayed for Bryce Bedick's return. A pattern was taking shape, incrementally, inexorably. Yet the errant, once known as Turadal Brizard, consort to Queen Janal, could not discern its meaning. The sensation of unease, of dread, was new to him. Indeed, he considered one could not imagine a more awkward state of mind for a god, here in the heart of his realm. Oh, he had known times of violence. He had walked the ashes of dead empires, but his own sense of destiny was, even then, ever untarnished, inviolate and absolute. And to make matters worse, patterns were his personal obsession, held to with a belief in his mastery of that arcane language, a mastery beyond challenge. Then who is it who plays with me now? He stood in the gloom, listening to the trickle of water seeping down some unseen wall, and stared down at the sedents, the stone tiles of the holds, the puzzle floor that was the very foundation of his realm. The sedents. My tiles, mine. I am the errant. This is my game. While before him the pattern ground on, the rumbling of stones too low and deep to hear, yet their resonance grated in his bones. Disparate pieces coming together, a function hidden until the last moment, when all is too late, when the closure denies every path of escape. Do you expect me to do nothing? I am not just one more of your victims. I am the errant. By my hand, every fate is turned, 
All that seems random is by my design. This is an immutable truth. It has ever been. It shall ever be. Still, the taste of fear was on his tongue, as if he'd been sucking on dirtied coins day after day, running the wealth of an empire through his mouth. But is that bitter flow inward or out? The grinding whisper of motion, all resolution of the images carved into the tiles, lost. Not a single hold would reveal itself. The sedents had been this way since the day Asgara Diskanar died. The errant would be a fool to disregard linkage, but that path of reason had yet to lead him anywhere. Perhaps it was not Asgara's death that mattered, but the cedars. He never liked me much, and I stood and watched as the Tist Edor edged to one side, as he flung his spear, transfixing Kuru Khan, killing the greatest cedar since the First Empire. My game, I'd thought at the time. But now I wonder. Maybe it was Kuru Khan's. And somehow it still plays out. I did not warn him of that imminent danger, did I? Before his last breath rattled, he would have comprehended that omission. Has this damned mortal cursed me? Me, a god! Such a curse should be vulnerable. Not even Kuru Khan was capable of fashioning something that could not be dismantled by the errant. He need only understand its structure, all that pinned it in place, the hidden spikes guiding these tiles. What comes? The Empire is reborn, reinvigorated, revealing the veracity of the ancient prophecy. All is as I foresaw. His study of the blurred pavestones below the walkway became a glare. He hissed in frustration and watched his breath plume away in the chill. An unknown transformation, in which I see naught but the ice of my own exasperation. Thus I see, but am blind, blind to it all. The cold, too, was a new phenomenon. The heat of power had bled away from this place. Nothing was as it should be. Perhaps at some point he would have to admit defeat. And then I will have to pay a visit to a little crabby old man, working as a servant to a worthless fool. Humble, I will come in search of answers. I let Terhol live, didn't I? That must count for something. Mail, I know you interfered last time, with unconscionable disregard for the rules, my rules, but I have forgiven you, and that too must count for something. Humility tasted even worse than fear. He was not yet ready for that. He would take command of the sedents, but to usurp the pattern he would first have to find its maker. Kuru Khan, he was unconvinced. There are disturbances in the pantheons, new and old. Chaos, the stink of violence. Yes, this is a god's meddling. Perhaps Male himself is to blame. No, it feels wrong. More likely he knows nothing, remains blissfully ignorant. Will it serve me to make him aware that something is awry? An empire reborn. True, the Tist Edur had their secrets, or at least they believed such truths were well hidden. They were not. An alien god had usurped them, and had made of a young Edur warrior an avatar, a champion, suitably flawed in grisly homage to the god's own pathetic dysfunctions. Power from pain, glory from degradation, themes in apposition. An empire reborn offered the promise of vigor, of expansion and longevity, none of which was, he had to admit, truly assured. And such are promises. The god shivered suddenly in the bitter cold air of this vast subterranean chamber shivered on this walkway above a swirling unknown. The pattern was taking shape, and when it did, it would be too late. It's too late. But there must be something we can do. I'm afraid not. It's dying, Master, and unless we take advantage of its demise right now, someone else will. The capybara fish had used its tentacles to crawl up the canal wall, pulling itself over the edge onto the walkway, 
where it flattened out, strangely spread-eagled, to lie mouth-gaping, gills gasping, watching the morning get cloudy as it expired. The beast was as long as a man is tall, as fat as a mutton merchant from the inner isles, and, to Tehol's astonishment, even uglier. Yet my heart breaks. Bug scratched his mostly hairless pate, then sighed. It's the unusually cold water, he said. These like their mud warm. Cold water? Can't you do something about that? Bug's hydrogation. You're branching out? No, I was just trying on the title. How do you hydrogate? I have no idea. Well, I have, but it's not quite a legitimate craft. Meaning it belongs in the realm of the gods? Mostly. Although, he said, brightening, with the recent spate of flooding and given my past experience in engineering dry foundations, I begin to see some possibilities. Can you soak investors? Bug grimaced. Always seeing the destructive side, aren't you, master? It's my opportunistic nature. Most people, he added, would view that as a virtue. Now, are you truly telling me you can't save this poor fish? Master, it's already dead. Is it? Oh. Well, I guess we now have supper. More like fifteen suppers. In any case, I have an appointment— so I will see you and the fish at home. Why, thank you, master. Didn't I tell you this morning walk would prove beneficial? Not for the capybara, alas. Granted. Oh, by the way, I need you to make me a list. Of what? Ah, I will have to tell you that later. As I said, I am late for an appointment. It just occurred to me, is this fish too big for you to carry by yourself? Well... Bug said, eyeing the carcass. It's small as far as capybara go. Remember the one that tried to mate with a galley? The betting on that outcome overwhelmed the drownings. I lost everything I had that day. Everything? Three copper docks, yes. What outcome did you anticipate? Why, small rowboats that could row themselves with big flippery paddles. You're late for your appointment, master. Wait! Don't look! I need to do something unseemly right now. Oh, master, really? Spies stood on street corners. Small squads of grey rain-caped patriotists moved through the throngs that parted to give them wide berth as they swaggered with gloved hands resting on their belted truncheons, and on their faces the bludgeon arrogance of thugs. Tehol Bedict, wearing his blanket like a sarong, walked with the benign grace of an ascetic from some obscure but harmless cult. Or at least he hoped so. To venture onto the streets of Letharas these days involved a certain measure of risk that had not existed in King Esgara Diskanar's days of pleasant neglect. While on the one hand this lent an air of intrigue and danger to every journey, including shopping for overripe root crops, there were also the taut nerves that one could not quell, no matter how many mouldy turnips one happened to be carrying. Compounding matters in this instance was the fact that he was indeed intent on subversion. One of the first victims in this new regime had been the Rat Catcher's Guild. Karos Invictad, the invigilator of the Patriotists, had acted on his first day of officialdom, dispatching fully a hundred agents to Scale House, the modest guild headquarters, whereupon they effected arrests on scores of rat-catchers, all of whom, it later turned out, were illusions, a detail unadvertised, of course, lest the dread Patriotists announce their arrival to cries of ridicule, which would not do. After all, tyranny has no sense of humour. Too thin-skinned, too thoroughly full of its own self-importance. Accordingly, it presents an almost overwhelming temptation. How can I not be excused the occasional mockery? Alas, the patriotists lacked flexibility in such matters. The deadliest weapon against them was derisive laughter, and they knew it. He crossed Quillas Canal at a lesser bridge, made his way into the less ostentatious North District, and eventually sauntered into a twisting, shadow-filled alley that had once been a dirt street, 
before the invention of four-wheeled wagons and side-by-side horse collars. Instead of the usual hovels and back doors that one might expect to find in such an alley, lining this one were shops that had not changed in any substantial way in the past seven hundred or so years. There, first to the right, the half-axed temple of herbs, smelling like a swamp sinkhole, wherein one could find a prune-faced witch who lived in a mud pit, with all her precious plants crowding the banks, or growing in the insect-flecked pool itself. It was said she had been born in that slime, and was only half human, and that her mother had been born there too, and her mother, and so on. That such conceptions were immaculate went without saying, since Tehol could hardly imagine any reasonable or even unreasonable man taking that particular plunge. Opposite the half-axe was the narrow-fronted entrance to a shop devoted to short lengths of rope and wooden poles, a man and a half high. Tehol had no idea how such a specialized enterprise could survive, especially in this unraveled, truncated market, yet its door had remained open for almost six centuries, locked up each night by a short length of rope and a wooden pole. The assortment proceeding down the alley was similar only in its peculiarity. Wooden stakes and pegs in one, sandal thongs in another. Not the sandals, just the thongs. A shop selling leaky pottery. Not an indication of incompetence, rather the pots were deliberately made to leak at various precise rates of loss. A place selling unopenable boxes, another toxic dyes. Ceramic teeth, bottles filled with the urine of pregnant women. Enormous amphorae containing dead pregnant women. The excreta of obese hogs and miniature pets, dogs, cats, birds, and rodents of all sorts, each one reduced in size through generation after generation of selective breeding. Tehol had seen guard dogs standing no higher than his ankle, and while cute and appropriately yappy, he had doubts as to their efficacy, although they were probably a terror for the thumbnail-sized mice and the cats that could ride an old woman's big toe, secured there by an ingenious loop in the sandal's thong. Since the outlawing of the Rat Catcher's Guild, Adventure Alley had acquired a new function, to which Tehol now set about applying himself with the insouciance of the initiated. First into the half-axe, clawing his way through the vines immediately beyond the entrance, then drawing up one step short of pitching head first into the muddy pool. Splashing, thick slopping sounds. Then a dark-skinned, wrinkled face appeared amidst the high grasses fringing the pit. It's you, the witch said, grimacing, then slithering out her overlong tongue to display all the leeches attached to it. And it's you, Tehol replied. The red protuberance with all its friends went back inside. Come in for a swim, you odious man. Come out and let your skin recover, Manuga. I happen to know you're barely three decades old. I am a map of wisdom. As a warning against the perils of overbathing, perhaps. Where's the fat root this time? What have you got for me first? What I always have. The only thing you ever want from me, Manuga. The only thing you'll never give, you mean? Sighing, Tehol drew out from under his makeshift sarong a small vial. He held it up for her to see. She licked her lips, which proved alarmingly complicated. What kind? Capybara Row. But I want yours. I don't produce row. You know what I mean, Tehol Bedict. Alas, poverty is more than skin deep. Also, I have lost all incentive to be productive, in any sense of the word. After all, what kind of a world is this that I'd even contemplate delivering a child into? Tehol Bedict, you cannot deliver a child. You're a man. Leave the delivering to me. Tell you what, climb out of that soup, dry out and let me see what you're supposed to look like, and who knows, extraordinary things might happen. Scowling, she held out an object. Here's your fat root. Give me that vial, then go away. I so look forward to next time. Tehol Bedict, do you know what fat root is used for? Her eyes had sharpened with suspicion, and Tehol realized that, 
Were she indeed to dry out, she might be rather handsome after all, in a vaguely amphibian way. No, why? Are you required to partake of it in some bizarre fashion? He shook his head. Are you certain? No unusual tea smelling yellow? Smelling yellow? What does that mean? If you smelled it, you'd know. Clearly you haven't. Good. Get out. I'm puckering. A hasty departure, then, from the half-axe. Onward to the entrance to Gruel's immeasurable pots. Presumably that description was intended to emphasize unmatched quality or something similar, since the pots themselves were sold as clocks and for alchemical experiments and the like, and such functions were dependent on accurate rates of flow. He stepped inside the cramped, damp shop. You're always frowning when you come in here, Tehol Bedict. Good morning, Laudable Gruel. The grey one, yes, that one there. A fine-looking pot. It's a beaker, not a pot. Of course. Usual price. Why do you always hide behind all those pots, Laudable Gruel? All I ever see of you is your hands. My hands are the only important part of me. All right. Tehol drew out a recently removed dorsal fin. A succession of spines, these ones from a capybara. Gradating diameters. How do you know that? Well, you can see it. They get smaller as they go back. Yes, but how precise? That's for you to decide. You demand objects with which to make holes. Here you have, what, twelve. How can you not be pleased by that? Who said I wasn't pleased? Put them on the counter. Take the beaker and get that damned fat root out of here. From there it was across to the small animal's shop and beastmonger shill, an oversized woman endlessly bustling up and down the rows of tiny stacked cages, on her flattened heels a piping, scurrying swarm of little creatures. She squealed her usual delight at the gifts of beaker and fat root, the latter of which, it turned out, was most commonly used by malicious wives to affect the shrinkage of their husband's testicles. Whilst Chill had, with some delicate modifications, applied the root's diminutive properties to her broods, feeding the yellow-smelling tea out in precise increments using the hold beaker. The meeting soured when Tehol slapped at a mosquito on his neck, only to be informed he had just killed a pygmy blood-sucking bat. His reply that the distinction was lost on him was not well received, but Shill opened the trap door on the floor at the back of the shop nevertheless, and Tehol descended the twenty-six narrow, steep stone steps to the crooked corridor, twenty-one paces long, that led to the ancient empty beehive tomb, the walls of which had been dismantled in three places to fashion rough doorways into snaking, low-ceilinged tunnels, two of which ended in fatal traps, the third passageway eventually opened out into a long chamber occupied by a dozen or so dishevelled refugees, most of whom seemed to be asleep. Fortunately, Chief Investigator Rucket was not among the somnolent. Her brows rose when she saw him, her admirable face filling with an expression of unfeigned relief as she gestured him to her table. The surface was covered in parchment sheets depicting various floor plans and structural diagrams. Sit, Tehol Bedict. Here, some wine. Drink. By the errant, a new face. You have no idea how sick I am of my interminable companions in this hovel. Clearly, he replied, sitting, you need to get out more. Alas, most of my investigations these days are archival in nature. Ah, the grand mystery you've uncovered— any closer to a solution? Grand mystery? More like damned mystery. And no, I remain baffled, even as my map grows with every day that passes. But let's not talk any more about that. My agents report that the cracks in the foundation are inexorably spreading. Well done, Tehol. I always figured you were smarter than you looked. Why, thank you, Rocket. Have you got those lacquered tiles I asked for? Onyx finished the last one this morning. 
Sixteen in all, correct? Perfect. Beveled edges? Of course. All of your instructions were adhered to with diligence. Great. Now, about that inexorable spreading. You wish us to retire to my private room? Er, uh, not now, Rocket. I need some coin, an infusion to bolster a capital investment. How much? Fifty thousand. Will we ever see a return? No, you'll lose it all. Tehal, you certainly do take vengeance a long way. What is the benefit to us, then? Why, none other than the return to preeminence of the Ratcatcher's Guild. Her rather dreamy eyes widened. The end of the Patriotists? Fifty thousand? Will seventy-five be better? A hundred? No, fifty is what I need. I do not anticipate any objections from my fellow guild masters. Wonderful! He slapped his hands together, then rose. She frowned up at him. Where are you going? Why, to your private room, of course. Oh, how nice. His gaze narrowed on her. Aren't you joining me, Rocket? What would be the point? The name Fat Root is a woman's joke, you know. I haven't drunk any yellow-smelling tea. In the future, I advise you to use gloves. Where's your room, Rocket? One brow lifted. Got something to prove? No, I just need to check on things. What's the point? she asked again. Now that your imagination is awake, you'll convince yourself you've got smaller, Tehol Bedict. Human nature. Worse that you happen to be a man, too. She rose. I, however, can be objective, albeit devastatingly so, on occasion. So, do you dare my scrutiny? He scowled. Fine, let's go. Next time, however, let us dispense entirely with the invitation to your room, all right? Misery lies in the details, Tehol Bedict, as we're about to discover. Venit Sathad unrolled the parchment and anchored its corners with flat stones. As you can see, master, there are six separate buildings to the holdings. He began pointing to the illustrations of each. Stables and livery, ice house, dry store with cellar, servants' quarters, and, of course, the inn proper. What of that square building there? Rotos Hivana asked. Then it frowned. As I understand it, the interior is virtually filled with an iconic object of some sort. The building predates the inn itself. Attempts to dislodge it failed. Now, what space remains is used for sundry storage. Rotos Hivana leaned back in his chair. How solvent is this acquisition? No more nor less than any other hostel, master. It may be worth discussing investment on restoration with the other shareholders, including Kauros and Victad. Hmm, I will consider that. He rose. In the meantime, assemble the new artifacts on the cleaning table on the terrace. At once, master. Fourteen leagues west of the Draconian Isles, doldrums had settled on this stretch of ocean leveling the seas to a glassy, greasy patina beneath humid, motionless air. Through the eyeglass, the lone ship, black hull low in the water, looked lifeless. The mainmast was splintered, all rigging swept away. Someone had worked up a foresail, but the storm-rigged canvas hung limp. The steering oar was tied in place. No movement anywhere to be seen. Skorgen Kaban, known as the Pretty, slowly lowered the eyeglass, yet continued squinting with his one good eye at the distant ship. He reached up to scratch one of the air holes, all that remained of what had once been a large, hawkish nose, then winced as a nail dug into sensitive scar tissue. The itch was non-existent, but the gaping nostrils had a tendency to weep, and the feigned scratch served to warn him of telltale wetness. This was one of his many gestures he probably imagined were subtle. Alas, his captain was too sharp for that. 
She drew away her sidelong study of Scorgan, then glanced back at her waiting crew, a miserable but cocky bunch. Doldrums weighed everyone down, understandably, but the hold of the raider was packed with loot, and this run of the errant's luck seemed without end. Now that they'd found another victim... Scorgan drew in a whistling breath, then said, It's ever all right. My guess is a stray that got tossed around a bit in that storm we spied out west yesterday. Chances are the crew's either sick or dead, or they abandoned ship in one of their Nari lifeboats. If they did that, they'll have taken the good stuff with them. If not, he grinned across at her, revealing blackened teeth. Then we can finish what the storm started. At the very least, the captain said, we'll take a look. She sniffed. At least maybe something will come of getting blown into the flats. Have him send out the sweep, Scorgan, but keep that lookout's head spinning in every direction. Scorgan looked across at her. You think there might be more of them out here? She made a face. How many ships did the Emperor send out? His good eye widened, then he studied the lone derelict once more through the eyeglass. You think it's one of those? Errant's butthole, Captain, if you're right. You have your orders, and it seems I must remind you yet again, first mate. No profanity on my ship. Apologies, Captain. He hurried off, began relaying orders to the waiting crew. Doldrums made for a quiet lot a kind of superstitious furtiveness gripping the sailors, as if any sound reaching too far might crack the mirror of the sea. She listened as the twenty-four sweeps slid out, blades settling in the water. A moment later came the muted call-out of the cocks, and the undying gratitude groaned as it lurched forward. Clouds of sleeper flies rose around the ship as the nearby sea's pellucid surface was disturbed. The damned things had a tendency to seek out dark cover once driven to flight. Sailors coughed and spat. All very well for them, the captain observed, as a whining cloud spun round her head and countless insects crawled up her nose, into her ears and across her eyes. Sun and sea were bad enough, combining to assail her dignity and whatever vanity a woman who was dead could muster, but for Shurk Elal these flies made for profoundly acute misery. Pirate, divine undead, strumpet of insatiability, witch of the deep waters. The times had been good ever since she first sailed out of the Letheras Harbor, down the long, broad river to the western seas. Lean and sleek, that first galley had been her passage to fame, and Shork still regretted its fiery loss to that mare escort in laughter's end. But she was well pleased with the undying gratitude. Slightly too big for her crew, granted, but with their return to Letheras that problem could be solved easily enough. Her greatest sense of loss was with the departure of the Crimson Guard. Iron bars had made it plain from the very start that they were working for passage. Even so, they'd been formidable additions on that wild crossing of the ocean, keeping the blood wake wide and unbroken as one merchant trader after another was taken, stripped of all valuables, then, more often than not, sent down into the dark. It hadn't been just their swords, deadly as those were, but the majory of Korlos, a majory far more refined, far more clever than anything Shurk had witnessed before. Such details opened her eyes, her mind as well. The world out there was huge, and in many fundamental ways the Empire of Letha, child of the First Empire, had been left in a kind of backwater, in its thinking, in its ways of working. A humbling revelation indeed. The leave-taking with Iron Bars and his squad had not been quite as emotional or heartfelt for Shurk Elal as it had probably seemed to everyone else, for the truth was she had been growing ever more uneasy in their company. Iron Bars was not one to find subordination palatable for very long. Oh, no doubt it was different when it came to his fellow avowed among the Crimson Guard, or to their legendary commander, Prince Kaz. But she was not an avowed, nor even one of that company's soldiers. So long as their goals ran in parallel, things were fine enough, and Shurk had made certain to never deviate, so as to avoid any confrontation. 
They had deposited the mercenaries on a stony beach of the eastern shore of a land called Jakaruku, the sky squalling with sleeting rain. The landing had not been without witnesses, alas, and the last she'd seen of Iron Bars and his soldiers, they were turning inland to face a dozen massively armoured figures descending the broken slope, great helmed with visors lowered. Brutal-looking bunch, and Shurik hoped all that belligerence was mostly for show. The grey sheets of rain had soon obscured all details from the strand as they pulled away on the oars back to the gratitude. Scorrigan had sworn he'd caught the sound of blades clashing, a faint echo, with his one good ear, but Shurik herself had heard nothing. In any case, they'd scurried from those waters as pirates were wont to do when there was the risk of organized resistance lurking nearby, and Shork consoled her agitated conscience by reminding herself that Iron Bars had spoken of Jakaruku with some familiarity, at least in so far as knowing its name. And as for Carlos's wide-eyed prayers to a few dozen divinities, well, he was prone to melodrama. A dozen knights wouldn't have been enough to halt Iron Bars and his crimson guard, determined as they were to do whatever it was they had to do, which, in this instance, was cross Jakaruku from one coast to the other, then find themselves another ship. A huge world indeed. The sweeps lifted clear of the water and were quietly shipped as the undying gratitude sidled up alongside the Edur wreck. Shurk Elal moved to the rail and studied the visible deck of the Blackwood ship. Riding low, Scorgan muttered. No bodies amidst the clutter, but there was clutter. No orderly evacuation, Shurk Elal said, as grappling hooks sailed out, the tines biting as the lines were drawn taut. Six with us, weapons out, she commanded, unsheathing her own rapier, then stepping up onto the rail. She leapt across, landed lightly on the mid-deck, two strides from the splintered stump of the mainmast. Moments later, Scorgan joined her, arriving with a grunt, then a curse as he jarred his bad leg. This was a scrap, he said, looking about. He limped back to the rail and tugged loose a splintered arrow shaft, then scowled as he studied it. Damn short and stubby! Look at that head! That could punch through a bronze-sheeted shield! And this fletching, it's leather like fins. So where were the bodies? Frowning, Shurk Elal made her way to the cabin's hatchway. She paused at the hold, seeing that the hatch had been staved in. Nudging it aside with her boot, she crouched and looked down into the gloom of the hold. The glimmer of water and things floating. Scorgan, there's booty here. Come over and reach down for one of those amphorae. The second mate, Misery, called over from their ship. Captain, that hulk's lower in the water than it was when we arrived. She could now hear the soft groans of the hull. Scorgan used his good arm to reach down and hook his hand through an ear of the amphora. Hissing with the weight, he lifted the hip-high object into view, rolling it onto the deck between himself and the captain. The amphora itself was a gorgeous piece of work. Shurk observed. Foreign, the glaze cream in color, down to the inverted beehive base, where the coils were delineated in black geometric patterns on gleaming white. But it was the image painted on the shoulder and belly that captured her interest. Down low on one side there was a figure, nailed to an X-shaped cross. Whirling out from the figure's upturned head, there were crows, hundreds, each one profoundly intricate, every detail etched, Crows flooding outward, or perhaps inward, to mass on the amphora's broad shoulders, encircling the entire object. Converging to feed on the hapless man? Fleeing him like his last dying thoughts? Scorgan had drawn a knife and was cutting away at the seal, stripping away the thick wax binding the stopper. After a moment he succeeded in working it loose. He tugged the stopper free, then leapt back as thick blood poured forth, spreading on the deck. It looked fresh, and from it rose a scent of flowers, pungent and oversweet. Cagenza pollen, Scorgan said, keeps blood from thickening. The Edor use it when they paint temples in the forest, you know, on trees. The blood sanctifies... It's not a real temple, of course. No walls or ceiling, just a grove. 
I don't like first mates who babble, Shurkilal said, straightening once more. Get the others out. The vessels alone will make us rich for a month or two. She resumed her walk to the cabin. The corridor was empty, the cabin door broken open and hanging from one leather hinge. As she made her way towards it, she glanced into the side alcoves and saw the layered bunks of the crew, but all were unoccupied, although disheveled as if subject to searching. In the cabin itself, more signs of looting, while on the floor was spread-eagled an Edua corpse. Hands and feet had been spiked into the floorboards, and someone had used a knife on him, methodically. The room stank of spilled wastes, and the expression frozen on the face was a twisted, agony-racked mask, the eyes staring out as if witness to a shattered face, a terrible revelation at the moment of death. She heard Scorgan come up behind her, heard his low curse upon seeing the body. "'Tortured him,' he said. "'Tortured the captain. This one was Merud, damn near an elder. Errant save us, captain. We're gonna get blamed if anyone else comes on this afore it all sinks. Torture. I don't get that. It's simple, she said. They wanted information. About what? Shurkilal looked round. They took the log, the charts. Now maybe pirates might do that, if they were strangers to Letha. But then they'd have no need to torture this poor bastard. Besides... They'd have taken the loot. No, whoever did this wanted more information, not what you could get from charts, and they didn't give a damn about booty. Nasty bastards, whoever they were. She thought back to that amphora and its grisly contents, then turned away. Maybe they had a good reason. Hold the hull, Scorgan. We'll wait around, though. Blackwood doesn't like sinking. We may have to fire it. A pyre to bring them all in, Captain. I am aware of the risks. Get on with it. Back on the deck, Shurkelal made her way to the forecastle, where she stood scanning the horizon while Scorgan and the crew began their demolition. Strangers on the sea, who are no friends of the Tistedua. Even so, I think I'd rather not meet them. She turned to face the mid-deck. Scorgan! When we're done here, we take to the sweeps, back to the coast. His scarred brows rose. Yes, alas. Why not? We can sell off and load up on crew. The battered man grinned. Back to Lazarus, aye, and fast. Chapter 4 The mutiny came that fell dawn when through the heavy mists that had plagued us for ten days we looked to the east, and there saw, rising vast and innumerable on the cloud-bound horizon, dragons. Too large to comprehend, their heads above the sun, their folded wings reaching down to cast a shadow that could swallow all of Dreen. This was too much, too frightening even for the more seasoned soldiers in our troop, for their dark eyes were upon us, an alien regard that drained the blood from our hearts, the very iron from our swords and spears. To walk into those shadows would quail a champion of the First Empire. We could not face such challenge, and though I voiced my fury, my dismay, it was naught but the bolster demanded of any expedition's leader, and indeed I had no intention of demanding of my party the courage that I myself lacked. Bolster is a dangerous thing, lest one succeeds where one would not. And so I ceased my umbrage, perhaps too easily, yet none made account of that, relieved as they all were as we broke camp, packed our mules, and turned to the west. Four days into the wild lands, Thrydis Adonict. Banishment killed most victims, when the world beyond was harsh when survival could not be purchased without the coin of cooperation. No graver punishment was possible among the tribal peoples, whether all or Drasilhani or Kerin. Yet it was the clan structure itself that imposed deadly intransigence, and with it a corresponding devastation when one was cast out, alone, bereft of all that gave meaning to life. Victims crumpled into themselves, abandoning all skills that could serve to sustain them. They withered, then died. 
The lethary and their vast cities, the tumult of countless faces, were, beyond the chains of indebtedness, almost indifferent to banishing. True, such people were not immune to the notion of spiritual punishment. They existed in families, after all, a universal characteristic of humans, yet such scars as were delivered from estrangement were survivable. Another village, another city. The struggle of beginning again could be managed, and indeed, for some, beginning anew became an addiction in its own right, a way of absolving responsibility. Red Mask, his life that of the all, unsullied for generations, had come to believe that the nature of the lethary, his most hated enemy, had nevertheless stained his spirit. Banishment had not proved a death sentence. Banishment had proved a gift, for with it he discovered freedom, the very lure that drew so many young warriors into the Lether Empire, where anonymity proved both bane and emancipation. Driven away, he had wandered far, with no thought of ever returning. He was not as he had once been, no longer the son of his father, yet what he had become was, even to himself, a mystery. The sky overhead was unmarred by clouds, the new season finding its heat, and jackrabbits raced from one thicket of momentary cover to another ahead of him as he rode the lethery horse on the herd trail on its northeasterly route. A small herd, he had noted, with few fly-swarmed birth stains along the path's outskirts, where Rodara males would gather protectively until the newborn was able to find its legs. The clan guiding these beasts was probably small. Red Mask's guardian, Kachain Chimal, were nowhere to be seen, but that was not unusual. The huge reptiles had prodigious appetites. At this time of year, the wild Bedarin that had wintered in pocket forests, a solitary larger breed than those of the plains to the south, ventured out from cover in search of mates. Massing more than two leathery oxen, the bulls were ferocious and belligerent, and would charge anything that approached too close, barring a female of its own kind. Sag Churok, the male Kel hunter, delighted in meeting that thundering charge, Red Mask had seen its pleasure, revealed in the slow, sinuous lashing of the tail, as it stood in the bull's path, iron blades lifted high. As fast as the Bedouin was, the Kachain Chemal was faster. Each time after slaying the beast, Sag Churok would yield the carcass to Gunth Mak, until she'd eaten her fill. Red Mask rode on through the day, his pace leisurely to ease the burden on the horse, and when the sun was descending towards the horizon, igniting distant storm clouds, he came within sight of the all encampment, situated on an ancient oxbow island between two dry eroded riverbeds. The herds were massed on the flanks of the valleys to either side, and the sprawl of dome-shaped sewn-hide huts huddled amidst the smoke of cook-fires blanketing the valley. No outriders, no pickets, and far too large a camp for the size of the herds. Red Mask reined in on the ridge line. He studied the scene below. Here and there voices rose in ritual mourning. Few children were visible moving about between the huts. After some time, as he sat motionless on the high lethery saddle, someone saw him. Sudden cries, scurrying motion in the growing shadows, then a half-dozen warriors set out at a trot towards him. Behind them, the camp had already begun a panicked breaking, sparks flying as hearths were kicked and stamped out, hide walls rippled on the huts. Herd and dray dogs appeared, racing to join the approaching warriors. The all warriors were young, he saw as they drew closer, only a year or two past their death nights, not a single veteran among them. Where were the elders, the shoulder men? Halting fifteen paces downslope, the six warriors began conferring in hissed undertones. Then one faced the encampment and loosed a piercing cry. All activity stopped below. Faces stared up at Red Mask. Not a single warrior among them seemed bold enough to venture closer. The dogs were less cowed by the presence of a lone warrior. Growling, hackles raised, they crept in a half-circle towards him. Then, catching an unexpected scent, the beasts suddenly shrank back, tails dipping, thin whines coming from their throats. Finally, one young warrior edged forward a step. 
You cannot be him, he said. Red Mask sighed. Where is your war leader? he demanded. The youth filled his chest and straightened. I am this clan's war leader, Masak, son of Nerud. When was your death night? Those are the old ways, Masak said, baring his teeth in a snarl. We have abandoned such foolishness. Another spoke up behind the war leader. The old ways have failed us. We have cast them out, Masak said. Remove that mask. It is not for you. You seek to deceive us. You ride a lethary horse. You are one of the factor's spies. Red Mask made no immediate reply. His gaze slid past the war leader and his followers, fixing once more on the camp below. A crowd was gathering at the near edge, watching. He was silent for another twenty heartbeats. Then he said, You have set out no pickets. A lessery troop could line this ridge and plunge down into your midst, and you would not be prepared. Your women cry out their distress a sound that can be heard for leagues on a still night like this. Your people are starving, war leader, yet they light an excess of fires, enough to make above you a cloud of smoke that will not move and reflects the light from below. You have been culling the newborn Rodara and Myrid instead of butchering the aging males and females past bearing. You must have no shoulder men, for if you did, they would bury you in the earth and force upon you the death night, so that you might emerge, born anew and, hopefully, gifted with new wisdom. Wisdom you clearly lack. Masak said nothing to that. He had finally seen Red Mask's weapons. You are him, he whispered. You have returned to the Aldan. Which clan is this? Radmask, the war leader said, gesturing behind him. This clan, it is yours. Receiving naught but silence from the mounted warrior, Masak added, We, we are all that remain. There are no shouldermen, Redmask, no witches. He waved out towards the flanking herds. These beasts you see here... They are all that's left. He hesitated, then straightened once more. Red Mask, you have returned for nothing. You do not speak, and this tells me that you see the truth of things. Great warrior, you are too late. Even to this, Red Mask was silent. He slowly dismounted. The dogs, which had continued their trepid circling, tails ducked, either picked up a fresh scent or heard something from the gloom beyond, for they suddenly broke and pelted back down the slope, disappearing into the camp. That panic seemed to ripple through the warriors facing him, but none fled, despite the fear and confusion gripping their expressions. Licking his lips, Masak said, Red Mask, the lethery are destroying us. Outrider camps have been ambushed, set upon and slaughtered, the herds stolen away. The Aindinar clan is no more. Sevond and Niritha remnants crawled to the Ganatok. Only the Ganatok remains strong, for they are furthest east, and cowards that they are, they made pact with foreigners. Foreigners? Red Mask's eyes narrowed in their slits. Mercenaries? Masak nodded. There was a great battle, four seasons passed, and those foreigners were destroyed. He made a gesture. The grey sorcery. Did not the victorious lethery then march on the Ganatok camps? No, Red Musk. Too few remained. The foreigners fought well. Masak, he said, I do not understand. Did not the Ganatok fight alongside their mercenaries? The youth spat. Their war leader gathered from the clan's fifteen thousand warriors. When the lethery arrived, he fled, and the warriors followed. They abandoned the foreigners, left them to slaughter. Settle the camp below, Red Mask said. He pointed to the warriors standing behind Masak. 
Stand first watch along this ridge line, here and to the west. I am now war leader to the Renfire clan. Massark, where hides the Ganatok? Seven days to the east, they now hold the last great herd of the all. Massark, do you challenge my right to be war leader? The youth shook his head. You are Red Mask. The elders among the Renfire who were your enemies are all dead. Their sons are dead. How many warriors remain among the Renfire? Massark frowned, then gestured. You have met us, war leader. Six. A nod. Red Mask noted a lone dray dog sitting at the edge of the camp. It seemed to be watching him. He raised his left hand and the beast lunged into motion. The huge animal, a male, reached him moments later, dropping onto its chest and settling its wide, scarred head between Red Mask's feet. He reached down and touched its snout, a gesture that, for most, would have risked fingers. The dog made no move. Massark was staring down at it with wide eyes. A lone survivor, he said, from an outrider camp. It would not let us approach. The foreigners, Red Mask said quietly. Did they possess war dogs? No, but they were sworn followers of the wolves of war, and indeed, war leader, it seemed those treacherous foul beasts tracked them, always at a distance, yet in vast numbers, until the Ganatok elders invoked magic and drove them all away. Massark hesitated, then said, Red Mask, the war leader among the Ganatok. Unseen behind the mask, a slow smile formed. Firstborn son of Kapala, Hadralt. How did you know? Tomorrow, Massak, we drive the herds east to the Ganatok. I would know more of those hapless foreigners who chose to fight for us, to die for the people of the Aldan. We are to crawl to the Ganatok as did the Sevond and the Niritha? You are starving. The herds are too weakened. I lead six youths, none of whom has passed the death night. Shall the seven of us ride to war against the Lethery? Though young, it was clear that Massark was no fool. You shall challenge, Hadralt. Red Mask, your warriors, we... we will all die. We are not enough to meet the hundreds of challenges that will be flung at us, and once we are dead... You will have to face those challenges long before you are deemed worthy to cross weapons with Hadralt himself. You will not die, Red Mask said, and none shall challenge any of you. Then you mean to carve through a thousand warriors to face Hadralt? What would be the point of that, Massark? I need those warriors. Killing them would be a waste. No. He paused, then said, I am not without guardians, Massak, and I doubt that a single Ganatok warrior will dare challenge them. Hadralt shall have to face me, he and I, alone in the circle. Besides, he added, we haven't the time for all the rest. The Ganatok hold to the old ways, war leader, there will be rituals, days and days before the circle is made. Massak, we must go to war against the Lethery, every warrior of the all. War leader, they will not follow you. Even Hadralt could only manage a third of them, and that with payment of Rodara and Myrid that halved his holdings. Massak waved at the depleted herds on the hillsides. We, we have nothing left. You could not purchase the spears of a hundred warriors. Who holds the largest herds, Massak? The Ganatok themselves. No, I ask again, who holds the largest herds? The youth's scowl deepened. The Lethery. I will send three warriors to accompany the last of the Renfire to the Ganatok. Choose two of your companions to accompany us.
The dray dog rose and moved to one side. Red Mask collected the reins of his horse and set out down towards the camp. The dray fell into heel on his left. We shall ride west, Massac, and find us some herds. We ride against the Lethery? War leader, did you not moments ago mock the notion of seven warriors waging war against them? Yet now you say, war is for later, Red Mask said. As you say, we need herds to buy the services of the warriors. He paused and looked back at the trailing youth. Where did the Lethery get their beasts? From the all, from us. Yes, they stole them. So we must steal them back. Four of us, war leader? And one Dre and my guardians. What guardians? Red Mask resumed his journey. You lack respect, Massac. Tonight, I think, you will have your death night. The old ways are useless. I will not. Red Mask's fist was a blur. It was questionable whether, in the gloom, Massark even saw it, even as it connected solidly with the youth's jaw, dropping him in his tracks. Red Mask reached down and grabbed a handful of hide jerkin, then began dragging the unconscious Massark back down to the camp. When the young man awoke, he would find himself in a coffin beneath an arm's reach of earth and stones. None of the usual traditional measured rituals prior to a death night, alas, the kind that served to prepare the chosen for internment. Of course, Massark's loose reins displayed an appalling absence of respect, sufficient to obviate the gift of mercy, which in truth was what all those rituals were about. Hard lessons, then but becoming an adult depended on such lessons. He expected he would have to pound the others into submission as well, which made for a long night ahead. For us all. The camp's old women would be pleased by the ruckus, he suspected, preferable to wailing through the night in any case. The last tier of the buried city proved the most interesting, as far as Udinas was concerned. He'd had his fill of the damned sniping that seemed to plague this fell party of fugitives, a testiness that seemed to be getting worse, especially from fierce Sengar. The ex-slave knew that the Tist Edur wanted to murder him, and as for the details surrounding the abandonment of Rulad, which made it clear that Udinas himself had had no choice in the matter, that he had been as much a victim as Fear's own brother, well, Fear wasn't interested. Mitigating circumstances did not alter his intransigence, his harsh sense of right and wrong, which did not, it appeared, extend to his own actions. After all, fear had been the one to deliberately walk away from Rulad. Udinas, upon regaining consciousness, should have returned to the Emperor. To do what? Suffer a grisly death at Rulad's hands? Yes, we were almost friends, he and I as much as might be possible between slave and master. And of that the master ever feels more generous and virtuous than the slave. But I did not ask to be there at the madman's side, struggling to guide him across that narrow bridge of sanity, when all Rulat wanted to do was leap head first over the side at every step. No, he had made do with what he had, and in showing that mere splinter of sympathy, he had done more for Rulad than any of the Sengars. Brothers, mother, father, more indeed than any Tist Edur. Is it any wonder none of you know happiness, fear Sengar? You are all twisted branches from the same sick tree. There was no point in arguing this, of course. Seren Padak alone might understand, might even agree with all that Udinus had to say but she wasn't interested in actually being one of this party. She clung to the role of Aquator, a finder of trails, the reader of all those jealously guarded maps in her head. She liked not having to choose, better still, she liked not having to care. A strange woman, the Aquator, habitually remote, without friends. Yet she carries a Tistedur sword, Cholsenga's sword. Kettle says he set it into her hands. Did she understand the significance of that gesture? She must have. 
Charles Sengar had then returned to Rulad, perhaps the only brother who'd actually cared. Where was he now? Probably dead. Fresh, night-cooled air flowed down the broad ramp, moaned in the doorways situated every ten paces or so to either side. They were nearing the surface, somewhere in the Saddleback Pass, but on which side of the fort and its garrison? If the wrong side, then Silchas Ruin's swords would keen loud and long. The dead piled up in the wake of that walking, white-skinned, red-eyed nightmare, didn't they just? The few times the hunters caught up with the hunted, they paid with their lives, yet they kept coming, and that made little sense. Almost as ridiculous as this mosaic floor with its glowing armies. Images of lizard warriors locked in war, long tails against short tails, with the long tails doing most of the dying, as far as he could tell. The bizarre slaughter beneath their feet spilled out into the adjoining rooms, each one, it seemed, devoted to the heroic death of some champion. Fouled Kel, Noruk Adat, and Matrons, said Silchas Rowan, as, enwreathed in sorcerer's light, he explored each such side chamber, his interest desultory and cursory at best. In any case, Udinas could read enough into the colorful scenes to recognize a campaign of mutual annihilation with every scene of short-tail victory answered with a matron's sorcerous conflagration. The winners never won because the losers refused to lose. An insane war. Seren Pedak was in the lead, twenty paces ahead, and Udinas saw her halt and suddenly crouch, one hand lifting. The air sweeping in was rich with the scent of loam and wood dust. The mouth of the tunnel was small, overgrown, and half blocked by angled fragments of basalt from what had once been an arched gate, and beyond was darkness. Seren Pedak waved the rest forward. I will scout out ahead, she whispered as they gathered about just inside the cave mouth. Did anyone else notice that there were no bats in that last stretch? That floor was clean. There are sounds beyond human hearing, Silchas Rowan said. The flow of air is channeled through vents and into tubes behind the walls, producing a sound that perturbs bats, insects, rodents, and the like. The short tails were skilled at such things. So, not magic, then? Seren Pedak asked. No wards or curses here? No. Udinas rubbed at his face. His beard was filthy, and there were things crawling in the snarls of hair. Just find out if we're on the right side of that damned fort, Aquitur. I was making sure I wouldn't trip some kind of ancient ward stepping outside, indebted. Something that all these broken boulders suggest has happened before. Unless, of course, you want to rush out there yourself. Now why would I do that? Udinas asked. Ruin gave you your answer, Seren Pedak. What are you waiting for? Perhaps... Fear Sengar said. She waits for you to be quiet. We shall all, I suppose, end up waiting forever in that regard. Tormenting you, Fear, gives me my only pleasure. A sad admission indeed, Seren Pedak murmured, then edged forward over the tumbled rocks and into the night beyond. Udinas removed his pack and settled down on the littered floor, dried leaves crunching beneath him. He leaned against a tilted slab of stone and stretched out his legs. Fear moved up to crouch at the very edge of the cave mouth. Humming to herself, Kettle wandered off into a nearby side chamber. Silchas Rowan stood regarding Udinas. I am curious, he said after a time. What gives your life meaning, Lethary? That's odd. I was just thinking the same of you, Tistandi. Indeed. Why would I lie? Why wouldn't you? All right, Udinas said. You have a point. So you will not answer my question. You first. I do not disguise what drives me. Revenge? Well, fine enough, I suppose, as a motivation. At least for a while, and maybe a while is all you're really interested in. But let's be honest here, Silchas Ruin. As the sole meaning for existing, it's a paltry, pathetic cause. 
Whereas you claim to exist to torment fierce Sengar. Oh, he manages that all on his own, Udina shrugged. The problem with questions like that is, we rarely find meaning to what we do until well after we've done it. At that point, we come up with not one but thousands. Reasons, excuses, justifications, heartfelt defenses. Meaning? Really, Silchas Ruin, ask me something interesting. Very well. I am contemplating challenging our pursuers. No more of this unnecessary subterfuge. It offends my nature, truth be told. At the tunnel mouth, fear turned to regard the tist Andy. You will kick awake a hornet's nest, Silchas Ruin. Worse, if this fallen god is indeed behind Rulad's power, you might find yourself suffering a fate far more dire than millennia buried in the ground. Fear's turning into an elder before our eyes, Udina said, jumping at shadows. You want to take on Rulad and Hanan Mossag and his Karisnan, Silchas Ruin? You have my blessing. Grab the errant by the throat and tear this empire to pieces. Turn it all into ash and dust. Level the whole damned continent, Tistandi. We'll just stay here in this cave. Come collect us when you're finished. Fear bad his teeth at Udinas. Why would he bother sparing us? I don't know, the ex-slave replied, raising an eyebrow. Pity? Kettle spoke from the side chamber's arched doorway. Why don't any of you like each other? I like all of you, even with her. It's all right, Udina said. We're all just tortured by who we are, Kettle. No one said much after that. Seren Pedak reached the edge of the forest, keeping low to remain level with the stunted trees. The air was thin and cold at this altitude. The stars overhead were bright and sharp, the dust-shrouded crescent moon still low on the horizon to the north. Around her was whispered motion through the clumps of dead leaves and lichen. A kind of scaled mouse ruled the forest floor at night, a species she had never seen before. They seemed unusually fearless, so much so that more than one had scampered across her boots. No predators, presumably. Even so, their behavior was odd. Before her stretched a sloped clearing, sixty or more paces, ending at a rutted track, Beyond it was a level stretch of sharp, jagged stones, loose enough to be treacherous. The fort squatting in the midst of this moat of rubble was stone-walled, thick at the base and tapering sharply to twice the height of a man. The corner bastions were massive, squared and flat-topped. On those platforms were swivel-mounted ballistae. Seren could make out huddled figures positioned around the nearest one, while other soldiers were visible, shoulders and heads, walking the raised platform on the other side of the walls. As she studied the fortification, she heard the soft clunk of armor and weapons to her left. She shrank back as a patrol appeared on the rutted track. Motionless, breath held, she watched them amble past. After another twenty heartbeats, she turned about and made her way back through the stunted forest. She almost missed the entrance to the cave mouth, a mere slit of black behind high ferns beneath a craggy overhang of tilted, layered granite. Pushing through, she stumbled into fierce Sengar. Sorry, he whispered. We were beginning to worry. Or at least, he added, I was. She gestured him back into the cave. Good news, she said once they were inside. We're behind the garrison. The pass ahead should be virtually unguarded. There are Karisnan wards up the trail, Siltress Ruin cut in. Tell me of this garrison, Equitor. Seren closed her eyes. Wards? Errant Takus, what game is Hanan Mossack playing here? I could smell horses from the fort. Once we trip those wards, they'll be after us, and we can't outrun mounted soldiers. The garrison, Siltress said. She shrugged. The fort looks impregnable. I'd guess there's anywhere between a hundred and two hundred soldiers there. And with that many, there's bound to be mages, as well as a score or more Tist Edur. Silchas Ruin is tired of being chased, Udinas said from where he lounged, back resting on a stone slab. 
Dread filled Seren Pedak at these words. Silchess, can we not go round these wards? No. She glanced across at Fear Sengar, saw suspicion and unease in the warrior's expression, but he would not meet her eyes. What conversation did I just miss here? You are no stranger to sorcery, Silchess Ruin. Could you put everyone in that fort to sleep or something? Or cloud their minds? Make them confused? He gave her an odd look. I know of no sorcery that can achieve that. Mokra, she replied. The Warren of Mokra. No such thing existed in my day, he said. The Karisnan sorcery, rotted through with chaos as it is, seems recognizable enough to me. I have never heard of this Mokra. Korlos, the mage with iron bars, the Crimson Guard mercenaries, he could reach into minds, fill them with false terrors. She shrugged. He said the magic of holds and elder warrens has, almost everywhere else, been supplanted. I had wondered at the seeming weakness of Kurald Galain in this land. Aquator, I cannot achieve what you ask. Although I do intend to silence everyone in that fort and collect for us some horses. Silchas, there are hundreds of lethery there, not just soldiers. A fort needs support staff. Cooks, scullions, smiths, carpenters, servants. And the test edor, Fear added, will have slaves. None of this interests me, the Tist Andy said, moving past Seren and leaving the mouth of the cave. Udinas laughed softly. Red ruin stalks the land. We must heed this tale of righteous retribution gone horribly wrong. So, fear Senga, your epic quest twists awry. What will you tell your grandchildren now? The Edua warrior said nothing. Seren Pedak hesitated. She could hear Silchas Ruin walking away, a few strides crunching through leaves, then he was gone. She could hurry after him, attempt one last time to dissuade him. Yet she did not move. In the wake of Ruin's passage, the only sound filling the forest was the scurry and rustle of the scaled mice, in their thousands, it seemed, all flowing in the same direction as the Tistandi. Sweat prickled like ice on her skin. Look at us, frozen like rabbits. Yet what can I do? Nothing. Besides, it's not my business, is it? I am but a glorified guide. Not one of these here holds to a cause that matters to me. They're welcome to their grand ambitions. I was asked to lead them out, that's all. This is Silchas Ruin's war and fierce Sengar's. She looked over at Udinas and found him studying her from where he sat, eyes glittering, as if presciently aware of her thoughts, the sordid tracks each converging on a single pathetic conclusion. Not my business. Errant take you, indebted. Mangled and misshapen, the Carisnan Ventrala reached up a scrawny, root-like forearm and wiped the sweat from his brow. Around him candles flickered, a forlorn invocation to Sister Shadow, but it seemed the ring of darkness in the small chamber was closing in on all sides, as inexorable as any tide. He had woken half a bell earlier, heart pounding and breath coming in gasps. The forest north of the fort was seething with Orthan, a rock-dwelling, scaled creature unique to this mountain pass. Since his arrival at the fort he had seen perhaps a half-dozen, brought in by the maned cats the leathery locals kept. Those cats knew better than to attempt to eat the orthon, poison as they were, yet were not averse to playing with them until dead. Orthon avoided forest and soft ground. They dwelt among rocks, yet now they swarmed the forest, and the Karisnan could feel something palpable from their presence, a stirring that tasted of bloodlust. Should he crouch here in his room, terrified of creatures he could crush underfoot? He needed to master this unseemly panic. Listen, he could hear nothing from the fort lookouts, no alarms shouted out. But the damned orthon carpeted the forest floor up the pass, massing in unimaginable numbers, and that dread scaly flood was sweeping down, and Ventrala's panic rose yet higher, threatening to erupt from his throat in shrieks, he struggled to think. 
Some kind of once-in-a-decade migration, perhaps. Once in a century, even. A formless hunger, that and nothing more. The creatures would heave up against the walls, seethe for a time, then leave before the dawn. Or they'd flow around the fort, only to plunge from the numerous ledges and cliffs to either side of the approach. Some creatures were driven to suicide. Yes, that was it. The bloodlust suddenly burgeoned. The Carissonan's head rocked back, as if he'd just been slapped. Chills swept through him. He heard himself begin gibbering, even as he awakened the sorcery within him. His body flinched as chaotic power blossomed like poison in his muscles and bones. Sister Shadow had nothing to do with this magic racing through him, nothing at all, but he was past caring about such things. Then, as shouts rose from the wall, Karisnan Ventrala sensed another presence in the forest beyond, a focus to all that bloodlust, a presence, and it was on its way. Atriprida Hyanar awoke to distant shouts. An alarm was being raised from the wall facing up trail. And that, she realized as she quickly donned her uniform, made little sense. Then again, there wasn't much about this damned assignment that did. Pursue, she'd been told, but avoid contact. And now, one of those disgusting Karisnan had arrived, escorted by twenty-five Merud warriors. Well, if there was any real trouble brewing, she would let them handle it. They're damned fugitives, after all. They could have them, with the errant's blessing. A moment later she was flung from her feet as a deafening concussion tore through the fort. Karisnan Ventrala screamed, skidding across the floor to slam up against the wall as a vast cold power swept over him, plucking at him as would a crow a rotted corpse. His own sorcery had recoiled, contracted into a trembling core deep in his chest. It had probed towards that approaching presence, probed until some kind of contact was achieved. And then Ventrala, and all that churning power within him, had been rebuffed. Moments later, the fort's wall exploded. Atriprida Hyanar stumbled from the main house and found the compound a scene of devastation. The wall between the uptrail bastions had been breached, the impact spilling huge pieces of stone and masonry onto the muster area. And the rock was burning— a black sizzling coruscation that seemed to devour the stone even as it flared wild, racing across the rubble. Broken bodies were visible amidst the wreckage, and from the stables, where the building's back wall leaned precariously inward, horses were screaming as if being devoured alive. Swarming over everything in sight were Orthan, closing on fallen soldiers, and where they gathered, skin was chewed through, and the tiny scaled creatures then burrowed in a frenzy into pulped meat. Through the clouds of dust in the breach came a tall figure with drawn swords, white-skinned, crimson-eyed. Errant, take me. He's had enough of running. The white crow. She saw a dozen Tist Edor appear near the barracks. Heavy throwing spears darted across the compound, converging on the ghastly warrior. He parried them all aside, one after the other, and with each clash of shaft against blade the sword sang until it seemed a chorus of deathly voices filled the air. Hyena, seeing a score of her leathery soldiers arrive, staggered towards them. Withdraw! she shouted, waving like a madwoman. Retreat, you damned fools! It seemed they had but awaited the command, as the unit broke into a rout, heading en masse for the down-trail gate. One of the Tist Edo closed on the Atriprida. What are you doing? he demanded. The Karisnan is coming. He'll slap this gnat down. When he does, she snarled, pulling back, we'll be happy to regroup. The Edo unsheathed his cutlass. Call them into battle, Atriprida, or I'll cut you down right here. She hesitated. To their right, the other Tist Edo had rushed forward and now engaged the White Crow. The swords howled, a sound so filled with glee that Hyanar's blood turned to ice. She shook her head, watching, as did the warrior confronting her, as the white crow carved his way through the Merud in a maelstrom of severed limbs, decapitations and disemboweling slashes that sent bodies reeling away. Your lethary! Charge him, damn you! She stared across at the Edo warrior. 
Where's your Carisnan? she demanded. Where is he? Ventrala clawed his way into the corner of the room furthest from the conflagration outside. Endless, meaningless words were spilling from his drool-threaded mouth. His power had fled, abandoning him here in this cursed room. Not fair. He had done all that was asked of him. He had surrendered his flesh and blood, his heart and his very bones, all to Hanan Mossag. There had been a promise, a promise of salvation, of vast rewards for his loyalty, once the hated youngest son of Tomad Sengar was torn down from the throne. They were to track Fear Sengar, the traitor, the betrayer, and when the net was finally closed around him, it would not be Rulad smiling in satisfaction. No, Rulad, the fool, knew nothing about any of this. The gambit belonged to Hanan Mossag, the warlock king, who had had his throne stolen from him. And it was Hanan who, with Fear Sengar in his hands, and the slave Udinas, would work out his vengeance. The emperor needed to be stripped, every familiar face twisted into a mask of betrayal. Stripped, yes, until he was completely alone, isolated in his own madness. Only then. Ventrala froze, curled tight into a fetid ball, at soft laughter spilling towards him. From inside his room. Poor oh, Grisnan, it then murmured. You had no idea this pale king of the Orthen would turn on you, this strider of battlefields. His road is a river of blood, you pathetic fool. And, oh, look, his patience, his forbearance, it's all gone. A wraith here with him, whispering madness. Be gone! he hissed, lest you share my fate. I did not summon you. No, you didn't. My chains to the Tist Edor have been severed by the one out there. Yes, you see, I am his, not yours. The white crows, ha, the lethery surprised me there. But it was the mice, Karisnan. Seems a lifetime ago now in the forest north of Hanan Mossag's village, and an apparition, alas, no one understands, no one takes note. But that is not my fault, is it? Go away! I cannot, will not, rather. Can you hear, outside? It's all quiet now. Most of the lethery got away, unfortunately tumbling like drunk goats down the stairs, with their captain among them. She was no fool. As for your Merud, well, they're all dead. Now listen, Boots in the hallway, he's on his way. The terror drained away from Ventrala. There was no point, was there? At least, finally, he would be delivered from this racked, twisted cage of a body, as if recalling the dignity it had once possessed, that body now lurched into motion, lifting itself into a sitting position, back pushed into the corner. It seemed to have acquired its own will, disconnected from Ventrala, from the mind and spirit that held to that name, that pathetic identity. Hanan Mossag had once said that the power of the fallen one fed on all that was flawed and imperfect in one's soul, which in turn manifested in flesh and bone. What was then necessary was to teach oneself to exult in that power, even as it twisted and destroyed the soul's vessel. Ventrala, with the sudden clarity that came with approaching death, now realized that it was all a lie. Pain was not to be embraced. Chaos was anathema to a mortal body. It ruined the flesh because it did not belong there. There was no exaltation in self-destruction. A chorus of voices filled his skull, growing ever louder. The swords! There was a soft scuffing sound in the hallway beyond, then the door squealed open. Orthan poured in, flowing like grey foam in the grainy darkness. A moment later the white crow stepped into view. The song of the two swords filled the chamber, red lambent eyes fixed on Ventrala. The tist Andy then sheathed his weapons, muting the keening music. 
Tell me of this one who so presumes to offend me. Ventrala blinked, then shook his head. You think the crippled god is interested in challenging you, Silchas Ruin? No, this offense, it is Hanan Mossag's, and his alone. I understand that now, you see. It's why my power is gone, fled. The crippled god is not ready for the likes of you. The white-skinned apparition was motionless, silent for a time. Then he said, If this Hanan Mossag knows my name, he knows too that I have reason to be affronted by him, by all the Tist Edua who have inherited the rewards of Skabandari's betrayal. Yet he provokes me. Perhaps, Ventrala said, Hanan Mossag presumed the cripple god's delight in discord was without restraint. Siltras Ruin cocked his head. What is your name, Karisnan? Ventrala told him. I will let you live, the Tist Andy said, so that you may deliver to Hanan Mossag my words. The Azath cursed me with visions, its own memories, and so I was witness to many events on this world and on others. Tell Hanan Mossag this. A god in pain is not the same as a god obsessed with evil. Your warlock king's obsessions are his own. It would seem, alas, that he is confused. For that I am merciful this night, and this night alone. Hereafter, should he resume his interference, he will know the extent of my displeasure. I shall convey your words with precision, Silchas Ruin. You should choose a better god to worship, Ventrala. Tortured spirits like company, even a god. He paused, then said, Then again, perhaps it is the likes of you who have in turn shaped the crippled god. Perhaps without his broken, malformed worshippers, he would have healed long ago. Soft, rasping laughter from the wraith. Silchas Ruin walked back through the doorway. I am conscripting some horses, he said without turning round. Moments later, the wraith slithered after him. The orthon, which had been clambering about in seemingly aimless motion, now began to withdraw from the chamber. Ventrala was alone once more. To the stairs, find the Atripreda an escort for the journey back to Letharas, and I will speak to Hanan Mossag, and I will tell him about death in the pass. I will tell him of a soul taken Tist Andy with two knife wounds in his back, wounds that will not heal, yet he forbears. Silchas Ruin knows more of the crippled god than any of us, barring perhaps Rulad, but he does not hate. No, he feels pity. Pity even for me. Seren Pedak heard the horses first, hoofs thumping at the walk up the forested trail. The night sky above the fort was strangely black, opaque, as if from smoke, yet there was no glow from flames. They had heard the concussion, the destruction of at least one stone wall, and Kettle had yelped with laughter, a chilling, grotesque sound. Then distant screams, and all too quickly thereafter, naught but silence. Siltras Ruin appeared, leading a dozen mounts, accompanied by sullen moaning from the scabbarded swords. And how many of my kin did you slay this time? Fiersengar asked. Only those foolish enough to oppose me. This pursuit, he said, it does not belong to your brother. It is the warlock king's. I believe we cannot doubt that he seeks what we seek. And now, fear Sengar, the time has come to set our knives on the ground, the two of us. Perhaps Hanan Mossag's desires are a match to yours, but I assure you such desires cannot be reconciled with mine. Seren Pedak felt a heaviness settle in the pit of her stomach. This had been a long time in coming, the one issue avoided again and again. 
ever excused to the demands of simple expediency. Fear Sengar could not win this battle, they all knew it. Did he intend to stand in Silchas' ruins' way? One more tist Edur to cut down? There is no compelling reason to broach this subject right now, she said. Let's just get on these horses and ride. No, Fear Sengar said, eyes fixed on the tist Andes. Let it be now. Silchas Ruin, in my heart I accept the truth of Scabandari's betrayal. You trusted him, and you suffered unimaginably in consequence. Yet how can we make reparation? We are not soul-taken. We are not ascendants. We are simply Tist Edur, and so we fall like saplings before you and your swords. Tell me, how do we ease your thirst for vengeance? You do not. Nor is my killing your kin in any way an answer to my need. Fear Sengar, you spoke of reparation. Is this your desire? The Edor warrior was silent for a half-dozen heartbeats. Then he said, Scavandari brought us to this world. Yours was dying. Yes. You may not be aware of this, Silchas Ruin continued, but Blood Eye was partly responsible for the thundering of Shadow. Nonetheless, of greater relevance to me are the betrayals that came before that particular crime. Betrayals against my own kin, my brother and Darist, which set such grief upon his soul that he was driven mad. He slowly cocked his head. Did you imagine me naive in fashioning an alliance with Scabandari blood eye? Udinas barked a laugh. Naive enough to turn your back on him? Seren Pedak shut her eyes. Please, indebted, just keep your mouth shut. Just this once. You speak truth, Udinas, Silchas Ruin replied after a moment. I was exhausted, careless. I did not imagine he would be so public. Yet in retrospect the betrayal had to be absolute, and that included the slaughter of my followers. Fear Sengar said, You intended to betray Skabandari, only he acted first. A true alliance of equals, then. I imagined you might see it that way, the Tist Andi replied. Understand me, Fear Sengar. I will not countenance freeing the soul of Skabandari Blood Eye. This world has enough reprehensible ascendants. Without Father Shadow, Fear said, I cannot free Rulad from the chains of the crippled god. You could not, even with him. I do not believe you, Silchas Ruin. Skabandari was your match, after all. And I do not think the crippled god hunts you in earnest. If it is indeed Hanan Mossag behind this endless pursuit, then the ones he seeks are myself and Udinas, not you. It is, perhaps, even possible that the warlock king knows nothing of you, of who you are beyond the mysterious white crow. That does not appear to be the case, Fear Sengar. The statement seemed to rock the Tist Edur. Siltras Rowin continued, Scabandari Blood Eye's body was destroyed. Against me, now, he would be helpless. A soul without provenance is a vulnerable thing. Furthermore, it may be that his power is already being used. By whom? Fear asked, almost whispering. The Tist Andy shrugged. It seems, he said with something close to indifference, that your quest is without purpose. You cannot achieve what you seek. I will offer you this, Fear Sengar. The day I choose to move against the crippled god, your brother shall find himself free, as will all the Tist Edur. When that time comes, we can speak of reparation. Fear Sengar stared at Siltras Rowan, then glanced momentarily at Seren Pedak. He drew a deep breath, then said, Your offer humbles me, yet I could not imagine what the Tist Edur could gift you in answer to such deliverance. Leave that to me, the Tist Andi said. 
Sarah and Pedak sighed, then strode to the horses. It's almost dawn. We should ride until midday at least. Then we can sleep. She paused, looked once more over at Silchas Rowan. You are confident we will not be pursued? I am, Aquitor. So, were there in truth wards awaiting us? The Tist Andy made no reply. As the Aquator adjusted the saddle and stirrups on one of the horses to suit Kettle, Udinas watched the young girl squatting on her haunches near the forest edge, playing with an orthon that did not seem in any way desperate to escape her attentions. The darkness had faded, the mist silver in the growing light. Wither appeared beside him, like a smear of reluctant night. These scaled rats, Udinas, came from the Kachain Chemal world. There were larger ones, bred for food, but they were smart, smarter perhaps than they should have been. Started escaping their pens, vanishing into the mountains. It's said there are some still left. Udinas grunted his derision. It's said? Been hanging round in bars with a... The terrible price of familiarity. You no longer respect me, indebted. A most tragic error, for the knowledge I possess is like a curse of boredom, Udinas said, pushing himself to his feet. Look at her, he said, nodding towards Kettle. Tell me, do you believe in innocence? Never mind, I'm not that interested in your opinion. By and large, I don't believe, that is. And yet that child there, well... I am already grieving. Grieving what? Wither demanded. Innocence, Wraith, when we kill her. Wither was, uncharacteristically, silent. Udinas glanced down at the crouching shade, then sneered. All your coveted knowledge. Seventeen legends described the war against the scaled demons they all called the Ketra. Of those, sixteen were of battles, terrible clashes that left the corpses of warriors scattered across the plains and hills of the Aldan. Less a true war than headlong flight, at least in the first years. The Ketra had come from the west, from lands that would one day belong to the Empire of Letha, but were then, all those countless centuries ago, little more than blasted wastes, fly-swarmed marshlands of peat and rotten ice. A ragged, battered horde, the Ketra had seen battle before, and it was held in some versions of those legends that the Ketra were themselves fleeing, fleeing a vast, devastating war that gave cause to their own desperation. In the face of annihilation, they all had learned how to fight such creatures. The tide was met, held, then turned. Or so the tales proclaimed, in ringing, stirring tones of triumph. Red Mask knew better although at times he wished he didn't. The war ended because the Ketra's migration reached the easternmost side of the Aldan and then continued onward. Granted, they had been badly mauled by the belligerent ancestors of the All, yet in truth they had been almost indifferent to them, an obstacle in their path, and the death of so many of their own kind was but one more ordeal in a history of fraught, tragic ordeals since coming to this world. Ketra Kachain Chemal, the firstborn of dragons. There was, to Red Mask's mind, nothing palatable or sustaining about knowledge. As a young warrior, his world had been a single knot on the rope of the All People, his own deliberate binding to the long, worn history of bloodlines. He had never imagined that there were so many other ropes, so many intertwined threads. He had never before comprehended how vast the net of existence nor how tangled it had become since the night of life, when all that was living came into being, born of deceit and betrayal and doomed to an eternity of struggle. And Red Mask had come to understand struggle, there in the startled eyes of the Rodara, the timid fear of the Myrid, in the disbelief of a young warrior dying on stone and wind-blown sand, in the staring comprehension of a woman surrendering her life to the child she pushed out from between her legs. He had seen elders, human and beast, curl up to die. He had seen others fight for their last breath with all the will they could muster. 
Yet in his heart he could find no reason, no reward waiting beyond that eternal struggle. Even the spirit gods of his people battled, flailed, warred with the weapons of faith, with intolerance and the sweet, deadly waters of hate. No less confused and sordid than any mortal, the lethary wanted, and want invariably transformed into a moral right to possess. Only fools believed such things to be bloodless, either in intent or execution. Well, by the same argument, by its very fang and talon, there existed a moral right to defy them. And in such a battle, there would be no end until one side or the other was obliterated. More likely, both sides were doomed to suffer that fate. This final awareness is what came from too much knowledge. Yet he would fight on. These plains he and his three young followers moved through had once belonged to the All, until the Lethary expanded their notion of self-interest to include stealing land and driving away its original inhabitants. Cairn markers and totem stones had all been removed, the boulders left in heaps. Even the ring stones that had once anchored huts were gone. The grasses were overgrazed, and here and there long rectangular sections had seen the earth broken in anticipation of planting crops, fence posts stacked nearby. But Red Mask knew that this soil was poor, quickly exhausted except in the old river valleys. The lethary might manage a generation or two before the topsoil blew away. He had seen the results east of the wastelands, in far Colance, an entire civilization tottering on the edge of starvation as deserts spread like plague. The blurred moon had lifted high in the star-spattered night sky as they drew closer to the mass of Rodara. There was little point in going after the Myrid. The beasts were not swift runners over any reasonable distance, but as they edged closer, Redmast could see the full extent of this Rodara herd. Twenty thousand head, perhaps even more. A large drover camp, lit by campfires, commanded a hilltop to the north. Two permanent buildings of cut log walls and sod-capped roofs overlooked the shallow valley and the herds. These would, Red Mask knew, belong to the factor's foreman, forming the focus for the beginning of a true settlement. Crouched in the grasses at the edge of a drainage gully cutting through the valley side, the three young warriors on his left, Red Mask studied the lethary for another twenty heartbeats. Then he gestured Massark and the others back into the gully itself. This is madness, the warrior named Thevan whispered. There must be a hundred lethary in that camp. And what of the shepherds and their dogs? If the wind shifts... Quiet, said Red Mask. Leave the dogs and the shepherds to me. As for the camp, well, they will soon be busy enough. Return to the horses, mount up, and be ready to flank and drive the herd when it arrives. In the moon's pale light, Massark's expression was nerve-twisted, a wild look in his eyes. He had not done well on his death night, but thus far he appeared more or less sane. Both Seven and Krasos had, Red Mask suspected, made use of bledden herb smuggled with them into their coffins, which they chewed to make themselves insensate, beyond such things as panic and convulsions. Perhaps that was just as well, but Massark had possessed no bledden herb, and, as was common to people of open lands, confinement was worse than death, worse than anything one could imagine. Yet there was value in searing that transition into adulthood, rebirth that began with facing oneself, one's own demonic haunts that came clambering into view in grisly succession, immune to every denial. With the scars born of that transition, a warrior would come to understand the truth of imagination, that it was a weapon the mind drew at every turn, yet as deadly to its wielder as to its conjured foes. Wisdom arrived as one's skill with that weapon grew. We fight every battle with our imaginations, the battles within, the battles in the world beyond. This is the truth of command and a warrior must learn command of oneself and of others. It was possible that soldiers such as the Lethary experienced something similar in attaining rank, but Red Mask was not sure of that. Glancing back, he saw that his followers had vanished into the darkness. Probably, he judged, now at their horses. 
waiting with fast, shallow breaths drawn into suddenly tight lungs, starting at soft noises, gripping their reins and weapons in sweat-layered hands. Red Mask made a soft grunting sound, and the dray, lying on its belly, edged closer. He settled a hand on its thick-furred neck, briefly, then drew it away. Together, the two set out, side by side, both low to the ground, towards the Rodara herd. Abbasad walked slowly along the edge of the sleeping herd to keep himself alert. His two favoured dogs trotted in his wake. Born and raised as an indebted in Dreen, the sixteen-year-old had not imagined a world such as this. The vast sky, sprawling darkness and countless stars at night, enormous and depthless at day. The way the land itself reached out impossible distances, until at times he could swear he saw a curvature to the world, as if it existed like an island in the sea of the abyss. And so much life in the grasses in the sky. In the spring, tiny flowers erupted from every hillside, with berries ripening in the valleys. All his life, until his family had accompanied the factor's foreman, he had lived with his father and mother, his brothers and sisters, with his grandmother and two aunts, all crowded into a house little more than a shack, facing onto a rubbish-filled alley that stank of urine. The menagerie of his youth was made up of rats, blue-eyed mice, mears, cockroaches, scorpions, and silverworms. But here, in this extraordinary place, he had discovered a new life, winds that did not stink with rot and waste. And there was room, so much room. He had witnessed with his own eyes a return to health among the members of his family, his frail little sister now wary and sun-darkened, ever grinning, his grandmother whose cough had virtually vanished, his father who stood taller now, no longer hunched beneath low-ceilinged shacks and worksheds. Only yesterday Abbasard had heard him laugh for the very first time. Perhaps, the youth dared believe, once the land was broken and crops were planted, there would be the chance to work their way free of debt. Suddenly all things seemed possible. His two dogs loped past him, vanished in the gloom ahead. A not unusual occurrence. They liked to chase jackrabbits or low-flying rinazan. He heard a brief commotion in the grasses just beyond a slight rise. Abbasad adjusted his grip on the staff he carried, increased his pace. If the dogs had trapped and killed a jackrabbit, there would be extra meat in the stew tomorrow. Reaching the rise, he paused, searched the darkness below for his dogs. They were nowhere to be seen. Abbasad frowned, then let out a low whistle, expecting at any moment to hear them trot back to him. Yet only silence answered his summons. Confused, he slowly dropped into a crouch. Ahead and to his right, a few hundred Rodara shifted, awake and restless now. Something was wrong. Wolves? The Blue Rose cavalry the foreman kept under contract had hunted the local ones down long ago. Even the coyotes had been driven away, as had the bears. Abbasad crept forward, his mouth suddenly dry, his heart pounding hard in his chest. His free hand, reaching out before him, came into contact with soft, warm fur. One of his dogs, lying motionless, still under his probing touch. Near its neck, the fur was wet. He reached down along it until his fingers sank into torn flesh where its throat should have been. The wound was ragged. Wolf, or one of those striped cats? But of the latter he had only ever seen skins, and those came from the far south, near Volcando Kingdom. Truly frightened now, he continued on, and moments later found his other dog. This one had a broken neck. The two attacks, he realized, had to have been made simultaneously, else one or the other of the beasts would have barked. A broken neck but no other wounds, no slather of saliva on the fur. The Rodara heaved a half-dozen paces to one side again, and he could make out, at the very edge of his vision, their heads lifted on their long necks, their ears upright. Yet no fear sounds came from them. So, no dangerous scent, no panic. Someone has their attention, someone they're used to obeying. There was no mistaking this. The herd was being stolen. Abbasad could not believe it. He turned about, retracing his route. Twenty paces of silent footfalls later, he set out into a run, back to the camp.
Red Mask's whip snaked out to wrap round the shepherd's neck. The old lethery had been standing, outlined well against the dark, staring mutely at the now-moving herd. A sharp tug from Red Mask and the shepherd's head rolled from the shoulders, the body, arms jerking momentarily out to the sides, falling to one side. The last of them Red Mask knew as he moved up, barring one who had been smart enough to flee, although that would not save him in the end. Well, invaders had to accept the risks. They were thieves as well, weren't they? Luxuriating in their unearned wealth, squatting on land not their own, arrogant enough to demand that it change to suit their purposes, as good as pissing on the spirits in the earth. One paid for such temerity and blasphemy. He pushed away that last thought as unworthy. The spirits could take care of themselves, and they would deliver their own vengeance in time, for they were as patient as they were inexorable. It was not for Red Mask to act on behalf of those spirits. No, that form of righteousness was both unnecessary and disingenuous. The truth was this, Red Mask enjoyed being the hand of all vengeance, personal and accordingly all the more delicious. He had already begun his killing of the lethery back in Dreen. Drawing his knife as he crouched over the old man's severed head, he cut off the lethery's face, rolled it up and stored it with the others in the salt-crusted bag at his hip. Most of the herd dogs had submitted to the all Dre's challenge. They now followed the larger, nastier beast as it worked to waken the entire herd, then drive it en masse eastward. Straightening, Red Mask turned as the first screams erupted from the drover camp. Abbasard was still forty paces from the camp when he saw one of the tents collapse to one side, poles and guides snapping as an enormous two-legged creature thumped over it, talons punching through to the struggling forms beneath, and screams tore through the air. Heads swiveling to one side, the fiend continued on in its loping, stiff-tailed gait, there were huge swords in its hands. Another one crossed its path, fast, low, heading for the foreman's house. Abbasard saw a figure dart from this second beast's path, but not quickly enough, as its head snapped forward, twisting so that its jaws closed to either side of the man's head, whereupon the reptile threw the flailing form upward in a bone-breaking surge. The limp corpse sailed in the air, landing hard and rolling into the hearth-fire in a spray of sparks. Abbasard stood, paralyzed by the horror of the slaughter he saw before him. He had recognized that man. Another indebted, a man who had been courting one of his aunts, a man who always seemed to be laughing. Another figure caught his eye, his baby sister, ten years old, racing out from the camp, away from another tent whose inhabitants were dying beneath chopping swords. Our tent, father! The reptile lifted its head, saw his sister's fleeting form, and surged after her. All at once Abbasard found himself running, straight for the monstrous creature. If it saw him converging, it was indifferent, until the very last moment, as Abbasard raised his staff to swing overhand, hoping to strike the beast on its hind leg, imagining bones breaking. The nearer sword lashed out, so fast, so... Abbasard found himself lying on sodden grasses, feeling heat pour from one side of his body, and as the heat poured out, he grew ever colder. He stared, seeing nothing yet, sensing how something was wrong. He was on his side, but his head was flattened down, his ear pressed to the ground. There should have been a shoulder below and beneath his head, and an arm, and it was where all the heat was pouring out and further down, the side of his chest, this too seemed to be gone. He could feel his right leg kicking at the ground, but no left leg. He did not understand. Slowly he settled onto his back, stared up at the night sky. So much room up there, a ceiling beyond the reach of everyone, covering a place in which they could live, uncrowded, room enough for all. He was glad, he realized, that he had come here, to see, to witness, to understand. Glad, even as he died. Red Mask walked out of the dark to where Massark waited with the lethery horse. Behind him, the Rodara herd was a mass of movement, the dominant males in the lead, their attention fixed on Red Mask. 
Dogs barked and nipped from the far flanks. Distant shouts from the other two young warriors indicated they were where they should be. Climbing into the saddle, Red Mask nodded to Massark, then swung his mount round. Pausing for a long moment, Massark stared at the distant lethary camp, where it seemed the unholy slaughter continued unabated. His guardians, he'd said. He does not fear challenges to come. He will take the fur of the Ganatok war leader. He will lead us to war against the lethary. He is Red Mask, who forswore the all, only to now return. I thought it was too late. I now think I am wrong. He thought again of his death night, and memories returned like winged demons. He had gone mad in that hollowed-out log, gone so far mad that hardly any of him had survived to return, when the morning light blinded him. Now the insanity was loose, tingling at the very ends of his limbs, loose and wild, but as yet undecided, not yet ready to act, to show its face. There was nothing to hold it back, no one. No one but Red Mask, my war leader, who unleashed his own madness years ago. Chapter 5 Denigration afflicted our vaunted ideals long ago, but such inflictions are difficult to measure, to rise up and point a finger to this place, this moment, and say, Here, my friends, this was where our honor, our integrity died. The affliction was too insipid, too much a product of our surrendering mindful regard and diligence. The meanings of words lost their precision, and no one bothered taking to task those who cynically abused those words to serve their own ambitions, their own evasion of personal responsibility. Lies went unchallenged, lawful pursuit became a sham, vulnerable to graft, and justice itself became a commodity, mutable in imbalance. Truth was lost, a chimera reshaped to match agenda, prejudices, thus consigning the entire political process to a mummer's charade of false indignation, hypocritical posturing, and a pervasive contempt for the commonry. Once subsumed, ideals and the honor created by their avowal can never be regained, except, alas, by outright unconstrained rejection, invariably instigated by the commonry at the juncture of one particular moment one single event, of such brazen injustice that revolution becomes the only reasonable response. Consider this, then, a warning. Liars will lie and continue to do so even beyond being caught out. They will lie, and in time such liars will convince themselves, will in all self-righteousness divest the liars of culpability. Until comes a time when one final lie is voiced the one that can only be answered by rage, by cold murder, and on that day blood shall rain down every wall of this vaunted, weaning society. Impeached Guildmaster's speech, Semel Fural of the Guild of Sandal Clasp Makers. Of the turtles known as Vinnick, the females dwelt for the most part in the uppermost reaches of the innumerable sources of the Lether River in the pooled basins and high-ground bogs found in the coniferous forests crowding the base of the Blue Rose Mountains. The mountain runoff, stemmed and backed by the dams built by flat-tailed river rats, descended in modest steps towards the broader, conjoined tributaries feeding the vast river. Vinnick turtles were long-shelled and dorsal-ridged, and their strong forelimbs ended in taloned hands bearing opposable thumbs. In the egg-laying season, the females, smaller by far than their male kin of the deep rivers and the seas, prowled the ponds seeking the nests of waterfowl. Finding one large enough and properly accessible, the female vinnick would appropriate it. Prior to laying her own eggs, the turtle exuded a slime that coated the bird eggs, the slime possessing properties that suspended the development of those young birds. Once the vinnick's clutch was in place, the turtle then dislodged the entire nest, leaving it free to float, drawn by the current. At each barrier, juvenile male vinnick were gathered to drag the nests over dry ground so that they could continue their passive migration down to the Lether River. Many sank or encountered some fatal obstacle on their long, arduous journey to the sea. 
Others were raided by adult Venic dwelling in the depths of the main river. Of those nests that made it to sea, the eggs hatched. The hatchlings fed on the bird embryos, then slipped out into the salty water. Only upon reaching juvenile age, sixty or seventy years, would the new generation of Vinnick begin the years-long journey back up the river, to those distant murky ponds of the Blue Rose Boreal Forest. Nests bobbed in the waters of the Lether River as it flowed past the imperial city, Letharas, seat of the emperor. Local fisher boats avoided them, since large Venic males sometimes tracked the nests just beneath the surface, and provided they weren't hungry enough to raid the nest, they would defend it. Few fisherfolk willingly challenged a creature that could weigh as much as a river galley and was capable of tearing such a galley to pieces with its beak and its clawed forearms. The arrival of the nests announced the beginning of summer, as did the clouds of midges swarming over the river the settling of the water level and the reek of exposed silts along the banks. On the faint rise behind the old palace, the disheveled expanse where stood the foundations of ancient towers, and one in particular constructed of black stone with a low-walled yard, a hunched, hooded figure dragged himself towards the gateway step by aching, awkward step. His spine was twisted, pushed by past ravages of unconstrained power until the ridge of each vertebra was visible beneath the threadbare cloak, the angle forcing his shoulders far forward so that the unkempt ground before him was within reach of his arms, which he used to pull his broken body along. He came searching for a nest, a mound of ragged earth and dying grasses, a worm-chewed hole into a now-dead realm. Questing with preternatural senses, he moved through the yard from one barrow to the next. Empty, empty, empty. Strange insects edged away from his path. Midges spun in cavorting swirls over him, but would not alight to feed, for the searcher's blood was rotted with chaos. The day's dying light plucked at his misshapen shadow, as if seeking sense of a stain so malign on the yard's battered ground. Empty. But this one was not. He allowed himself a small moment of glee. Suspicions confirmed at last. The place that was dead was not entirely dead. Oh, the Azath was now nothing more than lifeless stone, all power and all will drained away. Yet some sorcery lingered here, beneath this oversized mound ringed in shattered trees. Kurald for certain, probably Galane. The stink of Tist Andy was very nearly palpable. Binding rituals, a thick interwoven skein to keep something, someone, down. Crouched, the figure reached with his senses, then suddenly recoiled, breath hissing from between mangled lips. It has begun unraveling. Someone has been here, before me, not long. Sorcery, working the release of this imprisoned creature. Father of shadows, I must think. Hanan Mossag remained motionless, hunched at the very edge of this mound, his mind racing. Beyond the ruined grounds, the river flowed on, down to the distant sea. Carried on its current, vinic nests spun lazily, Milky green eggs, still warm with the day's heat, enclosed vague shapes that squirmed about, eager for the birth of light. She lifted her head with a sharp motion, blood and fragments of human lung smearing her mouth and chin, sliding then dripping down into the split-open ribcage of her victim, a fool who, consumed by delusions of domination and tyranny, no doubt, had chosen to stalk her all the way from upmarkets. It had become a simple enough thing, a lone, seemingly lost woman of high birth, wandering through crowds unaware of the hooded looks and expressions of avarice tracking her. She was like the bait the fisherfolk used to snare brainless fish in the river. True, while she remained hooded, her arms covered in shimmering silk the hue of raw ox heart, wearing elegant calf leather gloves as well as close-wrapped leggings of black linen, there was no way anyone could see the cast of her skin, nor her unusual features, and despite the Tist Edur blood coursing diluted in her veins, she was not uncommonly tall, which well suited her apparent vulnerability, 
for it was clear that these Edur occupiers in this city were far too dangerous to be hunted by the common lethary rapist. She had led him into an alley, whereupon she drove one hand into his chest, tearing out his heart. But it was the lungs she enjoyed the most, the pulpy meat rich with oxygen and not yet soured by the rank juices of violent death. The mortal realm was a delightful place. She had forgotten that. But now her feeding had been interrupted. Someone had come to the Azath grounds. Someone had probed her rituals, which had been dissolving the binding wards set by Siltra's ruin. There could be trouble there, and she was not inclined to suffer interference in her plans. Probably the errant, that meddling bastard, or, even more alarming, that elder god, Male. A miserably crowded city, this Letharus. She had no intention of tarrying over long here, lest her presence be discovered, her schemes knocked awry. Wiping her mouth and chin with the back of one sleeved forearm, she straightened from her feast, then set off. Rotos Hivana, head of the Liberty Consign, squatted on the muddy bank of the river, the work crews finishing the day's excavation directly behind him, the pump crews already washing down, the sounds from the estate's back kitchen rising with the approaching demands of supper. He was making a point of feeding his diggers well as much to ease their bemusement as to keep them working. They were now excavating way below the river level, after all, and if not for the constantly manned pumps, they would be working chest-deep in muddy water. As it was, the shoring on the walls needed continual attention, prone as they were to sag inward. Eyes tracking a half-dozen vinic nests rafting down the river, Rotos Hivana was lost in thought. There had been more mysterious objects buried deep and disconnected, but he had begun to suspect that they all belonged together, that in an as yet inconceivable way they could be assembled into a kind of mechanism. Some central piece remained undiscovered, he believed, perhaps tomorrow. He heard slippered feet on the plank walkway leading down to the river, and a moment later came Venit Sathad's voice. Master! Venet, you have allotted yourself two house guards for the journey. Take two more, and accordingly two more pack horses. You will travel without a supply wagon, as agreed, but that need not be a reason to reduce your level of comfort. Very well, master. And remember, Venet, Letua Anict is in every way the de facto ruler of Dreen regardless of the Edoa governor's official status. I am informed that you will find Orbin Truthfinder, the Invigilator's agent, a reliable ally. As to Letua Anict, the evidence points to the factors having lost perspective. His ambition seems without restraint, no longer harnessed to reason or, for that matter, common sense. I shall be diligent in my investigation, master. Rotos Hivana rose and faced his servant. If needs must, Venet, err on the side of caution. I would not lose you. A flicker of something like surprise in the indebted lined face, then the man bowed. I will remain circumspect, master. One last thing, Rotos said as he moved past Venet on his way up to the estate. Do not embarrass me. The indebted's eyes tracked his master for a moment, his expression once more closed. Unseen behind them on the river, a huge shape lifted beneath one venic nest, and breaking the water as the nest overturned was the prow ridge of an enormous shell, and below that a sinewy neck and a vast gaping beak, swallowing the nest entire. The currents then carried the disturbance away until no sign of it remained. You know, witnessing something is one thing, understanding it another. Bug turned away from his study of the distant river, where the setting sun's light turned the water into a rippled sheet of beaten gold, and frowned at Tehol Bedict. Very pondering of you, master. It was, wasn't it? I have decided that it is my normal eye that witnesses, while it is my blue eye that understands. Does that make sense to you? No. 
Good, I'm glad. The night promises to be both heavy and hot, Master, and I suggest the mosquito netting. Agreed. Can you get to it? I can't reach. You could if you stretched an arm. What's your point? Nothing. I admit to some distraction. Just now? Yes. Are you over it yet? Almost. Alas, certain individuals are stirring in the city this evening. Well, are you going to do something about it, or do I have to do everything around here? Bug walked across the roof to stand beside the bed. He studied the reposed form of Tehol Bedict for a moment, then he collected the netting and draped it over his master. Eyes, one brown, the other blue, blinked up at him. Shouldn't there be a frame or something? I feel I am being readied for my own funeral here. We used the frame for this morning's fire. Ah. Well, is this going to keep me from being bitten? Probably not, but it looks rather fetching. Tehol closed his blue eye. I see. Bug sighed. Gallows humor, master. My, you are in a state, aren't you? I am undecided, Bug said, nodding. Yes, I know, one of my eternal flaws. What you require, old friend, is a mortal's perspective on things. So let's hear it. Lay out the dilemma for me, Bug, so that I might provide you with a properly pithy solution. The errant follows the warlock king to see what he plans. The warlock king meddles with a nefarious ritual set in place by another ascendant, who in turn leaves off eating a freshly killed corpse and makes for an unexpected rendezvous with said warlock king, where they will probably make each other's acquaintance, then bargain to mutual benefit over the crumbling chains binding another ascendant, one soon to be freed, which will perturb someone far to the north, although that one is probably not yet ready to act. In the meantime, the long-departed Edur fleet skirts the Draconian Sea and shall soon enter the river mouth on its fated return to our fair city, and with it are two fell champions, neither of whom is likely to do what is expected of them. Now, to add spice to all of that, the secret that is the soul of one scabandari blood-eye will, in a depressingly short time, cease to be a secret— and consequently, and in addition to, and concomitant with, we are in for an interesting summer. Is that all? Not in the least, but one mouthful at a time, I always say. No, you don't. Shurk Elal is the one always saying that. Your penchant for disgusting images, Master, is as ever poorly timed and thoroughly inappropriate. Now, about that pithy solution of yours. Well... I admit to disappointment. You didn't even mention my grand scheme to bankrupt the Empire. The Invigilator now hunts for you in earnest. Karos Invictad? No wonder you put me under a shroud. I shall endeavor to be close to the roof's edge the day he clambers into view with his drooling henchmen, so that I can fling myself over the side, which, you'll agree, is far preferable to even one bell's worth of his infamous ghastly inquisition. In the meantime, what's for supper? Vinnick eggs. I found a somewhat broken nest washed up under a dock. But Vinnick eggs are poisonous, hence the clouds of complaining gulls constantly circling over every nasty little floating island. It's a matter of proper cooking, master, and the addition of a few essential herbs that serve to negate most of the ill effects. Most? Yes. And do you have in your possession those life-sustaining herbs? Well, no, but I thought I'd improvise. There you have it. There I have what, master? Why, my pithy reply, of course. Bug squinted at Tehol Bedic, who winked, this time closing his brown eye. The elder god scowled, then said, Thank you, master. What would I ever do without you? Scant little, I'd wager. Tanal Yathvana set the package down on the invigilator's desk. Delivered by a rat-faced urchin this morning. Sir, I expect it will prove no particular challenge. In any case, he continued as he began unwrapping the package, 
I was instructed to treat it delicately and to keep it upright, and you will, in moments, see why. Kauros and Victad watched with heavy-lidded eyes as the grease-stained, poor-quality ragweed wrapping was delicately pulled away, revealing a small, open-topped wooden box that seemed to possess layered sides. The invigilator leaned forward to peer inside, and saw a two-headed insect, such as were now appearing down by the river. Its legs were moving precisely, carrying it round and round. The insides of the box were each of coloured, polished tiles, and it appeared that the tiles could be slid free or rearranged, if one so chose. What were the instructions, Tanal? The challenge is to halt the insect's motion. It will, apparently, continue walking in a circle in the same place until it dies of starvation, which, incidentally, is the fail point for the puzzle, approximately four months. While the creature rotates in place, it will not eat. As for water, a small clump of soaked moss will suffice. As you can see, the tiles on the inside can be rearranged, and presumably, once the proper order or sequence is discovered, the insect will stop, and you will have defeated the puzzle. The restrictions are these. No object may be placed inside the container, nor can you physically touch or make contact with the insect. Kauros Invictad grunted. Seems direct enough. What is the record for the solution? There is none. You are the first and only player, apparently. Indeed. Curious. Tanol, three prisoners died in their cells last night. Some contagion is loose down there. Have the corpses burned in the receiving ground west of the city, thoroughly, and have the rest washed down with disinfectant. At once, invigilator. The ruins were far more extensive than is commonly imagined. In fact, most historians of the early period of the colony have paid little or no attention to the reports of the royal engineer, specifically those of Keden Khan, who served from the founding until the sixth decade. During the formulation of the settlement building plan, a most thorough survey was conducted. The three extant jag towers behind the old palace were in fact part of a far larger complex, which of course runs contrary to what is known of jag civilization. For this reason, it may be safe to assume that the jag complex on the bank of the Letha River represents a pre-dispersion site. That is, before the culture disintegrated in its sudden, violent diaspora. An alternative interpretation would be that the three main towers— Four subterranean vaults and what Khan called the lined moat all belonged to a single, unusually loyal family. In either case, the point I am making here is this. Beyond the jag, or more correctly jag hut, complex, there were other ruins. Of course, one need not point out the most obvious and still existing Azath structure. That lecture will have to wait another day. Rather, in an area covering almost the entire expanse of present-day Letharas could be found foundation walls, plazas or concourses, shaped wells, drainage ditches, and, indeed, some form of cemetery or mortuary, and, listen carefully now, all of it not of human design, nor Jaghut, nor even Tarthanal. Now, what were the details of this unknown complex? Well, for one, it was self-contained, walled, entirely covered by multi-level roofing, even the plazas, alleys, and streets. As a fortress, it was virtually impregnable. Beneath the intricately paved floors and streets, there was a second, even more defensible city, the corridors and tunnels of which can now be found as an integral part of our sewer outflow. In short, Letharas, the colony of the First Empire, was founded upon the ruins of an earlier city one whose layout seemed to disregard the presence of the Jaghut Towers and the Azath, suggesting that it predates both. Even the first engineer, Keden Khan, was unable or unwilling to attempt an identification of these early builders. Virtually no artifacts were found, no potsherds, no sculptures, no remnants of metalworking. One last interesting detail. It appeared that in the final stages of occupation, the dwellers set about frantic alterations to their city. Khan's analysis of these efforts led him to conclude that a catastrophic climate change had occurred, for the efforts indicated a desperate attempt to add insulation. 
Presumably, that effort failed. Her interior monologue ceased abruptly as she heard the faint scuff of someone approaching. Lifting her head was a struggle, but Janath Anar managed, just as the chamber's heavy door creaked open and light flooded in from a lantern, dull and low, yet blinding her nonetheless. Tanal Yathavana stepped into view. It would be none other but him, she knew, and a moment later he spoke. I pray you've yet to drive yourself mad. Through cracked, blistered lips she smiled, then said in a croaking voice, Lectures. I am halfway into the term. Early history. Mad? Oh, yes, without question. She heard him come closer. I have been gone from you too long. You are suffering. That was careless of me. Careless is keeping me alive, you miserable little wretch, she said. Ah, perhaps I deserved that. Come, you must drink. What if I refuse? Then, with your inevitable death, you are defeated. By me. Are you sure you want that, scholar? You urge me to stubborn resistance. I understand. The sadist needs his victim alive, after all, for as long as humanly possible. Dehydration is a most unpleasant way to die, Janath Anar. He lifted the spigot of a water skin to her mouth. She drank. Not too quickly, Tanal said, stepping back. You will just make yourself sick, which wouldn't, I see, be the first time for you. When you see maggots crawl out of your own wastes, Yathvana, next time, she added, take your damned candle with you. If I do that, he replied, you will go blind. And that matters? He stepped close once again and poured more water into her mouth. Then he set about washing her down. Sores had opened where stomach fluids had burned desiccated skin. And, he could see, she had been pulling on her bindings, seeking to squeeze her hands through the shackles. You are looking much worse for wear, he said as he dabbed ointment on the wounds. You cannot get your hands through, Janath. Panic cares nothing for what can and can't be done, Tanel Yathvana. One day you will discover that. There was a priest once, in the second century, who created a cult founded on the premise that every victim tallied in one's mortal life awaits that one beyond death. From the slightest of wounds to the most grievous, every victim preceding you into death waits for you. A mortal conducts spiritual economics in his or her life, amassing credit and debt. Tell me, patriotist, how indebted are you by now? How vast the imbalance between good deeds and your endless acts of malice. A bizarre, insane cult, he muttered, moving away. No wonder it failed. In this empire, yes, it's no wonder at all. The priest was set upon in the street and torn limb from limb. Still, its said adherents remain among the defeated peoples, the Tarthanal, the Fent and Nerek, the victims, as it were, of lethary cruelty. And before those people virtually disappeared from the city, there were rumors that the cult was reviving. Tanal Yathvana sneered. The ones who fail ever need a crutch, a justification. They fashion virtue out of misery. Kairos Invictad has identified that weakness in one of his treatises. Janath's laugh broke into ragged coughing. When she recovered, she spat and said, Karas Invictad, do you know why he so despises academics? He is a failed one himself. She bared her stained teeth. He calls them treatises, does he? Errant fend, how pathetic. Karas Invictad couldn't fashion a decent argument, much less a treatise. You are wrong in that, woman, Tanal said. He has even explained why he did so poorly as a young scholar. Oh, yes, he would not refute your assessment of his career as a student. Driven by emotions back then, incapable of a cogent position, leaving him rife with anger, but at himself, at his own failings. 
But years later he learned that all emotion had to be scoured from him. Only then would his inner vision become clear. Ah, he needed wounding then. What was it? A betrayal of sorts, I expect. Some woman? A protege? A patron? Does it even matter? Karas Invictad makes sense to me now. Why, he is what he has become. She laughed again, this time without coughing, then said, Delicious irony. Karas Invictad became a victim. Don't be a victim, Yathvana. And he didn't like it. Oh, no, not at all. It hurt. The world hurt him. So now he's hurting it back. And yet he has still to even the score. But you see, he never will, because in his mind he's still that victim, still lashing out. And as you said earlier, the victim and his crutch, his virtue of misery, one feeds the other without cessation. No wonder he bridles with self-righteousness for all his claims to emotionless intellect. He struck her hard, her head snapping to one side, spittle and blood threading out. Breathing fast, chest strangely tight, Tunnel hissed. Rail at me all you will, scholar. I expect that, but not at Karos Invictad. He is the Empire's last true hope. Only Karos Invictad will guide us into glory, into a new age, an age without the Edur, without the mixed bloods, without even the failed peoples. No, just the lethery, an empire expanding outward with sword and fire, all the way back to the homeland of the First Empire. He has seen our future, our destiny. She stared at him in the dull light. Of course, but first he needs to kill every lethery worthy of the name. Karas Invictad, the great scholar and his empire of thugs. He struck her again, harder than before, then lurched back, raising his hand. It was trembling, skin torn and battered, a shard of one broken tooth jutting from one knuckle. She was unconscious. Well, she asked for it. She wouldn't stop. That means she wanted it. Deep inside, she wanted me to beat her. I've heard about this. Karos has told me. They come to like it, eventually. They like the attention. So I must not neglect her, not again. Plenty of water, keep her clean and fed, and beat her anyway. But she was not unconscious, for she then spoke in a mumble. He could not make it out and edged closer. On the other side, I will wait for you. On the other side. Tanal Yathvana felt a slither deep in his gut and fled from it. No god waits to pass judgment. No one marks the imbalance of deeds. No god is beyond its own imbalances, for its own deeds are as subject to judgment as any other. So who then fashions this afterlife? Some natural imposition? Ridiculous. There is no balance in nature. Besides, nature exists in this world and this world alone. Its rules mean nothing once the bridge is crossed. Tanal Yathvana found himself walking up the corridor, that horrid woman and her cell far behind him now. He had no recollection of actually leaving. Karos has said again and again, justice is a conceit. It does not exist in nature. Retribution seen in natural catastrophes is manufactured by all too eager and all too pious people. Each one convinced the world will end, but spare them and them alone. But we all know the world is inherited by the obnoxious, not the righteous. Unless, came the thought in Janeth's voice, the two are one and the same. He snarled as he hurried up the worn stone stairs. She was far below, chained, a prisoner in her solitary cell. There was no escape for her. I have left her down there, far below, far behind. She can't escape. Yet in his mind he heard her laughter, and was no longer so sure. Two entire wings of the eternal domicile were empty, 
Long, vacated corridors and never-occupied chambers, storage rooms, administration vaults, servant quarters and kitchens. Guards patrolling these sections once a day carried their own lanterns and left unrelieved darkness in their wake. In the growing damp of these unoccupied places, dust had become mold, mold had become rot, and the rot in turn leaked rank fluids that ran down plastered walls and pooled in dips in the floors. Abandonment and neglect would soon defeat the ingenious innovations of Bugs' construction, as they defeated most things raised by hands out of the earth, and Turadal Brizard, the errant, considered himself almost unique in his fullest recognition of such sordid truths. Indeed, there were other elders persisting in their nominal existence, but they one and all fought still against the ravages of inevitable dissolution, whereas the errant could not be bothered. Most of the time. The Jaghart had come to comprehend the nature of futility, inspiring the errant to a certain modicum of empathy for those most tragic of people. Where was Gothos now, he wondered? Probably long dead, all things considered. He had written a multiple-volumed suicide note, his folly, that presumably concluded at some point, although the errant had neither seen nor heard that such a conclusion existed. Perhaps, he considered with sudden suspicion, there was some hidden message in a suicidal testimonial without end, but if so, such meaning was too obscure for the mind of anyone but a jag hut. He had followed the warlock king to the dead Azath, remained there long enough to discern Hanan Mossag's intentions, and had now returned to the eternal domicile, where he could walk these empty corridors in peace, contemplating, among other things, stepping once again into the fray to battle one more time the ravages of dissolution. He thought he could hear Gothos laughing somewhere, but no doubt that was only his imagination, ever eager to mock his carefully reasoned impulses. Finding himself in a stretch of corridor awash with slime-laden water, the errant paused. Well, he said with a soft sigh, to bring a journey to a close, one must first begin it. Best I act whilst the will remains. His next step took him into a glade, thick verdant grasses underfoot, a ring of dazzling flowers at the very edges of the black bold trees encircling the clearing. Butterflies danced from one bloom of colour to the next. The patch of sky visible overhead was faintly tinted vermilion, and the air seemed strangely thin. A voice spoke behind him. I do not welcome company here. The errant turned. He slowly cocked his head. It's not often the sight of a woman inspires fear in my soul. She scowled. Am I that ugly, Elder? To the contrary, Menandor, rather formidable. You have trespassed into my place of refuge. She paused, then asked, Does it so surprise you that one such as myself needs refuge? I do not know how to answer that, he replied. You're a careful one, Errant. I suspect you want a reason to kill me. She walked past him, long black sarong flowing from frayed ends and ragged tears. Abyss below, she murmured. Am I so transparent? Who but you could have guessed that I require justification for killing? So your sense of sarcasm has survived your solitude, Menandor. It is what I am ever accused of, isn't it? My random acts. Oh, I know, they're not random. They only seem that way. You delight in tragic failure, which leads me to wonder what you want with me. We are not well suited, you and I. What have you been up to lately? he asked. Why should I tell you? because I have information to impart, which you will find well suited to your nature, and I seek recompense. If I deny it, you will have made this fraught journey for nothing. It will only be fraught if you attempt something untoward, Menandor. Precisely. Her unhuman eyes regarded him steadily. He waited. Sky keeps, she said. Ah, I see. Has it begun, then? No, but soon. 
Well, you are not one to act without long preparation, so I am not that surprised. And which side will we eventually find you on, Menendor? Why, mine, of course. You will be opposed. One thin brow arched. The errant glanced around. A pleasant place. What warren are we in? You would not believe me if I told you. Ah, he nodded. That one. Very well, your sisters conspire. Not against me, Ellent. Not directly, or rather not immediately. Rest assured, however, that the severing of your head from your shoulders is the eventual goal. Has she been freed, then? Imminent. And you will do nothing? What of the others in that fell city? Others? Male is being male. Who else hides in Letharus, barring your two sisters? Sisters, she said, then sneered as she turned away, walked to one edge of the glade where she crouched and plucked a flower. Facing him once more, she lifted the flower to draw deep its scent. From the snapped stem, thick red blood dripped steadily. I've indeed heard it said that beauty is the thinnest skin. She suddenly smiled. Why, no one. I misspoke. You invite me to a frantic and no doubt time-devouring search to prove your ingenuousness, Menendor. What possible reason could you have to set me on such a trail? She shrugged. Serves you right for infringing upon my place of refuge, Errant. Are we done here? Your flower is bled out, he said as he stepped back and found himself once more in the empty, flooded corridor of the Eternal Domicile's fifth wing. Others, the bitch. As soon as the errant vanished from the glade, Menendor flung the wilted flower to one side, and two figures emerged from the forest, one from her left, the other from her right. Menendor arched her back as she ran both hands through her thick red hair. Both figures paused to watch. She had known they would. You heard? she asked, not caring which one answered. Neither did. Menendor dropped her pose and scowled over to the scrawny shadow-swarmed god to her left. That cane is an absurd affectation, you know. Never mind my absurd affectations, woman. Blood dripping from a flower for Hood's sake. Oops! The god known as Shadow Throne tilted a head towards the tall, cowled figure opposite. Humblest apologies, Reaper. Hood, Lord of Death, seemed to cock his head as if surprised. Yours? Apologies? Naturally not. I but made a declarative statement. Was there a subject attached to it? No. We three fell creatures have met, have spoken, have agreed on scant little, and have concluded that our previous impressions of each other proved far too generous. Nonetheless, it seems we are agreed, more or less, on the one matter you, Hood, wanted to address. It's no wonder you're so ecstatic. Menendor frowned at the Lord of Death, seeking evidence of ecstasy. Finding none, she eyed Shadow Throne once more. Know that I have never accepted your claim. I'm crushed, so your sisters are after you. What a dreadful family you have. Want help? You too? Recall my dismissal of the errant. Shadow Throne shrugged. Elders think too slowly. My offer is of another magnitude. Think carefully before you reject it. And what do you ask in return? Use of a gate. Which gate? Shadow Throne giggled, then the eerie sound abruptly stopped, and in a serious tone he said, Starve out Demolane. To what end? Why, providing you with assistance, of course. You want my sisters out of the way, too, perhaps more than I do. Squirming on that throne of yours, are you? Convenient convergence of desires, Menendor. Ask Hood about such things, especially now. 
If I give you access to Starvald Demolane, you will use it more than once. Not I. Do you so vow? Why not? Foolish, Hood said in a rasp. I hold you to that vow, Shadow Throne, Menendor said. Then you accept my help? As you do mine in this matter. Convergence of desires, you said. You're right, Shadow Throne said. I retract all notions of help. We are mutually assisting one another, as fits said convergence, and once finished with the task at hand, no other obligations exist between us. That is agreeable. You too, Hood said, turning away, are worse than advocates, and you don't want to know what I do with the souls of advocates. A heart beat later, and the Lord of Death was gone. Menendor frowned. Shadow Throne, what are advocates? A profession devoted to the subversion of laws for profit, he replied, his cane inexplicably tapping as he shuffled back into the woods. When I was emperor, I considered butchering them all. So why didn't you? she asked as he began to fade into a miasma of gloom beneath the trees. Faintly came the reply. The royal advocate said it'd be a terrible mistake. Menendor was alone once again. She looked around, then grunted. Gods, I hate this place. A moment later, she too vanished. Janol, once empress of the Lether Empire, was now barely recognizable as a human, brutally used as a conduit of the chaotic power of the crippled god. Her body had been twisted into a malign nightmare, bones bent, muscles stretched and bunched, and now huge bulges of fat hung in folds from her malformed body. She could not walk, could not even lift her left arm, and the sorcery had broken her mind the madness burning from eyes that glittered malevolently in the gloom as Nissal, carrying a lantern, paused in the doorway. The chamber was rank with sweat, urine, and other suppurations from the countless oozing sores on Janal's skin. The sweet reek of spoiled food and another odor, pungent, that reminded the emperor's concubine of rotting teeth. Janal dragged herself forward with a strange asymmetrical shift of her hips, pivoting on her right arm. The motion made a sudden sound beneath her, and Nissal saw the streams of saliva easing out from the once beautiful woman's misshapen mouth. The floor was pooled in the mucus, and it was this, she realized, that was the source of the pungent smell. Fighting back nausea, the concubine stepped forward. Empress? No longer! The voice was ragged, squeezed out from a deformed throat, and drool spattered with every jerk of her misshapen jaw. I am queen of his house, his honeyed house. Oh, we are a contented family. Oh, yes. And one day, one day soon, you'll see, that pop on the throne will come here for me, his queen. You, whore, you're nothing. The house is not for you. You blind roulette to the truth, but his vision will clear once. Her voice dropped to a whisper and she leaned forward. We are rid of you. I came, Nissal said, to see if you needed anything. Liar, you came in search of allies. You think to steal him away from me, from our true master. You will fail. Where's my son? Where is he? Nissal shook her head. I don't know. I don't even know if he's still alive. There are those in the court who claim he is, whilst others tell me he is long dead. But, Empress, I will seek to find out, and when I do, I will return with the truth. I don't believe you. You were never my ally. You were Esgara's whore, not mine. Has Turidal Brizard visited you, Empress? For a moment it seemed she would not answer. Then she managed something like a shrug. He does not dare. 
Master sees through my eyes. Tell Rulad that, and he will understand what must be. Through my eyes, look closer if you would know a god. The god, the only god that matters now. The rest of them are blind, as blind as you've made Rulad, but they're all in for a surprise. Oh, yes. The house is big, bigger than you imagine. The house is all of us, whore, and one day that truth will be proclaimed so that all will hear. See me? I am on my knees, and that is no accident. Every human shall be on their knees one day, and they will know me for their queen. As for the king in chains, she laughed, a sound sick with phlegm. Well, the crown is indifferent to whose skull it binds. The pup is failing, you know, failing. There is dissatisfaction. I should kill you now, here. Come closer, or Instead, Nissal backed away a step, then two, until she was once more in the doorway. Empress, the Chancellor is the source of Rulad's failings. Your god should know that, lest it make a mistake. If you would kill anyone, it should be Triban Gnoll, and perhaps Kaoros Invictad. They plot to usurp the Edur. The Edur? She spat. Master's almost done with them, almost done. I will send servants down, Nissal said, to clean your chamber, Empress. Spies? No, from your own entourage. Tanned! Empress, they will take care of you, for their loyalty remains. But I don't want them! Janal hunched lower. I don't want them to see me like this. A bed will be sent down, canopied. You can draw the shroud when they arrive. Pass out the soiled bedding through a part in the curtain. You would do this? I wanted you dead! The past is nothing, Nissal said. Not any more. Get out! Janal rasped, looking away. Master is disgusted with you. Suffering is our natural state. A truth to proclaim, and so I shall when I win my new throne. Get out, or, or come closer. Expect your servants within the bell, Nissal said, turning and walking from the grisly chamber. As the echo of the whore's footsteps faded, Janol, queen of the House of Chains, curled up into a ball on the slick, befouled floor. Madness flickered in her eyes, there, then gone, then there once more, over and over again. She spoke, one voice thick, the other rasping. Vulnerable! Until the final war... Watch the army as it pivots round, entirely round. These sordid games here, the times are almost past, past us all. Oh, when the pain at last ends, then you shall see the truth of me. Dear queen, my power was once the sweetest kiss, a love that broke nothing. Give me my throne, you promised. Is it worth it? I beg you. They all beg me and call it prayer. What sour benediction must I swallow from this eternal fount of dread and spite and bald greed? Will you never see, never understand? I must find the broken ones. Just do not expect my reach, my touch. No one understands how the gods fear freedom. No one. You have lied to me. You have lied to yourself. You all do, and call it faith. I am your god. I am what you made me. You all decry my indifference, but I assure you, you would greater decry my attention. No, make no proclamations otherwise. I know what you claim to do in my name. 
I know your greatest fear is that I will one day call you on it. And that is the real game here, this knuckles of the soul. Watch me, mortal, watch me call you on it, every one of you. My god is mad. As you would have me, so I am. I want my throne. You always want. Why won't you give it to me? I answer as a god. If I give you what you want, we all die. Ha! I know. You don't care. Oh, you humans, you are something else. You make my every breath agony. And my every convulsion is your ecstasy. Very well, mortal. I will answer your prayers. I promise. Just do not ever say I didn't warn you. Do not. Ever. Janal laughed, spraying spit. We are mad, she whispered. Oh, yes, quite mad. And we're climbing into the light. For all the scurrying servants and the motionless helmed guards at various entrances, Nissal found the more populated areas of the eternal domicile in some ways more depressing than the abandoned corridors she'd left behind a third of a bell past. Suspicion soured the air, fear stalked like shadows underfoot between the stanchions of torchlight. The palace's name had acquired a taint of irony, rife as the eternal domicile was with paranoia, intrigue, and incipient betrayal. As if humans could manage no better, and were doomed to such sordid existence for all time. Clearly there was nothing satisfying in peace, beyond the freedom it provided to get up to no good. She had been shaken by her visit to the supposedly insane once empress, Janon. This crippled god indeed lurked in the woman's eyes. Nissal had seen it, felt that chilling, unhuman attention fixing on her, calculating, pondering her potential use. She did not want to be part of a god's plans, especially that god's. Even more frightening, Janal's ambitions remained, engorged with visions of supreme power, her tortured, brutalized body notwithstanding. The god was using her as well. There were rumors of war hissing like wind in the palace, tales of a belligerent conspiracy of border kingdoms and tribes to the east. The Chancellor's reports to Rulad had been anything but simple in their exhortations to raise the stakes. A formal declaration of war, the marching of massed troops over the borders in a preemptive campaign of conquest. Far better to spill blood on their lands than on leathery soil, after all. If the Balkando-led alliance wants war, we should give it to them. The Chancellor's glittering eyes belied the cool, almost toneless enunciation of those words. Rulad had fidgeted on his throne, muttering his unease. The Edoer were too spread out, the Carisnan were overworked. Why did the Balkandans so dislike him? There had been no list of grievances. He had done nothing to spark this fire to life. Triban Gnoll had pointed out, quietly, that four agents of the conspiracy had been captured entering Letharas only the other day, disguised as merchants seeking ivory. Kauros and Victad had sent by courier their confessions, and would the emperor like to see them? Shaking his head in denial, Rulad had said nothing, his pain-racked eyes fixed on the tiles of the dais beyond his slippered feet. So lost, this terrible emperor. As she turned onto the corridor leading to her private chambers, she saw a tall figure standing near her door, a tist Edur, one of the few who were resident in the palace. She vaguely recalled the warriors having something to do with security. He tilted his head in greeting as she approached. First concubine Nassau. Has the emperor sent you? she asked, stepping past and waving him behind her into the chambers. Few men could intimidate her. She knew too well their minds. She was less at ease in the company of women and the virtually neutered men such as Triban Gnoll. Alas, the warrior said, I am not permitted to speak to my emperor. She paused and glanced back at him. Are you out of favor? I have no idea. 
Intrigued now, Nissal regarded the Edor for a moment, then asked, Would you like some wine? No, thank you. Were you aware that a directive has been issued by Invigilator Karos Invictad to compile evidence leading to your arrest for sedition? She grew very still. Sudden heat flashed through her. Then she felt cold, beads of sweat like ice against her skin. Are you here, she whispered, to arrest me? His brows rose. No, nothing of the sort. The very opposite, in fact. You wish, then, to join in my treason? First, concubine, I do not believe you are engaged in any seditious acts, and if you are, I doubt they are directed against Emperor Rulad. She frowned. If not the Emperor, then whom? And how could it be considered treasonous if they are not aimed at Rulad? Do you think I resent the Tist Edor hegemony? Precisely whom am I conspiring against? If I was forced to hazard a guess, Chancellor Triban Gnoll. She said nothing for a moment, then. What do you want? Forgive me, my name is Bruthen Trana. I was appointed to oversee the operations of the Patriotists, although it is likely that the Emperor has since forgotten that detail. I am not surprised. You've yet to report to him. He grimaced. True, the Chancellor has made certain of that. He insists you report to him instead, yes? I'm beginning to understand, Bruthen Trana. Presumably, Triban Gnoll's assurances that he has conveyed said reports to Rulad are false. The only reports the Emperor receives regarding the Patriotists are those from the Invigilator, as vetted through the Chancellor. He sighed. As I suspected... First concubine, it is said your relationship with the Emperor has gone somewhat beyond that of ruler and chosen whore. Forgive me for the use of that term. Rulad is being isolated from his own people. Daily he receives petitions, but they are all from Lethary, and those are carefully selected by Triban Gnoll and his staff. This situation had worsened since the fleet sailed, for with them went Tomad Sengar and Uruth, and many other Hiroth, including Rulad's brother, Binadas. All who might have effectively opposed the Chancellor's machinations were removed from the scene. Even Hanradi Kalag. His words fell away, and he stared at her, then shrugged. I must speak to the Emperor, Nisal, privately. I may not be able to help you, if I am to be arrested, she said. Only Rulad himself can prevent that from occurring, Bruthentrana said. In the meantime, I can afford you some protection. She cocked her head. How? I will assign you two Edua bodyguards. Ah, so you are not entirely alone, Bruthen. The only Edua truly alone here is the Emperor, and perhaps Hanan Mossag, although he still has his Karisnan. But it is anything but certain that the once warlock king is loyal to Rulad. Nissal smiled without much humor. And so it turns out, she said, that the Tist Edor are no different from the Lethary after all. Do you know Rulad would have it otherwise? Perhaps then, first concubine, we can work together to help him realize his vision. Your bodyguards had best be subtle, Bruthen. The Chancellor's spies watch me constantly. The Edua smiled. Nisal, we are children of shadow. Once long ago, she had walked for a time through Hood's realm. In the language of the Elaint, the warren that was neither new nor elder was known as Festal Rithan, the lairs of the dead. She had found proof of that when traversing the winding cut of a gorge, the raw walls of which revealed innumerable strata evincing the truth of extinction. Every species that ever existed was trapped in the sediments of Festal Rithan, not in the same manner of similar formations of geology as could be found in any world. No, in Hood's realm the soul sparks persisted, and what she was witness to was their lives abandoned here, crushed into immobility. The stone itself was, in the peculiar oxymoron that plagued the language of death, alive. 
In the broken grounds surrounding the lifeless Azath of Letharas, many of those long-extinct creatures had crawled back through the gate, as insidious as any vermin. True, it was not a gate as such, just rents, fissures, as if some terrible demon had slashed from both sides, talons the size of two-handed swords tearing through the fabric between the warrens. There had been battles here, the spilling of ascendant blood, the uttering of vows that could not be kept. She could still smell the death of the Tarthanol gods, could almost hear their outrage and disbelief as one fell, then another, and another, until all were gone, delivered unto Festal Rithan. She did not pity them. It was too easy to be arrogant upon arriving in this world, to think that none could challenge the unleashing of ancient power. She had long since discovered a host of truths in time's irresistible progression. Raw became refined, and with refinement power grew ever deadlier. All that was simple would, in time and under sufficient pressure, and if random chance proved benign rather than malignant, acquire greater complexity. And yet at some point a threshold was crossed, and complexity crumbled into dissolution. There was nothing fixed in this. Some forms rose and fell with astonishing rapidity, while others could persist for extraordinarily long periods in seeming stasis. Thus she believed she comprehended more than most, yet found that she could do little with that knowledge. Standing in the overgrown battered yard, her cold, unhuman eyes fixed on the malformed shape squatting at the edge of the largest sundered barrow, she could see through to the chaos inside him, could see how it urged dissolution within that complex matrix of flesh, blood, and bone. Pain radiated from his hunched, twisted back as she continued studying him. He had grown aware of her presence, and fear whispered through him, the sorcery of the crippled god building. Yet he was uncertain if she presented a threat. In the meantime, ambition rose and fell like crashing waves around the island of his soul. She could, she decided, make use of this one. I am Hanan Mossag, the figure said without turning. You, you are soul taken, the cruelest of the sisters, accursed among the Edor Pantheon. Your heart is betrayal. I greet you, Sukul Ankadu. She approached. Betrayal belongs to the one buried beneath Hanan Mossag, to the sister you once worshipped. How much, Edor, did that shape your destiny, I wonder? Any betrayals plaguing your people of late? Ah, I saw that flinch. Well then, neither of us should be surprised. You work to free her? I always worked better with Sheltatha Lore than I did with Menendor. Although that may not be the case now, the buried one has her obsessions. The Tist Edor grunted. Don't we all? How long have you known your most cherished protectress was entombed here? Suspicions for years. I had thought, hoped, that I would discover what remained of Skabandari blood eye here as well. Wrong ascendant, Sukul Ankadu said, her tone droll. Had you got it right as to who betrayed whom back then, you would have known that. I hear the contempt in your voice. Why are you here, so impatient as to add your power to the rituals I unleashed below? It may be, Hanan Mossag said, that we could work together for a time. What would be the value in that? The Tist Edor shifted to look up at her. It seems obvious. Even now, Silchas Ruin hunts for the one I'd thought here. I doubt that either you or Shaltatha Law would be pleased should he succeed. I can guide you onto his trail. I can also lend you support at the moment of confrontation. And in return? For one, we can see an end to your killing and eating citizens in the city. For another, we can destroy Silcha's ruin. She grunted. I have heard that determination voiced before, Hanan Mossag. Is the crippled god truly prepared to challenge him? With allies, yes. She considered his proposal. There would be treachery, 
but it would probably not occur until after ruin was disposed of. The game would turn over the disposition of the finest. She well knew that Scabandari Blood Eye's power was not as it once was, and what remained would be profoundly vulnerable. Tell me, does Silchas Ruin travel alone? No, he has a handful of followers, but of them only one is cause for concern. Atis Edur, the eldest brother of the Sengar, once commander of the Edur warriors. A surprising alliance. Shaky is a better way of describing it. He too seeks the finest, and will, I believe, do all he can to prevent its falling into ruin's hands. Ah, experience plagues us all, Sukul Ankadu smiled. Very well, Hanan Mossack. We are agreed, but tell your crippled god this. Fleeing at the moment of attack, abandoning Shaltatha Lore and myself to Silchas Ruin, and, say, making off with the finest during the fight, will prove a fatal error. With our dying breaths, we will tell Silchas Ruin all he needs to know, and he will come after the crippled god, and he will not relent. You will not be abandoned, Sukul Ankadu. As for the finest itself, do you wish to claim it for yourselves? She laughed. To fight over it between us? No, we'd rather see it destroyed. I see. Would you object, then, to the crippled gods making use of its power? Will such use achieve eventual destruction? Oh, yes, Sukul Ankadu. She shrugged. As you like. You must truly think me a fool, Hanan Mossag. Your god marches to war. He will need all the help he can get. Hanan Mossag managed his own smile, a twisted, feral thing. He is incapable of marching. He does not even crawl. The war comes to him, sister. If there was hidden significance to that distinction, Sukul Ankadu was unable to discern it. Her gaze lifted, fixed on the river to the south, wheeling gulls, strange islands of sticks and grasses spinning on the currents. And she could sense beneath the swirling surface enormous belligerent leviathans using the islands as bait, whatever came close enough. She was drawn to a rumble of power from the broken barrow and looked down once more. She's coming, Hanan Mossag. Shall I leave? Or will she be amenable to our arrangement? On that, Edor, I cannot speak for her. Best you depart. She will, after all, be very hungry. Besides, she and I have much to discuss. Old wounds to mend between us. She watched as the malformed warlock dragged himself away. After all, you are much more her child than you are mine, and I'd rather she was, for the moment, without allies. It was all Menendor's doing, anyway. Chapter 6 The argument was this. A civilization shackled to the strictures of excessive control on its populace, from choice of religion through to the production of goods, will sap the will and the ingenuity of its people for whom such qualities are no longer given sufficient incentive or reward. At face value, this is accurate enough. Trouble arrives when the opponents to such a system institute its extreme opposite, where individualism becomes godlike and sacrosanct, and no greater service to any other ideal, including community, is possible. In such a system, rapacious greed thrives behind the guise of freedom, and the worst aspects of human nature come to the fore a kind of intransigence as fierce and nonsensical as its maternalistic counterpart. And so, in the clash of these two extreme systems, one is witness to brute stupidity and blood-splashed insensitivity, two belligerent faces glowering at each other across the unfathomed distance, and yet, in deed and in fanatic regard, they are but mirror reflections. This would be amusing if it weren't so pathetically idiotic. In defense of compassion, Denebaris of Letharas, 4th century. Dead pirates were better, Shurkilal mused. 
There was a twisted sort of justice in the dead preying upon the living, especially when it came to stealing all their treasured possessions. Her pleasure in prying those ultimately worthless objects from their hands was the sole reason for her criminal activities, more than sufficient incentive to maintain her newfound profession. Besides, she was good at it. The hold of the undying gratitude was filled with the cargo from the abandoned Edoa ship. The winds were fresh and steady, pushing them hard north out of the Draconian Sea, and it looked as if the huge fleet in her wake was not getting any closer. Edor and Lethery ships, a hundred, maybe more. They'd come out of the southwest, driving at a converging angle towards the sea lane that led to the mouth of the Lether River. The same lane that Shurk Elal's ship now tracked, as well as two merchant scows the undying gratitude was fast overhauling. And that last detail was too bad, since those pillot scows were ripe targets, and without a mass of imperial ships crawling up her behind, she'd have pounced. Cursing, Scorgan Caban limped up to where she stood at the aft rail. It's that infernal search, ain't it? The two main fleets, or what's left of them. The first mate leaned over the rail and spat down into the churning foam scurling out from the keel. They're gonna be nipping our tails all the way into Letheras Harbor. That's right, pretty, which means we have to stay nice. Aye. Nothing more tragic than staying nice. We'll get over it, Shurkilal said. Once we're in the harbor, we can sell what we got, hopefully before the fleet arrives to do the same, because then the price will drop, mark my words. Then we head back out. There'll be more pillot scows, Scorgan. You don't think that fleet came up on the floating wreck, do you? They've got every stretch of canvas out, like maybe they was chasing us. We get to the mouth and we're trapped, Captain. Well, you have a point there. If they were truly scattered by that storm, a few of them could have come up on the wreck before it went under. She thought for a time, then said, Tell you what, we'll sail past the mouth, and if they ignore us and head up river, we can come round and follow them in. But that means they'll offload before we will, which means we won't make as much. Unless their haul ain't going to mark it the first mate cut in. Could be it's all to replenish the royal vaults, Captain. Or maybe it goes to the Edo and nobody else. Blood and Cagenza, after all. We could always find a coastal port and do our selling there. You get wiser with every body part you lose, pretty, he grunted. Gotta be some kind of upside. That's the attitude, she replied. All right, that's what we'll do, but never mind the coastal port. They're all dirt poor this far north, surrounded by nothing but wilderness and bad roads where the bandits line up to charge tolls. And if a few Edur galleys take after us, we can always scoot straight up to that holdout prison isle this side of Fent Reach. That's a tight harbour mouth, or so I've been told, and they got a chain to keep the baddies out. Pirates ain't baddies? Not as far as they're concerned. The prisoners are running things now. I doubt it'll be that easy, Scorgan muttered. We'd just be bringing trouble down on them. It's not like the Edo couldn't have conquered them long ago. They just can't be bothered. Maybe, maybe not. The point is, we'll run out of food and water if we can't resupply somewhere. Edo galleys are fast, fast enough to stay with us. Anywhere we dock, they'll be on us before the last line is drawn to the bollard. With the exception of the prison isle, she scowled. It's a damned shame. I wanted to go home for a bit. Then we'd best hope the whole damned fleet back there heads up river, Scorgan the pretty said, scratching round an eye socket. Hope and pray. You pray to any gods, Scorgan? Sea spirits, mostly. The face under the waves, the guardian of the drowned, the swallower of ships, the stealer of winds, the tower of water, the reef hiders, the... All right, pretty, that'll do. You can keep your host of disasters to yourself. Just make sure you do all the propitiations. Thought you didn't believe in all that, Captain. I don't, but it never hurts to make sure. One day their names will rise from the water, Captain, Scorgan Caban said making a complicated warding gesture with his one remaining hand. 
and with them the seas will lift high to claim the sky itself, and the world will vanish beneath the waves. You and your damned prophecies. Not mine. Fent. Ever see their early maps? They show a coast leagues out from what it is now. All their founding villages are under hundreds of spans of water. So they believe their prophecy is coming true. Only it's going to take ten thousand years. His shrug was lopsided. Could be, Captain. Even the Edo claim that the ice far to the north is breaking up. Ten thousand years or a hundred. Either way, we'll be long dead by then. Speak for yourself, pretty. Then again, what a thought. Me wandering round on the sea bottom for eternity. Scorgan, get young Bordenar down from the crow's nest and into my cabin. The first mate made a face. Captain, you're wearing him out. I ain't heard him complain. Of course not. We'd all like to be as lucky. Your pardon, Captain, for me being too forward, but it's true. I was serious, though. You're wearing him out, and he's the youngest sailor we got. Right, meaning I'd probably kill the rest of you. Call him down, pretty. Aye, Captain. She stared back at the distant ships. The long search was over, it seemed. What would they be bringing back to fair Letherus, apart from casks of blood? Champions. Each one convinced they can do what no other has ever managed. Kill the Emperor. Kill him dead, deader than me. So dead he never gets back up. Too bad that would never happen. On his way out of Letharas, Venet Sathad, indebted servant to Rortos Hivana, halted the modest train outside the latest addition to the Hivana holdings. The inn's refurbishment was well underway, he saw, as, accompanied by the owner of the construction company under hire, he made his way past the work crews crowding the main building, then out back to where the stables and other outbuildings stood. Then stopped. The structure that had been raised round the unknown ancient mechanism had been taken down. Then it stared at the huge monolith of unknown metal, wondering why, now that it had been exposed, it looked so familiar. The edifice bent without a visible seam, three quarters of the way up, at about one and a half times his own height, a seemingly perfect ninety degrees. The apex looked as if it awaited some kind of attachment, if the intricate loops of metal were anything more than decorative. The object stood on a platform of the same peculiar dull metal, and again there was no obvious separation between it and the platform itself. "'Have you managed to identify its purpose?' Venet asked the old, mostly bald man at his side. "'Well,' Bug conceded, "'I have some theories. "'I would be interested in hearing them.' "'You will find others in the city,' Bug said. "'No two alike, but the same nonetheless, if you know what I mean.' "'No, I don't, Bug. "'Same manufacture, same mystery as to function. "'I've never bothered actually mapping them, "'but it may be that there is some kind of pattern, "'and from that pattern the purpose of their existence might be comprehended. "'Possibly.' "'But who built them?' "'No idea, Venet. "'Long ago, I suspect... The few others I've seen myself are mostly underground, and further out towards the river bank, buried in silts. In silts? Venet continued staring, then his eyes slowly widened. He turned to the old man. Bug, I have a most important favour to ask of you. I must continue on my way out of Letharas. I need a message delivered, however, back to my master, to Rotas Hivana. Bug shrugged. I see no difficulty managing that, Venet. Good, thank you. The message is this. He must come here to see this for himself, and, and this is most important, he must bring his collection of artifacts. Artifacts? He will understand, Bug. All right, the old man said. I can get over there in a couple of days, or I can send a runner if you like. Best in person, Bug, if you would. If the runner garbles the message, my master might end up ignoring it. As you like, Venet. Where, may I ask, are you going? The indebted scowled. Blue Rose, and then on to Dreen. A long journey awaits you, Venet. May it prove dull and uneventful. Thank you, Bug. 
How go things here? We're waiting for another shipment of materials. When that arrives, we can finish up. Your master has pulled another of my crews over for that shoring up project at his estate, but until the trusses arrive, that's not as inconvenient as it might be. He glanced at Venet. Do you have any idea when Hivana will be finished with all of that? Strictly speaking, it's not shoring up, although that is involved. He paused, rubbed at his face. More of a scholarly pursuit. Master is extending bulwarks out into the river, then draining and pumping the trenches clear so that the crews can dig down through the silts. Bug frowned. Why? Is he planning to build a breakwater or a pier? No, he is recovering artifacts. Then it watched the old man look back at the edifice and saw the watery eyes narrow. I wouldn't mind seeing those. Some of your foremen and engineers have done just that, but none were able to work out their function. And yes, they are linked to this thing here. In fact, one piece is a perfect replica of this, only on a much smaller scale. When you deliver your message, you can ask to see what is found, Bug. I am sure he would welcome your observations. Perhaps, the old man said distractedly. Well, Venet said, I had best be going. Errant ignore you, Venet Sathad. And you, Bug? If only. That last statement was little more than a whisper, and Venet glanced back at Bug as he crossed the courtyard on his way out. A peculiar thing to say. But then old men were prone to such eccentricities. Dismounting, Atripreda Bivat began walking among the wreckage. Vultures and crows clambered about from one bloated body to the next, as if confused by such a bounteous feast. Despite the efforts of the carrion eaters, it was clear to her that the nature of the slaughter was unusual. Huge blades, massive fangs and talons had done the damage to these hapless settlers, soldiers and drovers, and whatever had killed these people had struck before. The unit of cavalry that had pursued Red Mask from Dreen's North Gate had suffered an identical fate. In her wake strode the Edur overseer, Brol Handar. There are demons he said, capable of this, such as those the Karisnan conjured during the war, although they rarely use teeth and claws. Bevat halted near a dead hearth. She pointed to a sweep of dirt beside it. Do your demons leave tracks such as these? The Edor warrior came to her side. No, he said after a moment. This has the appearance of an oversized, flightless bird. Oversized? She glanced over at him, then resumed her walk. Her soldiers were doing much the same, silent as they explored the devastated encampment. Outriders, still mounted, were circling the area, keeping to the ridge lines. The Rodara and Myrid herds had been driven away, their tracks clearly visible heading east. The Rodara herd had gone first, and the Myrid had simply followed. It was possible, if the Lethery detachment rode hard, that they would catch up to the Myrid. Bivat suspected the raiders would not lag behind to tend to the slower-moving beasts. Well, Atripreda, Brol Handar asked from behind her, do we pursue? She did not turn round. No. The Factor will be severely displeased by your decision. And that concerns you? Not in the least. She said nothing. The overseer was growing more confident in his appointment, more confident or less cautious. There had been contempt in the Tist Edora's tone. Of course, that he had chosen to accompany this expedition was evidence enough of his burgeoning independence. For all of that, she almost felt sorry for the warrior. If this red mask is conjuring demons of some sort, Brol Handar continued, then we had best move in strength, accompanied by both Lethery and Edur mages. Accordingly, I concur with your decision. It pleases me that you grasp the military implications of this, Overseer. Even so, in this instance, even the desires of the Factor are of no importance to me. I am first and foremost an officer of the Empire. You are, and I am the Emperor's representative in this region. Thus, she nodded. 
A few heartbeats later, the Tist Edor sighed. It grieves me to see so many slain children. Overseer, we are no less thorough when slaying the all. That too grieves me. Such is war, she said. He grunted, then said, Atrip reader, what is happening on these plains is not simply war. You Lethary have initiated a campaign of extermination. Had we Edor elected to cross that threshold, would you not have called us barbarians in truth? You do not hold the high ground in this conflict, no matter how you seek to justify your actions. Overseer, Bivat said coldly, I care nothing about justifications nor moral high ground. I have been a soldier too long to believe such things hold any sway over our actions. Whatever lies in our power to do, we do. She gestured at the destroyed encampment around them. Citizens of Lether have been murdered. It is my responsibility to give answer to that, and so I shall. And who will win? Brol Handar asked. We will, of course. No, Atripreda, you will lose, as will the all. The victors are men such as Factor Letur Anict. Alas, such people as the Factor view you and your soldiers little differently from how they view their enemies. You are to be used, and this means that many of you will die. Letur Anict does not care. He needs you to win this victory, but beyond that his need for you ends, until a new enemy is found. Tell me, do empires exist solely to devour? Is there no value in peace, in order and prosperity and stability and security? Are the only worthwhile rewards the stacks of coin in Leto Anik's treasury? He would have it so. All the rest is incidental and only useful if it serves him. Atripreda, you are in truth less than an indebted. You are a slave. I am not wrong in this, for I am a Tist Edward who possesses slaves. A slave, Bivat, is how Leto Anict and his kind see you. Tell me, overseer, how would you fare without your slaves? Poorly, no doubt. She turned about and walked back to her horse. Mount up, we're returning to Dreen. And these dead citizens of the Empire, do you leave their bodies to the vultures? In a month even the bones will be gone, Bivat said swinging onto her horse and gathering the reins. The whittle beetles will gnaw them all to dust. Besides, there is not enough soil to dig proper graves. There are stones, Brolhandar noted, covered in all glyphs. To use them would be to curse the dead. Ah, so the enmity persists, so that even the ghosts war with each other. It is a dark world you inhabit, Atripreda. She looked down at him for a moment, then said, Are the shadows any better, overseer? When he made no reply, she said, On your horse, sir, if you please. The Ganatok encampment, swollen with the survivors of the Sevond and Neritha clans, sprawled across the entire valley. Beyond to the east loomed vast, dun-hued clouds from the main herds in the next few valleys. The air was gritty with dust and the acrid smell of hearth fires. Small bands of warriors moved back and forth like gangs of thugs, weapons bristling, their voices loud. Outriders had made contact with Red Mask and his poultry tribe earlier in the day, yet had kept their distance, seemingly more interested in the substantial herd of Rodara trailing the small group. An unexpected wealth for so few all, leaving possession open to challenge, and it was clear to Red Mask as he drew rein on a rise overlooking the encampment that word had preceded them, inciting countless warriors into bold challenge, one and all coveting Rodara and eager to strip the beasts away from the mere handful of Renfire warriors. Alas, he would have to disappoint them. Mathark, he now said, remain here with the others. Accept no challenges. No one has come close enough to see your mask, the youth said. No one suspects what you seek, war leader. As soon as they do, we shall be under siege. Do you fear, Massark? Dying? No, not any more. Then you are a child no longer. Wait, do nothing. 
Red Mask nudged his horse onto the slope, gathering it into a collected canter as he approached the Ganatok encampment. Eyes fixed on him, then held, as shouts rose, the voices more angry than shocked, until the nearer warriors made note of his weapons. All at once a hush fell over the encampment, rippling in a wave, and in its wake rose a murmuring, the anger he had first heard only now with a deeper timber. Dray dogs caught the burgeoning rage and drew closer, fangs bared and hackles stiff. Red Mask reined in. His leathery horse tossed its head and stamped, snorting to warn off the huge dogs. Someone was coming through the gathered crowd, like the prow of an unseen ship pushing through tall reeds. Settling back on the foreign saddle, Red Mask waited. Hadralt, first-born son to Kapala, walked with his father's swagger but not his physical authority. He was short and lean, reputedly very fast with the hook-bladed short-swords cross-strapped beneath each arm. Surrounding him were a dozen of his favoured warriors, huge, hulking men whose faces had been painted in a simulacrum of scales, copper in tone yet clearly intended to echo Red Mask's own. The expressions beneath that paint were now ones of chagrin. His hands restless around the fetishes lining his belt, Hadralt glowered up at Red Mask. If you are who you claim to be, then you do not belong here. Leave, or your blood will feed the dry earth. Red Mask let his impassive gaze slide over the copper-faced warriors. You mouth the echoes, yet quail from the source. He looked once more upon the war leader. I am before you now, Hadralt, son of Kapala, Red Mask, war leader of the Renfire clan, and on this day I will kill you. The dark eyes widened, then Hadralt sneered. Your life was a curse, Red Mask. You have not yet earned the right to challenge me. Tell me, will your pathetically few pups fight for you? Your ambition will see them all killed, and my warriors shall take the Renfire herds, and the Renfire women, but only of bearing age. The children and elders will die, for they are burdens we will not abide. The Renfire shall cease to be. For your warriors to gain the right to challenge my kin, Hadralt, they must first defeat my own champions. And where are they hiding, Red Mask, unless you mean that scarred Dre that followed you in? The laughter at that jest was overloud. Red Mask glanced back at the lone beast. Lying on the ground just to the right of the horse, it had faced down all the other dogs in the area without even rising. The Dre lifted its head and met Red Mask's eyes, as if the animal not only comprehended the words that had been spoken, but also welcomed the opportunity to face every challenger. He felt something stir in his chest. This beast understands courage, he said, facing Hadralt once more. Would that I had ten thousand warriors to match it. Yet all I see before me is you, Hadralt, war leader of ten thousand cowards. The clamor that erupted then seemed to blister the air. Weapons flashed into sunlight, the massed crowd edging in, a sea of faces twisted with rage. Hadralt had gone pale. Then he raised his arms and held them high until the outcry fell away. Every warrior here, he said in a trembling voice, shall take a piece of your hide, Red Mask. They deserve no less in answer to your words. You seek to take my place. You seek to lead. Lead these cowards? You have learned nothing in your exile. Not a warrior here will follow you now, Red Mask. Not one. You hired an army, Red Mask said, unable to keep the contempt from his tone. You marched at their sides against the lethery. And then, when the battle was offered, and your new-found allies were engaged, fighting for you, you all fled. Cowards, that is too kind a word. In my eyes, Hadralt, you and your people are not all. 
Not any more, for no true all warrior would do such a thing. I came upon their bodies. I was witness to your betrayal. The truth is this. When I am war leader here, before this day's sun touches the horizon, it will fall to every warrior present to prove his worth, to earn the right to follow me. And I shall not be easy to convince. Copper paint on the faces of cowards. No greater insult could you have delivered to me. Climb down, Hadrot said in a rasp. Down off that lethary nag. Climb down, Red Mask, to meet your end. Instead, he drew out a hollowed Rodara horn and lifted it to his lips. The piercing blast silenced all in the encampment except for the dogs, which began a mournful howling in answer. Red Mask replaced the horn at his belt. It is the way of time, he said, loud enough for his voice to carry, for old enemies to find peace in the passing of ages. We have fought many wars, Yet it was the first that holds still in the memory of the All, here in this very earth. He paused, for he could feel the reverberation beneath him, as did others now, as the two Kachain Jemal approached in answer to his call. Hadralt, son of Kapala, you are about to stand alone, and you and I shall draw our weapons. Prepare yourself. From the ridge, where stood the modest line of Renfire warriors, six in all, two other shapes loomed into view, huge, towering. Then, in liquid motion, the pair flowed down the slope. Silence hung heavy, beyond the thump of taloned feet, and hands that had rested on the grips and pommels of weapons slowly fell away. My champions, said Red Mask, they are ready for your challenges, Hadralt. For your copper faces. The war leader said nothing, and Red Mask could see in the warrior's expression that he would not risk losing the force of his words when his commands were disobeyed, as they would be, a truth of which all who were present were now aware. Destiny awaited then in this solitary clash of wills. Hadralt licked his lips. Red Mask, when I have killed you, what then of these Ketra? Making no reply, Red Mask dismounted, walking to halt six paces in front of Hadralt. He unlimbered the Rigtha crescent axe and centered his grip on the hafted weapon. Your father is gone. You must now let go of his hand and stand alone, Hadralt. The first and last time. You have failed as war leader. You led all warriors to battle, then led them in flight. You betrayed allies, and now you hide here on the very edge of the wastelands rather than meet the invading lethary blade to blade, teeth to throat. You will now step aside or die. Step aside? Hadralt tilted his head, then managed a rictus smile. That choice is not offered to an all-warrior. True, Red Mask said. Only to elders who can no longer defend themselves, or to those too broken by wounds. Hadralt bared his teeth. I am neither, nor are you an all-warrior. Did your father step aside? No, I see that he did not. He looked into your soul and knew you, Hadralt, and so old as he was, he fought you for his tribe. For his honor. Hadralt unsheathed his hook blades. He was trembling once more. One of the copper faces then spoke. Kapala ate in the hut of his son. In a single night he sickened and died. In the morning his face was the color of blue lichen. Trenisgala? Red Mask's eyes narrowed in the mask's slits. You poisoned your father, Hadralt, rather than meet his blades? How is it you stand here at all? Poison has no name, 
muttered the same copper face. Hadrolt said, I am the reason they all still live. You will lead them to slaughter, Red Mask. We are not yet ready to face the lethery. I have been trading for weapons. Yes, there are lethery who believe our cause is just. We give up poor land and receive fine iron weapons, and now you come to undo all my plans. I see those weapons, Red Mask said, in the hands of many of your warriors. Have they been tested in battle? You are a fool, Hadrolt, to believe you won that bargain. The traders you meet are in the employ of the Factor. He profits on both sides of this war. A lie! I was in Dreen, Red Mask said, less than two weeks ago. I saw the wagons and their crates of cast-off weapons, the iron blades that will shatter at the first blow against a shield. Weapons break are lost, yet this is what you accepted. This is what you surrendered land for. Land home to the dust of our ancestors, home to all spirits, land that has drunk all blood. Lethery weapons must be taken from the corpses of soldiers. Those are the weapons worthy of the term, Hadrot. If you must use their way of fighting, then you must use weapons of a quality to match, lest you invite your warriors to slaughter. And this, he added, is clearly what you were not prepared to do. Thus, Hadrot, I am led to conclude that you knew the truth. If so, then the traders paid you in more than weapons. Did you share out the coin, war leader? Do your kin even know of the hoard you hide in your hut? Red Mask watched as the copper faces slowly moved away from Hadrolt, recognizing the betrayal their leader had committed upon them, upon the all. You intended surrender, Red Mask continued, didn't you? You were offered an estate in Dreen, yes, and slaves and indebted to do your bidding. You planned on selling off our people, our history. We cannot win! Hadrolt's last words. Three sword blades erupted from his chest, thrust into his back by his own copper faces. Eyes wide with shock, the firstborn son and slayer of Kapala, last worthy leader of the Ganatok, stared across at Red Mask. Hook blades fell from his hands, then he sagged forward, sliding from the swords with a ghastly sucking sound, almost immediately replaced by the gush of blood. Eyes blank now in death, the corpse of Hadralt then toppled face first into the dust. Red Mask returned the Rigtha to its harness. Seeds fall from the crown of the stork. What is flawed there makes its every child weak. The curse of cowardice has ended this day. We are the all, and I am your war leader. He paused, looked round, then said, And so I shall lead you to war. On the ridge overlooking the sprawling encampment, Massark made a gesture to sun and sky, then earth and wind. Red Mask now rules the all. Kraesos, standing on his right, grunted, then said, Did you truly doubt he would succeed, Masak? Ketra guard his flanks. He is the charging crest of a river of blood, and he shall flood these lands, and even as the lethery drown in it, so shall we. You cheated the death knight, Kraesos, and so you still fear dying. On Masak's other side, Thevan snorted, the bleden herb had lost most of its potency. It took neither of us through the night. I screamed to the earth, Masak. I screamed and screamed. So did Kraesos. We do not fear what is to come. Hadrout was killed by his own warriors, Masak said, from behind. This does not bode well. You are wrong, Seven said. Red Mask's words have turned them all. I did not think such a thing would be possible. I suspect we will be saying that often, 
noted Kresos. We should walk down now, said Massark. We are his first warriors, and behind us now there are tens of thousands. Thevan sighed. The world has changed. We will live a while longer, you mean. The young warrior glanced across at Massark. That is for Redmask to decide. Brol Handar rode at the Atripreda's side as the troop made its way down the trader track, still half a day from Dreen's gates. The soldiers at their backs were silent, stoking anger and dreams of vengeance, no doubt. There had been elements of Blue Rose cavalry stationed in Dreen since shortly after the annexation of Blue Rose itself. As far as Brol Handar understood, the acquisition of Blue Rose had not been as bloodless as Dreen had been. A complicated religion had served to unite disaffected elements of the population, led by a mysterious priesthood the Lethery had been unable to entirely exterminate. Reputedly, some rebel groups still existed, active mostly in the mountains lining the western side of the territory. In any case, the old Lethery policy of transferring Blue Rose units to distant parts of the Empire continued under Edua rule, certainly suggesting that risks remained. Brawl Handar wondered how the newly appointed Edor overseer in Blue Rose was managing, and he reminded himself to initiate contact with his counterpart. Stability in Blue Rose was essential, for any disruption of Dreen's principal supply route and trading partner could prove disastrous if the situation here in the Aldan ignited into fallout war. You seem thoughtful, overseer, Bivat said after a time. Logistics, he replied. If by that you mean military, such needs are my responsibility, sir. Your army's needs cannot be met in isolation, Atripreda. If this conflict escalates as I believe it will, then even the factor cannot ensure that shortages will not occur, particularly among non-combatants in Dreen and surrounding communities. In all-out war, overseer, the requirements of the military always take precedence. Besides, there is no reason to anticipate shortages. The Lethery are well versed in these matters. Our entire system of transport was honed by the exigencies of expansion. We possess the roads, the necessary sea lanes and merchant vessels. There nonetheless remains a choke point, Brolhandar pointed out. The Blue Rose Mountains. She shot him a startled glance. The primary eastward trade goods through that range are slaves and some luxury foodstuffs from the far south. Blue Rose, of course, is renowned for its mineral wealth, producing a quality of iron that rivals leathery steel. Tin, copper, lead, lime, and fire rock, as well as cedar and spruce, all in abundance, while the Blue Rose Sea abounds with cod. In return, Dreen's vast farms annually produce a surplus harvest of grains. Overseer, you appear to have been misinformed with respect to the material demands in question. There will be no shortages. Perhaps you are right. He paused, then continued. At Repreda, it is my understanding that the factor has instituted extensive trafficking of low-grade weapons and armor across the Blue Rose Mountains. These weapons are in turn sold to the all, in exchange for land, or at least the end of dispute over land. Over four hundred broad bed wagons have been shipped thus far. Although the factor holds the tithe seal, no formal acknowledgement nor taxation of these items has taken place. From this I can only assume that a good many other supplies are moving to and fro across those mountains, none with official approval. Overseer... Regardless of the factor's smuggling operations, the Blue Rose Mountains are in no way a choke point when it comes to necessary supplies. I hope you are right, especially given the recent failures of that route. Excuse me? What failures? The latest shipment of poor quality war material failed to arrive this side of the mountains, Atripreda. Furthermore, brigands struck a major fortress in the pass, routing the Lethery Company stationed there. What? I have heard nothing of this. An entire company? Routed? So it seems. Alas, that was the extent of the information provided me. 
Apart from the weapons, I was unsure what other items the factor lost in that shipment. If, as you tell me, there was nothing more of consequence to fall into the hands of the brigands, then I am somewhat relieved. Neither spoke for a time. Brol Handar was aware that the Atripreda's thoughts were racing, perhaps drawn into a tumult of confusion. Uncertainty at how much Brol knew, and by extension the Tist Edur, regarding lethary illegalities and perhaps greater unease at the degree to which she herself had remained ignorant of recent events in Blue Rose. That she'd been shaken told him she was not as much an agent of Letor Anict as he had feared. He decided he had waited long enough. Atri Prida, this imminent war with the All. Tell me, have you determined the complement of forces you feel will be necessary to effect victory? She blinked, visibly shifting the path of her thinking to address his question. More or less, overseer. We believe that the all could, at best, field perhaps eight or nine thousand warriors. Certainly not more than that. As an army, they are undisciplined, divisive due to old feuds and rivalries, and their style of combat is unsuited to fighting as a unit. So, easily broken, unprepared as they are for any engagement taking longer than perhaps a bell. Generally, they prefer to raid and ambush, keeping to small troops and striving to remain elusive. At the same time, their almost absolute dependency on their herds and the vulnerability of their main camps will inevitably force them to stand and fight, whereupon we annihilate them. A succinct preface, Brolhandar said. To answer you, we possess six companies of the Blue Rose Battalion and near full complement of the Reformed Artisan Battalion, along with detachments from the Dream Garrison and four companies from the Haridict Brigade. To ensure substantial numerical superiority, I will request the Crimson Rampant Brigade and at least half of the Merchant's Battalion. Do you anticipate that this Red Mask will in any way modify the tactics employed by the All? No, he did not do so the first time. The threat he represents lies in his genius for superior ambushes and appallingly effective raids, especially on our supply lines. The sooner he is killed, the swifter the end of the war. If he succeeds in evading our grasp, then we can anticipate a long and bloody conflict. At Repreda, I intend to request three Karisnan and four thousand Edur warriors. Victory will be quick then, Overseer, for Red Mask will not be able to hide for long from your Karisnan. Precisely. I want this war over as soon as possible, and with minimal loss of life, on both sides. Accordingly, we must kill Red Mask at the first opportunity, and shatter the All Army, such as it is. You wish to force the All to capitulate and seek terms? Yes. Overseer, I will accept capitulation. As for terms, the only ones I will demand are complete surrender. The all will be enslaved, one and all. They will be scattered throughout the empire, but nowhere near their traditional homelands. As slaves, they will be booty, and the right to pick first will be the reward I grant my soldiers. The fate of the Nerek and the Fent and the Tarthanol. Even so. The notion does not sit well with me, Atripreda, nor will it with any Tist Edur, including the Emperor. Let us argue this point once we have killed Red Mask, Overseer. He grimaced, then nodded. Agreed. Brolhandar silently cursed this Red Mask, who had single-handedly torn through his hopes for a cessation of hostilities, for an equitable peace. Instead, Leto Anict now possessed all the justification he needed to exterminate the All, and no amount of tactical genius in ambushes and raids would, in the end, make any difference at all. It is the curse of leaders to believe they can truly change the world. A curse that has even afflicted me, it seems. Am I, too, now a slave to Leto Anict and those like him? The rage within him was the breath of ice, held deep and overlong, until its searing touch burned in his chest. Upon hearing the copper-face Natarkas's last words, he rose in silent fury and stalked from the hut, 
then stood, eyes narrowed, until his vision could adjust to the moonless, cloud-covered night. Nearby, motionless as carved sentinels of stone, stood his Kachain Chemal guardians, their eyes faintly glowing smudges in the darkness. As Red Mask pushed himself into motion, their heads turned in unison to watch as he set off through the encampment. Neither creature followed, for which he was thankful. Every step taken by the huge beast set the camp's dogs to howling, and he was in no mood for their brainless cries. Half the night was gone. He had called in the clan leaders and the most senior elders, one and all crowding into the hut that had once belonged to Hadralt. They had come expecting castigation, more condemnation from their new and much-feared war leader, but Red Mask had no interest in further belittling the warriors now under his command. The wounds of earlier that day were fresh enough. The courage they had lost could only be regained in battle. For all of Hadralt's faults, he had been correct in one thing. The old way of fighting against the lethery was doomed to fail. Yet the now-dead war leader's purported intent to retrain the all to a mode of combat identical to that of the lethery was, Red Mask told his followers, also doomed. The tradition did not exist. The all were skilled in the wrong weapons, and loyalties rarely crossed lines of clan and kin. A new way had to be found. Red Mask had then asked about the mercenaries that had been hired, and the tale that unfolded had proved both complicated and sordid, details teased out from reluctant, shamefaced warriors. Oh, there had been plenty of lethery coin delivered as part of the land purchase, and that wealth had been originally amassed with the intent of hiring a foreign army, one that had been found on the borderlands to the east. But Hadralt had then grown to covet all that gold and silver, so much so that he betrayed that army, led them to their deaths, rather than deliver the coin into their possession. Such was the poison that was coin. Where had these foreigners come from? From the sea, it appeared, a landing on the north coast of the wastelands, in transports under the flag of Lamatath, a distant peninsula kingdom. Soldier priests and priestesses sworn to wolf deities. What had brought them to this continent? Prophecy. Red Mask had started at that answer, which came from Natakas, the spokesman among the copper faces, the same warrior who had revealed Hadralt's murder of Kapala. A prophecy, war leader, Natakas had continued, a final war. They came seeking a place they called the battlefield of the gods. They called themselves the Grey Swords, the Reeve of Tog and Fandere. There were many women among them, including one of the commanders. The other is a man, one-eyed, who claims he has lost that eye three times. No, war leader, this one still lives, a survivor of the battle. Hadralt imprisoned him. He lies in chains behind the women's blood hut. Natakas had fallen silent then, recoiling at the sudden rage he clearly saw in Red Mask's eyes. And now the masked war leader strode through the Ganatok encampment, eastward to the far edge where trenches had been carved into the slope, taking away the wastes of the all, to the hut of blood that belonged to the women, then behind it, where, chained to a stake, slept a filthy creature, the lower half of his battered body in the drainage trench, where women's blood and urine trickled through mud, roots and stones on their way to the deep pits beyond. Halting then to stand over the man, who awoke, turning his head to peer with one glittering eye up at Red Mask. Do you understand me? the war leader asked, a nod. What is your name? The lone eye blinked, and the man reached up to scratch the blistered scar tissue around the empty socket where his other eye had been. He then grunted as if surprised, and struggled into a sitting position. Anaster was my new name, he said, a strange twist of his mouth that might have been a grin. Then the man added, But I think my older name better suits me. With a slight alteration, that is. I am Tok. The smile broadened. Tok the Unlucky. I am Red Mask. I know who you are. I even know what you are. How? 
Can't help you there. Red Mask tried again. What hidden knowledge of me do you think you possess? The smile faded and the man looked down, seeming to study the turgid stream of thinned blood round his knees. It made little sense back then. Makes even less sense now. You're not what we expected, Red Mask. He coughed, then spat, careful to avoid the women's blood. Tell me what you expected. Another half-smile, yet Tok would not look up as he said, Why, when one seeks the first sword of the Kachain Chemal, well, one assumes it would be Kachain Chemal, not human. An obvious assumption, don't you think? First sword? I do not know this title. Tok shrugged. Kel, champion, consort to the matron, who'd take me king? They're all the same in your case. The man finally glanced up once more, and something glistened in his lone eye as he asked, So don't tell me the mask fooled them, please. The gorge the lone figure emerged from was barely visible. Less than three man heights across, the crevasse nestled between two steep mountainsides, half a league long and a thousand paces deep. Travellers thirty paces away, traversing the raw rock of the mountain to either side, would not even know the gorge existed. Of course, the likelihood of unwitting travellers anywhere within five leagues of the valley was virtually non-existent. No obvious trails wended through the Blue Rose Range this far north of the main passes. There were no high pastures or plateau to invite settlement, and the weather was often fierce. Clambering over the edge of the gorge into noon sunlight, the figure paused in a crouch and scanned the vicinity. Seeing nothing untoward, he straightened. Tall, thin, his midnight black hair long, straight and unbound, his face unlined, the features somewhat hooded, eyes like fire rock, the man reached into a fold in his faded black hide shirt and withdrew a length of thin chain, both ends holding a plain finger ring one gold, the other silver. A quick flip of his right index finger spun the rings round, then wrapped them close as the chain coiled tight. A moment later he reversed the motion. His right hand thus occupied, coiling and uncoiling the chain, he set off. Southward he went, into and out of swaths of shadow and sunlight, his footfalls almost soundless, the snap of the chain the only noise accompanying him. Tied to his back was a horn and bloodwood bow, unstrung. At his right hip was a quiver of arrows, bloodwood shafts and hawk feather fletching. At the quiver's moss-packed base the arrowheads were iron, teardrop-shaped and slotted, the blades on each head forming an X pattern. In addition to this weapon he carried a baldric-slung plain rapier in a silver-banded turtle-shell scabbard. The entire scabbard and its fastening rings were bound with sheepskin to deaden the noise as he padded along. These details to stealth were one and all undermined by the spinning and snapping chain. The afternoon waned on until he moved through unbroken shadow as he skirted the eastern flank of each successive valley he traversed, ever southward. Through it all the chain twirled, the rings clacking upon contacting each other, then whispering out and spinning yet again. At dusk he came to a ledge overlooking a broader valley, this one running more or less east-west, whereupon, satisfied with his vantage point, he settled into a squat and waited, chain whispering, rings clacking. Two thousand spins later the rings clattered, then went still, trapped inside the fist of his right hand. His eyes, which had held fixed on the western mouth of the pass, unmindful of the darkness, had caught movement. He tucked the chain and rings back into the pouch lining the inside of his shirt, then rose, and began the long descent. The onyx wizards, purest of the blood, had long since ceased to struggle against the strictures of the prison they had created for themselves. Antiquity and the countless traditions that were maintained to keep its memory alive were the chains and shackles they had come to accept. To accept, they said, was to grasp the importance of responsibility, and if such a thing as a secular god could exist, 
then to the dwellers of Andara, the last followers of the black-winged lord, that god's name was responsibility, and it had, over the decades since the Lethary conquest, come to rival in power the black-winged lord himself. The young archer, nineteen years of age, was not alone in his rejection of the stolid, outdated ways of the onyx wizards, and like many of his compatriots of similar age, the first generation born to the exile, he had taken a name for himself that bespoke the fullest measure of that rejection. Clan name cast away, all echoes of the old language, both the common tongue and the priest dialect, dispensed with. His clan was that of the exiled now. For all these gestures of independence, a direct command delivered by Ordent Brid, Reeve Master of the Rock among the Onyx Order, could not be ignored. And so the young warrior named Clip of the Exiled had exited the eternally dark monastery of Andara, had climbed the interminable cliff wall, and eventually emerged into hated sunlight to travel overland beneath the blinded stars of day, arriving at an overlook above the main pass. The small party of travellers he now approached were not traders. No baggage train of goods accompanied them. No shackled slaves stumbled in their wake. They rode lethary horses, yet even with the presence of at least three lethary, Clip knew that this was no imperial delegation. No, these were refugees, and they were being hunted. And among them walks the brother of my god. As Clip drew nearer, as yet unseen by the travellers, he sensed a presence flowing alongside him. He snorted his disgust. A slave of the Tist Edur. Tell me, do you not know your own blood? We will tear you free, ghost, something you should have done for yourself long ago. I am unbound, came the hissing reply. Then I suppose you are safe enough from us. Your blood is impure. Clip smiled in the darkness. Yes, I am a cauldron of failures. Nerek, Lethary, even Drasilhani. And Tistandi. Then greet me, brother. Rasping laughter. He has sensed you. Was I sneaking up on them, ghost? They have halted and now await. Good. But can they guess what I will say to them? Can you? You are impertinent. You lack respect. You are about to come face to face with Silchas Ruin, the White Crow. Will he bring word of his lost brother? No, I thought not. Another hiss of laughter. Oddly enough, I believe you will fit right in with the ones you are about to meet. Seren Pedak squinted into the gloom. She was tired. They all were, after long days traversing the pass, with no end in sight. Siltras Ruin's announcement that someone was approaching brought them all to a halt beside the sandy fringe of a stream, where insects rose in clouds to descend upon them. The horses snorted, tails flicking and hides rippling. She dismounted a moment after Siltras Ruin and followed him across the stream. Behind her, the others remained where they were. Kettle slept in the arms of Udinas, and he seemed disinclined to move lest he wake her. Fear Sengar slipped down from his horse but made no further move. Standing beside the albino Tist Andy, Seren could now hear a strange swishing and clacking sound, whispering down over the tumbled rocks beyond. A moment later, a tall, lean form appeared, silhouetted against grey stone. A smudge of deeper darkness flowed out from his side to hover before Silchas' ruin. Ken, said the wraith. A descendant of my followers, Wither. Oh no, Silchas' ruin. Breath slowly hissed from the Tist Andy. My brothers, they were this close. The young warrior drew closer, his pace almost sauntering. The tone of his skin was dusky, not much different from that of a Tist Edur. He was twirling a chain in his right hand, the rings on each end blurring in the gloom. Silchas Ruin, he said, I greet you on behalf of the Onyx Order of Andara. It has been a long time since we last met a Tist Andi not of our colony. The broad mouth quirked slightly. 
You do not look at all as I had expected. Your words verge on insult, Siltras Ruin said. Is this how the Onyx Order would greet me? The young warrior shrugged, the chains snapping taut for a beat, then spinning out once more. There are Karisnan wards on the trail ahead of you, traps and snares. Nor will you find what you seek in Blue Rose, not the city itself, nor Jasp, nor Outbound. How is it you know what I seek? He said you would come sooner or later. Who? Browse Rose. Why, your brother. He didn't arrive in time to prevent your getting taken down, nor the slaughter of your followers. Did he avenge me? A moment, Seren Pedak cut in. What is your name? A white smile. Clip. To answer you, Silchas Ruin, he was not inclined to murder all the Tist Edur. Scabandari blood eye had been destroyed by elder gods. A curse was laid upon the lands west of here, denying even death's release. The Edur was scattered, assailed by ice, retreating seas and terrible storms. In the immediate aftermath of the Umptos Felak curse, their survival was at risk, and Rake left them to it. I do not recall my brother being so merciful. If our histories of that time are accurate, Clip said, then he was rather preoccupied. The sundering of Korald Emolan, rumors of Osirk in the vicinity, a mercurial dalliance with Lady Envy, arguments and a shaky alliance with Kilmandaros, and then, finally, Silana, the Elaint who emerged at his side from Emulan at the closing of the gate. It seems much of that time is common knowledge among your order, Siltras Ruin observed, his tone flat. He stayed with you for a lengthy period, then. He stays nowhere for very long, Clip replied, clearly amused by something. Seren Pedak wondered if the youth knew how close he was to pushing Ruin over the edge. A few more ill-chosen words and Clip's head would roll from his shoulders. Is it your mission, she asked the Tist Andy, to guide us to our destination? Another smile, another snap of the chain. It is. You will be, uh, welcomed as guests of the Andara, although the presence of both Lethary and Tist Edur in your party is somewhat problematic. The Onyx Order has been outlawed, as you know subject to vicious repression. The Andara represents the last secret refuge of our people. Its location must not be compromised. What do you suggest? Saren asked. The remainder of this journey, Clip replied, will be through Warren, through Korald Galain. Siltras Ruin cocked his head at that, then grunted. I am beginning to understand. Tell me, Clip, how many wizards of the Order dwell in the Andara? There are five, and they are the last. And can they agree on anything? Of course not. I am here by the command of Ordant Brid, Reeve Master of the Rock. My departure from the Andara was uneventful, else it is likely I would not be here. Should another of the Order have intercepted you? A nod. Can you wait for the maelstrom your arrival will bring, Silchas Ruin? I can't. Thus, your greeting earlier should have been qualified. The Order does not welcome us. Rather, this Ordent Brid does. They all choose to speak for the Order, Clip said, his eyes glittering, when it will most confound the others. Now I can see how eager you all are. From his right hand the chain whipped out, the silver ring round his index finger, and at the snap of the chain's full length a gate into darkness appeared to the warrior's right. Call the others here, Clip said. At haste, even now, bound wraiths serving the Tist Edur are converging. Of course, they all dream of escape. Alas, that we cannot give them. But their Edur masters watch through their eyes, and that won't do. Seren Pedak turned about and summoned the others. Clip stepped to one side and bowed low. Silchas Ruin, 
I invite you to walk through first and know once more the welcome embrace of true darkness. Besides, he added, straightening as Ruin strode towards the gate, you will make for us a bright beacon. One of Silchas Ruin's swords hissed out, a gleaming blur, the edge slashing across the space where Clip's neck had been, but the young warrior had leaned back, just enough, and the weapon sang through air. A soft laugh from the youth, appallingly relaxed. He said you'd be angry. Silchas Rowan stared across at Clip for a long moment. Then he turned and walked through the gate. Drawing a deep breath to slow her heart, Seren Pedak glared at Clip. You have no idea, don't I? The others appeared, leading their horses. Udinas, with Kettle tucked into one arm, barely glanced over at Clip before he tugged his horse into the rent. You wish to cross swords with a god, Clip? He gave himself away. Oh, he's fast, all right. And with two weapons he'd be hard to handle, I'll grant you. And will the Reeve Master who sent you be pleased with your immature behavior? Clip laughed. Odent could have selected any of a hundred warriors at hand for this mission, Lethary. Yet he chose you, meaning he is either profoundly stupid, or he anticipated your irreverence. You waste your time, Aquator, Fearsengar said, coming up alongside her and eyeing Clip. He is Tist Andy. His mind is naught but darkness, in which ignorance and foolishness thrive. To fear, the young warrior bowed again. Edur, please, proceed. Darkness awaits you. And he waved at the gate. As Fear Sengar led his horse into the gate, the chain on Clip's right index finger spun out once more, ending with a clash of rings. Why do you do that? Seren demanded, irritated. Brows lifted. Do what? Swearing under her breath, the Aquator walked through the gate. Book Two Lairs of the Dead Who now strides on my trail, devouring the distance between, no matter how I flee, the wasted breath of my haste cast into the wind, and these dogs will prevail, dragging me down with howling glee, for the beasts were born fated, trained in bold vengeance by my own switch and hand, and no god will stand in my stead nor provide me sanctuary, even should I plead for absolution. The hounds of my deeds belong only to me, and they have long hunted, and now the hunt ends. Songs of Guilt, Bet Nerask Chapter 7 Twice as far as you think, half the distance you fear, too thin to hold you and well over your head, so much cleverer by far, yet witless beyond measure, will you hear my story now? Tales of the Drunken Bard Fisher Standing at the rail, Atripreda Jan Tovis, known to her soldiers as Twilight, watched the sloping shoreline of the Lether River track past. Gulls rode the waves in the shallows. Fisher boats sculled among the reeds, the net casters pausing to watch the battered fleet work its way towards the harbour. Along the bank, birds crowded the leafless branches of trees that had succumbed to the last season's flood. Beyond the dead trees, riders were on the coast road, cantering towards the city to report to various officials. Although Jan Tovis was certain that the palace had already been informed that the first of the fleets now approached, with another a bare half day behind. She would welcome solid ground beneath her boots again, and the presence of unfamiliar faces within range of her vision, rather than these tired features behind and to either side that she had come to know all too well, and at times she had to admit despise. The last ocean they had crossed was far in their wake now, and for that she was profoundly relieved. The world had proved immense. Even the ancient lethary charts mapping the great migration route from the land of the First Empire had revealed but a fraction of the vast expanse that was this mortal realm. The scale had left them all belittled, as if their grand dramas were without consequence, as if true meaning was too thinly spread too elusive for a single mind to grasp. 
and there had been a devastating toll paid for these fated journeys. Scores of ships lost, thousands of hands dead. There were belligerent and all-too-capable empires and peoples out there, few of whom were reluctant to test the prowess and determination of foreign invaders. If not for the formidable sorceries of the Edur and the new cadres of leathery mages, there would have been more defeats than victories recorded in the ledgers, and yet fewer soldiers and sailors to rest eyes once more upon their homeland. And Radi Kalag, Uruth, and Tomad Sengar would have dire news to deliver to the Emperor, sufficient to overwhelm their meagre successes, and Yan Tovis was thankful that she would not be present at that debriefing. She would have more than enough to deal with in her own capacity besides. The lethary marines had been decimated, families would need to be informed, death pensions distributed, lost equipment charged, and debts transferred to heirs and kin. Depressing and tedious work, and she already longed for the last scroll to be sealed and signed. As the stands of trees and undergrowth dwindled, replaced by fisher shacks, jetties, and then the walled estates of the elite, she stepped back from the rail and looked round the deck. Seeing Taralak Veed positioned near the stern, she walked over. We are very close now, she said. Letharas, seat of the emperor, the largest and richest city on this continent. And still your champion will not come on deck. I see bridges ahead, the barbarian observed, looking back up the length of the ship. Yes, the tears. There are canals in the city. Did I not tell you of the drownings? The man grimaced, then swung about once more and spat over the stern rail. They die without honor, and this entertains you. What is it you would wish Ikarium to see, Twilight? He shall need his anger, she replied in a low voice. Taralak Veed ran both hands over his scalp, flattening back his hair. When he is next awakened, matters of resolve will mean nothing. Your emperor shall be annihilated, and likely most of this sparkling city with him. If you choose to witness, then you too will die, as will Tomad Sengar and Hanradi Kalag. Alas! she said after a moment. I will not be present to witness the clash. My duties will take me back north, back to Fent Reach. She glanced across at him. A journey of over a month by horseback, Taralak Veed. Will that be distant enough? He shrugged. I make no promises. But one, she pointed out. Oh? That he will fight. You do not know Ikarium as I do. He may remain below, but there is an excitement about him. Anticipation now, unlike any I have ever seen before. Twilight, he has come to accept his curse, indeed to embrace it. He sharpens his sword again and again, oils his bow, examines his armor for flaws with every dawn. He has no more questions for me, and that is the most ominous detail of all. He has failed us once she said. There was intervention. That shall not occur again unless your carelessness permits it. At a gentle bend in the river, Letharas revealed itself, sprawling up and back from the north shore, magnificent bridges arching over garishly painted buildings and the haze of innumerable cook fires. Domes and terraces, towers and platforms loomed, edges blurred in the gold-lit smoke. The Imperial Keys were directly ahead, just beyond a mole, and the first dromons of the fleet were shipping oars and swinging in towards berths. Scores of figures were gathering along the waterfront, including a bristling procession coming down from the eternal domicile, pennons and standards wavering overhead. The official delegation, although Jan Tovis noted that there were no Edur among them. It seemed that Triban Gnoll's quiet usurpation was all but complete. She was not surprised. The Chancellor had probably begun his plans long before King Esgara Diskanar downed the fatal draft in the throne room. Ensuring a smooth transition is how he would have defended himself. The Empire is greater than its ruler, and that is where lies the Chancellor's loyalty, always and forevermore. Laudable sentiments, no doubt, but the truth was never so clear. 
The lust for power was a strong current, roiling with clouds that obscured all to everyone, barring, perhaps, Triban Gnoll himself, who was at the very centre of the maelstrom. His delusion of control had never been challenged, but Jan Tovis believed that it would not last. After all, the Tist Edur had returned. Tomad Sengar, Hanradi Kalag, and three other former war chiefs of the tribes, as well as over four thousand seasoned warriors who'd long ago left their naivete behind, lost in Kalos, in Sepik, Nemil, the Perish Coast, Shalmorzin, and Drift Avali, in a host of foreign waters among the Mekros, the journey had been long, fraught. The nest is about to be kicked awake. Taralak Veed said, a rather ugly grin twisting his features. Jan Tobis shrugged. To be expected. We have been absent a long time. Maybe your emperor is already dead. I see no Tist Edur in that contingent. I do not think that likely. Our Karisnan would have known. Informed by their god? Jan Tobis, no gift from a god comes for free. More, if it sees fit, it will tell its followers nothing. Or, indeed, it will lie. The Edor do not understand any of this, but you surprise me. Is it not the very nature of your deity, this errant, to deceive you at every turn? The Emperor is not dead, Taralakvid. Then it is only a matter of time. So you continually promise. But he shook his head. I do not speak of Icarium now. I speak of when a god's chosen one fails, and they always do, Twilight. We are never enough in their eyes, never faithful enough, never fearful enough, never abject enough. Sooner or later we betray them, in weakness or in overwrought ambition. We see before us a city of bridges, yet what I see and what you see are two different things. Do not let your eyes deceive you. The bridges awaiting us are all too narrow for mortals. Their ship slowly angled in towards the central imperial dock like a weary beast of burden, and a handful of Edor officers were now on deck whilst sailors readied the lines along the port rail. The stench of effluent from the murky waters rose thick enough to sting the eyes. Taralak Veed spat onto his hands and smoothed back his hair yet again. Almost time. I go to collect my champion. Noticed by no one, Turadal Brizad, the errant, stood with his back to a quayside warehouse thirty or so paces from the main pier. His gaze noted the disembarking of Tomad Sengar, the venerable warrior looking worn and aged, and his expression as he observed the absence of Tist Edur among the delegation from the palace seemed to grow darker by the moment. But neither he nor any of the other Edur held the god's attention for long. His attention sharpened as the Atripreda in command of this fleet's lethary marines strode the length of the gangway, followed by a half-dozen aides and officers, for he sensed all at once that there was something fated about the woman. Yet the details eluded him. The god frowned, frustrated by his diminishing percipience. He should have sensed immediately what awaited Jan Tobis. Five years ago he would have, thinking nothing of the gift, the sheer privilege of such ascendant power. Not since those final tumultuous days of the First Empire, the succession of ghastly events that led to the intercession of the Tulani Mas to quell the fatal throes of Disimbalakis's empire, had the errant felt so disconnected. Chaos was rolling towards Letharas with the force of a cataclysmic wave, an ocean surge that simply engulfed this river's currents. Yes, it comes from the sea. That much I know. That much I can feel. From the sea, just like this woman, this twilight. Another figure appeared on the plank, a foreigner, the skin of his forearms a swirl of arcane tattoos, the rest of his upper body wrapped in a roughly woven cape, the hood hiding his features. Barbaric, wary, the glitter of eyes taking it all in, pausing halfway down to hawk and spit over the side, a gesture that startled the errant and, it seemed, most of those standing on the dock. A moment later, another foreigner rose into view, pausing at the top of the gangway. The errant's breath caught, a sudden chill flowing through him, 
as if Hood himself had arrived, his cold breath whispering across the back of the god's neck. Abyss take me, all that waits within him. The foment none other here can see, could even guess at. Dear son of Gothos and that overgrown hag, the stain of Azath blood is about you like a cloud. This was more than a curse, all that afflicted this fell warrior. Deliberate skeins were woven about him, the threads of some elaborate, ancient, and deadly ritual, and he knew their flavor. The Nameless Ones. Two soldiers from Triban Gnoll's palace guard moved to await the jag as he slowly walked down to the dock. The errant's heart was thudding hard in his chest. They have delivered a champion, a challenger to the emperor of a thousand deaths. The jag stepped onto solid ground. From the buildings beyond the harbor front, birds rose suddenly, hundreds, then thousands, voicing a chorus of shrieks, and beneath the errant's feet the stones shifted with a heavy groaning sound. Something large collapsed far into the city, beyond Quillas Canal, and distant screams followed. The errant stepped out from the wall and saw the bloom of a dust cloud rising behind the caterwauling, panicked pigeons, rooks, gulls, and starlings. The subterranean groaning then ceased, and a heavy silence settled. Icarium's tusked mouth revealed the faintest of smiles, as if pleased with the earth's welcome, and the errant could not be sure, at this distance, if that smile was truly as childlike as it seemed, or if it was in fact ironic, or indeed bitter. He repressed the urge to draw closer, seeking an answer to that question, reminding himself that he did not want Icarium's attention. Not now, not ever. Tomad Senga, what your son will face. It was no wonder, he suddenly realized, that all that was to come was obscured in a maelstrom of chaos. They have brought Icarium into the heart of my power. Among the delegation and other lethery nearby, it was clear that no particular connection had been made between Icarium's first touch on solid ground and the minor earthquake rumbling through Letheras. Yet such stirrings were virtually unknown for this region, and while the terror among the birds and the bawling of various beasts of burden continued unabated, already the consternation of those within the errant sight was diminishing. Foolish mortals, so quick to disregard unease. In the river beyond, the water slowly lost its shivering agitation, and the gulls further out began to settle once again amidst yet more ships angling towards shore. Yet somewhere in the city, a building had toppled, probably some venerable ancient edifice, its foundations weakened by groundwater, its mortar crumbled and supports rotted through. There would have been casualties. Icarium's first, but most assuredly not his last and he smiles. Still cursing, Taralak Veed turned to Jan Tovis. Unsettled lands. Burn does not rest easy here. The Atripreda shrugged to hide her queasy shock. To the north of here, along the Reach Mountains, the ground shakes often. The same can be said for the north side of the ranges to the far south, the other side of the Draconian Sea. She saw the glimmer of bad teeth in the hood's shadow. But not in Letheras, yes? I've not heard of such before, but that means little, she replied. This city is not my home, not where I was born, not where I grew up. Taralak Veed edged closer, facing away from Icarium, who stood listening to the two palace guards as they instructed him in what was to come. You fool, he hissed at her, Burns flesh flinched, twilight, flinched because of him. She snorted. The growl cocked his head, and she could feel his contempt. What happens now? he asked. Now? Very little. There are secure residences for you and your champion. As for when the emperor chooses to face his challengers, that is up to him. Sometimes he is impatient and the clash occurs immediately. Other times he waits, often for weeks. But I will tell you what will begin immediately. What is that? The burial urn for Icarium, and his place in the cemetery where resides every challenger Rulat has faced. 
Even that place will not survive, Taralak Veed muttered. The Graal, feeling sick to his stomach, walked over to Ikarium. He did not want to think of the destruction to come. He had seen it once, after all. Burn, even in your eternal sleep, you felt the stabbing wound that is Ikarium. And none of these people here countenanced it. None was ready for the truth. Their hands are not in the earth. The touch is lost. Yet look at them. They would call me the savage. Ikarium, my friend. Can you not feel it, Taralak Veed? In his unhuman eyes, the gleam of anticipation. This place, I have been here before. No, not this city. From the time before this city was born, I have stood on this ground. And it remembered, growled Taralak Veed. Yes, but not in the way you believe. There are truths here waiting for me. Truths. I have never been as close to them as I am now. Now I understand why I did not refuse you. Refuse me? You considered such a thing? Was it truly so near the edge? Your destiny will soon welcome you, Ikarium, as I have said all along. You could no more refuse that than you could the Jaghat blood in your veins. A grimace. Jaghat. Yes, they have been here. In my wake. Perhaps even on my trail. Long ago, and now again. Again? Omtos Falak, the heart of this city is ice, Taralak Veed. A most violent imposition. Are you certain? I do not understand. Nor I. Yet. But I shall. No secret shall survive my sojourn here. It will change. What will change? Ikarium smiled, one hand resting on the pommel of his sword, and did not reply. You will face this emperor, then? So it is expected of me, Taralak Veed. A bright glance. How could I refuse them? Spirits below, my death draws close. It was what we wanted all along. So why do I now rail at it? Who has stolen my courage? It is as if, Ikarium whispered, my life awakens anew. The hand shot out in the gloom, snatching the rat from atop the wooden cage holding the forward pump. The scrawny creature had a moment to squeal in panic before its neck was snapped. There was a thud as the dead rat was flung to one side, where it slid down into the murky bilge water. Oh, how I hate you when you lose patience, Samar Dev said in a weary tone. That's an invitation to disease, Garza Orlong. Life is an invitation to disease, the huge warrior rumbled from the shadows. After a moment, he added, I'll feed it to the turtles. Then he snorted. Turtles big enough to drag down this damned ship. These lethary live in a mad god's nightmare. More than you realize, Samar Dev muttered. Listen, shouts from shore. We're finally drawing in. The rats are relieved. Don't you have something you need to do to get ready? Such as? I don't know. Knock a few more chips off your sword or something. Get it sharp. The sword is unbreakable. What about that armor? Most of the shells are broken. It's not worthy of the name and won't stop a blade. No blade will reach it, witch. I shall face but one man, not twenty. And he is small. My people call you children. And that is all you truly are. Short-lived, stick-limbed, with faces I want to pinch. The Edor are little different, just stretched out a bit. Pinch? Would that be before or after decapitation? He grunted a laugh. Samar Dev leaned back against the bale in which something hard and lumpy had been packed. Despite the mild discomfort, she was not inclined to explore any further. Both the Edo and the Lethary had peculiar ideas about what constituted booty. In this very hold there were amphorae containing spiced human blood and a dozen wax-clad corpses of Edo refugees from Sepik who had not survived the journey, 
stacked like bolts of cloth against a blood-stained conch-shell throne that had belonged to some remote island chieftain, whose pickled head probably resided in one of the jars Carsa Orlong leaned against. At least we're soon to get off this damned ship. My skin has all dried up. Look at my hands. I've seen mummified ones looking better than these. All this damned salt, it clings like a second skin, and it's molting. Spirits below, woman, you incite me to wring another rat's neck. So I am responsible for that last rat's death, am I? Needless to say, I take exception to that. Was your hand that reached out, Toblakai, your hand that— And your mouth that never stops making me need to kill something. I am not to blame for your violent impulses. Besides, I was just passing time in harmless conversation. We've not spoken in a while, you and I. I find I prefer Taxilian's company, and were he not sick with homesickness and even more miserable than you— Conversation! Is that what you call it? Then why are my ears numb? You know I, too, am impatient. I've not cast a curse on anyone in a long time. Your squalling spirits do not frighten me, Casa Orlong replied, and they have been squalling ever since we made the river, a thousand voices clamoring in my skull. Can you not silence them? Sighing, she tilted her head back and closed her eyes. Doblekai, you will have quite an audience when you clash swords with this Edua emperor. What has that to do with your spirit, Samar Dev? Yes, that was too obscure, wasn't it? Then I shall be more precise. There are gods in this city we approach, resident gods. Do they ever get a moment's rest? They don't live in temples, nor any signs above the doors of their residences, Carso or Long. They are in the city, yet few know of it. Understand, the spirits shriek because they are not welcome and even more worrying should any one of those gods seek to wrest them away from me, well, there is little I could do against them. Yet they are bound to me as well, aren't they? She clamped her mouth shut, squinted across at him in the gloom. The hull thumped as the ship edged up alongside the dock. She saw the glimmer of bad teeth, feral, and a chill rippled through her. What do you know of that? she asked. It is my curse to gather souls, he replied. What are spirits which, if not simply powerful souls? They haunt me, I haunt them. The candles I lit in that apothecary of yours, they were in the wax, weren't they? Released, then held close, yes. I gathered them, after I'd sent you away. Bound them into that knife at your belt. Carsa said. Tell me, do you sense the two Toblakai souls in my own weapon? Yes, no. That is, I sense them, but I dare not approach. Why? Carsa, they are too strong for me. They are like fire in the crystal of that flint, trapped by your will. Not trapped, he replied. They dwell within because they choose to, because the weapon honors them. They are my companions, Samar Dev. The Toblakai rose suddenly, hunching beneath the ceiling. Should a god be foolish enough to seek to steal our spirits, I will kill it. She regarded him from half-closed eyes. Declarative statements such as that one were not rare utterances from Carsa Orlong, and she had long since learned that they were not empty boasts, no matter how absurd the assertion might have sounded. That would not be wise, she said after a moment. A god devoid of wisdom deserves what it gets. That's not what I meant. Carsa stooped momentarily to retrieve the dead rat. Then he headed for the hatch. She followed. When she reached the main deck, the Toblakai was walking towards the captain. She watched as he placed the sodden rat in the lethery's hands, then turned away, saying, Get the hoists. I want my horse on deck and off this damned hulk. Behind him, the captain stared down at the creature in his hands. Then, with a snarl, he flung it over the rail. Samar Dev contemplated a few quick words with the captain to stave off the coming storm, 
a storm that Carsa had nonchalantly triggered innumerable times before on this voyage, then decided it was not worth the effort. It seemed that the captain concluded much the same, as a sailor hurried up with a bucket of seawater into which the lethery thrust his hands. The main hatch to the cargo hold was being removed, while other hands set to assembling the winches. Carsa strode to the gangway. He halted, then said in a loud voice, This city reeks. When I am done with its emperor, I may well burn it to the ground. The planks sagged and bounced as the Toblakai descended to the landing. Samar Dev hurried after him. One of two fully armored guards had already begun addressing Karsa in contemptuous tones. To be unarmed whenever you are permitted to leave the compound, said permission to be granted only by the ranking officer of the watch. Our immediate task is to escort you to your quarters, where the filth will be scrubbed from your body and hair. He got no further as Carsa reached out, closed his hand on the guard's leather weapons harness, and with a single heave flung the lethery into the air. Six or more paces to the left he sailed, colliding with three stevedores who had been watching the proceedings. All four went down. Voicing an oath, the second guard tugged at his short sword. Carsa's punch rocked his head back and the man collapsed. Hoarse shouts of alarm, more lethery soldiers converging. Samar Dev rushed forward. Who take you, Toblakai? Do you intend to war with the whole empire? Glaring at the half-circle of guards closing round him, Karsa grunted then crossed his arms. If you are to be my escort, he said to them, then be civil, or I will break you all into pieces. Then he swung about, pushing past Samar. Where is my horse? he bellowed to the crew still on deck. Where is Havoc? I grow tired of waiting. Samar Dev considered returning to the ship, demanding that they sail out, back down the river, back into the Draconian Sea, then beyond, leaving this unpredictable Toblakai to Letharas and all its hapless denizens. Alas, even gods don't deserve that. Bug stood thirty paces from the grand entrance to the Hivana estate, one hand out as he leaned against a wall to steady himself. In some alley garden a short distance away, chickens screeched in wild clamor and flung themselves into the grill hatches in frenzied panic. Overhead, starlings still raced back and forth en masse. He wiped beads of sweat from his brow, struggled to draw a deep breath. A worthy reminder, he told himself, Everything was only a matter of time. What stretched would then contract. Events tumbled, forces closed to collision. And for all that, the measured pace seemed to remain unchanged, a current beneath all else. Yet, he knew, even that slowed incrementally from one age to the next. Death is written in birth, the words of a great sage. What was her name? When did she live? Ah, oh, so much has whispered away from my mind, these memories like sand between the fingers. Yet she could see what most cannot, not even the gods. Death and birth, even in opposition the two forces are bound, and to define one is to define the other. And now he had come, with his first step delivering the weight of history, this land's his own. Two forces in opposition, yet inextricably bound. Do you now feel as if you have come home, Icarium? I remember you, striding from the sea, a refugee from a realm you had laid to waste. Yet your father did not await you. He had gone. He had walked down the throat of an Azath. Icarium, he was Jaghat, and among the Jaghat no father reaches across to take his child's hand. Are you sick, old man? Blinking, Bug looked across to see a servant from one of the nearby estates returning from market with a basket of foodstuffs balanced on his head. Only with grief, dear mortal. He shook his head. It was the floods, the servant went on, shifting the clay. Aye. Scale house fell down, did you hear? Right into the street. Good thing it was empty, eh? Though I heard there was a fatality in the street. The man suddenly grinned. A cat! Laughing, he resumed his journey. 
Bugs stared after him. Then, with a grunt, he set off for the gate. He waited on the terrace, frowning down at the surprisingly deep trench the crew had managed to excavate into the bank, then outward, through the bedded silts of the river itself. The shoring was robust, and Bug could see few leaks from between the sealed slats. Even so, two workers were on the pump, their bared backs slick with sweat. Rotos Hivana came to his side. Bug, welcome. I imagine you wish to retrieve your crew. No rush, sir, Bug replied. It is clear to me now that this project of yours is ambitious. How much water is coming up from the floor of that pit? Without constant pumping, the trench would overflow in a little under two bells. I bring you a message from your servant, Bennett Safad, who visited on his way out of the city. He came to observe our progress on the refurbishment of the inn you recently acquired, and was struck with something of a revelation upon seeing the mysterious mechanism we found inside an outbuilding. He further suggested it was imperative that you see it for yourself. Also, he mentioned a collection of artifacts, recovered from this trench, yes? The large man was silent for a moment, then he seemed to reach a decision, for he gestured Bug to follow. They entered the estate, passing through an elongated shuttered room in which hung drying herbs, down a corridor, and into a workroom dominated by a large table and prism lanterns attached to hinged arms, so that, if desired, they could be drawn close or lifted clear when someone was working at the table. Resting on the polished wood surface were a dozen or so objects, both metal and fired clay, not one of which revealed any obvious function. Rotos Hivana, still silent and standing now at his side, Bug scanned the objects for a long moment, then reached out and picked up one in particular. Heavy, unmarked by pitting or rust, seamlessly bent almost to right angles. Your engineers, Rotos Hivana said, could determine no purpose to these mechanisms. Bug's brows rose at the man's use of the word mechanism. He hefted the object in his hands. I have attempted to assemble these, the merchant continued, to no avail. There are no obvious attachment points, yet somehow they seem to me to be of a piece. Perhaps some essential item is still buried beneath the river, but we have found nothing for three days now, barring a wheelbarrow's worth of stone chips and shards, and these were recovered in a level of sediment far below these artifacts, leading me to believe that they predate them by centuries, if not millennia. Yes, Bug muttered. Aerosol, a mated pair, preparing flint for tools, here on the bank of the vast marsh. He worked the cores, she did the more detailed napping. They came here for three seasons, then she died in childbirth, and he wandered with a starving babe in his arms until it too died. He found no others of his kind, for they had been scattered after the conflagration of the great forests, the wildfires sweeping out over the plains. The air was thick with ash. He wandered until he died, and so was the last of his line. He stared unseeing at the artifact, even as its weight seemed to burgeon, threatening to tug at his arms, to drag him down to his knees. But Icarium said there would be no end, that the cut thread was but an illusion. In his voice, then, I could hear his father. A hand closed on his shoulder and swung him round. Startled, he met Rortos Hivana's sharp, glittering eyes. Bug frowned. Sir? You... you are inclined to invent stories. Or perhaps you are a sage gifted with unnatural sight. Is this what I am hearing, old man? Tell me, who was this Icarium? Was that the name of the Erisol, the one who died? I am sorry, sir. He raised the object higher. This artifact, you will find it is identical to the massive object at the inn, barring scale. I believe this is what your servant wanted you to realize, as he himself did when he first looked upon the edifice once we had brought down the walls enclosing it. Are you certain of all this? Yes. 
Bug gestured at the array of items on the table. A central piece is missing, as you suspected, sir. Alas, you will not find it, for it is not physical. The framework that will hold it together is one of energy, not matter. And, he added, still in a distracted tone, it has yet to arrive. He set the artifact back down and walked from the chamber, back up the corridor, through the dry rack room, out onto the terrace. Unmindful of the two workers pausing to stare across at him as Rortos Hivana appeared as if in pursuit, the merchant's hands were spread, palms up, as if beseeching, although the huge man said not a word, his mouth working in silence, as though he had been struck mute. Bug's glance at the large man was momentary. He continued on, along the passage between the state wall and compound wall, to the side postern near the front gate. He found himself once more on the street, only remotely noticing the passers-by in the cooler shade of afternoon. It has yet to arrive, and yet it comes. What were you walking, old man? Lave off him. See how he weeps? It's an old man's right to grieve, so leave him be. Must be blind, the clumsy fool. And here... Long before this city was born, there stood a temple into which Ikarium walked, as lost as any son, a child severed from the thread. But the elder god within could give him nothing, nothing beyond what he himself was preparing to do. Could you have imagined, Karul, how Ikarium would take what you did? Take it into himself as would any child seeking a guiding hand? Where are you, Karul? Do you sense his return? Do you know what he seeks? Clumsy or not, it's a question of manners and proper respect. Bug's threadbare tunic was grasped, and he was dragged to one side, then flung up against a wall. He stared at a battered face beneath the rim of a helm, to one side, scowling, another guard. Do you know who we are? the man holding him demanded, bearing stained teeth. Karos in Victad thugs, I, His private police, the ones who kick in doors at the middle of night. The ones who take mothers from babes, fathers from sons. The ones who, in the righteous glory that comes with unchallenged power, then loot the homes of the arrested, not to mention raping the daughters. Bug was thrown a second time against the wall, the back of his head crunching hard on the pitted brick. For that, bastard! The man snarled, You'll drown! Bug blinked sweat from his eyes. Then, as the thug's words penetrated, he laughed. Drown? Oh, that's priceless. Now take your hands off me, or I will lose my temper. Instead, the man tightened his hold on the front of Bug's tunic, while the other said, You were right, Canossos. He needs beating. The bully's greatest terror. Bug said, comes when he meets someone bigger and meaner. And is that you? Both men laughed. Bug twisted his head, looked round. People were hurrying past. It was never wise to witness such events, not when the murderers of the patriotists were involved. So be it, he said under his breath. Gentlemen, allow me to introduce to you someone bigger and meaner, or, to be more accurate, some thing. A moment later, Bug was alone. He adjusted his tunic, glanced about, then set off once more for his master's abode. It was inevitable, he knew, that someone had witnessed the sudden vanishing of two armed and armored men. But no one cried out in his wake, for which he was relieved, since he was not inclined to discuss much with anyone right at that moment. Did I just lose my temper? It's possible. But then you were distracted, perturbed even. These things happen. Featherwitch wasted little time. Off the cursed ships and their countless, endlessly miserable crowds, the eyes always upon her, the expressions of suspicion or contempt and the stench of suffering that came of hundreds of prisoners, the fallen Edur of Sepik, mixed blood one and all, worse in the eyes of the tribes than lethary slaves, the scores of foreigners who possessed knowledge deemed useful, at least for now, the Nemil fisherfolk, the four copper-skinned Shalmorzin warriors dragged from a floundering carrack, 
denizens of seven cities hailing from Erlitan, the Karang Isles, poor Atri and other places, Quan sailors who claimed to be citizens of an empire called Malaz, dwellers of Lamatath and Kalos. Among them there were warriors considered worthy enough to be treated as challengers. An axeman from the ruined Mekros city the fleet had descended upon, a Kabalhi monk and a silent woman wearing a porcelain mask, the brow of which was marked with eleven arcane glyphs. She had been found near dead in a storm-battered scow south of Kalos. There were others chained in the holds of other ships in other fleets, but where they came from and what they were was mostly irrelevant. The only detail that had come to fascinate Feather Witch among all these pathetic creatures was the bewildering array of gods, goddesses, spirits, and ascendants they worshipped. Prayers in a dozen languages, voices reaching out into vast silences, all these forlorn fools and all the unanswered calls for salvation. No end in that huge chaotic world to the delusions of those who believed they were chosen. Unique among their kind, basking beneath the gaze of gods that gave a damn, as if they would, when the truth was, each immortal visage, for all its peculiar traits, was but a facet of one, and that one had long since turned away, only to fight an eternal battle against itself. From the heavens only indifference rained down like ash, stinging the eyes, scratching raw the throat. There was no sustenance in that blinding deluge. Chosen. Now there was a conceit of appalling proportions. Either we all are, or none of us are. And if the former, then we will all face the same judge, the same hand of justice. The wealthy, the indebted, the master, the slave, the murderer and the victim, the raper and the raped, all of us. So pray hard, everyone, if that helps, and look well to your own shadow. More likely, in her mind, no one was chosen, and there was no day of judgment awaiting every soul. Each and every mortal faced a singular end, and that was oblivion. Oh, indeed, the gods existed, but not one cared a whit for the fate of a mortal soul, unless they could bend that soul to their will, to serve as but one more soldier in their pointless, self-destructive wars. For herself, she was past such thinking. She had found her own freedom, basking beneath that blessed reign of indifference. She would do as she willed, and not even the gods could stop her. It would be the gods themselves, she vowed, who would come to her, beseeching on their knees, snared in their own game. She moved silently now, deep in the crypts beneath the old palace. I was a slave once. Many believe I still am. Yet look at me. I rule this buried realm. I alone know where the hidden chambers reside. I know what awaits me within them. I walk this most fated path, and, when the time is right, I will take the throne. The throne of oblivion. Uruth might well be looking for her right now, the old hag with all her airs, the smugness of a thousand imagined secrets, but Feather Witch knew all those secrets. There was nothing to fear from Uruth Sengar. She had been usurped by events, by her youngest son, by the other sons who then betrayed Rulad, by the conquest itself. The society of Edur women was now scattered, torn apart. They went where their husbands were dispatched. They had surrounded themselves in leathery slaves, fauners, and indebted. They had ceased to care. In any case, Feather Witch had had enough of all that. She was in Letharas once more, and like that fool Udinas, she was fleeing her bondage. And here, in the catacombs of the old palace, none would find her. Old storage rooms were already well supplied, equipped a morsel at a time in the days before the long journey across the oceans. She had fresh water, wine and beer, dried fish and beef, fired clay jugs with preserved fruits, bedding, spare clothes, and over a hundred scrolls stolen from the Imperial Library. Histories of the Nerek, the Tarthanol, the Fent, and a host of even more obscure peoples the Lethery had devoured in the last seven or eight centuries, the Bratha, the Katar, the Dresh, and the Sheikh. And here, beneath the old palace, Feather Witch had discovered chambers lined with shelves on which sat thousands of mouldering scrolls, crumbling clay tablets and worm-gnawed bound books. 
Of those she had examined, the faded script in most of them was written in an arcane style of lethary that proved difficult to decipher. But she was learning, albeit slowly. A handful of old tomes, however, were penned in a language she had never seen before. The first empire, whence this colony originally came all those centuries ago, seemed to be a complicated place, home to countless peoples, each with their own languages and gods. For all the imperial claims to being the birth of human civilization, it was clear to Featherwitch that no such claim could be taken seriously. Perhaps the first empire marked the initial nation consisting of more than a single city, probably born out of conquest, one city-state after another swallowed up by the rampaging founders. Yet even then, the fabled seven cities was an empire bordered by independent tribes and peoples, and there had been wars and then treaties. Some were broken, most were not. Imperial ambitions had been stymied, and it was this fact that triggered the age of colonization to distant lands. The first empire had met foes who would not bend a knee. This was, for Featherwitch, the most important truth of all, one that had been conveniently and deliberately forgotten. She had gained strength from that, but such details were themselves but confirmation of discoveries she had already made, out in the vast world beyond. There had been clashes, fierce seafarers who took exception to a foreign fleet's invading their waters. Lethary and Edoer ships had gone down, figures amidst flotsam-filled waves, arms raised in hopeless supplication, the heave and swirl of sharks, denarabi, and other mysterious predators of the deep. Screams, piteous screams, they still echoed in her head, writhing at the pit of her stomach, revulsion and glee both. The storms that had battered the fleet, especially west of the Draconian Sea, had revealed the true immensity of natural power, its fickle thrashings that swallowed entire ships. There was delight in being so humbled, coming upon her with the weight of revelation. The Letha Empire was puny. Like Uruth Sengar, it held to airs of greatness when it was but one more pathetic hovel of cowering mortals. She would not regret destroying it. Huddled now in her favoured chamber, the ceiling overhead a cracked dome, its plaster paintings obscured by stains and mould, Featherwitch sat herself down cross-legged and drew out a small leather pouch. Within, her most precious possession. She could feel its modest length through the thin hide, the protuberances, the slightly ragged end, and opposite, the curl of a nail that had continued growing. She wanted to draw it out, to touch once again its burnished skin. Foolish little girl! Hissing, Feather Witch flinched back from the doorway. A twisted, malformed figure occupied the threshold. She had not seen it in a long time, had almost forgotten. Hanan Mossack, I do not answer to you. And if you think me weak... Oh, no! wheezed the Warlock King. Not that! I chose my word carefully when I said foolish. I know you have delved deep into your leathery magic. You have gone far beyond casting those old chipped tiles of long ago, haven't you? Even Urus has no inkling of your seedence. You did well to disguise your learning. Yet for all that, you are still a fool, dreaming of all that you might achieve, when in truth you are alone. What do you want? If the Emperor were to learn that you're skulking around down here, he will learn nothing. You and I, Lethary, we can work together. We can destroy that abomination. With yet another in his place, you... Do you truly think I would have let it come to this? Rulite is mad, as is the god who controls him. They must be expunged. I know your hunger, Hanan Mossag. You do not! The Edoer snapped, a shudder taking him. He edged closer into the chamber, then held up a mangled hand. Look carefully upon me, woman. See what the chained one's sorcery does to the flesh. Oh, we are bound now to the power of chaos, to its taste, its seductive flavor. It should never have come to this. So you keep saying, she cut in with a sneer. And how would the great empire of Hanan Mossack have looked? 
a rain of flowers onto every street, every citizen freed of debt, with the benign Tist Edward overseeing it all. She leaned forward. You forget, I was born among your people, in your very tribe, Warlock King. I remember going hungry during the Unification Wars. I remember the cruelty you heaped upon us slaves. When we got too old, you used us as bait for Beskra crabs, threw our old ones into a cage and dropped it over the side of your nari. Oh, yes, drowning was a mercy. But the ones you didn't like, you kept their heads above the tide line. You let the crabs devour them alive and laughed at the screams. We were muscle, and when that muscle was used up, we were meat. And is indebtedness any better? No, for that is a plague that spreads to every family member, every generation. Hanan Mossag shook his misshapen head. I would not have succumbed to the chained one. He believed he was using me, but I was using him. Feather which, there would have been no war, no conquest. The tribes were joined as one. I made certain of that. Prosperity and freedom from fear awaited us, and in that world the lives of the slaves would have changed. Perhaps, indeed, the lives of Lethery among the Tist Edur would have proved a lure to the indebted in the Southlands, enough to shatter the spine of this empire, for we would have offered freedom. She turned away, deftly hiding the small leather bag. What is the point of this, Hanan Mossag? You wish to bring down Rulad. I will bring you all down. But it must begin with Rulad. You can see that. Unless he is destroyed, and that sword with him, you can achieve nothing. If you could have killed him, Warlock King, you would have done so long ago. Oh, but I will kill him, she glared across at him. How? Why, with his own family? Feather Witch was silent for a dozen heartbeats. His father cowers in fear. His mother cannot meet his eyes. Binadas and Trull are dead, and fear has fled. Binadas? The breath hissed slowly from Hanan Mossag. I did not know that. Tom had dreamed of his son's death, and Hanradi Kalag quested for his soul, and failed. The warlock king regarded her with hooded eyes. And did my Karisnan attempt the same of Trull Sengar? No, why would he? Rulat himself murdered Trull, chained him in the nascent. If that was meant to be a secret, it failed. We heard. We slaves hear everything. Yes, you do. And that is why we can help each other. Feather Witch, you wish to see this cursed empire collapse? So do I. And when that occurs, know this. I intend to take my Edor home, back to our Northlands. If the South is in flames, that is of no concern to me. I leave the lethery to the lethery, for no surer recipe for obliteration do any of us require. I knew that from the very start. Lether cannot sustain itself. Its appetite is an addiction, and that appetite exceeds the resources it needs to survive. Your people had already crossed that threshold, although they knew it not. It was my dream, Feather Witch, to raise a wall of power and so ensure the immunity of the Tist Edur. Tell me, what do you know of the impending war in the East? What war? Hanan Mossag smiled. The unraveling begins. Let us each grasp a thread, you at one end, me at the other. Behind you, the slaves. Behind me, all the Karisnan. Does Troll Sengar live? It is Fear Sengar who seeks the means of destroying Rulad. And I mean for him to find it. Decide now, Feather Witch, are we in league? She permitted herself a small smile. Hanan Mossag, when the moment of obliteration comes... You had better crawl fast. I don't want to see them! With these words the Emperor twisted on his throne, 
legs drawing up, and seemed to focus on the wall to his left. The sword in his right hand, point resting on the dais, was trembling. Standing in an alcove to one side, Nissal wanted to hurry forward, reaching out for the beleaguered, frightened Edur. But Triban Gnoll stood facing the throne. This audience belonged to him and him alone, nor would the Chancellor countenance any interruption from her. He clearly detested her very presence, but on that detail Rulad had insisted, Nissal's only victory thus far. Highness, I agree with you. Your father, alas, insisted I convey to you his wishes. He would greet his most cherished son. Further, he brings dire news. His favorite kind, Rulad muttered, eyes flickering as if he was seeking an escape from the chamber. Cherished? His word? No, I thought not. What he cherishes is my power. He wants it for himself, him and Benedas. Forgive my interruption, Highness, Triban Gnoll said, bowing his head. There is news of Benedas. The Emperor flinched, licked dry lips. What has happened? It is now known, the Chancellor replied, that Benedas was murdered. He was commanding a section of the fleet. There was a battle with an unknown enemy. Terrible sorcery was exchanged, and the remnants of both fleets were plunged into the nascent, there to complete their battle in that flooded realm. Yet this was all prelude. After the remaining enemy ships fled, a demon came upon Benedas's ships. Such was its ferocity that all the Edoa were slaughtered. Benedas himself was pinned to his chair by a spear flung by that demon. How? Rulad croaked. How is all this known? Your father dreamed. In that dream he found himself a silent, ghostly witness, drawn there as if by the caprice of a malevolent god. What of that demon? Does it still haunt the nascent? I shall hunt it down. I shall destroy it. Yes, there must be vengeance. He was my brother. I sent him. My brother sent him. They all die by my word, all of them. And this is what my father will tell me. Oh, how he hungers for that moment. But he shall not have it. The demon, yes, the demon who stalks my kin. His fevered ramble trickled away, and so ravaged was Rulad's face that Nisal had to look away, lest she cry out. Highness, the Chancellor said in a quiet voice. Nisal stiffened. This was what Triban Gnoll was working towards. All that had come before was for this precise moment. Highness, the demon has been delivered. It is here, Emperor. Rulad seemed to shrink back into himself. He said nothing, though his mouth worked. A challenger, Triban Gnoll continued. Tarthanal blood, yet purer, Hanradi Kalag claims, than any Tarthanal of this continent. Tomad knew him for what he was the moment the giant warrior took his first step onto Edoa Bloodwood. Knew him, yet could not face him, for Binadas's soul is in the Tarthanal's shadow along with a thousand other fell victims. They clamour one and all for both freedom and vengeance. Highness, the truth must now be clear to you. Your God has delivered him, to you, so that you may slay him, so that you may avenge your brother's death. Yes, Rulad whispered. He laughs. Oh, how he laughs. Benedas, are you close? Close to me now? Do you yearn for freedom? Well, if I cannot have it, why should you? No, there is no hurry now, is there? You wanted this throne, and now you learn how it feels. Just a hint, yes, of all that haunts me. Highness, the Chancellor murmured, are you not eager to avenge Binadas? Tomad, Tomad! Rulad jolted on the throne, glad at Triban Gnoll, who visibly rocked back. He saw the demon slay Benedas, and now he thinks it will do the same to me. That is the desire for vengeance at work here, you fish-skinned fool. Tomad wants me to die because I killed Benedas, and Troll, I have killed his children. But whose blood burns in my veins? Whose? Where is Hanrati? Oh, I know why he will not be found in the outer room. He goes to Hanan Mossag. They plunge into darkness and whisper of betrayal. I am past my patience with them. Triban Gnoll spread his hands. 
Highness, I had intended to speak to you of this, but at another time. Of what? Out with it! A humble inquiry from Invigilator Karos Invictad, Highness. With all respect, I assure you, he asks your will in regard to matters of treason, not among the Lethary, of course, for he has that well in hand, but among the Tist Edua themselves. Nissal's gasp echoed in the suddenly silent room. She looked across to where Edor guards were stationed and saw them motionless as statues. Rulad looked ready to weep. Treason among the Edor! My Edor! No, this cannot be! Has he proof? A faint shrug. Highness, I doubt he would have ventured this inquiry had he not inadvertently stumbled on some sensitive information. Go away! Get out! Get out! Shriban Gnoll bowed, then backed from the chamber. Perhaps he'd gone too far, yet the seed had been planted in most fertile soil. As soon as the outer doors closed, Nissal stepped from the alcove. Rulad waved her closer. My love, he whispered in a child's voice. What am I to do? The demon, they brought it here. You cannot be defeated, Emperor. And to destroy it. How many times must I die? No, I'm not ready. Benadas was a powerful sorcerer, rival to the warlock king himself. My brother! It may be, Nissal ventured, that the Chancellor erred in the details of that. It may indeed be that Tomad's dream was a deceitful sending. There are many gods and spirits out there who see the crippled god as an enemy. No more. I am cursed into confusion. I don't understand any of this. What is happening, Nissal? Palace ambitions, beloved. The return of the fleets has stirred things up. My own Edo, plotting treason. She reached out and set a hand on his left shoulder. The lightest of touches, momentary, then withdrawn once more. Dare I? Karos Invictad is perhaps the most ambitious of them all. He revels in his reign of terror among the Lethary, and would expand it to include the Tist Edur. Highness, I am Lethary. I know men like the Invigilator. I know what drives them, what feeds their malign souls. He hungers for control, for his heart quails in fear at all that is outside his control, at chaos itself. In his world he is assailed on all sides. Highness, Karos Invictad's ideal world is one surrounded by a sea of corpses, every unknown and unknowable obliterated. And even then he will find no peace. Perhaps he should face me in the arena, Rulad said with a sudden vicious smile. Face to face with a child of chaos, yes? But no, I need him to hunt down his lethary, the traitors! And shall this lethary be granted domination over Tist Edur as well? Treason is colorless, Rulad said, shifting uneasily on the throne once more. It flows unseen, no matter the hue of blood. I have not decided on that. I need to think, to understand. Perhaps I should summon the Chancellor once again. Highness, you once appointed an Edur to oversee the Patriotists. Do you recall? Of course I do. Do you think me an idiot, woman? Perhaps Bruthantrana. Yes, that's him. Not once has he reported to me. Has he done as I commanded? How do I even know? Summon him then, Highness. Why does he hide from me, unless he conspires with the other traitors? Highness, I know for a truth that he seeks an audience with you almost daily. You? Rulad glanced over at her, eyes narrowing. How? Bruthentrana sought me out, beseeching me to speak to you on his behalf. The Chancellor denies him an audience with you. Tribungnol cannot deny such things. He is a lethary. Where am I, Edo? Why do I never see them? And now Tomad has returned, and Hanradi Kalag. None of them will speak to me. Highness, Tomad waits in the outer chamber. He knew I would deny him. You are confusing me, or... I don't need you. I don't need anyone. I just need time to think. That is all. They're all frightened of me, and with good reason. Oh, yes. Traitors are always frightened, and when their schemes are discovered, oh, how they plead for their lives. 
Perhaps I should kill everyone, a sea of corpses. Then there would be peace. And that is all I want, peace. Tell me, are the people happy, Nissal? She bowed her head. I do not know, Highness. Are you? Are you happy with me? I feel naught but love for you, Emperor. My heart is yours. The same words you spoke to Diskanar, no doubt, and all the other men you've bedded. Have your slaves draw baths, you stink of sweat woman. Then await me beneath silks. He raised his voice. Call the Chancellor. We wish to speak to him immediately. Go, Nissal. Your leathery stink makes me ill. As she backed away, Rulad raised his free hand. My dearest, the golden silks. You are like a pearl among those. The sweetest pearl. Ruth Entrana waited in the corridor until Tomad Sangar, denied audience with the Emperor, departed the citizens' chamber. Stepping into the Elder's path, he bowed and said, I greet you, Tomad Sangar. Distracted, the older Tist Edua frowned at him. Dendratha, what do you wish from me? A word or two, no more than that. I am Bruth Entrana, one of Rulad's sycophants. Alas, no. I was appointed early in the regime to oversee the Lethary security organization known as the Patriotists. As part of my responsibilities, I was to report to the Emperor in person each week. As of yet, I have not once addressed him. The Chancellor has interposed himself and turns me away each and every time. My youngest son suckles at Gnoll's tit, Tomad Sengar said in a low, bitter voice. It is my belief, Bruth Entrana said, that the Emperor himself is not entirely aware of the extent of the barriers the Chancellor and his agents have raised around him, Elder Sengar. Although I have sought to penetrate them, I have failed thus far. Then why turn to me, Denratha? I am even less able to reach through to my son. It is the Tist Edur who are being isolated from their Emperor, Bruthen said. Not just you and I, all of us. Hanan Mossag is reviled, for it is well understood that the Warlock King is responsible for all of this. His ambition is packed with an evil god. He sought the sword for himself, did he not? Then Rulad is truly alone. Bruthentrana nodded, then added, There is a possibility. There is one person, the Lethary woman who is his first concubine. The Lethary? Tomad snarled. You must be mad. She is an agent for Gnoll, a spy. She has corrupted Rulad. How else could she remain as first concubine? My son would never have taken her unless she had some nefarious hold over him. The snarl twisted the elder's features. You are being used, warrior. You and I shall not speak again. Tomad Sengar pushed him to one side and marched down the corridor. Bruce and Trana turned to watch him go. Drawing out a crimson silk cloth, Karos and Victad daubed at the sweat on his brow his eyes fixed on the strange two-headed insect as it circled in place, round and round and round in its box cage. Not a single arrangement of tiles will halt this confounded brainless creature. I begin to believe this is a hoax. Were it me, sir, Tanal Yathvana said, I would have crushed the whole contraption under heel long ago. Indeed, it must be a hoax. The proof is that you have not defeated it yet. The invigilator's gaze lifted, regarded Tanal. I do not know which is the more disgusting, you acknowledging defeat by an insect, or your pathetic attempts at flattery. He set the cloth down on the table and leaned back. The studied pursuit of solutions requires patience, and more, a certain cast of intellect. This is why you will never achieve more than you have, Tanal Yathvana. You totter at the very edge of your competence. Ah, no need for the blood to so rush to your face. It is what you are that I find so useful to me. Furthermore, you display uncommon wisdom in restraining your ambition, so that you make no effort to attempt what is beyond your capacity. That is a rare talent. Now, what have you to report to me this fine afternoon? Master, 
We have come very close to seeing our efforts extended to include the Tist Edur. Karos in Victad's brows rose. Treban Gnoll has spoken to the Emperor? He has. Of course, the Emperor was shaken by the notion of traitors among the Edur, so much so that he ordered the Chancellor from the throne room. For a while, Tanal Yathvana smiled. A quarter bell, apparently. The subject was not broached again that day, yet it is clear that Rulad's suspicions of his fellow Edur have burgeoned. Very well. It will not be long, then. The invigilator leaned forward again, frowning down at the puzzle box. It is important that all obstacles be removed. The only words the Emperor should be hearing should come from the Chancellor. Tanal, prepare a dossier on the first concubine. He looked up again. You understand, don't you, that your opportunity to free that scholar you have chained far below has passed. There is no choice now but that she must disappear. Unable to speak, Tanal Yathvana simply nodded. I note this, and with some urgency, because you have no doubt grown weary of her in any case, and if not, you should have. I trust I am understood. Would you not enjoy replacing her with the first concubine? Kauros smiled. Tanal licked dry lips. Such a dossier will be difficult, master. Don't be a fool. Work with the Chancellor's agents. We're not interested in factual reportage here. Invent what we need to incriminate her. That should not be difficult. Errant knows we've had enough practice. Even so, forgive me, sir, but she is the Emperor's only lover. You do not understand at all, do you? She is not Rulad's first love. No, that woman, an Edur, killed herself. Oh, never mind the official version. I have witnessed reports of that tragic event. She was carrying the Emperor's child. Thus, in every respect imaginable, she betrayed him. Tanal, for Rulad, the rains have just passed. And while the clay feels firm underfoot, it is in truth thin as papyrus. At the first intimation of suspicion, Rulad will lose his mind to rage. We will be lucky to wrest the woman from his clutches. Accordingly, the arrest must take effect in the palace, in private, when the first concubine is alone. She must then be brought here immediately. Do you not believe the Emperor will demand her return? The Chancellor will advise against it, of course. Please, Tanal Yathvana, leave the subtle details of human and Edur natures to those of us who fully comprehend them. You shall have the woman, fear not, to do with as you please, once we have her confession, that is. Bloodied and bruised, is that not how you prefer them? Now leave me. I believe I have arrived at a solution to this contraption. Tanal Yathvana stood outside the closed door for a time, struggling to slow his heart, his mind racing. Murder Janath Anar? Make her disappear like all the others? Fattening the crabs at the bottom of the river? Oh, errant, I do not know. If... I do not know... From behind the office door came a snarl of frustration. Oddly enough, the sound delighted him. Yes, you towering intellect, it defeats you again, that two-headed nightmare in miniature. For all your lofty musings on your own genius, this puzzle confounds you. Perhaps, invigilator, the world is not how you would have it, not so clear, not so perfectly designed to welcome your domination. He forced himself forward, down the hall. No, he would not kill Janath Anar. He loved her. Karos in Victad loved only himself. It had always been so, Tanal suspected, and that was not going to change. The invigilator understood nothing of human nature, no matter how he might delude himself. Indeed, Karos had given himself away in that careless command to kill her. Yes, invigilator, this is my revelation. I am smarter than you. I am superior in all the ways that truly matter. You and your power, it is all compensation for what you do not understand about the world, for the void in your soul where compassion belongs. Compassion and the love that one can feel for another person. He would tell her now. He would confess the depth of his feelings. And then he would unchain her, and they would flee, out of Letharas beyond the reach of the patriotists. Together, they would make their lives anew.
He hurried down the damp, worn stairs, beyond the sight of everyone now, down into his own private world, where his love awaited him. The invigilator could not reach everywhere, as Tanal was about to prove. Down through darkness, all so familiar now, he no longer needed a lantern. Where he ruled, not Karos in Victad, no, not here. This was why the invigilator attacked him again and again, with ever the same weapon, the implicit threat of exposure, of defamation of Tanal Yathvana's good name. But all these crimes, they belonged to Karos in Victad. Imagine the countercharges Tanal could level against him, if he needed to. He had copies of records, he knew where every secret was buried. The accounts of the blood-stained wealth the invigilator had amassed from the estates of his victims. Tanal knew where those records were kept, and as for the corpses of the ones who had disappeared... Reaching the barred door to the torture chamber, he drew down the lantern he had left on a ledge, and, after a few efforts, struck the wick alight. He lifted clear the heavy bar and pushed open the heavy door with one hand. Back so soon? The voice was a raw croak. Tanal stepped into the chamber. You have fouled yourself again. No matter, this is the last time, Janath Anar. Come to kill me, then. So be it. You should have done that long ago. I look forward to leaving this broken flesh. You cannot chain a ghost. And so, with my death, you shall become the prisoner. You shall be the one who is tormented. For as long as you live, and I do hope it is long, I shall whisper in your ear. She broke into a fit of coughing. He walked closer, feeling emptied inside, his every determination stripped away by the vehemence in her words. The manacles seemed to weep blood. She had been struggling against her fetters again. Dreaming of haunting me, of destroying me. How is she any different? How could I have expected her to be any different? Look at you, he said in a low voice. Not even human anymore. Do you not care about your appearance? About how you want me to see you when I come here? You're right, she said in a grating voice. I should have waited until you arrived until you came close, then voided all over you. I'm sorry. I'm afraid my bowels are in bad shape right now. The muscles are weakening, inevitably. You'll not haunt me, woman. Your soul is too useless. The abyss will sweep it away, I'm sure. Besides, I won't kill you for a long while yet. I don't think it's up to you anymore, Tanal Yathvana. It's all up to me, he shrieked. All of it. He stalked over to her and began unshackling her arms, then her legs. She lost consciousness before he had freed her second wrist and slid into a heap that almost snapped both her legs before he managed to work the manacles from her battered, torn ankles. She weighed almost nothing, and he was able to move quickly up twenty or so stairs until he reached a side passage. The slimy cobble floor underfoot gradually sloped downward as he shambled along, the woman over one shoulder, the lantern swinging from his free hand. Rats scurried from his path, out to the sides where deep, narrow gutters had been cut by an almost constant flow of runoff. Eventually, the drip of dark water from the curved ceiling overhead became a veritable rain. The droplets revived Janath momentarily, enough for her to moan, then cough for a half-dozen strides. He was thankful when she swooned once more, and the feeble clawing on his back ceased. And now came the stench. Disappeared? Oh no, they are here, all of them. All the ones Karos and Victad didn't like, didn't need, wanted out of the way. Into the first of the huge domed chambers with its stone walkway encircling a deep well, in which white-shelled crabs clambered amidst bones. This well was entirely filled, which is what had forced the opening of another, then another and another. There were so many of them down here beneath the river. Arriving at the last of the chambers, Tanal set her down, where he shackled one of her legs to the wall. On either side of her she had company, although neither victim was alive. He stepped back as she stirred once more. This is temporary, 
he said, you won't be joining your friends beside you. When I return, and it won't be long, I will move you again, to a new cell known to no one but me, where I will teach you to love me. You'll see, Janoth Anar. I am not the monster you believe me to be. Kauros Invictad is the monster. He has twisted me. He has made me into what I am. But Kauros Invictad is not a god, not immortal, not infallible. As we shall all discover, he thinks I want her, that whore of the emperors, that dirty fallen bitch. He could not be more wrong. Oh, there's so much to do now, but I promise I won't be gone long. You'll see, my love. She awoke to the sound of his footfalls dwindling, then lost to the trickle and drip of water. It was dark and cold, colder than it had ever been before. She was somewhere else now, some other crypt. But the same nightmare. She lifted a hand as best she could and wiped at her face. Her hand came away slick with slime. Yet, the chains, they're gone. She struggled to draw her limbs inward, then almost immediately heard the rattle of iron links snaking across stone. Ah, not completely. And now pain arrived, in every joint, piercing fire. Ligaments and tendons, stretched for so long, now began contracting like burning ropes. Oh, errant, take me! Her eyes flickered open once more, and with returning consciousness she became aware of savage hunger, coiling in her shrunken stomach. Watery waste trickled loose. There was no point in weeping, no point in wondering which of them was madder, him for his base appetites and senseless cruelty, or her for clinging so to this remnant of a life. A battle of wills, yet profoundly unequal. She knew that in her heart, had known it all along. The succession of grand lectures she had devised in her mind all proved hollow conceits, their taste too bitter to bear. He had defeated her, because his were weapons without reason. And so I answered with my own madness. I thought it would work. Instead, I ended up surrendering all that I had that was of any worth. And so now, the cold of death stealing over me, I can only dream of becoming a vengeful ghost, eager to torment the one who tormented me, eager to be to him as he was to me believing that such a balance was just, was righteous. Madness, to give in kind, is to be in kind. So now, let me leave here, forever gone. And she felt that madness reach out to her, an embrace that would sweep away her sense of self, her knowledge of who she had been, once that proud, smug academic with her pristine intellect ordering and reordering the world until even practicality was a quaint notion, not even worthy of discourse, because the world outside wasn't worth reaching out to, not really. Besides, it was sullied, wasn't it, by men like Tanal Yathavana and Karos Invictad, the ones who reveled in the filth they made, because only the stench of excess could reach through to their numbed senses. As it reaches through to mine, listen, he returns, step by hesitant step. A calloused hand settled on her brow. Janath Anar opened her eyes. Faint light coming from every direction. Warm light, gentle as a breath. Looming above her was a face, old, lined and weathered, with eyes deep as the seas, even as tears made them glisten. She felt the chain being dragged close. Then the old man tugged with one hand, and the links parted like rotted reeds. He reached down then and lifted her effortlessly. Abyss, yours is such a gentle face. Darkness once more. Beneath the bed of the river, below silts almost a story thick, rested the remains of almost sixteen thousand citizens of Letharas. Their bones filled ancient wells that had been drilled before the river's arrival, before the drainage course from the far eastern mountains changed cataclysmically, making the serpent lash its tail, the torrent carving a new channel, one that inundated a nascent city countless millennia ago. Lethary engineers, centuries past, had stumbled upon these submerged constructs, wondering at the humped corridors and the domed chambers, 
wondering at the huge deep wells with their clear cold water, and baffled to explain how such tunnels remained more or less dry, the cut channels seeming to absorb water like runners of sponge. No records existed any more recounting these discoveries. The tunnels and chambers and wells were lost knowledge to all but a chosen few. And of the existence of parallel passages, the hidden doors in the walls of corridors, and the hundreds of lesser tombs, not even those few were aware. Certain secrets belonged exclusively to the gods. The elder god carried the starved, brutalized woman into one of those side passages, the cantilevered door swinging shut noiselessly behind him. In his mind there was recrimination, a seething torrent of anger at himself. He had not imagined the full extent of depravity and slaughter conducted by the patriotists, and he was sorely tempted to awaken himself, unleashing his fullest wrath upon these unmitigated sadists. Of course, that would lead to unwarranted attention, which would no doubt result in yet greater slaughter, and one that made no distinction between those who deserved death and those who did not. This was the curse of power, after all. As, he well knew, Karos Invictad would soon discover. You fool invigilator! Who has turned his deadly regard upon you? Deadly, oh my, yes indeed. Though few might comprehend that, given the modestly handsome, thoroughly benign features surrounding that face. Even so, Karos Invictad, Tehol Bedict has decided that you must go. And I almost pity you. Tehol Bedict was on his knees on the dirt floor of the hovel, rummaging through a small heap of debris, when he heard a scuffling sound at the doorway. He glanced over a shoulder. Ublala Pang! Good evening, my friend! The huge half blood Tarthanol edged into the chamber, hunching beneath the low ceiling. What are you doing? A wooden spoon or at least the fragment thereof, employed in a central role in the preparation of this morning's meal. I dread the possibility that Bug tossed it into the hearth. Ah, here, see that? A curdle of fat remains on it. Looks like dirt to me, Tehol Bedict. Well, even dirt has flavor, he replied, crawling over to the pot simmering on the hearth. Finally, my soup acquires subtle sumptuousness. Can you believe this, Ublala Pung? Look at me, reduced to menial chores, even unto preparing my own meals. I tell you, my manservant's head has grown too large by far. He rises above his station, does Bug. Perhaps you could box him about the ears for 